Section 1 of Uther and the Grain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Parker Went, Hampton, Georgia, March 2022. Uther and the Grain by Warwick Deeping. Book 1, Chapter 1. Beneath the dark cornices of a thicket of wind-stunted pines stood a small company of women looking out into the hastening night. The half-light of evening lay over the scene, rolling wood and valley into a misty mass, while the horizon stood curbed by a belt of imminent clouds. In the western vault, a vast rent in the wall of gray gave out a blaze of transient gold that slanted like a spear shaft to a sullen sea. A wind cried restlessly amid the trees, gusty at intervals, but tuning its mood to a desolate and constant moan. There was an expression of despair on the face of the west. The woods were full of a vague woe and of troubled breathing. The trees seemed to sway to one another, to fling strange words with a tossing of hair and outstretched hands. The firs in the valley swept and harrowed, undulated like a green lagoon. The women upon the hill were garbed after the fashion of gray nuns. Their gowns stood out blankly against the ascetic trunks of the pines. They were huddled together in a group like sheep under a thorn hedge when storms threatened. The dark ovals of their hoods were turned towards the south, where the white patch of a sail showed vaguely through the gathering gray. Between the hill and the cliffs lay a valley threaded by a meager stream that quavered through pastures. A mist hung there despite the wind. Folded by a circle of oaks rose the gray walls of an ecclesiastical building of no inconsiderable size, while the mournful clangor of a bell came up upon the wind, with a vague sound as of voices chanting. Valley, stream, and abbey were rapidly melting into the indefinite background of the night. Suddenly, a snarling murmur seemed to swell the plaining of the bell. A dark mass that was moving through the meadows beneath like a herd of kine broke into a fringe of hurrying specks that dissolved into the shadows of the circle of oaks. The bell still continued to toll, while the women beneath the pines shivered and drew closer together as though for warmth and comfort. There was not one among them who had not grasped the full significance of the sinister sound that had come to them from the valley. A novice, taller than her sisters, stood forward from the group as though eager to catch the first evidence of the deed that was to be done on that drear evening. She held up a hand to those behind her in mute appeal to them to listen. The bell had ceased pulsing. In its stead sounded a faint, eerie whimper, an occasional shrill cry that seemed to leap out of silence like a bubble from a pool where death has been. The women were shaken from their strained vigilance as by a wind. The utter gray of the hour seemed to stifle them. Some were on their knees praying and weeping. One had fainted and lay huddled against the trunk of a pine. It was such a tragedy as was often played in those days of disruption and despair. For Rome, the decrepit Saturn of history, had fallen from empire to a tottering dotage. Her colonies, those titans of the past, still quivered beneath the doom piled upon them by the Teuton. In Britain, the cry of a nation had gone out blindly into the night. Vodigern had perished in the flames of Genorium. Ricoboom, Rutupii, and Durovirum had fallen. The fair fields of Kent were open to the pirate, while Aurelius, stout soldier king, gathered spear and shield to remedy the need of Britain. The women upon the hill were but the creatures of destiny. Realism had touched them with cynical finger. The barbarians had come shorewards that day in their ships, and at the first breathing of the news the abbey dependents had fled, leaving none and novice to the mercies of the moment. It had become a matter of flight or martyrdom. Certain fervent women had chosen to remain beside their abscess in the abbey chapel to await with vesper chant and bell the coming of sword and sax. 
Those more frail of spirit had fled with the novices from the valley, and now knelt numb with a tense terror on the brow of that windswept hill, watching fearfully for the abbey's doom. They could imagine what was passing in the shadowy chapel where they had so often worshipped. The face of the Madonna would be gazing placidly on death, and on more than death. It was all very swift, very terrible. Thenceforward, cloister and garden were theirs no more. A red gleam started suddenly from the black mass in the valley. The nuns gripped hands and watched, while the gleam became a glare that poured steadily above the dark outline of the oaks. A long flame leapt up like a red finger above the trees. The belfry of the chapel rose blackly from a circlet of fire, and gilded smoke rolled away nebulously into the night. The barbarians had set torch to the place. The Abbey of Avangel went up in flame. The tall novice who had been kneeling in advance of the main company rose to her feet and turned to those who still watched and prayed under the pines. The girl's hood had fallen back. The hair that should have been primly coiffed rolled down in billowy bronze upon her shoulders. There was infinite pride on the wistful face, a certain scorn for the frailer folk who wept and found sustenance in prayer. The girl's eyes shone largely even in the meager light under the trees, and there was a straight courage about her lips. She approached and spoke to the woman who knelt and watched the burning abbey in a cataleptic stupor. "'Will you kneel all night?' she said. The words were scourges in their purpose. Several of the nuns looked up from the flames in the valley. "'Shame on you, worldling,' said one of the thin and thankless visage. "'Down on your knees, brat, and pray for the dead.' The novice gave a curt, low laugh. The reproofs of a year rankled in her like bitter herbs. "'Let the dead bury their dead,' quoth she. "'I am for life and the living.' "'Shame, shame,' came the ready response." May the mother of mercy melt your proud heart and punish you for your sins. You are bad to the core. Shame or no shame, said the girl, my heart can grieve for death as well as thine, sister Claudia, and now the abbey's burnt. You may couch here and scold till dawn if you will. You may scold the heathen when they come to butcher you all. I warrant they will give such a beauty short shrift. The lean nun ventured no answer. She had been worsted before by this rebellious tongue and had discovered expediency in silence. Several of the women had risen and were thronging around the novice Egrain, querulous and fearful. Implicit faith, though pious and admirable in the extreme, neither pointed a path nor provided a lantern. Southwards lay the sea and the barbarians. The purlieus of Andreswold came down to touch the ocean. There was night in the sky, no refuge within miles, and wild folk enough in the world to make traveling sufficiently perilous. Moreover, the day's deed had hurried the women's emotions into a condition of vibrating panic. The unknown seemed to hem them in, to smother as with a cloak. They were like children who fear to stir in the dark and shrink from impalpable nothingness, as though a strange hand waited to grip them to some spiritual torture. As it was, they were fluttering among the pines like birds who fear the falcon. It grows dark, said one. Let Claudia pray for us. Egrain, you are wiser in the world than we. Truth, said the girl. You may bide and snivel with Claudia if you will. I am for Endurida through the woods. But the woods, said a child with wide dark eyes. The woods are fearful at night. They are kinder than the heathen said Egrain, taking the girl's hand. Come with me, I will mother you. Even as she spoke, the novice saw a point of fire disjoint itself from the dark circle of the oaks below. Another and another followed it, and began to jerk hither and thither in the meadows. The dashes of flame gradually took a northern trend, as though the torch-bearers were for ascending the long slope that idled up to the ragged thicket of pines. She turned without further vigil and made the most of her tidings in an appeal to the women under the trees. Look yonder, she said, pointing into the valley. Let Sister Claudia say whether she will wait 
till those torches come over the hill. There was an instant hubbub among the nuns, cooped as they had been within the mothering arms of the church. Peril found them utterly impotent when self-reliance and natural instinct were needed to shepherd them from danger. The night seemed to sweep like a wheel with the burning pyre in the meadows for Axel. The torches were moving hither and thither in fantastic fashion, as though the men who bore them were doubling right and left in the dark, like hounds casting about for a scent. The sight was sinister and stirred the women to renewed panic. Egrain, help us, came the cry. Even tyranny is welcome in times of peril. Witless, resourceless, they gathered about her in a dumb stupor. Even Claudia lost her greed for martyrdom and became human. They were all eager enough for the forest now, and hungry for a leader. Egrain stood up among them like a tall figure of hope. Her eyes were on the east, where a weird glow above the treetops told her that the moon was rising. See, she said, we shall have light upon our way. There is a bridle path through the wold here that goes north and touches the road from Durovernum. I am going by that path. Follow who will. We will follow Egrain, came the answer. North, east, and west lay Anders' wold, sinister as a sea at night. The hill, tangled with gorse and bracken and sapped by burrows, dipped to it gradually like an outjutting of the land. To the east they could see a wide tangle of pines latticing the light of the moon. It was dark and the ground more than dubious to the feet. The women, nine in all, herded close on Egrain, who walked like an eastern shepherdess, with the sheep following in her track. First came Claudia, who had held sway over the linen, with Malt, the stout celeris. Next, Elaine and Lily, twin sisters, two nuns, and two novices. There was much stumbling, much clutching at one another in the dark, but, thanks to holy terror, their progress was in measure ungracefully speedy. The girl Egrain led with a keen gleam in her eyes and a queer cheerfulness upon her face, as she stepped out blithely for the dark mass where the wold began. Her sojourn in the abbey had been brief and stormy, a curt attempt at discipline that had failed most nobly. One might as well have sought to hem in spring with winter as to curb desire that leapt towards greenness and the dawn like joy. She had ever thought more of a net for her hair than of her rosary. The little pool in the pleasance had served as her mirror, casting back a full face set with amber-shadowed eyes, and a bosom more attuned to passion than to dreams of quiet sanctity. She had been the wayward child of the abbey flock, flooded with homilies, surrendered to eternal penances, yet holding her own in a fair worldly fashion that left the good women of the place wholly to leeward. Thrust out into the world again, she took to the wild like a fox to the woodland, while her more tractable conrads were like caged doves baffled by unaccustomed freedom. Matins, complines, vespers were no more. Cold stone arched no more to tomb her fancies. Above stretched the free dome of the sky, around the wilderness free and untainted. In lieu of psalms, she heard the gathering cry of the wind and the great voice of the forest at night. In due course, they came to where a dark mast betokened the rampart thickets of the wold, rising like a wall across the sky. Egrain hoped for the track, and found it running like a white fillet about the brow of a wood. They followed it till it thrust into the trees, a thin thread in the shadows. As they went, great oaks overreached them with sinuous limbs. The vault was fretted innumerably with the faint overdome of the sky. Now and again a solitary star glimmered through. To the women that place seemed like an interminable cavern, where grotto on grotto dwindled away into oblivious gloom. But for the track's narrow comfort, Egrain and her company would have been impotent indeed. The prospect was sad for these folks who had lived for peace, and had tuned their lives to placid chance and the balm of prayer. 
In Britain, Christ was worshipped and the cross adored, yet abbeys were burnt and children martyred and strong towns given over to sack and fire. Truth seemed to taunt them with the apparent impotence of their creed. The Abbess Gratia had often said that Britain, for its sloth and sin, deserved to meet the scourge of war. And here were her words exampled by her own stark death. The nuns talked of the state of the land as they plodded on through the night. There was no soul among them that had not been grossly stirred by the fate that had overtaken Avangel, Gratia, and her more zealous nuns. It was but natural that a cry for vengeance should have gained voice in the hearts of these outcast women, and that a certain quarrelous bitterness should have found tongue against those in power. Egraine, walking in the van, listened to their words and laughed with some scorn in her heart. You are very wise, all of you, she said presently over her shoulder. You speak of war and disruption as though the whole kingdom were in the dust. True, Kent is lost. The heathen have burnt defenseless places on the coast and have stormed a few towns. The Abbey of Avangel is not all Britain. Have we not Aurelius and the great Uther? Our folk will gather head anon and push these whelps into the sea. God grant it, said Claudia, with a smirk heavenward. We need a man, quoth Egraine. Perhaps you will find him, pert one. Peril will, said the girl. There is no hero when there is no dragon or giant in need of the sword. Britain will find her knight ere long. Lud, said Malt, the cellarist. I wish I could find my supper. Thereat they all laughed, Egraine as heartily as any. Perhaps Claudia will pray for manna do, she said. Scoffer! It will be cranberries and bread and water till better seasons come. I have heard that there are wild grapes in the wold. Bread, quoth Malt. Did some kind soul say bread? I have a small loaf here under my habit. Ah, Egraine girl! I would chant twenty psalms for a morsel of that loaf. Chant away, sister. Begin on the attendite populi. I believe it is one of the longest. Don't trifle with the hungry wrench. The psalms, Malt, or not a crust. Keep it yourself, greedy hussy. I can go without. We will share it, all of us presently, said the girl, unless Malt wants to eat the whole. They held on under the ban of night following the track like Theseus did his thread. At times the path struck out into a patch of open ground, covered with scrub and bracken, or bristling thick with firs. Egraine had never seen such timid folk as these nuns from Avangel. If a stick cracked, they would start, huddle together, and vow they heard footsteps. They mistook an owl's hoot for a heathen cry, and a nightjar's creaking note made them swear they caught the chaff of steel. Once they suffered a most shrewd fright. They drove a herd of red deer from cover, and the rush and tumultuous sound of their galloping created a most holy panic among the women. It was some time before Egraine could get them on the march again. As the night wore on, they began to lag from sheer weariness. Two or three were feeble as sickly children, and the abbey life had done little for the body, though it had done much to deform the mind. Egraine had to turn tyrant in very earnest. She knew the women looked to her for courage and guidance, and that they would be hopeless without her stronger mind to lead them. She put this knowledge to effect, and held it like a lash over their weakly spirits. Egraine found abundant scope for her ingenuity. When they voted a halt for rest, she vowed she would hold on alone and leave them. The threat made the whole company trail after her like sheep. When they grumbled, she told tales of the savagery and lust of the heathen, and made their fears ache more lustily than did their feet. By such devices she kept them to it for the greater portion of the night, knowing that the shrewdest kindness lay in seeming harshness, and that to humor them was but mistaken pity. At last, heathen or no heathen, they would go no further. It was some hours before dawn. The trees had thinned, 
and through more open colonnades, they looked out on what appeared to be a grass-grown valley sleeping peacefully under the moon. A great cedar grew near, a pyramid of gloom. Malt, the cellarus, grumbling and groaning, crept under its shadows and commended Egrain to purgatorial fire. The rest, limp and spiritless, vowed they would rather die than take another step. Huddling together under the branches, they were soon half of them asleep in an ecstasy of weariness. Egrain, seeing further effort useless, surrendered to the inevitable and lay down herself to sleep under the tree. End of Book 1, Chapter 1 How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Section 2 of Uther and Egrain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Uther and Egrain by Warwick Deeping. Book 1, Chapter 2. Day came with an essential stealth. The great tree stood without a rustling leaf, in a stupor of silence. A vast hush held as though the wold knelt at orisons. Soon ripple on ripple of light surged from the hymning east, and the night was not. The sleep of the women from Avangel had proved but brief and fitful, couched as they had been under so strange a roof. They were all awake under the cedar. Egrain, standing under its green ledges, listened to their monotonous talk as they rehearsed their plight dismally under the shade. The nun Claudia's voice was still raised weakly in pious fashion. She had learned to ape saintliness all her life, and it was mere habit with her. The cellaress's red face was in no measure placid. Hunger had dissipated her patience like an ague, and she found comfort in grumbling. The younger women were less voluble, as age and custom behoved them to be. Unnaturally bred, they were like images of wax, capable only of receiving the impress of the minds about them. Such a woman as Malt owed her individuality solely to the superlative cravings of the flesh. About them rose the slopes of a valley, set tier on tier with trees, nebulous, silent in the now hurrying light. Grassland, moist and spangled, lay dew-heavy in the lap of the valley, with the track curling drearily into a further tunnel of green. Igrain, scanning the trees and the stretch of grassland, found on a sudden something to hold her gaze. On the southern side of the valley the walls of a building showed, vaguely through the trees. It was so well screened that a transient glance would have passed over the line of foliage without discovering the white glimmer of stone. She pointed it out to her companions, who were quickly up from under the cedar at the thought of the meal and the material comforts such a forced habitation might provide. They were soon deep in the tall grass, their habits wet to the knee with dew, as they held across the valley for the manor amid the trees. The place gathered distinctness as they approached. Two horns of woodland jutted out, and closing and holding it jealously from the track through the valley. There were outhouses packed away under the trees. A garden held it on the north. The building itself was modeled somewhat after the fashion of a Roman villa, with a porch, whitely pillared, leading from a terrace fringed with flowers. The silence of the place impressed itself upon Igrine and the women as they drew near from the meadowlands. The manor seemed lifeless as the woods that circled it. There were no cattle, no servants to be seen, not even a hound to bay warning on the threshold. Passing over a small stone bridge, 
they went up an avenue of cypresses that led primly to the garden and the terrace. They halted at the steps leading to the portico. The garden, broken in places and somewhat unkempt, glistened with color in the early sun. Terrace and portico were void and silent. The whole manor seemed utterly asleep. The women halted by the stairway and looked dubiously into one another's faces. There was something sinister about the place, a prophetic hush that seemed to stand with finger on lip and bid the curious forbear. After their march over the meadows, and considering the hungry plight they were in, it seemed more than unreasonable to turn away without a word. Nonetheless, they all hesitated, beckoning each to her fellow to set foot first into this house of silence. Egrine, seeing their indecision, took the initiative as usual and began to climb the steps that led to the portico. Claudia and the rest followed her in a body. Within the portico, the carved doors were wide. The sun streamed down through a latticed roof into a peristylum, where flowers grew, and a pool shone silverly. There were statues at the angles. One had been thrown down and lay half buried in a mass of flowers. The place looked wholly deserted, though, by the orderly mood of court and garden. It could not have been long since human hands had tended it. The women gathered together about the little font in the center of the peristylum and debated together in low tones. They were still but half at ease with the place and quite ready to suspect some sudden development. The house had a scent of tragedy about it that was far from comforting. Said Malt, I should judge, sisters, that the folk have fled and that we are to be sustained by the hand of grace. Come and search. Claudia demurred a moment. Is it lawful, quoth she, to possess oneself of food and raiment in a strange and empty house? Nonsense, said the cellaress with a sniff. But, Malt, I never stole a crust in my life. Better learn the craft, then. King David stole the shoe bread. It was given him of the priests. Tut, sister, then are we wiser than David? We can thieve with our own hands. I say this house is God-sent for our need. May I stifle if I err. Malt is right, said Egrine, laughing. Let us deprive the barbarians of a pie or a crucifix. I, chimed Malt. Want makes thieving honest. Jubilate Deo. I'm for the pantry. A colonnade enclosed the peristylum on every quarter. Beneath the shadows cast by the architrave and roof showed the portals of various chambers. Igrain led the way. The first room that they essayed appeared to have been a sleeping apartment, for there were beds in it, the bedding lying disordered and fallen upon the floor as though there had been a struggle or a sudden wild flight. It was a woman's chamber, judging by its mirror of steel, and the articles that were scattered on floor and table. The next room proved to be a species of parlor or living room. A meal had been spread upon the table and left untouched. Platter and drinking cups were there, a dish of cakes, a joint on a great charger, bread, olives, fruit, and wine. Armor hung on the walls, with mirrors of steel, and paintings upon panels of wood. The women made themselves speedily welcome after the trials of the night. Each was enticed by some special object, and character leaked out queerly in the choosing. Malt ran for a beaker of wine. The cakes were pilfered by the younger folk. Claudia, whispering of Saxon desecration, possessed herself with an abeyance of a little silver cross that hung upon the wall. Igrine took down a bow, a quiver of arrows, and a sheathed hunting knife. She slung the quiver over her shoulder and strapped the knife to her girdle. 
the clear kiss of morning had sharpened the hunger of a night, and the meal spread in that woodland manner proved very comforting to the fugitives from Avangel. Satisfied, they passed out to explore the rooms as yet unvisited. A fine curiosity led them, for they were like children who probed the dark places of a ruin. The eastern chambers gave no greater revealings than did those upon the west. The kitchen quarters were empty and soundless, though there was a joint upon the spit that hung over the ashes of a spent fire. It seemed more than likely that the inmates had fled in fear of the barbarians, leaving the house in the early hours of some previous dawn. As yet, they had not visited a room whose door opened upon the southern quarter of the peristyle. Judging by its portal, it promised to be a greater chamber than any of the preceding, probably the banqueting or guest room. The door stood ajar, giving view of a frescoed wall within. Malt, who had waxed jovial since her communion with the tankard, pushed the door open and went frankly into the half-light of a great chamber. She came to an abrupt halt on the threshold, with a fat hand quavering the symbol of the cross in the air. The women crowded the doorway and looked in over the cellaress's stout shoulders. In a gilded chair in the center of the room sat the figure of a man. His hands were clenched upon the lion-headed arms of the siege, and his chin bowed down upon his breast. He was clad in purple. There were rings upon his fingers, and his brow was bound with a band of gold. At his feet crushed a great wolfhound, motionless, dead. The women in the doorway stared on the scene in silence. The man in the chair might have been thought asleep save for a certain stark look a bleak immobility that contradicted the possibility of life. Here they had stumbled on tragedy with a vengeance. The mute face of death lurked in the shadows, and the vast mystery of life seemed about them like a cold vapor. It was a sudden change from sunlight into shade. Igrine pushed past Malt and ventured close to the crouching hound. Bending down, she looked into the dead man's face. It was pinched and gray, but young, nonetheless, and bearing even in death a certain sensuous haughtiness and dissolute beauty. The man had been dark, with hair turbulent and lustrous. In his bosom glinted the silver pommel of a knife, and there were stains upon cloak and tessellated pavement. Clasped in one hand was a small cross of gold that looked as though it had been plucked from a chain or necklet, and held grip in the death agony. The wolfhound had been thrust through the body with a sword. Hum, said Malt with a sniff. Christian work here. And a comely fellow, too, more's the pity. Look at the rings on his fingers. I wonder whether I might take one for prayer money? It would buy candles. Ikrain was still looking at the dead man with strange awe in her heart. Keep off, she said, thrusting off Malt. The man has been stabbed. Well, haven't I eyes too, hussy? Claudia came in, white and quavering, with her crucifix up. Poor wretch, said she. Can't we bury him? Bury him, cried Malt. Yes, sister. Thanks, no. It would spoil my dinner. Claudia gave a sudden scream and jumped back, holding her skirts up. There's blood on the floor. Holy mother, did the dog move? Move, quoth Malt, giving the brute a kick. What a mouse you are, Claudia. Are you sure the man's dead? Dead and cold, said Agrine, touching his cheek and drawing away with a shiver. Come away. The place makes my flesh creep. Shut the door, Malt. Let us leave him so. The women from Avangel had seen enough of the manor in the forest. Certainly it held nothing more perilous than a corpse, perched stiffly in a gilded chair. But the dead man seemed to exert a sinister influence upon the spirits of the company, and to stifle any desire for a further sojourn into the place. 
folk with murder fresh upon their hands might still be within the purlieu of the valley. The women thought of the glooms of the forest and of the strong walls of Andorida, and discovered a very lively desire to be free of Andredswold and the threats of the unknown. They left the man sitting in his chair with the hound at his feet and went to gather food for the day's journey. Bread they took, and meat, and bound them in a sheet, while Malt filled a flask with wine, and bestowed it at her girdle. Igrine still had her bow, shafts, and hunting knife. Before sallying, they remembered the dead. It was Igrine's thought. They went and stood before the door of the great chamber, sang a hymn, and said a prayer. Then they left the place and held on into the forest. Nothing befell them on their way that morning. It was noon before they struck the road from Duravernum to Andorida, a straight and serious highway that went whitely amid wastes of scrub, thickets, and dark knolls of trees. The women were glad of its honest comfort, and blessed the Romans who had wrought the road of old. Later in the day they neared the sea again. Between masses of trees and over the slopes, they caught glimpses of the blue plain that touched the sky. From a little hill that gave broader view, they saw the white sails of ships that were plowing westward with a temperate wind. They took them for the galleys of the Saxons, and the thought hurried them on their way the more. Presently they came to a mild declivity with a broken toll house standing by the roadside, and two horsemen on the watch there, as the distant galleys swept over the sea towards the west. The men belonged to the royal forces in Enderida. They were reticent in measure, and in no optimistic mood. They told how the heathen had swept the coast, how their ships had ventured even to Vectus, to burn, slay, and martyr. The women learned that Andred's town was some ten miles distant. There was little likelihood, so the men said, of their getting within the walls that night, for the place was in dread of siege and was shut up like a rock after dusk. Igrine and the nuns elected, nonetheless, to hold upon their way. Despite their wariness, the women preferred to push on and gain ground rather than to lag and lose courage. For all they knew, the Saxons might be as soon ashore, ready to raid and slay in their very path. They left the soldiers at the toll house and went downhill into a long valley. Possibly they had gone a mile or more when they heard the sound of galloping coming in their wake. On the slope of the hill they had left, they could see a distant wave of dust curling down the road like smoke. The two men from Andred's town were coming on at a gallop. They were very soon within bowshot, but gave no hint of halting. Thundering on, they drew level with the women, shouted as they went by, and held on fast, dust and spume flying. "'God's curse upon the cravens,' said Malt the cellarus. Cravens they were in sense, yet the men had reason on their side, and the women were left staring at the diminishing fringe of dust. There was much frankness in the phenomenon, a curt hint that carried emphasis— and advised action. To the woods, it said. To the woods, good souls, and that quickly. The road ran through the flats at that place, with marsh and meadowland on either hand. Further westward, the wold thrust forth a finger from the north to touch the highway. Southward, scrub and grassland swept away to the sea. It was when looking southwards that the nuns from Avangel discovered the stark truth of the soldiers' warning. Against the skyline could be seen a number of jerking specks, moving fast over the open land and holding northwest as though to touch the road. They were the figures of men riding. The outjutting of woodland that rolled down to edge the highway was a quarter of a mile from where the women stood. A bleak line of roadway parted them from the mazy refuge of the wold. They started away at a run, Igrine and another novice dragging the nun Claudia between them. The display was neither Olympic nor graceful. It would have been ridiculous but for the stern need that inspired it. 
Igrain and her fellows made the best of the highway. In the west, the world seemed to stretch an arm to them like a mother. The heathen raiders were coming fast over the marshes. Igrain, dragging the panting Claudia by the hand, looked back and took measure of the chase. There were some score at the gallop, three furlongs or more away, with others on foot, holding on to stirrups, running and leaping like madmen. The girl caught their wild, burly look even at that distance. They were hollowing one to another, tossing axe and spear, making a race of it, like huntsmen at full pelt. Possibly there was sport in hounding a company of women, with the chance of spoil, and something more brutish to entice. Igrain and her flock were struggling on for very life. Their feet seemed weighted with the shackles of an impotent fear, while every yard of the white road appeared three to them as they ran. How they anguished and prayed for the shadows of the wood. A frail nun, winded and lagging, began to scream like a hare when the hounds are hard on her haunches. Another minute, and the trees seemed to stride down to them with green-bosomed kindness. A wild scramble through a shallow dike brought them to bracken and a tangled barrier about the hem of the wood. Then they were amid the sleek, solemn trunks of beechwood, scurrying up a shadowed aisle with the dull thudding of the nearing gallop in their ears. It was borne in upon Igrine's reason, as she ran, that the trees would barely save them from the purpose of pursuit. The women, limp, witless, dazed by danger, could hardly hold on fast enough to gain the deeper mazes of the place, and the sanctuary the world could give. Unless the pursuit could be broken for a season, the whole company would fall to the net of the heathen, and only the virgin knew what might befall them in that solitary place. Sacrifice flashed into the girl's vision. A sudden ecstasy of courage, like hot flame. These abbey folk had been none too gentle with her. Nonetheless, she would essay to save them. She cast Claudia's hand aside and turned away abruptly from the rest. They wavered, looking at her as though for guidance, too flurried for sane measures. Ikrine waved them on, with a certain pride in her that seemed to chant the triumph song of death. "'What will you do, girl? Are you mad?' Go, was all she said. Perhaps you will pray for me as for Grazia the abbess. They will kill you. Better one than all. They wavered, unwilling to be wholly selfish despite their fear and the sounding of pursuit. There shone a fine light on the girl's face as they beheld her, tyrannical even in heroism. Her look awed them and made them ashamed. Yet they obeyed her, and like so many winging birds, they fled away into the green shadows. Igrine watched them a moment, saw the gray flicker of their gowns go amid the trees, and then turned to front her fortune. Pursing her lips into a queer smile, she took post behind a tree bowl and waited with an arrow fitted to her string. She heard a slothering babble as the men reined in, with much shouting, on the forest's margin. They were very near now. Even as she peered round her tree trunk, a figure on foot flashed into the grass ride and came on at the trot. The bow snapped, the arrow streaked the shadows, and hummed cheerily into the man's thigh. Igrine had not hunted for nothing. A second fellow edged into view and took the point in his shoulder. Igrine darted back some forty paces and waited for more. In this fashion, slipping from tree to tree and edging northwest, she held them for a furlong or more. The end came soon with an empty quiver. The woods seemed full of armed men. They were too speedy for her, too near to her for flight. She threw the empty quiver at her feet, with the bow athwarted, put a hand in the breast of her habit, and waited. It was not for long. 
a man ran out from behind a tree and came to a curt halt fronting her. He was young, burly with a great tangle of hair and a yellow beard that bristled like a hound's collar. A naked sword was in his hand, a buckler strapped between his shoulders. He laughed when he saw the girl, the coarse laugh of a Teuton, and came some paces nearer to her, staring in her face. She was very rich and comely in a way foreign to the fellow's fancy. There was that in his eyes that said as much. He laughed again, with a guttural oath, and stretched out a hand to grip the girl's shoulder. An instant shimmer of steel and a grain had smitten him above the golden torque that ringed his throat. Life rushed out in a red fountain. He went back from her with a stagger, clutching at the place, and cursing. As the blood ebbed, he dropped to his knees, and thence fell slantwise against a tree. He had found death in that stroke. A hand closed on the girl's wrist. The knife that had been turned towards her own heart was smitten away and spurned to a distance. There were men all about her, ogrish folk, mustachioed, jerkened in skins, bare-armed, bare-legged. Igrine stood like a statue, impotent, frozen into a species of apathy. The bearded faces thronged her, gaped at her with a gross solemnity. She had no glance for them, but thought only of the man twitching in the death trance. The woods seemed full of gruff voices, of grotesque words mouthed through hair. Then the barbaric circle rippled and parted. A rugged-faced old man with white hair and beard came forward slowly. There was a tense silence over the throng as the old man stood and looked at the figure at his feet. There were shadows on the earl's face, and his hands shook, for the smitten man was his son. Out of silence grew clamor. Hands were raised, fingers pointed. A sword was poised tentatively above the girl's head. The wood seemed full of bearded and grotesque wrath and the hollow aisles rang with the clash of sword on buckler. But age was not for sudden violence, though the blood of youth ebbed on the grass. The old man pointed to a tree, spoke briefly, quietly, and the rough warriors obeyed him. They stripped a grind, cast her clothes at her feet, and bound her to the trunk of the tree with their girdles. Then they took up the body of the dead man, and so departed into the forest. End of Book One, Chapter Two Recorded by Lori Nadeau Richardson www.loririchardsonvo.com Section Three of Uther and Agrain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Uther and Agrain by Warwick Deeping Book One, Chapter Three It was well towards evening when the men disappeared into the wood, leaving the girl bound naked to the tree. The day was calm and tranquil, with the mood of June on the wind and a benign sky above. Egrine's hair had fallen from its band, and now hung in bronze masses well nigh to her knees, covering her as with a cloak. Her habit, shift, and sandals lay close beside her on the grass. The barbarians had robbed her of nothing, according to their old earl's wishes. She was simply bound there, and left unscathed. When the men were gone, and she began to realize what had passed, she felt a flush spread from face to ankle, a glow of shame that was keen as fire. Her whole body seemed rosily flaked with blushes. The very trees had eyes, and the wind seemed to whisper mischief. There were none to see, none to wonder, and yet she felt like Eve in Eden 
when knowledge had smitten the pure flesh with gradual shame. Though the place was solitary as a dry planet, her aspen fancy peopled it with life. She could still see the heavy-jowled barbaric faces staring at her like the malign masks of a dream. The West was already prophetic of night. There was the golden glow of the decline through the billowy foliage of the trees, and the shadows were very still and reverent, for the day was passing. A beam of gold slanted down upon Igrain's breast, and slowly died there amid her hair. The west flamed and faded, the east grew blind. Soon the day was not. Igrain watched the light faint above the trees, wondering in her heart what might befall her before another sun could set. She had tried her bonds, and had found them lacking sympathy in that they were as staunch as strength could make them. She was cramped, too, and began to long for the hated habit that had trailed in the galleries of Avangel, and had brought such scorn into her discontented heart. There was no hope for it. She was pilloried there, bound body, wrist, and ankle. Philosophy alone remained to her, a poor enough cloak to the soul, still worse for things tangible. Her plight gave her ample time for meditation. There were many chances open to her, and even in mere possibilities, fate had her at a vantage. In the first place, she might starve, or other unsavory folk find her, and her second state be worse than her first. Then there were wolves in the wold, or country people might find and release her, or even Claudia and the women might return and see how she had fared. There was little comfort in this last thought. She shrewdly guessed that the abbey folk would not stop till they happened on a stone wall, or the heathen took them. Lastly, the road was at no very great distance, and she might hear perchance if any one passed that way. Presently the moon rose upon Andred's vault with a stupendous splendor. The veil of night seemed dusted with silver as it swept from her tiara of stars. Innumerable glimmering eyes starred the foliage of the beeches. Vague lights streamed down and netted the shadows with mysterious magic. Here and there a tree trunk stood like a ghost, splashed with a phosphor tunic. The wilderness was soundless the billowy bastions of the trees unruffled by a breath. The hush seemed vast, irrefutable, supreme. Not a leaf sighed, not a wind wandered in its sleep. The great trees stood in a silver stupor and dreamt of the moon. The solemn aisles were still as Thebes at midnight, the smooth bowls of the beaches like ebony beneath canopies of jet. The scene held a grind in wonder. There was mystery about a moonlit forest that never lessened for her. The vasty void of the night, untainted by a sound, seemed like eternity unfolded above her ken. She forgot her plight for the time and took to dreaming, such dreams as the warm fancy of the young heart loves to remember. Perhaps beneath such a benediction she thought of a pavilion, set amid water lilies, and a boy who had looked at her with boyish eyes. Yet these were childish things. They lost substance before the chafing of the cords that bound her to the tree. Presently she began to sing softly to herself for the cheating of monotony. She was growing cold and hungry, too, despite all the magic of the place, and the hours seemed to drag like a homily. Then. With a gradual stealthiness, the creeping fear of death and the unknown began to steal in and cramp even her buoyant courage. It was vain for her to put the peril from her and to trust today and the succor that she vowed in her heart must come. Dread smote into her more cynically than did the night air. What might be her end? To hang there parched? starved, delirious, till life left her, to hang there still, 
a loathsome, livid thing, rotting like a cloak to be torn and fed upon by birds. She knew the region was as solitary as death, and that the heathen had emptied it of the living. The picture grew upon her distraught imagination, till she feared to look on it, lest it should be the lurid truth. It was about midnight, and she was beginning to quake with cold, when a sound stumbled suddenly out of silence and set her listening. It dwindled and grew again, came nearer, became rhythmic and ringing in the keen air. Egrine soon had no doubts as to its nature. It was the steady smite of hoofs on the high road, the rhythm of a horse walking. Now was her chance if she dared risk the character of the rider. Doubts flashed before her a moment, hovered, and then merged into decision. Better to risk the unknown, she thought, than tempt starvation tied to the tree. She made her choice and acted. Help there! Help! The words went like silver through the woods. Egrine, listening hungrily, strained forward at her bonds to catch the answer that might come to her. The sound of hoofs ceased and gave place to silence. Possibly the rider was in doubt as to the testimony of his own hearing. Egrine called again and again waited. Stillness held. Then there was a stir and a crackling as of trampled brushwood, followed by the snort of a horse and the thrill of steel. The sounds came nearer, with the deadened tramp of hoofs for an underchant. Egrine, full of hope and fear, of doubt and gratitude, kept calling for his guidance. Presently a cry came back to her in turn. By the Holy Cross, who are you that calls? A woman, she cried in turn, bound here by the heathen. Where? Here, in the grass ride, tied to a tree. The words had come to her were very welcome, heralding, as they did, a friend, at least in race, and there was a manly depth in the voice, too, that gave her comfort. She saw a glimmer of steel in the shadows of the wood, as man and horse drew into being from the darkness. Moonlight played fitfully upon them, weaving silver gleams amid a smoke of gloom, making a white mist about the man's great horse. A single ray burnt and blazed like a halo about the rider's cask, and his spear point flickered like a star beneath the vaultings of the trees. He had halted, a solitary figure wrapped round with night and rendered grand and wizard by the misty web of the moon. The sight was pathetic enough, yet infinitely fair. Light streamed through and fell full upon the tree where Igrine stood. The girl's limbs were white and luminous against the dark bosom of the beach, and her rich hair fell about her like mist. As for the strange rider— he could at least claim the inspiration accorded to a Christian. The servant of the Galilean has, like Constantine, a symbol in the sky, prophetic in all need, generous of all guidance. The cross is a perpetual Delphi oracular on trivial matters, as on the destinies of kingdoms. The man dismounted, knelt for a moment with sword held before him, and then rose and strode to the tree with shield held before his face. Egrine was looking at the figure in armor, kindly, redly, from amid the masses of her hair. The small noblenesses of his bearing towards her had won her trust with a flush of gratitude. The man saw only the white feet like marble amid the moss as he cut the thongs where they circled the tree. The bands fell, he saw the white feet flicker, a trail of hair waving under his shield. Then he turned on his heel without a word and went to tether his horse. The interlude was as considerate as courtesy had intended. Egrine darted for her habit with a rapturous sigh. 
When the man turned leisurely again, a tall girl met him, cloaked in gray, with her hair still hanging about her and sandals on her feet. Mother Virgin! A nun! The words seemed sudden as an echo. Egrine bent her head to hide the half-abashed, half-smiling look upon her face. It had been thus at Avangel. Nun and novice had worn like habits, and there had been nothing to distinguish them save the final, solemn vow. The man's notions were plainly celibate, and, with a sudden, twinkling inspiration, she fancied that they should bide so. It would make matters smoother for them both, she thought. My prayers are yours, daily, for this service, she said. The man bent his head to her. I am thankful, madam, he answered, that I should have been so good fortunate as to be able to befriend you. How came you by such evil hazard? I was of Avangel, she said. You speak as of the past, quoth he, with a keen look. Avangel was burnt and sacked but yesterday, she said. Many of the nuns were martyred. Some few escaped. I was made captive here and bound to this tree by the heathen. Igrain could see the man's face darken even in the moonlight, as though pain and wrath held mute confederacy there. He crossed himself and then stood with both hands on the pommel of his sword, stately and statuesque. And the Lady Gratia, he said. Dead, I fear. A half-heard groan seemed to come from the man's helmet. He bent his head into the shadows and stood stiff and silent, as though smitten into thought. Presently he seemed to remember himself, a grime, and the occasion. And yourself, madam, he said with a twinge of tenderness in his voice. The girl blushed and nearly stammered. I am unscathed, she hastened to say. Thanks to heaven. I am safe and whole as if I had spent the day in a convent cell. My name is Grine, if you would know it. I fear I have told you heavy tidings. The man turned his face to the sky like one who looks into other worlds. It is nothing, he said, gazing into the night. Nothing but what we must look for in these stark days. Our altars smoke, our blood is spilt, and yet we still pray. Yet may I be cursed, and cursed again, if I do not die my sword for this. There was a sudden bleak fierceness in his voice that betrayed his fiber and the strong thoughts that were stirring in his heart that moment. His face looked almost fanatical in the cold gloom, gaunt, heavy-jawed, lion-like. Egrine watched this thundercloud of thought and passion in silence, thinking she would meet the man in the rack of life rather as friend than as foe. The brief mood seemed to pass, or at least to lose expression. Again, there was that in the kindness of his face that made the girl feel beneath the eye of a brother. You will ride with me? he asked. Igrine hesitated a moment. I was for Andorida, she said, and it is only three leagues distant. Now that I am free, I can go through the world alone, for I am no child. An insult to my manhood, said the stranger. But the heathen are everywhere, and I should but cumber you. Madam, you talk like a fool. There was a sheer sincerity about the speech that pleased Egrine. His spirit seemed to overtop hers and to silence argument. Proud heart, yet without thought of debate, she gave way in the most placid manner and was content to be shepherded. I might walk at your stirrup, she said meekly. The man seemed to ponder. He merely looked at her with dark, solemn eyes, showing a quiet disregard for her humility. Listen to me, he said. You, a woman, must not attempt Andorida alone. 
the town will be beleaguered, or I am no prophet. To Andorida I cannot go, for I have folk at Winchester who wait my coming. If you can put your trust in me, and will ride with me to Winchester, you will find harbor there. She considered a moment. Winchester, she said. Yes, and most certainly I trust you. The man stretched out a hand to her with a smile. God willing, he said, I will bear you safe to the place. As for your frocks and vows, they must follow necessity and pocket their pride. It will not damn you to ride before a man. I trow not, she said, with a little laugh that seemed to make the leaves quiver. So they took horse together and rode out from the beech wood into the moonlight. End of Chapter 3 of Uther and Grein Narrated by Laurie Nadeau Richardson www.laurierichardsonvo.com Section 4 of Uther and Egrein. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Uther and Egrein by Warwick Deeping. Book 1, Chapter 4. When they were clear of the solemn beaches and saw the road white as white before them, Egrine began to tell the man of the doom of Avangel and the great end made by Gratia the abbess. The knight had folded his red cloak and spread it for her comfort. Her tale seemed very welcome to him despite its grievous humor, and he questioned her much concerning Gratia, her goodness and her charity. Now it had been well known in Avangel that Gratia had come of noble and excellent descent, and seeing that this stranger had been familiar with her in the past, Egrine guessed shrewdly that he himself was of some ancient and goodly stock. To tell the truth, she was very curious concerning him, and it was not long before she found a speech ready to her tongue likely to draw some confession from his lips. I have promised to pray for you, she said, and pray for you I will, seeing that you have done me so great a blessing tonight. When I bow to the Virgin and the saints, what name may I remember? The man did not look at her, for her face was in the shadow of her hood, and his clear and white in the light of the moon. To some I am known as Sir Peleus, he said. And to me? As Sir Peleus, if it please you, madam. Egrine understood that she was to be pleased with the name, whether she liked it or not. Then, for Sir Peleus, I will pray, she said, and may my gratitude avail him. There was silence for a space, broken by the rhythmic play of hoofs upon the road and the dull jar of steel. Egrine was meditating further catechism, adapting her questions for the knowledge she wished for. You ride errant, she said presently. I ride alone, madam. The wold is a rude region set thick with perils. Very true, quoth the man. Perhaps you are a venturesome spirit. I believe that I am often as careful as death. Egrine made her culminating suggestion. Some high deed must have been in your heart, she said, or probably you would not have risked so much. The man Peleus did not even look at her. She felt the bridle arm that half held her tighten unconsciously as though he were steeling himself against her curiosity. Madam, he said very gravely, every man's business should be for his own heart, and I do not know that I have any need to share the right or wrong of mine with others. It is a grand thing 
to be able to keep one's own counsel. It is enough for you to know my name. Igrain, nonetheless, was not a bit abashed. There is one thing I would hear, she said, and that is how you came to know of the Abbas Grazia. For a moment the man looked black, and his lips were stern. You may know if you wish, he said. Well? Madam, the Lady Gratia was my mother. Igrain felt a flood of sudden shame burst redly into her heart. Gratia was the man's mother, and she had been plying him with questions, cruelly curious. She caught a short, shallow breath and hung her head, shrinking like a prodigal. Set me down, she said. I am not worthy to ride with you. Pardon me, quoth the man. You did not think, not knowing I was in pain. Set me down, was all she said. Set me down, set me down. The man, Peleus, changed his tone. Madam, he said, with a sudden gentleness that made her desire to weep, I have forgiven you. What, then, does it matter? Ikrine hung her head. I am altogether ashamed, she said. She drew her hood well over her face and took her reproof to heart like a veritable penitent. Even religious solemnities make little change in the notorious weaknesses of women. Igrine was angry, not only for having blundered clumsily against the man's sorrow, but also because of the somewhat graceless part she seemed to have played after the deliverance he had vouchsafed her. As yet, her character seemed to have lost honor fast by mere brief contrast with the man's. Peleus, meanwhile, rode with eyes watching the wan stretch of road to the west. On either side the woods rose up like nebulous hills, bowled by tunneled mysteries of gloom. He had turned his horse to the grass beside the roadway, so that the tramp of hoofs should fall muffled on the air. Igrain, close against his steeled breast, with his bridle arm about her, looked into his face from the shadows of her hood and found much to initiate her liking. If she loved strength, it was there. If she desired the grand reserve of silent vigor, it was there also. The deeply caverned eyes watching through the night seemed dark with quiet destiny. The large, finely molded face, gaunt and white in its meditative repose, seemed fit to front the ruins of a stricken land. It was the face of a man who had watched and striven, who had followed truth like a shadow, and had found the light of life in the heavens. There was bitterness there, pain, and the ghost of a sad desire that had pleaded with death. The face would have seemed morose, but for a certain something that made its shadows kind. Instinctively, as she watched the mask of thought beneath the dark arch of his open cask, she felt that he had memories in his heart at that moment. His thoughts were not for her, however much she pitied him, or longed to tell him of her shame and sympathy. Nothing could come into that sad session of remembrances, save the soul of the man and the memories of his mother. That he was grieving deeply, Igrain knew well. His was a strong nature that brooded in silence and felt the more. It must be a terrible thing, she thought, to have the martyrdom of a mother haunting the heart like a fell dream at night. Slipping from such a reverie, the turmoil and weariness of the past days returned to take their tribute. Despite the strangeness of the night, Igrain began to feel sleepy as a tired child. The magnetic calm of the man beside her seemed to lull to slumber while the motion of the ride 
cradled her the more. The noise of hoofs, the dull clink of scabbard against spur or harness, grew faint and faint. The woods seemed to swim into a mist of silver. She saw, as in a dream, the strong face above her staring calmly into the night, the long spear poised heavenwards. Her head was on the man's shoulder. With scarcely a thought, she was asleep. It was then that Peleus discovered the girl heavy in his arms and looked down to find her sleeping, with hood fallen and a white face turned peacefully to his. Strangely enough, the sorrow that had taken him seemed to make his senses vibrate strongly to the more human things of life. The supple warmth of the girl's slim body crept up the sinews of his arms like a subtle flame. From her half-parted lips, the sigh of her breathing came into his bosom. Over his harness clouded her hair, and her two hands had fastened themselves upon his sword belt with a restful trust. The man bent his head and watched her in some awe. Her lips were like autumn fruit fed wistfully on moonlight. To Peleus, woman was still wonderful, a creature to be touched with reverence and soft delight. The drab, the scold, and the harlot had failed to debase the ideals of a staunch spirit and the fair flesh at his breast was as full of mystery as a woman could be. He took his fill of gazing, feeling half ashamed of the deed, and half dreading lest a grind should wake suddenly and look deeply into his eyes. He felt his flesh creep with magic when she stirred or sighed, or when the hands upon his belt twitched in their slumber. Peleus had seen stark things of late, burnt hamlets, priests slaughtered and churches in flames, children dead in the trampled places of the slain. He had ridden where smoke ebbed heavenwards and blood clotted the green grass. Now this ride beneath the quiet ice of night, with the bosomed silence of the woods around, and this lily plucked from death in his arms, seemed like a passage of calm after a page of tempest. Little wonder that he looked long into the girl's face and thrilled to the soft sway of her bosom. He thanked God in his heart that he had plucked her blemishless from gradual death. It was even thus, he thought, that a good soldier should ride into paradise bearing the soul of the woman he loved. Igrine stirred little in her sleep. Poor child, thought Peleus, she has suffered much, has feared death, and is weary. Let her sleep the night through if she can. So he drew the cloak gently about her, said his prayers in his heart, and holding as much as possible under the shadows of the trees, kept watch patiently on the track before him. All that night Peleus rode, thinking of his mother, with the girl sleeping in his arms. He saw the moon go down in the west, while the gray mist of the hour before dawn made the forest gaunt like an abode of the dead. He heard the birds wake in the break and thicket. He saw the red deer scamper, frightened into the glooms, and the rabbits scurrying amid the bracken. When the east mellowed, he found himself in fair meadowlands, lying locked in the depths of the wold, where flowers were thick as on some rich tapestry, and where the scent of dawn was as the incense of many temples. With a calm sorrow for the dead, he rode on, threading the meadowland, till the girl woke and looked up into his face with a little sigh. Then he smiled at her half sadly and wished her good morning. Egrine, wide-eyed, looked around in a daze. Day, she said, and meadows? 
It was moonlight when I fell asleep. It has dawned an hour or more. Then I have slept the night through. You must be tired to death and stiff with holding me. Not so, said Peleus. I am sorry that I have been selfish, she said. I was asleep before I could think. Have you ridden all night? Of course, quoth he with a smile, and not a soul have I seen. I have been watching your face and the moon. Egrine colored slightly and looked sideways at him from under her long lashes. Her sleep had chastened her, and she felt blithe as a bird and ready to sing. Putting the man's scarlet cloak from her, she shook her hair from her shoulders and sprang lightly from her seat to the grass. I will run at your side a while, she said, so rest you. Perhaps you will halt presently and sleep an hour or two under a tree. I can watch and keep guard with your sword. Peleus smiled down at her like the sun from behind a cloud. Not yet, he said. A soldier needs no sleep for a week, and I feel lusty as Christopher. We will go a while before breakfast, if it please you. There is a stream near where I can water my horse, and we can make a meal from such stuff as I have. When you are tired, tell me, and I will mount you here again. She nodded at him gravely. Grass and flowers were well nigh to her waist. Her gown shook showers of dew from the feathery hay. Foxglove rose like purple rods amidst the snow webs of the wild daisy. Tangled domes of dog rose and honeysuckle lined the white track, and there were countless harebells lying like a deep blue haze under the green shadows of the grass. Presently they came to where red poppies grew thickly in the golden meads. Igrine ran in among them and began to make a great posy, while Peleus watched her as her gray gown went amid the green and red. In due course she came back to him holding her flowers in her bosom. Scarlet is your color, she said, and these are the flowers of sleep and of dreams for those that grieve. Hold them in the hollow of your shield for me. Peleus obeyed her mutely. She began to sing a soft, slumberous dirge, while she walked beside the great black horse and plaited the flowers into its mane. The man watched her with a kind of wondering pain. The song seemed to wake echoes in him, like sea surges wake in the caverns of a cliff. He understood Igrine's grace to him and was grateful in his heart. How long were you mewed in Avangel? he said presently. Long enough, quoth she, betwixt her singing, to learn to love life. So I should judge, said Peleus curtly. His tone disenchanted her. She threw the rest of the flowers aside and walked quietly beside him, looking up with a frank seriousness into his face. I was placed there by my parents, she said by way of explanation, and against my will, for I had no hope in me to be a nun. But the times were wild, and my father, a solemn soul, thought for the best. But you're an novitiate. You had your choice. I had my choice, she answered vaguely. Did ever a woman choose for the best? Evangel was no place for me. Peleus eyed her somewhat sadly from his higher vantage. The nun's is a sorry life, he said, when her thoughts fly over the convent walls. A level kindness in the words seemed to loose her tongue like magic. Twelve long months had her sympathies been outraged, and her young desires crushed by the heel of a so-called godliness. Never had so kind a chance for the outpouring of her discontent come to her. Women love an honest grumble. In a moment, 
all her bitterness found ready flight into the man's ears. I hated it, she said. I hated it. Abigail had no hold on me. What were vigils, penitences, and long prayers to a girl? They made us kneel on stone and sleep on boards. The chapel bell seemed to ring every minute of the day. We had vile food and no liberty. It was saint this, saint that, from morning till night. We saw no men. We might never dress our hair. And, believe me, there were no mirrors. I had to go to a little pool in the garden to see my face. And they were so dull, so dismal. No one ever laughed. No one ever told romances. All our legends were of pious things in petticoats. And what was the use of it all? Was anyone ever a jot the better? I used to get into my cell and stamp. I felt like a corpse in a charnel house, and the whole world seemed dead. Peleus scanned her half smilingly, half sadly. I am sorry for your heart, he said. Sorry? You needs must be when you are a soldier, with life in your ears like a clarion cry. Life is a sorry ballad, Sister Igrine, unless we remember the cross. Ah, yes, I have all the saints in mind, dear souls. But then, Sir Pelleas, one cannot live on one's knees. I was made to laugh and twinkle, and if such is sin, then a sorry nun am I. You misunderstand me, said the man. I would that a Christian held his course over the world, with a great cross set in the west to lead him. He can laugh and joy as he goes, sleep like the good, and take the fruits of life in his time. Yet ever above him should be the glory of the cross, to chasten, purge, and purify. There is no sin in living merrily if we live well, but to plot for pleasure is to lose it. Look at the sun. There is no need for us to ever be on our knees to him. Yet we know well that it would be a sorry world without his comfort. Ah, she said with a little gesture. I see you are too devout for me, despite my habit. Take me up again, Sir Pelleas, and I will ride with you, though I may not argue. Pelleas halted his horse and she was soon in the saddle before him, somewhat subdued and pensive in contrast to her former vivacity. The man believed her a nun, and she had a character to play. Well, when she wearied of it, which would probably be soon, she could tell him and so end the matter. It was not long before they came to the ford across the stream Peleus had spoken of. It was a green spot shut in by thorn trees and here they made a halt as the night had purposed. Before the meal, Peleus knelt by the stream and prayed. Igrine, seeing him so devout, did likewise, though her eyes were more on the man than on heaven. Her thoughts never got above the clouds. When they were at their meal of meat and bread, with a horn of water from the stream, she talked yet further of her life at Avangel and the meager blessing it had been to her. It was while she talked thus that she saw something about the man's person that fired her memory, and set her thinking of the journey of yesterday. Peleus was wearing a gold chain that bore a cross hanging above the left breast, but with no cross over the right. Looking more keenly, Igrine saw a broken link still hanging from the right portion of the chain. Instinctively her thoughts fled back to the silent manor in the wood, and the dead man seated stiffly in the great carved chair. Without duly weighing the possible gravity of her words, she began to tell Peleus of the incident. Yesterday, she said, I saw a strange thing as we fled through the wold. We came to a villa, and seeking food there, found it deserted, save for a dead man seated in a chair, 
and stricken in the breast. The dead man had a small gold cross clutched in his fingers, and there was a dead hound at his feet. The man gave her a keen look from the depths of his dark eyes, then glanced at the broken chain. You see that I have lost a cross, he said. Igrain nodded. Your reason can read the rest. She nodded again. There is nothing like the truth. Igrain stared at the man in some astonishment. He was cold as a frost, and there was no shadow of discomfort on his strong face. Knowledge had come to her so sharply that she had no answer for him at the moment. Yet there stood a sublime certainty in her heart that this violent deed was deserving of absolute approval. So soon had her faith in him become like steel. The man deserved death, she said presently, with a curt and ingenuous confidence. Peleus eyed her curiously. How should you know? he asked. I have faith in you, was all she said. Peleus smiled, despite the subject. No man deserved death better. And so you slew him. He nodded without looking at her, and she could see still the embers of wrath in his eyes. I slew him in his own manner, finding him alone and ready to justify himself with lies. Honor does not love such deeds. But what would you? Britain is free of a viper. And you have blood on your hand. He winced slightly and glanced at his fingers as though she had not spoken in metaphor. All is blood in these days, he said. And what think you of such laws? she ventured, with a supreme reaching after the requirements of her order. What of the cross? There was blood upon it. But the blood of self-sacrifice. Her words moved him more than she had purposed. His dark face flushed, and light kindled in his eyes as though the basal tenets of his life had been called in question. He glowed like a man whose very creed is threatened. Igrain watched the fire, rising in him with a secret pleasure. The love of a woman for the hot courage of a man. Listen to me, he said strongly. Which think you is the worthier of life? To dream in a stone cell, mewed from the world like a weak weed in a cellar, or to go forth with a red heart and a mellow honor? To strive and smite for the weak and the wounded? To right the wrong? To avenge the fatherless? Choose and declare. Choose, she said, with a shrill laugh and a kindling color. Truth and I will. Away with the rosary. Give me the sword. Like a wild echo to her human choice came the distant cry of a horn borne hollowly over the sleeping meadows. Both heard it and started. The great war horse, grazing nearby, tossed his head, snorted, and stood listening with ears twitching and head to the east. Peleus rose up and scanned the road from under his hand, and the girl Igrain beside him. A Saxon horn, he said laconically. The heathen are in the woods. This is the end of Chapter 4 of Uther and Igrain by Warwick Deeping. This LibriVox recording has been narrated by Lori Richardson at www.loririchardsonvo.com. Section 5 of Uther and Egrain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Uther and Egrain by Warwick Deeping Book One, The Way to Winchester Chapter Five As they watched, looking down betwixt two thorn-trees, a faint puff of dust rose on the road far to the east, and hung like a diminutive cloud over the meadows. This danger-signal counseled the pair. 
Peleus caught his horse and sprang to settle. Egrain clambered by his stirrup and was lifted to her seat before him. Peleus slung his shield forward and loosened his sword. If it comes to battle, he said, I will set you down, and you must hide in the meadows or woods while I fight. You would but cumber me and be in great peril here. Rest assured, though, that I shall not desert you while I live. With that he turned his horse to the road, and halted, gazing down amid the placid fields to where the little cloud of dust had hinted at life. It was there still, only larger, and sounded on by the distant triple canter of horses at the gallop. Peleus and Egrain could see three mounted figures coming up the road amid a white haze, moving fast as though pressed by some as yet unseen enemy. It was soon evident to Peleus and the girl that one of the fugitives was a woman. "'We will abide them,' said the man, "'and learn their peril. We shall be stronger, too, for company, and may succor one another if it comes to smiting. Look, yonder comes the heathen pack.' A second and larger cloud of dust had appeared, a mile or less beyond the first. Peleus watched it a while, and then turned and began riding at a trot towards the west, so that the three fugitives should overtake him. He bade Egrain keep watch over his shoulder while he scanned the meadows before them for sign of peril or of friendly harbor. "'Have no fear, child,' he said. "'I could vow by these fields that there is a manor near. I trust confidently that we shall find refuge.' Egrain smiled at him. I am no coward, she said. That is well spoken. I would, though, that you would give me your dagger, so that, if things come to an evil pass, I shall know how to quit myself. My dagger, he said, with a sudden stare. I left it in the man's heart in Andred's world. Ah, said Egrain, then I must do without. The dull thunder of the nearing gallop came up to them, a stirring sound, full of terse life and eager hazard. Peleus spurred to a canter, while Egrain's hair blew about his face and helmet as they began to meet the kiss of the wind. She clung fast to him with both hands, and told what was passing on the road in their rear. "'How they ride!' she said. "'A tangle of dust and whirling hoofs. There is a lady in blue on a white horse, with an armed man on either flank. They are very near now. I can see the heathen far away over the meadows. They are galloping, too, in a smoke of dust. Our folk will be with us soon. In a minute the lady and her men were hurtling close in Peleus's wake. He spurred to a gallop in turn, and bade Egrain wave them on to his side. The three were soon with them, stride for stride. The girl on the white horse drew up on Peleus's right flank. She was habited in blue and silver, a flaxen-haired damosel with the round face of a child. Seemingly she was possessed of little hardihood, for her mouth was a red streak and a waist of white, and her blue eyes so full of fear that Egrain pitied her. She cried shrilly to Peleus, her voice rising above the din like the cry of a frightened bird. "'The heathen!' she cried. "'Many!' shouted the man. Two score or more. There is a strong manor near. If we gain it, we may live. How far? Not a mile over the meadows. Lead on, said Peleus. We will follow as we may. The damosel on the white horse turned from the road and headed southwards over the meadows with her men galloping beside her. The long grass swayed water-like before them, its summer seed flying like a mist of dew. Wood and pasture slid back on either hand. The ground seemed to rise and fall before them as a sea, while rocks here and there thrust up bluff noses in the grass like great lizards stirred by the hurtling thunder of the gallop. On they went, with white spume on breast and bridle, leaping swerving where rough ground showed. To Egrain the ride was life indeed, bringing back many a whistling gallop from the past. 
she felt her heart in her leaping to the horse's stride. Now and again she took a sly look at Peleus's face, finding it calm and vigilant, the face of a man whose thought ran a silent course unruffled by the breeze of peril. She felt his bridle arm staunchly about her like a girdle of steel. Although she could see the dust gathering thickly on the distant road, she felt blithe as a new bride in the man's company, and there was no fear at all in her thought. The grassland began to slope gradually towards the south. A quavering screech of joy came back to them from the woman riding in the van. Peleus spoke his first word during the gallop. Courage, he said, southwards lies our refuge. Egrain looked over his shoulder and saw how their flight tended down the flank of a gentle hill into the lap of a fair valley. The grass stretch was broken by great trees, oaks, beeches, and huge corniced cedars. Down in the green hollow below them a mirror shone with the soul of the sky steeped in its quiet waters. It was ringed with trailing willows, and an island held its center, piled with green shadows and the gray shape of a fair manor. The place looked as peaceful as sleep in the eye of the morning. The woman on the white horse bade one of her men take his bugle horn and blow a summons thereon to rouse the folk upon the island. Twice the summons sounded down over the water, but there was no answering stir to be marked about the house or garden. The place was smokeless, lifeless, silent. Like many another home, its hearths were cold for fear of the barbarian sword. As they held downhill, E. Grain wove the matter through her thought like swift silk through a shuttle. Should there be no boat, she said, giving voice to her misgivings, what can you do for us? We must swim for it, said Peleus keenly. It is a broad, fair water, and the horse cannot bear us both. He shall if needs be. She felt that the brute would, after Peleus had spoken so. She patted the arched black neck and smiled at the sky as they came down to the mirror's edge at a canter. The water was lapping softly at the sedges amid a blaze of marsh marigolds and purple flags, the surface gleaming like glass in the sun. Half a score water hens went winging from the reeds and skimming low and fast towards the island. A heron rose from the shallows and labored heavenwards with legs trailing. Riding round the margin, they found, to their joy, a barge grounded in a little bay, with sweeps ready upon the thwarts and a horse-board fitted at the prow. A purple cloak hung over one bulwark, trailing in the water. A small crucifix and a few trinkets were scattered on the poop, as though those who had used the ferry last had fled in fear, forgetful of everything save flight. Then came the embarkation. The barge would but hold three horses at one voyage, so Peleus ordered Egrain and the rest into the boat, and bade the men row over and return. Egrain demurred a moment. Leave your horse, she said. They may come before the boat can take you. Peleus refused her with a smile, running his fingers through the brute's black mane. I have a truer heart than that, he said. The men launched away, and pulled at the sweeps with a will, Egrain helping and doing her devoir for the man Peleus's sake. The barge slid away, with ripples playing from the prow, and a gush of foam leaping from each smile of the blades. It was a hundred yards or more to the island, and the craft was ponderous enough to make the crossing slow. Peleus sat still and watched the meadows. Suddenly, bleakly, a figure on horseback topped the low hill on the north, and held motionless on the summit, scanning the valley. A second joined the first. Peleus caught a shout, muffled by the wind, as the two plunged down at full gallop for the mirror, sleeping in its bed of green. Here were two gentlemen who had outstripped their fellows, and were as keen as could be to catch Peleus before the barge could recross, and set the mirror betwixt them. Peleus saw his hazard in a moment. Even if the barge came before the heathen, there would be some peril of its capture in the shallows. He would have to fight for it, unless he cared to swim the mirror. 
provided he could deal with these two outriders before the main company came up, well and good, the raiders would find clear water between the quarry and their swords. He thought of Evangel and grew iron of heart. Then there was the nun, Egrain, with the wonderful eyes and hair warm as the dun woods in autumn. He was her sworn knight as far as Winchester. God helping him, he thought, he would yet see her face again. So he rode out grimly to get fair field for horsecraft, and waited for the two who swept the meadows. Egrain, standing on the wooden stage at the water's edge, saw Peleus taking ground and preparing for a tussle. The barge had put off again and had already half-spanned the water. She was alone with the woman of the white horse, who stood beside her, still quaking like a reed, and almost voiceless from the fulsome terror of an unshrived death. Egrain had no heed for her at the moment. Her whole thought lurked with the red shield and the black horse in the meadows. Worldly heart! Her desire burnt redly in her own bosom and found no flutter for the powers above. She saw Peleus gathering for the course, while the heathen slackened so as not to override their mark. A crescent of steel flashed as the foremost man launched his axe at the knight's head. The red shield caught and turned it. In a trice Peleus's spear had picked the road from the saddle, despite his crouching low and seeking to shun it. The second fellow came in like a whirlwind. His horse caught the black destrier cross-counter and rolled him down like a rammed wall. Peleus avoided and was up with bleak sword. Smiting low, he caught the man's thigh and broke the bone like a laugh. The Saxon lost his seat and came down with a snarling yell. The rest was easy as beating down a maimed wolf. The main company had just topped the hill. Peleus, with the skirmish ended to his credit, shook his sword at them and led his horse into the shallows. The barge swept in, took its burden from the bank, and held back for the island, where Egrain stood watching on the stage, ready with her welcome. She was glad of Peleus in her heart, as though the comradeship of half a day had given her the right to share his honor and to chime her joy with his. The woman in her swamped the assumed sanctity of the nun. As the water stretch lessened between them, Peleus, silent and dark-browed as was his wont, found himself beneath the beck of eyes that gazed like the half-born wonder of the sky at dawn. It was neither joy nor great light in them, but a kind of quiet musing, as though there were strange new music in her soul. "'Are you hurt?' she asked, as he sprang from the barge and stood beside her, with head thrown back and his great shoulders squared. "'Not a graze. Two to one and a fair field,' quoth she, with a quaver of triumph. "'My heart sang when those men went down. That was a great spear-thrust. Less and less of the rosary.' She caught his deep smile and laughed. "'I am a greater heathen than either.' she said. God rest their souls. Meanwhile, the lady in the blue tunic had somewhat recovered her squandered wits and courage. She came forward with a simpering dignity, walking daintily, with her gown gathered in her right hand and her left laid over her heart. Her eyes were very big and blue, their brightness giving her an eager, sanguine look that was upheld the more by an assumed simpleness of manner. Her childish bearing, winsomely studied, exercised its subtleties with a lavish embellishment of smiles and blushes. Looked at more closely and in repose, her face belied in measure the perspicuous personality she had adopted. A sensual boldness lurked in mouth and nostrils, and there was more carnal wisdom there than a pretended child should possess. "'Courtesy fails me, sir,' she said letting her shoulders fall into a graceful stoop and turning her large eyes to Peleus's face. Courtesy fails me when I would most praise you for your knightly deed in yonder meadows. I am so frightened that I cannot speak as I would. My heart is quite tired with its fear and flutter. Think you you can save us from these wolves? 
Peleus had neither the desire nor the leisure to stand juggling courtesies with the woman. Madame, he said, we shall fight. Leave the rest to Providence. I can give you no better comfort. No, she said, no, as in a daze. Peleus, reading her misery, repented somewhat of his abrupt truthfulness. Come, he said, with a kind strength and a hand on her shoulder. Go to the house and rest there with Sister Egrain. I see you are too much shaken. Go in and pray if you can while we hold the island. The girl looked at him unreservedly for a moment. Then she gave a little laugh that was half a sob, and, bending to him, kissed his hand before he could prevent her. Giving him yet another glance from her tumbled hair, she stepped aside to Egrain, and they turned together towards the manor and the trees and gardens that ringed it. The girl had set her hand in Egrain's with a little gesture that was intended to be indicative of confidence in the supposed nun's greater intelligence. "'Let us go and sit under that yew tree she suggested. "'I cannot stifle within walls now. "'You are named Egrain. "'I am called Morgan, Morgan La Blanche, "'and I am a lord's daughter. "'I almost envy you your frock now, "'for death cannot frighten you as it frightens me. "'Of course you are very good, "'and the saints guard and watch over you. "'As for me, I have always been very thoughtless.' "'Not more than I,' said Egrain with a smile. I have often hummed romances when I should have praised Paul or Peter. But doesn't the fear of death blight you like a frost? I never think of death. It seems so near us now that I can hardly breathe. Do you think we are tortured in the other world if there be one? How should I know, simple one? I wish the mere world league broad. I should feel further from the pit. Is your conscience so unkind? "'Conscience, sister! It is self-love, not conscience. I only want to live. Look, the heathen are coming down to the mere. How their axes shine! Holy Mother, I wish I could pray!' Egrain, catching the girl's pinched face, with lips drawn and twitching, pitied her from her very heart. "'Come, then, I will pray with you,' she said. No, no, my prayers would blacken heaven. I cannot, I cannot. The wild company had swept down between the great trees in disorderly array. Their weapons shone in the sunlight, their round bucklers blickered. They were soon at the place where Peleus had slain his men in fair and open field. Dismounting, they gathered about their dead fellows, and sent up, after their custom, a vicious dismal ululation. A sound like the howling of wolves, drear enough to make the flesh tingle under the stoutest steel. Lining the bank among the willows, they shook buckler and axe, gesticulating threatening, their long hair blowing wild, their skin-clad bodies giving them a wolfen look not pleasant to behold. Round the margin they paddled, searching, casting about for a boat. They seemed like beasts behind the gates of some Roman amphitheatre, caged from the slaughter. The girl Morgan looked at them, screamed, and hid her face in her tunic. Egrain found the girl's quaking hand and held it fast in hers. "'Courage, courage,' she said. "'There is no boat, and even if they swim, Sir Peleus is a great knight.' "'What can he do against fifty? whined the girl." with her face still covered. Fifty? There are but a score. I have numbered them myself. I would give all the jewels in the world to be in Winchester. Ah, girl, I have no jewels to give, but this, I promise you, is better than a convent. The barbarians had gathered in a group beneath a great willow. Plainly they were in debate as to what should be done. Some, by their gestures, their tossing weapons, and their bombast, were for swimming the mere. Their counsels were palpably divided. Possibly the sager folk among them did not think the venture worth the loss to them it might entail, seeing that one of those cooped upon the island had already given proof of no mean prowess. 
they could see the three armed men waiting grimly by the water's edge, ready to strike down the swimmer who should crawl half-naked from the water weeds and mire. Gradually, but surely, the elder tongues held the argument, and the balance went down solemnly for those upon the island. Peleus and the two men, watching keenly for any movement, saw the circle of figures break and melt towards the horses. They saw them pick up the bodies of their two dead fellows and lay them across the saddle. In a minute the whole troop turned and held away southwards at a trot, flinging back a last wild cry over the water. The meadows rolled away behind them, the gradual trees hid them from moment to moment. Peleus and the two servants stood and watched till the black line had gone southwards into the thickening woods. Under the yew tree, Morgan Leblanche had uncased her white face and was smiling feebly. I am glad I did not pray, she said. It would have been so weak. Look, I have torn my tunic and my belts awry. Bind my hair for me, sister, quickly, before Sir Peleus comes. End of Book One, Chapter Five. Recording by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa. Section Six of Uther and Egrain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Uther and Egrain by Warwick Deeping Book One, The Way to Winchester Chapter Six With the heathen lost in the distant woods, Peleus and the women essayed the house, leaving the two servants to sentinel the island. The great gates of the porch were ajar. Pushing in, they crossed into the atrium and found it sleepy as solitude. The water in the impluvium gleamed with the gold flanks of the fish that moved through its shadows. Lilies were there, white and wonderful, swooning to their own images in the pool. The tiled floor was rich with color. Venturing further, they found the triclinium untouched. Rich couches and flaming curtains everywhere, gilded chairs and deep-lusted mirrors, urns and flowers. In the chapel, candles were guttered on the altar. Dim lights came down upon a wealth of solemn beauty. Saints, censers, crosses, frescoed walls all green and azure, gold and scarlet. The viridarium, set betwixt chapel and tablinum, held them dazed with a glowing paradise of flowers. Here were dreamy palms, orange trees like mounts of gold, roses that slept in a deep delight of green. Over all was silence untainted even by the silken purr of a bird's wing. Genetium and Bower were void of them in turn. Everywhere they found the relics of a swift desertion. The manor folk had gone, as if to the ferry of death, taking no worldly store or sumptuous baggage with them. Not a living thing did they discover, save the fish darting in the water. The cabicula were empty, their couches tumbled the Kalina fireless and its hearth cold. Peleus and the women marveled much at the beauty of the place. Its solitude seemed but a ghostly charm to them. As for the girl Morgan, she had taken Peleus into her immediate and especial favor, holding at his side everywhere, a bubble with delight. The luxury of the place pleased her at every glance. Her vanity ran riot like a bee among flowers. She eyed herself furtively in mirrors, and put a rose daintily in her hair, while Peleus was not looking. She had already rifled a cabinet, strung a chain of amethysts about her neck, and poked her fingers into numberless rings. Then she would try the couches, queen it for a moment in some stately chair, or smother her face sensuously in the flowers growing from the urns. All these pretty vaporings were carried through with a most mischievous grace. Egrain, who had seen the girl white and whimpering an hour before, and in deadly horror of the pit, wondered at her, and hated her liberally in her heart. Nor was Peleus glad of the change her presence had wrought, for her childish subtleties had no hold on him, 
and even her thieving seemed insipid. With solemn and shadowy thoughts in his heart, her frivolous worldliness came like some tinkling discord. Egrain seemed to have dimmed her eyes from him beneath the shadow of her hood. Her face was set like the face of a statue, and there was no play of thought upon it. She walked proudly behind the pair, not with them, like one elbowed out of companionship by a vaporing rival. In the woman's bower Morgan found a lute and pounced upon it. "'One's whole desire seems here,' she chattered. "'This bower suits my fancy like a dream, and I could lodge here a month for love of it. "'What think you, knight Peleus? I never set foot in a fairer manner. "'I warrant you there are meat and wine in the cellars. "'We will feast and have music anon.' Peleus's face looked more suited to a burial. Egrain pitied him, for his eyes looked tired and sad. Morgan ran on like a jay. In the chapel she found Egrain a share. "'Here is your portion, holy sister,' she said. "'Mine the bower, yours the altar. So you see we are all well suited. Come, though, is it not very horrible having to look solemn all day and to wear a grey gown? I should fade in a week inside such a hood.' Besides, it makes you look such a color. Egrain could certainly boast a color at that moment that might have warned the woman of her rising fume. Peleus broke in and took up the argument. Men do not consider dress, he said. Everything is fair to the comely. I look into a woman's face and into her eyes and take the measure of her heart. Such is my catechism. "'But you like to see rich silks and a smile, and to hear a laugh at times. "'What is a girl if she is not gay? "'No discourtesy to you, sister, but you seem so far set from Sir Peleus and myself.' "'Egrain, lacking patience, flared up like a torch. "'Ha! mark you,' she said. "'My habit makes me no coward, nor do I thieve. "'No discourtesy to you, my dear lady.' Morgan set up a thrill of laughter. "'How true a woman is a nun,' quoth she. "'But you are too severe, too careful. "'Thieving, too. "'Why, I may as well have a trinket or so before the place is rifled, "'even if I take a single ring. "'And what is more, I have been turned from my own house "'with hardly a bracelet or a bodkin. "'Come, Sir Peleus, let us be going. "'The sister would be at her prayers.' I see we but hinder her. Peleus had lost both pity and patience in the last minute. Partisanship is inevitable even in the most trivial differences, and Peleus's frown was strongly for Morgan La Blanche. Perhaps it would be well, madame, said he, if we all went on our knees for the day's deliverance. I cannot see that there is any shame in gratitude. Gratitude? chirped the girl. Gratitude to whom? To the Lord Saviour, madame, and the Mother Virgin. She half laughed in his face, but his eyes sobered her. For a moment she fronted him with an incredulous smirk. Then her glance wavered and lowered to his breast. It held there with a tense stare, while her whole face hardened. Peleus saw her pupils darken, her cheeks flush and pale in a moment. He thought nothing of it, or ascribed her distraught and strange look to some sudden shame or shock of penitence. In a trice the smile was back again, and she seemed pert and pleased as ever. "'I see you are too devout for me,' she said with a glib laugh, "'and that I am too wicked a thing for the moment. "'I will leave you to Sister Egrain till you both have prayed your fill.' Here she laughed again a laugh that made Egrain's cheeks burn. Remember me to St. Anthony, if you may. If I recollect rightly, he was a nice old gentleman who cured the fire for a miracle and nearly fell in love with the devil. Till you have done, I will go and gather flowers. Peleus and Egrain looked at one another. A devout child, said the man, and not bred in a nunnery. The world's convent, I should say. For the moment Egrain was almost for telling him of her own hypocrisy, but the thought found her more troubled on that score than she could have guessed. 
She had acted a lie to the man, and feared his true eyes despite her courage. Another day I will tell him, she thought. It is not so great a sin after all. So they turned and knelt at their devotions. Morgan La Blanche went away like the wind. She ran through atrium and porch with hate free in her eyes, and her child's face twisted into a scowl of temper. In the garden she idled up and down a while in a restless fume, like one whose thoughts bubble bodingly. Sometimes she would smite a lily peevishly with her open hand, or pluck a flower and trample it under her feet as though it had wronged her. Then she would take something from her bosom and stare at it while her lips worked, or while she bit her fingers as though galled by some inward barb. Presently she found her way by a laurel walk to the orchard, and thence by a wicket gate to the island's rim, where one of her men kept watch on the further meadows. She stood under an apple tree, called to him, and beckoned. He came to her, a short, burly fellow with the look of a bull, and brute writ large on his visage. Morgan drew him under the swooping dome of the tree, plucked something that shone from her bosom, and dangled it before his eyes. The cross, she said, almost in a whisper. Galerius, the cross. The man stared at her stupidly. Morgan lifted a finger, ran this way and that, peering into the green glooms and listening. Then she came back to the man, soft-footed, glib as a cat, with the cross of gold gripped in her fingers. She smiled at him, a smile that was almost a leer. Galerius, she said, the knight in the house yonder wears a chain with one cross missing, and the fellow cross matches this. Moreover, his poniard sheath is empty. I marked all this as I stood by him a moment ago. This is the man who slew my lord. The servant's heavy face showed that he understood her well enough now. Tonight, she said, almost skipping under the trees with the intensity of her malice, it shall be with his own poniard. I have it here. Galerius, you have always been a good fellow. The man grinned. Keep silence and leave all to me. I shall need your hand and no more. Nor shall he, said Galerius curtly. Morgan grew suddenly bleak and quiet, with the thought of murder harbored in her heart. Look for yourself, Galerius, she said. See that my eyes have not deceived me. The man must have come upon Lord Madan when he was alone, after our hirelings had deserted the house. He slew him in the winter room. This whelp sent by Aurelius the king. You and I, Galerius, found the cross in my lord's dead hand and the poniard in his bosom. I warrant you we will level this deed before we hold again for Winchester. Trust my hand, Madame Morgan, quoth the man. If you can have the fellow sleeping, so much the better. One need not strike in a hurry. Leave it to me, she said. I will give you your knife and your chance tonight. With that, she sent the fellow back to his watching and threaded the orchard to the manor garden. Peleus and Egrain had long ended their prayers in the chapel. Morgan found them in the atrium, watching the fish in the water and their own reflections in the pool. The girl had quite smothered the bleak look that had held her features in the orchard. She was the same ingenuous, self-pleased little woman whose blue eyes seemed as clear and honest as a sleeping sea in summer. Before, she had flown in Peleus's face for vanity's sake. Now she seemed no less his woman, ready with smiles and childish flattery, and all the pleasantness she could gather. She was at his side again, quick with her eyes and tongue. Probably she guessed that the man despised her, but then that was of no moment now, seeing that it made the secret in her heart more bitter. At noon they dined in the triclinium, with man Galerius to serve. He had ransacked kitchen and pantry, and from the ample store discovered, had spread a sufficient meal. His eyes were ever on Peleus as he waited. There was no doubt about cross or poniard sheath and Galerius found pleasure in scanning the knight's armor and looking for the place where he might strike. The afternoon proved sultry, 
and Peleus took his turn in keeping watch by the bank. Cool and placid lay the water in the sun, while vapory heat hung over the meadows and the distant woods. There was still fear lest the heathen might return, thinking to catch the islanders napping. The very abruptness of their retreat had been in itself suspicious, and Peleus was all for caution. Egrain's face seemed to make him more careful of peril. He thought much of her as he paced the green bank for three hours or more, before leaving the duty to Galerius and his fellow. Returning to the manor, he found Egrain cushioned on the tiled floor beside the impluvium, fingering the lute that Morgan Leblanche had found. The latter lady was still in the tablinum, so Egrain said, pilfering and admiring at her leisure, with fruit and a cup of spiced wine ready at her hand. Peleus took post on the opposite side of the pool to Egrain, unarmed himself at his leisure, and began to clean his harness. No task could have pleased Egrain better. She put the lute away, took his helmet on her lap, and burnished it with the corner of her gown. Peleus had sword, breastplate, greaves, and shoulder pieces beside him. Their eyes often met over the pool as they sat with the scent of lilies in the air, and talked little, but thought the more. Egrain felt queerly happy. There seemed a warm fire in her bosom, a stealthy, happy heat that crept through every atom of her frame like the sap into the fibers of some rich rose. Her heart seemed to unfold itself like a flower in the sun. She looked often at Peleus, and her eyes were very soft and bright. A fair place, this, she said presently, as the man furbished his sword. Fair indeed, said he, a rich manner. It is strange to me after Evangel. Perhaps more beautiful. Ah, she said with a sudden kindling, I think my whole soul was made for beauty, my whole desire born for fair and lovely things. You will smile at me for a dreamer, but often my thoughts seem to fly through forests, marvelous green glooms all drowned in moonlight. I love to hear the wind, to watch the great oaks battling, to see the sea one laugh of gold. Every sunset harrows me into a moan of woe. I can sing to the stars at night, songs such as the woods weave from the voice of a gentle wind, dew-laden, green, and lovely. Sometimes I feel faint for sheer love of this fair earth. Peleus's eyes were on her with a strange deep look. His dark face was aglow with a new wonder, as though his soul had flashed to hers. The great sword lay naked and idle in his hands. Often have I felt thus, he said, but my lips could never say it. Thoughts are given to some without words. But the joy is there, she answered with a quiet smile. Joy in beauty? Yes. Ah, girl, a beautiful face or a blaze of gold and scarlet over the western hills are like strange wine to my heart. Yes, yes, it is grand to live, said Egrain. Peleus's head went down over his sword as though in thought. It would seem, he said presently, that beauty is a closed book save to the few. It is good to find a heart that understands. Ah, that know I well, she chimed. In Evangel they had souls like clay. They saw nothing, understood nothing. I think I would rather die than be soul-blind. So many folk, said the man, seem to live as though they were ever scanning the bottom of a pot. They never get beyond reflections on appetite. As they talked, Morgan Leblanche came in from behind the looped curtains, with silks, samites, cyclotins, and sarcanets in her arms. She had found some rich chest in the bower accomplice to her fingers, and had reveled gloriously. She sat herself down near Peleus, and began to laugh and chatter like a pleased child. The dainty stuffs were tossed this way and that, gathered into scarfs or frills, spread over her lap, and eyed critically as to color, before being bound in a bale for her journey. 
vain and vapid as her behaviour seemed there was more in this little woman's heart than either peleus or egrain could have guessed her whole mood was false foolish as she seemed on the surface she was more keen more subtle by far than egrain whose whole soul spelt fire and courage as the day drew towards evening morgan became more stiff and silent her eyes were bright as the jewels round her neck they would flash and waver or fall at times into long sidelong stares more than once egrain caught the girl's face in hard thought the pert lips straight and cruel the eyes hungry and very shallow it reminded her of morgan's look in the morning when she was in such stark fear of the heathen and of death yet while she watched her smiles and glib vivacity would sweep back again as though there had been but a transient cloud of thought over the girl's face with the shadows lengthening they turned all three of them into the garden and found ease on a grass bank beneath the black boughs of a great cedar the arch of the dark foliage cut the sky into a semicircle of azure all about them the grass seemed dusted with dim flowers blue white and violet a rich company of tiger lilies bowed to the west dense banks of laurels and cypresses stood like screens of blackest marble for the sun was sinking as they lay under the tree they could look down upon the water sheeny and glorious in the evening peace further still the willows slept like a mist of green with the fields elysian and full of sweet stupors the woods beyond standing solemn and still at the beck of night morgan who had brought the lute with her began to touch the strings and to sing softly in a thin elfin voice my heart is open at the hour of night when lilies swoon and roses kiss in bed when all the dreams of sad-lipped passion rise from sleep's blue bowers to die in lovers eyes come flame come fire a woman's bosom is but life's desire so all my treasures are but held for love in scarlet silks and tapestries of snow i long white-bosomed like the stars that sigh a bed in heaven for love's ecstasy come flame come fire a woman's bosom is all man's desire the birds were nestling and gossiping in the laurel bushes taking lodging for the night from the topmost pinnacle of the cedar a thrush a feathered muezzin had called the world to prayer from the mere came the cries of waterfowl the eerie wail of the lapwing rose in the meadows presently all was still and breathless a vast hush seemed to hold the world the west was fast dying under the cedar the light lurked dim and magic morgan's fingers were still hovering on the strings and she was singing to herself in a whisper as though she had care for nothing save for that which was in her heart peleus and egrain were quite near each other in the shadow they had looked into each other's eyes one long deep look each had turned away troubled yet with a sudden glory of quick anguish in their hearts the night seemed very subtle to them and the whole world sweet end of book one chapter six recording by geoffrey wilson ames iowa Section 7 of Uther and Egrain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel Harper. Uther and Egrain by Warwick Deeping. Book 1, Chapter 7. Egrain's thoughts were to music when she went to bed that night. Peleus's eyes stayed with her, darkly, sadly, his tragic face seemed to look out of the night, like the face of one dead. And he more than liked her. She felt sure of that, even if she did not dream of kinder things sprung from long looks and quiet sighings. 
She sat on her bed and smiled the whole strange day over to herself again. She had the man before her in all his looks and poses. How he sat his horse, the habit he had of looking deeply into nothingness, his strength and quiet nightliness, and above all his devout soul. He seemed to please her at every point in a way that set her thrilling within herself with a delicious wonder. Last, she thought of the weird twilight under the grand old tree, rare climax to a day of deeds and memories. She felt her heart leap as she remembered the great wistful look that had shone out on her from Peleus's eyes. The manor house seemed still as the night itself. Morgan LeBlanche had taken herself to a couch in the triclinium, choosing it rather than one of the cubicles leading from the atrium. Galerius was on guard, pacing the mirror's bank, while his comrade slept in the kitchen. Peleus, armed, with sword and shield beside him, had quartered himself on cushions in the great porch, with the doors open. It was about ten o'clock. Egrain, full of sweet broodings, crept into bed and settled herself for sleep. The night was wonderfully peaceful. The window of the room was overgrown with a tangle of roses, the flowers seeming to mellow the air as it came softly in, and there was a faint shimmer into the shadows that hinted at moonlight. Egrain lay long awake, with her eyes on the few stars that peeped through between the jams. There was too much in her heart to let sleep in for the while, and her thoughts were a dance within her brain, like wild, fleet-footed things. As she lay in a happy fever of thought, her face grew hot upon the pillow, and her tumbled hair was like a lustrous lava flow over the bed. In course, despite her tossing, she fell into a shallow, fitful sleep that verged between wakefulness and dreams. It was well past midnight when she started, wide awake, with the half-dreamt memory of some eerie sound in her ears. She sat up in bed and listened, shivering. There were footfalls, swift and light, on the pavement of the atrium. From somewhere came a gruff voice, speaking tersely and in bated tones. Next, there was something that sounded like a groan, and then silence. Egrain crept out of bed, hurried on her habit, opened the door gently, and looked out. Moonlight streamed in through the square aperture in the roof of the hall, but all else lay in darkness. The porch gates were ajar, with a band of light slanting through upon the tiles. Eager, tremulous, she fancied as she stood that she heard the beat of oars. Then the low, groaning cough that she had heard before thrilled her into action like a trumpet cry. She was across the court in a second and into the darkened porch. The doors swung back to her hands, and the night streamed in. Clear before her, lit with a silver emphasis, lay the water, and on it she saw the dark outline of the barge, moving with foaming oars towards the further bank. For the moment her heart seemed to halt within her. Peleus! she cried. Peleus! A stifled sound answered her from a dark corner of the porch. With a sudden frost in her bosom, she saw a black rill trickling over the tiles in the moonlight, even touching her feet. Great fear came upon her, but left her power to think. In the triclinium she had seen a lamp, with tinder, steel, and flint in a tray beside it, and in her fear she ran thither, tore her fingers in her haste with stone and steel, but had the lamp lit with such speed as she had never learned at Avangel. Then she went back trembling into the porch. The knight Peleus lay in the corner, half propped against the wall. His head was bowed down upon his chest, and he had both hands clasped upon the neckband of his tunic. Blood was trickling from his mouth, and he seemed to be hardly breathing, while under the left armpit shone the silver hilt of the knife that had been thrust there by Galerius's hand. To the thought of the girl it seemed as if the man were in his death agony. The utter realism of the moment drove all fear from her. She set the lamp on the tiles, and kneeling by Peleus, pulled the knife slowly from his side. A gush of blood followed. She strove to staunch it with a corner of her gown. The man was quite unconscious and never heeded her, though he was still breathing jerkily and feebly, with a rattling strider in his throat. She lifted his head and rested it upon her shoulder, while she knelt and pressed her hand over the wound, dreading to see him die each moment. For an hour she knelt, cold and almost bare-kneed, on the stone floor, holding the man to her watching his breathing with a tense fear, pressing upon the wound as though ethereal life would ebb and mock her fingers. Little by little she felt the warm flow cease, 
felt her fingers stiffened at their task, while the minutes dragged like eons and the lamp flickered low in the night. At last she knew that the issue was stayed, and that Peleus bled no more. Gradually, fearfully, lest life should fall away like a poised wand, she laid the man down and again watched with her hand over the stricken side. He was breathing more noticeably now, with less of the look of death about him. Encouraged thus, she dared to meditate leaving him to find wine and sheets to cover him there. When she essayed to move, she found her habit clotted to the wound where she had held it. It took her minutes to cut the cloth through with the knife that had stabbed Peleus, for she was palsied lest the wound should break again and lose her, her love's labor. Free at last, she fled into her room, tore the clothes in which she had lain from the bed, and carried them trailing into the porch. Then, lamp in hand, she spoiled the triclinium of rugs and cushions, and found there the chalice of wine that Morgan had sipped from. Laden, she struggled back across the hall, fearing all the while to find the man parted. No such foul fortune, however. He was breathing better and better. Then she set to to make a bed. She spread cushions and rugs, and then, so slowly, so gently, that she seemed hardly to move, she had the man laid upon the couch with two cushions under his head. Next she covered him with the clothes taken from her own bed. Thus much completed without mishap, she washed his lips and face with water taken from the pool, trickled some wine down his throat, and set the doors wide to watch for dawn. So pressed had she been by the man's peril, that even the right of thought had been denied her. Now, seated by the lamp, she began to sift matters as well as her meager knowledge would suffer, keeping constant watch on wounded Peleus the while. She knew that Morgan and her men were gone in the barge, but as to who gave Peleus his wound— she could come to no clear understanding in her heart. There must have been some deep feud for such a stroke, though she could find no reason for the deed. Still, she could believe anything of that chit, Morgan LeBlanche, and there the riddle rested for a season. Before long she saw the summer dawn stealing silently and mysteriously into the east. The face of the sky grew gray with waking light, and the hold of the moon and night relaxed on wood and meadow. Then the birds began in the garden, till she thought their shrill piping must wake Peleus from his swoon, so blithe and lusty were they. The east was forging day fast in its furnace of gold. The glare touched the clouds and rolled them into wreaths of amber fire. A sigh from the couch brought her to her feet like magic. She went and knelt by the bed in quite a tumult of expectation. Peleus's hands were groping feebly over the coverlet like weak blind things. Egrain caught them in hers, thrilled as they closed upon her fingers, and, bending low, she waited with her lips almost on the man's, her hair on his forehead, her eyes fixed on his closed lids. All her soul seemed to droop above him like a lily over a grave. Presently he sighed again, stirred, and opened his eyes full on Egrain's, as she knelt and mingled her breath with his. Pelias, she whispered. Pelias. He looked at her for a moment with a dazed stare that dawned into a smile that made her long to sing. "'It is Egrain,' she said. Peleus caught a deep breath and groaned as his stricken side twinged to the quick. Egrain put two fingers on his lips. "'Lie still,' she said. "'Lie still if you love earth. You must not speak. No, not one little word. I must have you quiet as a child, Peleus. You have been so near death.' She felt the man's hand answer hers. He did not speak or move, but lay and looked at her as a little child in a cradle looks at its mother, or as a dog eyes his master. Egrain put his hands gently down upon the coverlet and smiled at him. "'Lie so, Peleus,' she said. "'Be very quiet, for I am to leave you for a minute and no more. You must not move a finger or I shall scold.' She beamed at him, started up, and ran straight to the chapel, her heart a whimper with a joy that was not mute. She went full length on the altar steps with her face turned to the cross above, the cross whose golden arms were aglow with the sun through the eastern window. In her mood, the white Christ's face seemed to smile on her with equal joy. She learnt more in that moment than Avangel had taught her in a year. Hardly five minutes had passed before she was with Peleus again, bearing fruit and olives, bread and oil. 
she made a sweet dish of bread and berries with some wine in it for his heart's sake, and then knelt at his side to feed him. She would not let him lift a finger, but served him herself with silver spoon and platter, smiling to give him courage as he obeyed her like a babe. It seemed very pitiful to her that so much strength and manliness should have been smitten so low in one brief night. Nonetheless, the man's feebleness brought her more joy than ever his courage had done, and his peril had discovered clear wells of ruth in her that might have been months hidden but for the hand of Galerius. When Peleus had finished the bread and fruit, she gave him more wine, and then set to to bathe his hands and face with scented water taken from the tablinum. Peleus's eyes, with deep shadows under them now, watched her all the while with a kind of wondering calm. The sunlight flooded in and lit her hair like red gold, and made her neck to shine like alabaster. Meeting his look, she reddened, and turned to hide her face for a moment, that he might not see all that was writ there in letters of flame. "'Now you must sleep, Peleus,' she said, crossing his hands upon the quilt. He shook his head feebly. "'I am going to leave you,' she persisted. "'So you must not flout me, Peleus. I shall be here, ready, when you wake.' She smiled at him and closed his lids gently with her fingertips. "'Sleep,' she said, brushing her hand softly over his forehead. "'For sleep will give you strength again. You may need it.' She left him there, and taking bread and olives with her, she closed the porch gates to shade him, and went herself into the garden. After a meal under the old cedar, she went down to the water's edge and washed her feet from the stains of Peleus's blood, and bathed her hands and face. She saw the barge amid the reeds and rushes on the farther bank. There was no sign of life in the meadows, and the woods were deep with peace. Then she remembered Peleus's horse. Going to the stable behind the manor, she found the beast stalled there, though Morgan's horses had been taken by the men in the barge. Egrain took hay from the rack, gave him a measure of oats in his manger, and watered him with water from the mirror. Then she stood and combed his mane with her fingers as he fed. Some of the poppies she had plaited there were dead and drooping in the black hair. She thought as she unbound the withered things how nearly Peleus's life had withered with theirs. She was very happy in her heart, and she sang softly the low, tender songs women love when their thoughts are maying. Egrain passed the whole morning in the garden, going every now and again to the porch to open the doors gently and peep in upon the sleeper. She gathered a basket of fruit and a lap full of flowers— about noon she went in, and bringing jars from the triclinium, she filled them with water and garnished them with flowers. These jars she set in array about Peleus's bed, one of tiger lilies and one of white lilies, a bowl of roses at his head, a jar of hollyhocks and one of thyme, and fragrant herbs at the foot. Moreover, she strewed the coverlet with pansies and scattered rose leaves on his pillow. Then she went to the chapel to pray a while before sitting down to watch beside his bed. Peleus woke about an hour after noon had turned. At his first stirring, Egrain was hanging over him like a mother, with her hands on his. Peleus looked up at her, saw the flowers about his bed, and, risking her menaces, spoke his first word. Egrain, he said. She put her face down to his. I am much stronger, he said. I can talk now. Perhaps a very little, she answered with her eyes on his. Egrain, yes, Peleus, you are very wonderful. Peleus, she said redly, I should have died without you, for I was witless and coughing blood. I thought you would die, she said very softly, with her eyes downcast. I held you in my arms, and, God helping me, staunched the flow from your wound. But tell me, Peleus, who was it stabbed you? The man smiled at her. "'There I am as ignorant as you,' he said. "'I woke with a fiery twinge in my side, "'and saw a man running out of the porch in the dark. "'I struggled to rise. "'Blood came into my mouth, "'and betwixt coughing and hard breathing I must have fainted. "'What of the others?' "'Egrain knelt up from stooping over him, and thought. "'Morgan and her men,' she said presently, "'fled across the mere in the barge "'just after you had been stabbed. "'I saw them go in the moonlight. "'It was your cry that woke me in bed. "'I came and found you senseless in the corner, "'and the woman and her rascals making off in the boat. 
One of the men must have smitten you while you slept. Peleus kept silence for a while, as though he were thinking hard. Show me the knife, he said anon. Egraine had washed away the stains and laid it aside in a corner. She held it up now before Peleus's eyes as he lay in bed. He took it from her with trembling hands and handled it, his face darkening. This is my own poniard, he said, the poniard I left in the heart of the man in Andresvold. Look, girl, look. Search and see. Mayhaps you may find a cross. Egraine did his bidding and searched the pavement, but found nothing. Then she came back to the bed and began to turn the cushions up here and there and to scan the tiled floor. Sure enough, under the foot of the bed, she found a small gold cross lying, smeared lightly with dried blood. She took it up and gave it to Peleus. He caught and held it with a terse cry. End of Book One, Chapter Seven. Recording by Rachel Harper. Section Eight of Uther and Igraine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. Uther and Igraine by Warwick Deeping. Book One. Chapter Eight. Pelias lay the afternoon through in a half-dream of shifting thought. But for the tangible things about him, there might have been elfin mischief in the air, for the last few days had passed with such a flash of new feeling and desire that the man's mind was still in a daze. He lay in bed, with jars of lilies round him, and a woman tending him with the grace of a Diana. It was all very strange, very pleasant, despite the ague in his ribs and his inordinate weakness. He was not so sure, after all, that he bore Morgan La Blanche any so fervent a piece of malice. Fortune seemed to beckon him towards generosity, seeing that his condition was so truly picturesque. Uncouth feelings were swallowed up for the time being by a benignant stupor of contentment. But the balance of human happiness is often very nice and subtle. Leaden reason tumbled into the scale of melancholy may even outscale the bowl of dreams. Love and law often dangle on either beam of a man's mind, or philosophy anchored to a rock may sky poor fancy into the clouds. So it was with Pelias that day, wisdom being often enough a miserable nurse. When he thought of Igraine, reason as he would with himself, his soul began to shimmer like moon-rippled water. When she looked at him, the very pillars of his manhood seemed to quake. When she passed, light-footed, from garden to porch, she seemed to come in like the sun, bringing streams of warmth into his wounded flesh. Of necessity, he soon met other cogitations less pleasant and no less imperative. From legal quarters came that inevitable pedagogue, blear-eyed verity, paunched up with dogma and breathing ethical platitudes like garlic. "'The woman's a nun,' quoth Dom Verity, with a sneer, Keep your fancy in leash, my good Pelias, and forswear romance. Buy your thoughts from a child of the church, or you will rue it. No man may serve a nun, the world has said. What with his wound and his fractious meditations, Pelias soon fell into a most dismal temper. Like most sick folk, he had lost for the time that level sense of proportion that is the sure outcome of health. His thoughts began to gape at him, and to pull most melancholy grimaces. Even the dead man squatting in the great chair in the manor in Androswald began to haunt him like an ogreish conscience. Hot and racked, he could stand his own company at last no longer. Calling a grain to him, he began to unburden himself to her with regard to the man he had done to death in the forest. The girl listened, mild as moonlight, 
and ready to swear away her soul to soothe him. I am troubled for the deed, he was saying, though the man deserved death, twenty deaths, and though I serve justice to the echo, his blood hangs on my hands and makes me restless at heart. Tell me his sin, Peleus. They were many and too gross for ears such as thine. Then palpably he was too gross to live. No doubt, child. Then why trouble for his death, Peleus? You would not shrink from treading out an adder's brains? Ah, but there is the man's soul. I feel for him after my own downbringing. What chance had he of penitence? True she added gravely, but your mother, the Abbess Gratia, used to tell us that bad men repented only in legends and in the Bible, never in grim life. Besides, you prevented the man committing worse offences in the future, and getting deeper into the pit. Why, Peleus, hundreds of good knights have lost life for mere matter of love. Why trouble for the life of a wretch who perhaps never knew what truth meant? You would not grieve for men slain in battle. In battle the blood is hot and the brain afire. This was rank and reasonable stroke. And therefore the more deserved. Why trouble about it, Peleas? In faith, since your plight makes me tyrant, I forbid such brooding. It is but the evil fancy of a distraught mind, an incubus I must chase away. See, your hands are hot, and your forehead too. Will you sleep again, or shall I sing to you? Presently, he said, I have more to speak of yet. Ygraine knelt by him on her cushion, serene and tender. Say on, Peleas, she said. A woman loves a man's confidence. If I can give you comfort, I will gladly listen here till midnight. You are not yourself— Weak from loss of blood, and a gnat sting is like a lance thrust to you. Tell me your other troubles. Peleus groaned, hesitated, looked up into her eyes, and recanted inwardly. He furbished up a minor woe to serve the occasion. It is my sword and shield, he said. They were given me, blessed and consecrated, by my mother. It is in my thought that I had smirched them by this deed. What think you, girl? I cannot think so, she said, stoutly. Then since his face was so wistful and troubled, she racked her fancy for some plan she thought might soothe him. A sudden purpose came to her like prophecy. Listen, she said, I can do this for you. Give me your shield and sword, and let me lay them on the high altar under the cross with candles burning— and let me pray for them there. Will that comfort you, Peleus? Yes, he said, with a sudden sad smile. Pray for me. Go and pray for me, Igraine. It was the impulse of a moment. She bent down with a great thrill of wonder and kissed the man's lips. It was soon done, soon sped. She saw Peleus's blood stream to his face, saw something in his eyes that made her heart canter. Then she darted away, took up the great sword and the shield with its red face, and went to the chapel, singing like a seraph. Her prayers were a strange jumble of worship and recollection. "'Lord Jesu, cleanse his spirit,' said her heart one moment. "'Truth, how he coloured and looked at me. It sang with more human refrain the next.' May he be a knight above knights, quoth devotion, and may I be ever fair in his eyes, chimed love. Altogether, it was a most quaint prayer. Now a certain mundane matter had been troubling Igraine's thought that day. The barge, seized and put to use by Morgan and her men, lay amid the reeds on the nether shore, ready to give passage to any chance wayfarer welcome or otherwise, who should choose to cross the mere. The boat, so fixed, floated as a constant peril to Pelias and herself. She felt that peace would flout them so long as the barge lay ready to play ferryboat to any casual intruder. 
Pelias's wound might keep them cooped many days in the place, she vowed to herself that the boat should be regained, and blushed when the oath accused her. At dusk, when the birds were piping, and there was a green hush over the world, she went back to Pelias, a beautiful shameface, accomplished by the twilight. "'I have prayed,' she said simply. Pelias touched her fingers. "'I feel happier,' he said. "'That is well. Stay near me, Igraine. It grows dark fast. "'I shall be with you till you sleep,' she said. Igraine fed him with her own hands, talking little the while, but feeling very enamoured of her lot. She was thinking of her new surprise with some mischievous pleasure as she tended Pelias. The man was silent, yet very placid and facile to her willing. When she had bathed his face and neck, and seen him well couched, she took the lute Morgan had handled, and began to sing to him softly, wistfully, as though the song was the song of a quiet wind through willows. It was a chant for the dusk, for the quiet gazing of the first fires of heaven. Pelias heard it like the distant touching of strings over charmed water, and with the breath of lilies over him. He fell asleep. Igraine held by him, still as a mouse in the dark, till she knew by his breathing that he was deep in slumber. Then she set the lute aside, put the lamp by the porch door so that it should be ready to hand, and stole out into the garden. The moon was just coming up above the distant trees. Igraine waited under the black vaulted cedar till the great ring rode bleak above the fringe of the tops, before she went down between laurels to the water's edge. There was a deep cedarn scent on the warm air, and everything seemed deathly still. Going to the landing stage, she stood there a while, looking at the water, dark and mysterious, with pale webs of light upon its agate surface. Then she began to bind her hair closely on her head, smiling to herself and staring down at her vague image in the water. Her hair in shackles, she turned to her task in earnest. Soon habit, shift, and sandals were lying in a heap, and she was standing clean, rare, gleamingly straight as a statue, with her arms folded upon her breast. For a moment she stood, making the night to swoon, before taking to the mere. Pearly white with an aureole of foam, she swam flankwise with an overhand stroke, one arm thrusting out like a silver sickle. Here and there, fretted by the willows, long moonbeams glinted on her round whiteness, as the maddened foam bubbled and the water sighed and yearned amid the sedges. A fine glow had leapt through her body like wine, and the mere seemed to sway and sing as she swam for the main bank, where the willows stood blackly in a mist of phosphor glory. Soon she reached the shallows at a pleasant place, where a stretch of grassland tongued down into the mere. She climbed out and stood like a water nymph, her body a gleam and a sparkle with its dew, her skin like rare silk, smooth as a star's glance. Down fell her hair like smoke. She stretched her arms to the moon and laughed, her glow with the warmth gotten of her swim. Then she went to where the barge lay amid the reeds, and boarding it poled out into the deeps. Standing on the poop, she used an oar as a paddle, and so brought the cumbrous barge slowly under way. It stole out from the fretted shadows of the trees, and glided like a great arc over the mere in black silence, save for the dip of the blade and the drip of water. The voyage took Igraine longer than her swim. At last, with the boat moored at the stage, she dried her limbs and body with her hair, and took again to shift and habit. Then she stole back to the manor, listened a moment to Pelias's breathing, 
and having lit her lamp, she went to bed. Next morning, Igraine, with her deed locked up in her heart, was preparing Pelias a meal. He had just stirred and roused himself from sleep with a little cry, and he was watching the girl with the mute reflective look of one just freed from the visions of the night. Igraine, he said. She turned to him with a soft smile. I have been dreaming, he confessed gravely. Dreaming, Pelias? I thought, said he, that I saw a great dragon of gold come over the meadows, with a naked sword in his mouth, and a collar of rubies round his throat, and he came to the mere's edge, ramping and breathing fire, and lo, he entered into the barge there, and the barge went forth bearing him, while all the mere's water boiled and shone about the boat like flame. So he came to the island, and all greenness seemed to wither before him, and with the fear of him I awoke. Igraine shook her head at the man. "'Your dreams are distraught,' she said. "'It is your wound, Pelias. In faith, we should need the great Merlin for such a vision.' "'Ah,' said he, "'I can read you the riddle, Igraine. Our barge lies by the land-bank, ready for any foe. That is where the dream touches us.' Igraine brought him a bowl of crushed bread and fruit, and made as though to feed him. "'Never worry,' she said. "'The barge is moored safe at the stage.' Pelias put the bowl aside with one hand, and stared at her from his pillows. "'Did the barge swim the mere of herself?' quoth he. "'And anchor for us so fairly?' "'No.' "'Then?' Igraine went red of a sudden, and looked at her knees. "'Sooth, Pelias,' she said, "'I must have been the dragon of your dream. God pardon me.' Igraine, I never knew I seemed so fearful a creature. Honour and praise. He half rose on his pillows in his enthusiasm. Igraine put him gently back and took up the bowl of bread and fruit. That will do, my dear Pelias, she said. Now just lie still and have your breakfast. What boots it to chronicle at length their sojourn in the island manor? Twelve days Igraine nursed the man there, giving all her heart for service, tending him from sunrise to the fall of night. She seemed to have no other joy than to sit and talk to him, to make music with voice and hand, to keep his couch posed round with flowers. On waking, Pelias would find her by him, fresh as the dawn and full of a golden tenderness, at night his eyes closed upon her gracious figure as she sat in the gloaming and sang. She was near to hear his voice, quick to see his needs and to remedy them with soft hands and softer looks. The very atmosphere about the man seemed touched and mellowed by her, and the hours seemed to trip to the measure of a golden rhyme. Pelias mended very rapidly under her care. His wound sweet and innocent, gave him no trouble save some slight feverishness on the third day. The sixth morning found him so stalwart of temper that Igraine consented to his leaving bed for a morning, provided he obeyed her to the letter. His first steps were taken in the atrium, with Igraine's arm about his waist and his upon her shoulders. So well did he bear himself that the girl led him to the chapel, and there, side by side, on the altar steps, they winged up their devotion to heaven. Igraine's prayers, be it known, were all for love, Pelias's for the threatening shadows over his own soul. Daily after this innovation, Igraine would make him a couch under the great cedar tree in the garden, where he could rest shaded from the sun, and there, morn, noon, and eve, they had much comradeship and speech together. They would talk of God, the saints and the souls of men, of love and honour and the needs of Britain. Pelias would tell her of his own service with Aurelius, of all the fair pomp of lesser Britain, where Conan had begun a goodly kingdom years ago, and where many British folk had taken refuge. 
He had been to Rome as a boy, and he described that vast city to her, and told her of the bloody fields he had seen when the steel of Christendom met the heathen. Fresh streams from either soul welled out and mingled much during those summer days. Pelias and Igraine looked deep into the heart of the other, finding fine store of nobleness, of truth, and of things beautiful, till the heart of each had treasured everything for love and for love's desire. They were fair hours and very sweet to the two. The day seemed a casket of gold, and the night a bowl of ebony ablaze with stars. About this time the man Peleus began to go down into deep waters. Many days had passed with a flare of torches in the west, their sojourn was drawing to a close, and the night seemed near. The hailer Peleus grew in body, the more halt and hopeless waxed his soul. The whole world seemed to grow wounded to his eyes. The west was wistful at evening, and the starry sky a sob of pain. When a grain harped and sang, each note flew like winged death into his heart. He had no joy that was not smitten through with anguish, no thought that was not crowned with thorns. It was a very simple matter indeed, but perverse to utter bitterness. Pallias saw no hope for himself in the end. He would rock and toss and think at night till the darkness seemed to crush him into a mere mass of misery. Above all, there seemed to rise a great hand holding a cross of gold and a voice that said, Beware thy soul and death. Not so was it with Igraine. To her life had no shroud, and love prophesied of love alone. She knew what she knew, and her heart was full of summer and the song of birds. Pelias loved her. She would have staked her soul on it, though she did not realize the desperate turmoil passing in the man's clean heart. Knowing what she did, she was all for sun and moods of radiant thought and happiness. Each day she imagined that she would tell Pelias of her secret. Each day she gave the golden moment to the morrow. She knew how the man's face would flame up with the fullness of great wonder, and like a woman she hoarded anticipation in her heart and waited. The day soon came when Pelias declared himself hale enough to bear armour, though the admission was made with no great amount of satisfaction. To test his strength, he armed himself with Igraine's help, harnessed his black horse, and rode round the island, first at a level pace with Igraine running beside him. Then he tried to gallop, handling spear and shield the while. Lastly, he took Igraine up to him, and rode with her as he had ridden through the wold. Suffering nothing from these ventures, and seeming sure in cell as ever, he declared with heavy heart that they should sally for Winchester on the morrow. Pelias and Igraine passed their last evening in the island under the great cedar in the garden. The place had deep memories for them, and the very loath were they to leave it. So fair and kind a refuge had it proved to them in peril. Neither said much that evening, for their thoughts were busy. As for Pelias, he was glum and heavy-browed as thunder, with a look in his deep eyes that spelt mystery. It was as though he were leaving his very soul in the place to ride out like a corpse on a pilgrimage with despair. How much she might have eased him, perhaps Igraine never knew. The west was already red and rosy, and there was a green hush over the meadows and a canopy of pale porphyry in the east. All the soul of the world seemed to lift white hands to the night in a stupor of mutest woe. Yet the girl's mood tended towards mere sensitive regret, for the future was not dark to her imaginings. "'You are sad, Pelias,' she said. "'I am only thinking, Igraine. "'I am sorry to leave this place.' Pelias sighed for answer. With a contradictory spirit, born of pain, he longed for night and the peace it would not bring, 
Something swore to him that he was more to the girl than man had ever been, and yet she seemed happy when he compared her humour with his own. The possibility that she could dream of broken vows was never in his thought. He could only believe that her heart was less deep than his, and the thought only added bitterness to his meed of sorrow. Igraine, he said anon. She turned to him. You love life? Truth, Pelias, I do. Then love it not, girl. Ah, tis a broken bowl. How so? she said, thrilling. Pelias turned his face from her to hide the strife thereon. He felt as though death was in his heart, yet he spoke as quietly as though he were telling some mundane tale, and not words conjured up by desperate wisdom. Igraine, he said, I have lived and learnt something in my time. My words are honest. On earth, what do we find? A lie on truth's lips, and anguish on the face of joy. The roses bloom and die. White hands shrivel, and harness rusts under the green grass. As for fame, it breeds hate and jealousy, and the curse of the proud. Music is broken by the laugh of the fool, nor can youth forget the crabbed noisomeness of age. Women sing and pass. A man marries one night and is tombed the next. And love, what of love? I tell you, love lives only in the eyes of woe. It is all mockery, cold, damned mockery, I have said. End of Book One, Chapter Eight Section Nine of Uther and Igraine this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. Uther and Igraine by Warwick Deeping. Book One, Chapter Nine. Pelias and Igraine were stirring soon after dawn on the morning of their sally for Winchester. It was a summer dawn, still and stealthy. The meadows were full of a shimmering mist, the mere spirit wrapped, and dappled here and there with gold. Silent and distraught, they made their last meal in the quiet manner. Everything seemed sad and solemn, as though the stones could grieve. The lilies by the impluvium seemed a droop, and the flowers about Pelias's bed were withered. After the meal, Pelias armed himself and went to harness his horse, while Igraine put up bread and foodstuff into a linen cloth for their journey. Before sallying, they went all round the manor, into the chapel, where they prayed before the altar, into bower, parlour, and viridarium. The porch with its empty bed and withered flowers they took leave of last. There was such wistfulness there that even the dumb things seemed to cry out in pain. Pelias closed the gates with bowed head, and made the sign of the cross upon them with the pommel of his dagger. His throat seemed full of one great muffled sob. Together they wandered for the last time through the garden, while Igraine plucked some flowers for a keepsake. Pelias felt that he loved every leaf in the place like his own soul. Then they went down to the water's edge, and getting the horse on board, they loosed the barge from the bank, and came slowly to the nether shore. It might have been the fury of death, so stark and solemn was Pelias's face. Before turning their backs and riding away, they stood and looked long at the place girdled with its quiet waters. The great cedar slept there with a hood of mist over his green pole. Like a dream island, it seemed, plucked by magic from some southern sea, fair with all fairness. Anon, despite their grieving, the last strand cracked, and the wrench was done. They were holding over vapoury meadows, with their faces to the west. Pelias was very stoical that morning. As a matter of fact, he had been awake all night, couched with misery and with thoughts that wounded him. 
All night through the lagging hours he had tossed and turned, cursing his destiny in his heart, too bitter for any prayer. What mockery that he who had passed so long unscathed should fall into hopeless homage to a nun. Desperate, he left his bed in the dark and made the garden a dim cloister until dawn. Yet, in the rack of struggle, a clear voice had come to touch and dominate his being, and day had found him steadfast. He would hold to the truth, he vowed, do his duty, and let God judge of the measure of his gratitude. He could obey, but not with humility. He could suffer, but not with resignation. It was after such a night in the furnace of struggle that he forged his temper for the days to come. He had thought to meet love with stark hardihood, to talk lightly, to go with unruffled brow while his heart hungered. Nothing should move him to any emotion. He would meet destiny like a rock, let surges beat and melt back to the sea. It was better thus, he thought, than go moaning for the moon. Such was the determination that met Igraine's lighter humour that morning. She could make nothing of the man as she rode before him. He was bleak, dismal, yet striving to seem contented with their lot, now conjuring up with a withered smile, now lapsing into interminable silence. His eyes were stern in measure, but there was the old light in them when she looked deeply, and the staunch flame was there still. After all, Pelias's quiet humour did not trouble her very vastly. She had her own reading of the riddle, and a word in her heart that could unlock his trouble. Moreover, she was more than inclined to put him to such a test as should bring his manhood to a splendid trial. Perhaps there was some imp of vanity deep down in her woman's heart. At all events, she suited herself to the occasion, and passed much of the time in thought. A ride of some seventy miles lay before them, before they should come to the gates of Winchester. Much of that region was wild forestland and moor, bleak wastes of scrub let into woods and gloom. Occasional meadows and rare acres of glebe, ringing some rude hamlet, broke the shadowy desolation of the land. Great oaks, gnarled, vast and terrible, held giant sway amid the huddled masses of the lesser folk. Here the boar lurked, and the wolf hunted, but for the most it was dark and calamitous, a ghostly wilderness almost forsaken by man, and given over to the savagery of beasts. Pallias and Igraine came upon the occasional trail of the heathen as they went. A smoking villa, a burnt village with a dun mist hanging over it like a shroud, and once a naked man, bruised and bloody, bound to a tree, and shot through with arrows. Such were the few sights that remembered to them their own need of caution. The wild country had been raided, and its sparse civilization scattered to the woods. The crosses at the crossroads had been thrown down and broken. A hermitage they came on in the woods had been sacked, and in it, to their pity, they found the body of a dead girl. They halted there to pray for her and to give her burial. Pelias dug a shallow grave under an oak, and they left her there and went on their way with greater caution. Not a soul did they meet, yet Pelias kept under cover as much as possible for prudence' sake. He scanned well every valley or piece of open land before crossing it, and kept under the woollen shore whenever the track ran near trees. Fear of the unknown and the dear burden that he bore kept him alert as a goshawk for possible peril. By noon, despite sundry halts and reconnoitrings, they had covered nearly twenty miles, and by the evening of the same day they had added another score, for Pelias's horse was a powerful beast, and Igraine's weight cumbered him little. Towards evening it began to rain, a heavy summer windless shower that made moist rattle in the leaves and flooded fragrant freshness into the air. Pelias gave Igraine his cloak, 
and made her wear it, despite her excuses. As luck would have it, they came upon a little inn, built in the grey shelter of a forsaken quarry. The innfolk were still there, an old woman and a brat of a boy, a grandson. Seeing so great a night, the bedlam was ready enough to give them lodgings, and what welcome she could muster. She spread a supper of goat's milk, brown bread, and venison, not a bad table for such a hovel. The meal over, she pointed Pelias with a leer to a little inner room that boasted a rough bed, a water-pot, and ewer. "'We will not disturb ye,' she said. "'My lad has followed the horses. You would be stirring early?' Pelias gave the woman her orders, and sent a grain into the inner room. He made himself a bed of dried bracken before her door, and laid himself there, so that none could enter save over his body. The woman and the boy slept on straw in a corner. In this wise they passed the night. On the morrow, after more goat's milk and brown bread, with some wild strawberries to smooth it, they sallied early, and held on their way to Winchester. The shower of the night had given place to fair weather, and a fresh breeze blowing from the west. Soon the sun was up in such strength that the green woods lost their dankness and the leaves their dew. It was the very morning for a ride. If possible, Pelias was even more gloomy than on the day before. There was such a level air of dejection over his whole being that Igraine began to have grave qualms of conscience and to suffer the reproaches of a pity that grew more clamorous hour by hour. None the less, Moga the man's sorry humour, there was a certain stealthy joy in it all, for Pelias, by his very moodiness, flattered her tenderness for him not a little. She began to see, in very truth, how staunch the man was, how he meant to honour to the letter her imagined vows, though his love grieved like a winged merlion. His great strength became more and more apparent. A lighter spirit would have gone with the wind, or made great moan over the whole business. Pelias, she saw, was striving to buckle his sorrow deep in his bosom, to save her the pain of knowing his distress. There was nothing little about the man. Palpably, he had not succeeded, eminently, in his attempt to spur a wounded spirit into light courtliness and easy hypocrisy. Still, that was not his fault, it only said the more for his love. It was not till noon had passed that Pelias, with a heavy courage, constrained himself to speak calmly of their parting. Even then, he was so eager to shape his speech into mere courtesies that he overdid the thing, more than betraying himself to the girl's quick wit. He had questioned her as to her friends in Winchester and her purposes for the future. His rambling took somewhat of a didactic turn as he laboured at his mentorship. "'There is a fair abbey within the walls,' he said. "'I have heard it nobly spoken of, both as to devoutness and comfort. Their rules are not of such iron cast as at some other holy houses. The library is good, and there is a well-planted garden.' The abbess is a gracious and kindly woman, and of high family. I have often had speech with her myself, and can vouch for her courtliness and benevolence. Assuredly, you may find very safe and peaceful harbour there. Igraine smiled to herself at the callous benignity of his counsel. He might have been her grandfather by his manner. You see, she said naively, I do not like being caged. It spoils one's temper so. I have an uncle in the place, an uncle by marriage, a man not loved vastly by the proud folk of my own family. He is a goldsmith by trade, and is named Radomanth. Pelias's quick answer was not prophetic of great favour. Radomanth, he said, a gentleman who weighs his religion by the pound, and is seen much at church. Pardon my frankness, I had this gold chain of him. He is rich as Rome, and has high rank among the merchants. So I have heard, she answered. Pelias looked into space with a most judicial air. 
You do not think of going to a secular house, he said. Igraine smiled to herself and halted a moment in her answer. Why not? she said. You? A nun? Pelias, I do not see why it is necessary for holiness to be bricked up like a frog in a wall in order to escape corruption. Why, you are eating your own words. But you have vows, he said. I have, and doubts also. Doubts? quoth the man, with a quick look, thrilling inwardly. Doubts, Pelias, doubts. She caught his eyes with hers, and gave him one long deep stare that made him quake, as though all that had been flame within him, that which he had sought to tread to ashes, had but spread redly into her bosom. There was no parrying such a message. It smote him blind in a moment. The spiritual bastions of his soul seemed to reel and rock, as though some chaos had broken on their stones. There was great outcry in his heart, as of a leaguer when guards and stormers are at grapple on the walls. Cross! Holy cross! cried conscience in the moil. Yield ye! Yield ye! Pelias! sang a voice more subtle. Yield ye, and let love in! He sat stiff in the saddle, and shut his eyes to the day, while the fight boiled on within him. Now love had him heart and hand, now honour, blind and bleeding, struggled in and stemmed the rout. He was won and lost, lost and won, a dozen times in a minute. Recovered somewhat, he made bold to question Igraine yet further. "'Tell me your doubts, girl,' he said. "'They are deep, Pelias, deep as the sea.' "'Whence came they, then?' Some great power put them in my heart, and they are as steadfast as death. Again the wild flush of liberty swept Pelias like wind. Tell me, Igraine, he said in a gasp. She put her fingers gently on his lips. Patience, patience, she said, and perhaps I will tell them to you, Pelias, ere long. Thus much she suffered him to go and no further. Her quick instinct had read him nearly to the explicit, and there she halted, content for an hour or a day. Her love was singing like a lark in the blue. She beamed on the man in spirit streams of pride and tumultuous tenderness. How she would comfort him in the end! He should carry her into Winchester on his horse, and she would lodge there, but not at the great inn that harboured souls for heaven. She would have the bow and the torch for her signs, and possibly the church might serve her in other fashion. Like a lotus-eater, she dallied with all these dreams in her heart. With the sun low in the west, Pelias and Igrain were still three leagues or so from Winchester. The day was passing gloriously, with the radiant acolytes of evening swinging their jasper censers in the sky. The two were riding on a pine-crowned ridge, and the stretch of wilderness beyond seemed wrapped in one mysterious blaze of smoking gold. Hills and woods were glittering shadows, like spirit things in a spirit atmosphere. The west was a great curtain of transcendent gold. Pelias and Igraine could not look at it without great wonder. Presently they came to a little glade, green and quiet, with a clear pool in it ringed round with rushes. A lush cushion of grass and moss swept from the water to the bases of the trees. It was as quaint and sweet a nook as they had passed that day. The place, with its solitude and stillness, pleased Igraine very greatly. "'What say you, Pelias?' she said. "'Let us off-saddle and harbour here the night.' This little refuge will serve us more kindly than a ride in the dark to Winchester. Pelias looked round about him, knelt for once without struggle to his own inmost wishes, and agreed with Igraine. Very good, he said. I can build you a bower to sleep in. There are hazels yonder, just the stuff for a booth. The water in the pool there looks sweet enough to drink, and we have ample in the cloth for a supper. 
Igraine gave him no more leisure to moralize on such trifles. She sprang down to the cushiony turf and took his horse by the bridle. "'I will be master again for once, Pelias,' she said. "'Since, well of your wound, you have played the tyrant. At least you shall obey me to-night.' Pelias, half in a stupor, gave up fighting his own heart for a while, and fell in with Igraine's humour. She was strangely full of smiles and quiet glances. Her eyes would meet his, flash, thrill him, and then evade his soul with sudden mischief. She tethered his horse for him, and then, making him sit under a tree, she began to unarm him, kneeling confidently by his side. Her fingers lingered overlong on the buckles. When she lifted off his helmet, her hands touched his face and forehead and set him blushing like a boy. The very nearness of her, her breath, her dress, her lips and eyes so near to his, made him so much like wax, passive, obedient, yet red as fire. When she had ended her task, she gave him his naked sword and her orders. "'Now you may cut me hazels for a bower, Pelias,' she said. "'I will have it here, under this tree, where the moss is soft and dry. "'This summer night one could sleep under the stars and never feel the dew.' "'Pelias rose up and did her bidding. "'The green boughs were ready to his great sword as it gleamed and glimmered in the wizard light. "'He cut two forked stakes and set them upright in the ground with a pole between them.' Then he built up branches about this centerpiece till the hole was roofed and walled with shelving green. He spread his red cloak therein for a carpet. Igraine sat and watched his labour. Life seemed to have rushed nearly to its zenith, and her thoughts were soaring in regions of gold. The black moth knight had come into the sky with his golden-spotted wings all spread. It was time for idyllic love pure looks and the touch of hands. The billowy bosoms of the trees rolled sombrously above, and the little pool was like a wizard's glass, black and deep with sheeny mysteries. Igraine beckoned Pelias to a seat on the grass bank at her feet when he had finished. There was a light on her face that the man had not seen before, a kind of quiet rapture, a veil of exultation as though her maidenhood were flowering gold under a net of pinkest satin. She had loosened her hair in straight streams upon her shoulders, and her habit lay open to the very base of her shapely throat. She sat there and looked at him, with hands clasped in her lap, and her grey gown rising and falling markedly as she breathed. It seemed to Pelias that there was nothing in the whole universe save twilight, two eyes, a stirring bosom, and two wistful lips. They had been speaking of their ride, and of the many strange things that had befallen them during their adventures together. Igraine had waxed strangely tender in her talk, and had spoken subtle, bodeful words that meant much at such a season. She was flinging bonds about Pelias that made him exult and suffer. His heart seemed great within him and ready to break, for the blood that bubbled and yearned in it in glorious anguish. "'Tomorrow,' said the girl, "'we enter Winchester, and I have known you, Pelias, two weeks and some few hours more. You seem to have been in my life many years.' Words flooded into Pelias's heart and stifled all struggle for a moment. He was breathing like a hunted thing. "'Igraine,' he said. Pelias, I never lived till our lives were joined. Igraine gave a little gasp and bent over him suddenly, her eyes aglow, her hair falling down into his face. Kiss me, Pelias, she said. In the name of God, kiss me. Pelias gave a great groan. Girl, I dare not. You dare? Igraine? She bent herself till her lips were over his, and both their heads were clouded in her hair. Her eyes glimmered, her breath beat on his. He saw the whiteness of her teeth between her half-closed lips. Igraine, 
he said again, half in a groan. She did not answer him, but simply took his face between her hands and looked into his eyes. Coward, Pelias! Power seemed to go from the man in a moment. He put his hands upon her shoulders and looked at her as in a splendid dream. Her face was beautifully peevish, and there lurked an infinite hunger on her lips. Then, with a great woe in his heart, he drew her face down to his and kissed her. There was such a sweet pain in the grand despair of it all that he felt faint for strength of loving. Before he had gathered breath, Igraine had slipped away from him and was in the bower. "'Till dawn, Pelias, till dawn,' she said. "'Ah, Igraine! Go and sleep, Pelias. I will talk to you on the morrow.'" End of Book One, Chapter Nine Section 10 of Uther and Igraine This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mikey Moonflower, Miami, Florida Uther and Igraine by Warwick Deepin Book 1, Chapter 10 with the girl's face lost behind the green eaves of the bower, Peleus fell off a sudden into great darkness of soul. It was as though the moon had passed behind a cloud and left him a grope in the woods, without light and without guide. Igraine had bidden him to go and sleep. She might as well have told the sea to be still in the lap of the wind, going aside towards the mouth of the glade so that he might not disturb the girl. He began to tread the grass between break and break, while he held parley with his turbulent and seeding thoughts. What was the grain to be to him on the morrow? She had broken the back of his determination and beaten down his strength in those grand moments of sudden passion. The rich June of her beauty was still on his sight. Her grace, her infinite tenderness, the purity of her were all set about his soul like angels round a dreamer's bed. She was light and darkness, sound and silence. She had the round world in her red heart, and the stars seemed to go about her in companies of gold. Never had Peleus thought idolatry so smooth and swift a sin. He never believed that love in so brief a space could make such rack of madness in a hale and healthy body. As he walked under the giant limbs of the great trees, he tried to grapple the thing with reason, to untangle this knot by natural logic. These were the bleak facts, and they stood up like white headstones in the night. He loved the grain, and the grain he knew loved them in turn. But a grain was a nun, despite her womanliness, and there lay the core of the whole matter. If he obeyed loved, he must disgrace the girl with broken vows, for like a staunchly taught Christian, of somewhat stern and primitive mold, he stood in honest awe of things spiritual and ecclesiastic. His very love for the girl made him fearful of in any way dishonoring her. If he held the trite observations of a prompted conscience, then he must forswear love and leave a grain to the miserable celibacy of the church, that chrysalid state that never burgeons into the fuller fairer life of perfect womanhood. These were the two forces that held him shaken in the balance. Long while he went east and west under the trees with the old gloom flooding back like thunder. His old thoughts seemed warped into bitterness. The blatant mockery of it all grinned and screamed like a harpy. Again with clarion cry and rosy flush of Banner's love stormed in and held law at that store for a season. Again came the inevitable repulse, the moaning lapse of desire, while the black banner of the church flapped once more over him in dismal sanctity. Peleus found no shred of peace wheresoever he looked. Who has not learnt that when anarchy is in the heart, the whole world seems out of gear? As the night passed, love seemed to faint, 
and wax pale before an ever-darkening visage that declared despair. A sense of inevitable gloom seemed to weigh down desire and to drown hope and misery. Peleus grew calmer at heart, though his thoughts were no less woeful. Love's voice, stifled and wistful, came like an elfin voice through woods, while the cry of conscience was like the thundering surge of the wind through trees. He grew less restless, more apathetic. Coming to a halt, he leaped against an oak's bossy trunk and stood motionless as in a stupor for an hour or more. The blight of soul sickness was on him, and he was like one dazed by a great fever. Presently, he went back slowly to a grain's shelter of bows and stood near it, thinking. Then he dropped on his hands and knees, crept up close, and parting the leaves looked in on her as she slept, wrapped in his red cloak. He could see her face indistinctly white in a wealth of shadows. He could hear her breathing, and he crept away again like a wounded thing, and lay for a time with his face in his arms, grieving without a sound. Again, a second time, he crept to the bower and listened there on his knees. Turning his face to the night, he tried to pray, vainly indeed, for his heart seemed dumb. A corner of a grain's gown lay near his hands at the entry. He went down on hands and knees and kissed it. Then he took the little gold cross from his bosom, the cross Morgan had held, and laid it on the grass at a grain's feet. He also put a purse with a few gold coins in it beside the cross. When he had done this, he crept away mutely and began to arm in silence. Once, as he was buckling on his cast, he thought he heard a grain stirring. He kept very still with a sudden wild wish in his heart that she would wake and save him, but the sound proved nothing. He finished buckling on his harness, girded his sword, and hung his shield about his neck. Then he went to the little pool, and kneeling down, dashed water in his face and drank from his palms. He felt faint and bruised after the night's battle. Once more he went and stood by the hazel shelter as though for a last leave-taking before the strong wrench came. The little pavilion of leaves seemed to hold all hope and human joy in its narrow compass. Peleus stood and took long leave of the girl in his heart. He wished her all the fair fortune he could think of prayed for her as well as he could in a broken, wounded way, and then with a great sob he turned and left her sleeping. His black horse was tethered not far away. As he went he staggered, and seemed blind for a moment. He soon had the girths tightened, and was in the saddle riding away, dried-eyed and broken soul, into the night. Presently the dawn came, redly, glorious, like a marriage pageant. A grain, reft from dreams, woke with a little shiver of joy in her pavilion of green bows. She lay still a while, and let her thoughts dance, like the motes in the shimmer of sunlight that stole in between the branches. The day seemed warm and glorious, for that morning was she not to tell Peleus of the secret she had kept from him so many days. The words she had hoarded in her heart like love, it would be a fitting end she thought, to the rare novitiate each had passed in the heart of the other. Hearing no stir about her shelter, she thought Peleus asleep, and peeped out presently between the bows to bid him wake. Glade and pool lay peacefully in green and silver, but she saw no knight sleeping, no war horse standing under the trees. Starting up, the gold cross glinting on the grass, with the purse beside it, appealed her with mute tragedy. She caught them up, trembling, and with sudden fear in her heart she went out into the glade and searched from break to break. It was barren as her joy. Peleus had gone. End of Book One, Chapter Ten Section Eleven of Uther and Igraine this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thor Van Walsam in Hardwick, Vermont. For more information on this reader, please visit ThorVWIs.cool. Uther and Igraine by Warwick Deeping. Book 2, Chapter 1. Radamanth the goldsmith was held in no little honor and esteem by the townsfolk of Winchester. Even the market women and the tavern loungers stood aside for him in the street as he made his stately march in black robe and chain of gold. He was a man possessed of those outward virtues so well suited to commend a character to the favor of the world. He was venerable, rich, and much given to charity. His coffers were often open to infirmary and church. His house near the market square was as richly furnished as any noble's, and he gave good dinners. No man in Winchester had a finer aptitude for pleasing all classes. He was smooth and intelligent to the rich, bland and neighborly to his equals, quite a father to the poor, and, moreover, he had no wife. Every Sabbath he went at the head of his household to the great basilica church in the chief square, worshipped and did alms as a rich merchant should. Disinterestedness is a somewhat unique virtue, and it must not be supposed that Radamanth lived with his eye on eternity alone. It must be confessed that self-interest was often the dial of his philanthropy, and expediency to him the touchstone of action. Nothing furthers commerce better than a pious and merciful reputation, and Radamanth knew the inestimable value of a solid and goodly exterior. Wise in his generation, he nailed the cross to his door, and plied his balances prosperously behind the counter. Thus, when the girl Igraine trudged sad-eyed into Winchester in her gown of grey, and appeared before him as a homeless child of the church, he took her in like the good uncle of the fairy tale, and proffered her his house for home. Possibly he pitied her for her plight after the burning of the Evangel, for she seemed much cast down in mind and very deserving of a kinsman's proper comfort. Then she was of noble family, a coincidence that no doubt weighed heavily in Radamanth's opinion. It was good to have so much breeding in the house— to be able to say with a smirk to his friends and neighbors, My niece, the daughter of Malgo, lord of the Redlands, slain and plundered of the heathen in Kent. Igraine brought quite a luster into Radamanth's home. He beamed on her with sleek pride and satisfaction, gave her rich stuffs for dress, a goodly chamber, and a little Silurian maid to wait. Moreover, he gave his one child and daughter Lilith a grave lecture on sisterly companionship, advised her to study Igraine's gentle manners and to profit by her aristocratic and educated influence. Luckily, Lilith was a quiet girl, not given to jealousy or much self-trust, and Igraine found as warm a welcome as her unhappy heart could wish. No few days had passed since that dawn on the hill above Winchester when Igraine had started up from under the green boughs to find Peleus gone. They had been days of keen trouble for the girl. Often and often had she hated herself for her vain delay, her over-tender procrastination that had brought misery in place of joy. The past was now a wounded dream to her, ripe and beautiful, yet fruited with such mute pain as only a woman's heart can feel. A grain had conjured up love like some eastern house of magic, only to see its domes faint goldly into a gloom of night. She felt as much for Peleus as for herself, and there was a blight upon her that seemed as though it could never pass. She was not a woman given to tears. Her trouble seemed to live in her eyes with pride, and to stiffen her stately throat into a pillar of rebellious strength. Not a word, not a sign, had come to her of Peleus. Taken into Radamanth's house, served, petted, flattered, she went drearily through it daily round, sat at its board, talked with the guest folk, while hope waited wide-eyed in her heart and kept her brave. Peleus had told her that he was for Winchester, and assuredly, she thought, she might find him and confess all. 
She often kept watch hour by hour at her window overlooking the street. In her walks she had a glance for almost every man who passed on foot or horseback, till she grew almost ashamed of herself and feared for her modesty. Her eyes always hungered for a red shield and harness, a black horse, a face grieving in dark reserve and silence. At night she was often quite a child in herself. She would even take the little gold cross from her bosom and brood over it. She even found herself whispering to the man as she lay in bed and stretching out her arms to him, in the dark as in pain. For all her pride and courage, she was often bowed down and broken when no one was near to see. It was not long before she found a confidant to befriend her in her distress of heart. Lilith, the goldsmith's daughter, had great brown eyes, soft and very gentle. Her face was wistful and white under her straightly combed hair. She was a quiet girl, timid, but very thoughtful for others. The two appealed each other by contrast. Lilith had soon read trouble in Igraine's eyes and had nestled to her in soul, ready with many little kindnesses that were like dew in a dry season. Igraine unbent to her and suffered herself to be enfolded by the other's sympathy. One day she told her the whole distressful tale. It was in the garden behind the house, a green and pleasant place opening on the river and flanked with stone. The two were in an arbor framed of laurels, its floor mosaiced with quaint tiles. Igraine sat on a bench with Lilith on a stool at her feet. They were both sad, for Lilith was a girl whose heart answered strongly to any tale of unhappy mood. Igraine had made mere truth of the matter, neither justifying nor embellishing. Her clear, bleak words were the more pathetic for their very simpleness. Lilith had been crying softly to herself. Her brown eyes were very misty when she turned her white face to Igraine's with a grievous little sigh. "'What can I say to you?' she said. "'Nothing,' said Igraine, taking her hands and smiling through misery. "'I have never the words I wish for, and when I feel most I can say little. "'You understand. That is enough for me.' "'Ah,' said Lilith, with a fine blush and a shy look, "'I think I can feel for you, Igraine, almost to the full.' though I seem such an Agnes. I am woman enough to have learnt something that means all to a girl. I am very sad for your sake. Child, I will try to comfort you. Igraine's eyes burned. She kissed Lilith on the lips and was mute. For a while they sat with their arms about each other, not daring to look into each other's eyes. Then the girl kissed Igraine's cheek and touched her hair with her slim fingers. "'Perhaps I can help you,' she said. "'Help me?' Lilith flushed and spoke very quickly. "'Yes, to find Peleus. "'I tell you what I will do. "'I will send a friend of mine to question all the guards at the gates "'whether they have seen such a one as you have described right in.' "'Igraine hugged the girl. "'And then you say, this Peleus was in the king's service. "'I have never heard of a knight so named, but there are so many, "'and I hear only gossip. "'I know a girl in the king's household.' I will go and ask her whether she knows of a tall, dark knight whose color is red, who rides a black horse, and is named Peleus. You do not know how much I may not learn from her. I feel wise already. Igraine plucked up in heart and spirit. She felt sorry that she had not spoken of her trouble to Lilith before, for she had lost many days trusting to her own eyes and her little knowledge of the town. She kissed the girl again and almost laughed. Then, in a flash, she remembered a speech of Peleus's which she had forgotten till that moment. "'Fool that I am,' she said. "'The very chain he wore had it from your father, and here in my bosom I have the little cross that nigh lost him his life. Surely this may help us in some measure.' Lilith looked at the cross that Igraine had taken from under her tunic, where it hung by a little chain about her neck. "'We will show it to my father,' said the girl, "'and ask him thereof.' He may have record of such a chain, and to whom it was sold. Who knows? Come, Igraine, we will show it to him after supper, if you wish. And again Igraine kissed her. It was Radamanth's custom, after the business of the day had been capped by an honest supper, to sit in his parlor and drink wine with certain of his friends. He had a particular gossip, an old fellow named Udal, who had been a merchant in his time and had retired with some wealth. 
These two would spend many an evening together over their wine, taking enough to make their tongues wag, but never exceeding the decent warmth of moderation. Udall was a lean old gentleman, with a white beard and a most patriarchal manner. He was much of a woman's creature, and loved a pretty face and a plump figure, and he would father any wench who came in his way with a benignity that often made him odious. He had a soft voice, and a sleek, silken way with him that made folk think him the most tender-souled creature imaginable. These two were at their wine together when Lilith and Igraine went in to them that evening. Radamanth, since his spouse's death, had grown as much a father as trade and the getting of gold permitted. In his selfish, matter-of-fact way, he was fond of this timid, brown-eyed creature he called daughter. His affections boasted more of science than of sentiment. Lilith, unusually bold, went and sat on the arm of his chair, and patted his face in a half-shy, half-mischievous fashion. Udall laughed, and shook his head with a critical look at Igraine. "'More begging,' quoth he. "'So, Cousin Igraine, you look fresh as a yellow rose in the sun.' Igraine laughed and sat down to talk to him, while Lilith questioned her father. The goldsmith bore his daughter's caresses with a sublime and patient resignation. She began to tell him about the chain, keeping a grain and her tail wholly in the background. When she had said enough for the sake of explanation, she showed her father the cross and waited his words. Radamanth fingered it, turned it this way and that, and found his own mark thereon. "'I wrought in chains as you describe,' he said. "'But what is such a chain to you, child, and whence came this cross?' Lilith flushed, hesitated, and glanced at Igraine. The cross is mine, quoth the latter. Radamanth eyed her as though he were not a little desirous of questioning her further, but there was a very palpable coldness on his niece's face that forbade any such curiosity. He had a most hearty respect for the girl's pride, and never dreamt of any degree of tyranny that might seem vulgarly plebeian to her more noble notions. The remembrance of her parentage and estate had always a most emollient effect upon his mind. "'Well, well,' he said, "'I'll meddle discreetly and go no further than I am asked.' Udall winked at the company at large. "'Never ask a lady an uncomfortable question,' quoth he. Lilith beamed at him shyly. "'You are very wise,' she said. Radamanth rose from his chair and, going to a great press, took a book from it. He set the book on the table and, after much turning of pages, discovered the record that he sought. Following the scrawling lines with his finger, he read aloud from the ledger. Gold chain of special weight. Large links, two gold crosses pendant over either breast. Of such three were wrought and sold. The first to Bedivere, knight of the king's guard. Nota bene, unpaid for. Udall set up a sudden brisk cackle. The man, the very man, I'll swear. Igraine gave him a look that made his mouth close like a trap and his body stiffen in his chair. Radamanth continued his reading. The second chain was sold to John of Glastonbury, the third to the most noble Uther, Prince of Britain. Radamanth closed the book and returned it to the press, orderly even in trifles. Lilith and Igraine had exchanged a mute look that meant everything. Slipping away without a word to either man, they went to Igraine's bedroom, a great chamber hung with heavy red hangings and richly garnished. A carved bed stood in the center. The two girls sat on it and stared into each other's eyes. Igraine was breathing fast, and her face was pale. "'You know Bedivere?' she said. Lilith shook her head. "'Or John of Glastonbury?' "'No. "'Or Uther?' Lilith's brown eyes brightened. "'Noble Uther, I have seen,' she said, "'riding through Winchester on a black horse.' A dark man, and sad-looking. He would be much like your Peleus. Igraine went very white. There seemed a race of thoughts in her as she played the statue with her eyes at gaze and her lips drawn into a line of red. Her hands hung limply over the edge of the bed, and she seemed stiffened into musings. Lilith sidled close to her and put her warm arms round her neck, her soft cheek to Igraine's. We may learn yet, she said. Uther, said Igraine as in a dream, can it be? Igraine drew a long breath and sighed like one waking. I must see him, was all she said. Lilith kissed her. 
I will go to the king's house tomorrow, she said. The girl may tell us something of use. I have heard it said that Uther has not been in Winchester for many a week. Ah, Egraine, if it should be he. They looked deep into each other's eyes and smiled as only women can smile when their hearts are fast in sympathy. Then they went to bed in Egraine's bed and slept the night through in each other's arms. Early the next day they went together to the king's house that stood by the gardens and the river. At the kitchen quarters, Lilith inquired for the girl who served as a maid in the household. Being constrained by a most polite lackey, she went in to see the woman, while Igraine kept her pride and herself in the porch, and watched the people go by in the street. Presently Lilith came out again with a frown on her mild face, and her brown eyes troubled. She took Igraine aside into the gardens that lined the great highway skirting the palace, and led her to where a fountain played in the sun and stone seats ringed in a quiet pool. White pigeons were there, cocketing and sweeping the ground with their spread tails, their low cooing mingling with the musical plashing of the water. An old beggar woman sat hunched in a corner, and three or four children were feeding the fish in the pool. All about them the gardens were thickly shadowed with great trees and glistening lusty laurels. Igraine looked into Lilith's face. I see no news in your eyes, she said. Lilith brooded at the pool and the children, and seemed disquieted, even angry. I have learnt little, Egraine, she said, and am disappointed. I will tell you how it was. The old wretch who oversees the women found me talking with the girl Gwyneth, read me a sermon on interfering with household work, scolded me for a young gossip, and had me packed off like a beggar. What a harridan! I have learned little. Quick, I first. Lilith hurried on for sympathy. The girl had never heard of a knight named Peleus, she said, and there are so many dark men about court that your description was little guide. As for Uther, no one knows where he is at present. Folk are not disquieted, for he seems to be ever riding away into the woods on adventure. So much gossip could read me. Egraine's face clouded. Did you ask of Bedivere? she said. Oh, yes. A silly, vain fellow, with a red beard and sandy hair. And John of Glastonbury? Gwyneth could tell me nothing of that man. Dame Martha caught us talking, and it was then she scolded. The ugly, red-faced old hen. She said, and Lilith blushed, that I was an idle, silly hussy, to gad and gossip after court gentlemen. Now, that wasn't fair. Was it, Egraine? No, dear. I should like to have a talk with Dame Martha. Lilith rose to the notion. She would never scold you, Egraine. You look far too stately. Simpleton, a scold would spat her, Gabriel. Well, if I were Gabriel, I know what I should do to Dame Martha. You quiet-faced thing. Why, you are quite a vixen after all. Ah, Egraine, was there ever a woman without a temper? No, dear, and I wouldn't give a button for her either. Suddenly, as they sat and talked, the beggar woman lifted up her head to listen, and the children turned from feeding the fish in querulous, childish wonder. There was something strange in the wind. Igraine and Lilith heard a gradual sound rising afar over the city, a noise as of men shouting, a noise that waxed and waned like the roar of surges on a beach. It grew, rushed nearer like a storm through the trees, deep, sonorous, triumphant. The girls sat mute for a moment, and looked at each other in conjecture. What can it be? God knows. The heathen? Not that shout. Then, Uther. Egraine caught a deep breath. Listen, it comes nearer. Come away, I must see. Passing through the gardens, they came again to the highway skirting the palace. Men, women, brats, monks, all Christendom, seemed swarming up from the city, and there was already a great throng in the street. The breeze of shouting came nearer each moment. Igraine climbed the pediment of a statue that rose above the balustrading of the gardens. The ledge gave room to both Lilith and herself. Together they stood and looked down on the crowd that began to swarm at their feet. Soldiers, nobles, dirty craftsmen, courtesans, fat housewives, churchmen, their small prides lost in one common curiousness. The street seemed mosaic with color. The broken words and cries of the crowd were flung up to a grain like so much foam. Gorlos, you say? Noble Gorlos, 
A thousand heathen. What? All slain? Where? Under the walls of Anderida. Come to my house, and I will give you red wine and play to you on the Sithern. Thank the virgin, great Gorlois. If it is true, I'll burn twenty candles. Give over trampling me. A thousand heathen. Ho! There! Some rogues thieved my purse. They are coming. Let's shout for him, great Gorlois. Up between the stone fronts of the palace and the dwindling houses and the rolling green of the gardens came a blaze of gold and purple, of white, green, blue, and scarlet, a gross glare of steel thundered on with the tramp of men and the cry of many voices. A river of armor seemed to flow with a brazen magnificence between the innumerable heads of the crowd. Clarions were braying, bannerals a dance. The sun flashed on helmet and shield and made a brave blaze on the flanks of the great serpent of war as it swayed through the thundering street, arrogant, triumphant, glorious. Well in the van rode a knight on a great white horse. His armor was all of gold, his trappings white with gold borders, and stars of gold scattered thereon. His baldric was set with jasper, his sword and scabbard marvelous with beryl and sardonyx. A coronet gemmed with one great ruby circled his cask and shot red gleams at the archer sun. Behind him came a veritable grove of spears, lusty knights, their saddles weighed down with the spoil of battle, with torque, bracelet, sword, and axe. Further yet came pikemen, mass on mass, bearing each on his spear point a heathen head, pageant of leers, frowns, scowls of red wrath, wild eyes, blood, and blood-tangled hair. The great knight on the white horse rode with a certain splendid arrogance, and his eyes were full of fire under the arch of his cask. It was easy to see that the noise and pomp were like wine to him, and that his pride blazed like a beacon in the wind. Gorlois! Great Gorlois! thundered the crowd. By the palace there was such a press that the white horse came to a halt, hemmed in by a sea of vociferous faces. A grain in a gown of violet was leaning from her statue and looking at Gorlois. Her glance seemed to magnetize him, for he turned and stared full at the girl as she stood slightly above him in the glory of her beauty and her pride. Long looked Gorlois, like a man smitten with a sudden charm. Then he wrenched the coronet from his cask, and, spurring his horse through the crowd, rode close to the statue whose knees were clasped by Igraine's arm. It was the statue of fame, crowned by love, with a wreath of laurels. So Gorlois, with his head bowed, held up the coronet on the cross of his sword, and gave Igraine his glory. End of Book Two, Chapter One Recording by Thor Van Walsam in Hardwick, Vermont To read things I have written, visit thorvwis.cool Section 12 of Uther and Egrain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thor Van Walsam in Hardwick, Vermont. For more information on this reader, please visit ThorVWIs.cool. Uther and Egrain by Warwick Deeping. Book 2, Chapter 2. Splendid in arms, magnificent in fortune, Gorlois of Cornwall held high place in the war lore and romances of the Green Isle of Britain. Ask any pikeman or gallowglass whose crest he would have advance in the van in the tough tussle of a charge home, and he would tell you of Gorlois or of Uther. Question any merchant as to the most prolific purse in the kingdom, and he would beam seraphically and talk to you of Gorlois. So much for the man's reputation. Physically, he was tall, big-chested, lean-limbed, with a square jaw and eyes that shone ever alert, as though watching a knife in an enemy's hand. You could read the swift, soaring, masterful spirit of him in the bleak lines of his handsome face— and the soldierly carriage of his head. He was quick as a hawk, supple and springy as a willow, keen and eager in his action as a born fighter should be. 
When you saw him move, the lean, hard fiber of him seemed as tense and tough as the string of a five-foot bow. Though he might seem to the eye all impulse, there was a leopard reason in him that made him the more formidable. He was no mere fighting machine, rather a man of brain and sinew, whose cunning went far to back his strength. Meliogrant ruled in Cornwall in those days. Meliogrant, who was to rear young Tristan for the plaguing of Mark, and the love of the fair Isolt. Gorlois was Meliogrant's nephew, holding many castles, woods, and wild coastlands towards Lyonnais, lording it also over other lands in Britain, houses in London and Winchester, and some mountainous regions in Gore, where Urians held sway. Mordaunt had been his father, a great knight who had done many brave deeds in his day. His grandsire, Gravain, famed for his wisdom, had fought abroad and died in battle. Gorlois had ancestry enough to breed worship in him, and after Ambrosius and Black Uther, he held undoubted precedence of all knights in Britain. Unblemished fortune is not always the nurse best suited to the dandling of a man's mind. It had been so with Gorlois. He was one of those beings whose life seemed to promise nothing but triumphal processions and perpetual bays of victory. Selfishness is such a glittering garment that it needs a great light to reveal its true texture to the wearer. Flattered, praised, obeyed, bent to, it became as natural for Gorlois to expect the homage of circumstance as to look for the obedience of his cook. There was much that was Greek about him in the worst sense, a certain sensuous brilliancy that aimed at making life a surfeit of rare sensations, with an infinite indifference for the hearts of others. Gorlois liked to see life swinging round him like a dance, while he stood pedestaled in the center, an earthly jove. The man had given Igraine his coronet on the cross of his great sword. That meant much for Gorlois. He was not a gentleman who had need to trouble his wits about women, for there were many enough ready to ogle their eyes out in his service. Yet, in his keen way, he had conceived a strong liking for the girl's face. A species of sudden admiration had leapt out of him, and brought him in some wonder to a realization of the power of a pair of eyes. Igraine was such a one as would attract the man. In the first place she was very fair to look upon, a point of some importance. She was tall, big of body, and built for grace and strength, things pleasant to Gorlois's humor. Above all, she was proud and implacable, no giggling Franian hardly worth the kissing, and Gorlois had grown past the first blush of experiences of heart. He was sage enough to know that a woman lightly won is often soon lost, or not worth the winning. Let a man's soul sweat in the taming of her, and there is some chance of his making an honest bargain. Moreover, like many a man of restless, soaring spirit, Gorlois ever hungered for romance, and the mysterious discomforts and satisfactions that hedge the way into a woman's bosom. Certain men are never happy unless they have the firebrand of love, making red stir for them in heart and body. Of some such stuff was Gorlois. He had a soul that doted on nights spent at a window under the moon. All the thousand distractions, the infinite yet atomic cares, the logical sweats of reasoning were particularly pleasant to his fancy. He loved the color, the exaltation, the heroism, the desperate tenderness of it all. Battle, effort, ambition lost half their sting for Gorlois when there was no woman in the coil. Igraine's home was known to him, thanks to the apt vigilance of a certain page much in favor with Gorlois for mischief and cunning. The boy had Igraine's habits to perfection in a week or two. By making love to the girl who served her, he put himself into the way of getting almost any tidings he required. Every morning he would slip out early, meet Igraine's girl, Isolde, under the shadow of the garden wall and under the cover of a kiss— he would inquire what her mistress might be doing that day, pretending, of course, that his interest on such a subject merely arose from his desire to have Igraine out of the way and her girl free. 
The lad quite enjoyed the game, his soul being a giggling black-eyed wench who loved mischief. Of course, he ended by falling in love with the reckless earnestness of a boy, but that kept him well to business. Betimes, he would run home and tell his master where a grain would probably be seen that day. Gorloise's proud face began to come into the girl's life at every turn. Igraine would see him often from her window as he rode by on his white horse, looking up and very eager to greet her. He would pass her in the aisles of the great basilica in the market, walking in gold and scarlet amid silks and cloths from the east, vases, armor, skins of the tiger and camelopard, flowers, fruit, wine, and all manners of merchandise. On the river which ran by the end of Radamanth's garden, his barge often swept past with the noise of oars and music, and a gleam of gold over the hurrying water. In the orchards without the walls, his face would come suddenly upon her through a mist of green, and she would be conscious of his eyes and the nearness of his stride. One Sunday morning she found him laving his hands in the labrum beside her, before entering the long narthex porch of the church, and he was near her all through the service, watching her furtively, noting the graceful curves of her figure as she knelt, the profusion of her hair, a thousand little things that are much to a man. When the sacrament was given, he knelt close beside her and touched the cup where her lips had been. Apparently, Gorlois was content for a while with the rich delight of gazing. His bearing was courteous enough, and he never exposed her to any public rudeness that could warrant her in resenting his persistent, though distant, homage. The great baths of Winchester stood in a little hollow near the southern gate of the city, a white pile of stone set about with quiet gardens. They had fallen into some decay and disrepute, but still in the summertime girls and men of the richer classes went thither to bathe. On sunny mornings in the great marble bath of the women, girls would flash their white limbs and sport like naiads in the laughing water. Afterwards they would have their hair dressed in perfume, and then go to sun themselves in the rose walks like eastern odalisks. The music of flute and cithern might often be heard in the grass-grown peristyles. The library attached to the place had once boasted many scrolls and tomes, but it had long ago been pillaged by the monks of the great abbey. Lilith had taken a grain there more than once. One morning Igraine had bathed, tied her hair, and passed out into the garden alone. The place was of some size, boasting twenty acres or more full of winding paths, grass glades, and knolls of bushy shrubs, where one might lose oneself as soon as think. Children often played hide-and-seek there, and idling up some green walk, you might catch a giggling girl with hair flying, bursting out of some thicket with a lad in full chase. Or in some shady lawn, you might come upon a company of children, dancing as solemnly as little elves to the sound of a pipe. Nooks and grass walks were almost deserted at this hour, the gardens being most favored towards the evening, when the day was marked by a deepening discretion. Igraine had no purpose in the place. She knew that Lilith was somewhere within its bounds. She also knew that Lilith had no particular need of her that morning, and as the day was hot and slothful, Igraine's only ambition was to waste her time as pleasantly as possible till noon. Turning round a holly hedge that hid a statue of Cupid, she came full upon a woman seated on the stone bench that ringed the statue's pedestal. The woman wore a light blue tunic, and a purple gown that ran all along the seat in curling masses. She was combing her fair hair as though she had only lately come from the bath. Her white, glimmering arms were bare to the elbow, and she was humming a song to the sway of her hair, while many rings laughed on her slim white fingers. She had not heard Igraine's step upon the grass, but saw suddenly her shadow stealing along in the sun. Lifting her face, she stared, knew on the instant, and went red and gray by turns. Her comb halted, tangled in a strand very quiet, and big about the eyes. Igraine remembered well enough where she had seen that would-be innocent stare, and that loose little mouth that seemed to bud for lawless kisses. Morgan, with her face as white as her bosom, drew the comb from her hair and flourished it uneasily betwixt her fingers. She was frightened as a mouse at the tall girl standing big and imperious so near, 
and her eyes were furtive for chance of flight. A grain in her heart was in no less quandary than was dead Madden's wife. She could prove nothing against the woman, for Peleus was lost in a way, and even the man's name might be a myth likely to involve further mystery. She had as much to fear, too, from Morgan's tongue, as Morgan had from her knowledge of that night in the island manor. Morgan, too flurried for sudden measures, sat biting her lips, while her blue eyes were with a restless caution. Neither woman said a word for fully a minute, but each eyed each other like a couple of cats, each waiting for the other to move. The shrubs around were so still that you might imagine they were listening, while Cupid, poised on one foot, drew his bow very much at a venture. "'Good morning, holy sister,' Igraine said never a word. "'I am glad to see you so improved in dress that olive-green gown looks so well on you.' Still no retort. "'By the saints, sister, you are very silent. I hope you were not kept long on that island.' Igraine arched her eyebrows and gave the girl a stare. She knew what a coward Morgan was and guessed she was in a holy panic, despite her cool impudence and seeming ease of mind. Womanlike, she conceived a sudden strong desire to have Morgan whimpering and groveling at her feet, for there is some satisfaction in terrorizing an enemy, even if one can do no more. I presume, madame, she said, you thought me safely packed away in that island, and likely to die of hunger or be taken by heathen. Morgan forced a smile, and began to bind her hair for the sake of having something to do in the full glare of Igraine's great eyes. "'You did not think I could swim. Madame, I could think anything of you. Nuns are so clever. After all, I am not a nun. Of course. You could not be bothered with vows in summertime. I turned nun myself once for a month, it being convenient.' Igraine began to fret and lose patience. "'You are over-venturesome, madam,' she said, "'in coming to Winchester. "'So, I believe they hang folk here at times. "'They might even break your slim white neck.' "'Morgan's lips twitched, but she did not blench from the argument. "'You speak of hanging,' she said, "'and the inference is rather peculiar. "'Listen a moment, my good convent saint. Your knight on the black horse would most certainly have needed the rope if my man had not mended vengeance with that poniard. Peleus and the gallows. You're a fool. Morgan smiled back at her very prettily. After all, your man did first murder, she said, on a traitor cur Andred's world. Madam, my husband... The woman's contention was not so illogical when Agrain came to consider it in a less personal light. Morgan may have loved the man Madan for all she knew, and she could feel for her in such a matter. She looked at her with less scorn for the moment and less injustice of thought. Perhaps you have grieved much, she said. Morgan gave a blank stare. Grieved? You loved your husband? I did, while he lived. And no longer? What is the use of wasting one's youth on a corpse? Igraine retracted her late sympathy and returned to enmity. Morgan had risen, and was ruffling herself like a swan in her part of the great lady, and gathering her purple gown round her slim figure with infinite affectation. I cannot see that we have cause to quarrel further, she suggested. Indeed. Seemingly we are quits, good sister morality. I have lost my man, you yours. You are very logical, said Egrain. Why should we women grieve? Why, indeed? There are many more men in the world. Madame, I do not understand you. Morgan gave a malicious little laugh that ended in a sneer. She touched her hair with her jeweled fingers, blew a kiss to Cupid, and again laughed in her sly, mischief-making way. In a moment, words were out of her lips that set Igraine's face ablaze, her heart at a canter, and mulled all further parley. Morgan saw trouble, dodged and ran around the statue. Igraine was too quick for her, and winding fingers into the woman's hair gave her a cuff that would have set a helmet ringing. 
Morgan tripped and fell, dragging Igraine with her, and for a moment there was a struggle, green and purple mixed. Igraine, the heavier and stronger, came aloft on the other soon. Then a knife flashed out. Morgan got two quick strokes in, one on the girl's shoulder, a second in her left forearm. Igraine lost her grip and fell aside in a stagger of surprise and pain, while Morgan, taking her chance, squirmed away, slipped up and ran like a rabbit. She was out of sight and sound before Igraine had got back her reason. Here was a pretty business. The girl's sleeve was already red and soaked, and the slit cloth showed a long red streak in the plump white of her flesh. Blood was welling up and dripping fast to the grass at her feet. Despite the smart of her wounds and her temper, she saw it would be mere folly to chase Morgan. Following instinct, she ran for home, holding her right hand pressed over her shoulder. In the main avenue, who should she meet but Gorlois, carried in a litter, and looking out lazily from behind half-drawn curtains. His quick eyes caught sight of Igraine as she passed. He saw the blood in the girl's white face, and he was out of the litter like a stag from cover, and at her side with spirited concern. Igraine was white and half-dazed, her green gown soaked and stained. Her eyes trembled up at Gorlois as she showed him her gashed arm, with a smile and a little whimper that made him storm. "'Who did this?' He had stripped off his cloak and was tearing it in strips, while his jaw stiffened. An old foe of mine. Describe him. A woman, my lord. The damned vixen! Her dress? Blue tunic and gown of purple. Gorlois turned to certain servants who stood round gaping at the girl in her blood-stained dress, and their lord tearing his cloak into bandages with characteristic furor. Search the gardens. A woman in blue and purple. Have her caught— by my sword, I'll hang her. He rent Igraine's sleeve to the shoulder and wound the strips of his cloak about her arm with a strength that made her wince. Pardon, he said in his quick, fierce way. This will serve a season, stern heart, good surgeon. Igraine smiled and made light of it while he knotted the bandage. Some of his men had scattered among the shrubs and into the dark alleys of the place, for Igraine could hear them trampling and calling to each other. While she listened and before she could hinder him, Gorlois had lifted her as though she had been but a sheaf of corn, and laid her in the litter. He drew the curtains. The bearers were at the poles, and setting off at a good stride, they were soon in the town. By the time they reached Radamanth's doorway, Igraine, despite her spirit, was faint from loss of blood and all a tremble. Gorlois, tersely imperious, lifted her up as she lay half-dazed and stupid, carried her in his arms into the house, and, taking guidance from a white-faced maid, bore Igraine above to her chamber, and laid her on her bed. Then he kissed her hand, and, leaving her to the women, hurried off to send skilled succour. End of Book Two, Chapter Two Recording by Thor Van Walsam in Hardwick, Vermont To read things I have written, visit thorvwis.cool Section 13 of Uther and Igraine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thor Van Walsam in Hardwick, Vermont. For more information on this reader, please visit ThorVWIs.cool. Uther and Igraine by Warwick Deeping. Book 2, Chapter 3. It was not long before Gildas, the court physician, a dear old scoundrel with a white beard and a portentous face, came down in state to attend on Igraine. He was an old gentleman of most solemn soul. His dignity was so tremendous a thing that you might have imagined him a solitary atlas, holding the whole world's health upon his shoulders. He soon dabbled his fingers in Igraine's wound, and that morning dropped in oil and balmed them with myrrh and unguence under a dressing of clean cloth. He frowned all the time, as was his custom in the sick chamber, as though wisdom lay heavy on his soul, or at least as though he wished folk to think so. The only time you saw Gildas smile was when you paid him a fee or complimented him upon his knowledge. Tickle his pocket or his vanity, and he beamed on you. That morning he told Radamanth that his niece's wounds were serious, 
but that he trusted that they would heal innocently, treated as they had been by credited skill. Gildas always pulled a long face over a patient's possibilities. Such discretion kept him from pitfalls and enabled him to claim all the credit when matters turned out happily. The streaks of scarlet in the white waste of skin soon died cleanly into mere bands of pink, and Igraine had little trouble from her wounds thanks to the great Gildas. In fact, she was in bed but three days, while Lilith played nurse, chatted and sang to her, or leant at the open window to tell her of those who passed in the street. Master Gildas came and went, morning and evening, with the prodigious regularity of the sun. The girls aped him behind his back, and Igraine, with some ingratitude to science, made Lilith empty the ruby-colored physic out of the window. It happened to spatter a lean booby of a man as he passed, who, looking up, flattered himself that Lilith must have sprinkled him with scented water by way of showing her affection. So much for Gildas's rose water and flowers of dill. The man of physic marched each day like a god into Gorlois's house to tell how the Lady Igraine fared at his hands. Such patronage was worth much to Gildas, and knowing how the wind blew, he puffed religiously upon the new-kindled fire. The girl's glamour had caught up Gorlois in a golden net. He had loved to look upon her and to dream, but now the perfume of her hair, the warm softness of her body— the very odor of her shed and scarlet blood were memories in him that would not fade. One evening, a posy of flowers came tumbling in at Igraine's window. Lilith looked out and saw Gorlois. For the Lady Igraine, were his words. Lilith smiled down and ventured to tell him that Igraine was much beholden to his courtesy and succor, and would thank him with her own lips when well of her wounds. She took the flowers to Igraine, who was listening in bed in the twilight. "'Shall I throw a flower back?' asked the girl. "'It would be courteous.' "'Lilith did so. "'The bloom struck Gorlois on the mouth like a blown kiss. "'The man put the thing in his bosom with a great smile, "'and went home to spend some hours like a stargazer in his garden, "'while his musicians tuned their strings behind the bushes. "'At such a season Gorlois loved sound and color. "'The voices, sweetly melancholic, thrilled up into the night. Her head is of brighter gold than the broom flower, her breast like foam under her green tunic, like a summer sky at night are her glances, her fingers are as wooden enemies in a daze of dew, of her lips who shall tell the gates of a sunset where love dies, her limbs are like may blossoms, bedded on a green couch. The night sighs for her, and for the touch of her hand. Of course, Morgan had escaped capture. Gorlois's men had hunted an hour or more, and had caught nothing, not even a glimpse of the purple gown for which they searched. Radamanth, who had had the affair from Gorlois's own lips, came and told Igraine, and began to ask her who this woman foe of hers was. Igraine put him off with a fable. She had no thought of letting him have knowledge of her love for Peleus, and she was glad in measure that Morgan had escaped capture, and so left her secret in oblivion. The woman might have proved troublesome if brought to bay, for she had as much right to claim the truth as had Igraine. Better let a snake go than take it by the tail. In a week or so, there was nothing left to mark the incident save the red lines in Igraine's white skin. Flowers and fruit came daily in from Gorlois, and every evening there was music under the window, till she began to consider these perpetual courtesies. She was woman enough to know whither they all tended. As for Radamanth, he was more kind to her than ever, seeing how the wind might blow favors into his ready lap. Gorlois was a great and noble gentleman, and the goldsmith had an intense respect for the nobility. The very first day that Igraine walked abroad again after her seclusion, she fell in straight with Gorlois. By Gildas's advice, she had gone, presumably for her health's sake, to the baths with Lilith, and Gorlois, warned by the leech himself, followed alone and overtook them near the porch. He was very gracious, very sympathetic. Very splendid. He begged a meeting with Igraine after she bathed, and since the girl had something in her heart that made her wish to speak with him, she consented and left him in the Laconium, 
proposing to meet him in the Rose Walk an hour later. Truth to tell, she intended questioning him as to Peleus, whether Gorlois had heard of a knight so named, and also as to Uther, whether he had yet been heard of in any region of Britain. She knew Gorlois would take her consent as favor. Still, she imagined she could venture a little for her heart's sake, without much prick of conscience. An hour later, true to her word, she went alone into the Rose Walk, a grassy pathway banked with yews and hemmed with a rich tangle of red blooms. Gorlois was there waiting as for a tryst. He was full of smiles and staunch glances as he led her to a seat that was set back in an alcove, carved from the dense green of the yews, where they might talk at leisure and out of sight. Igraine's hair lay loosened over her shoulders to dry in the sun. It had been perfumed, and the scent of it swept over Gorlois like a violet mist. He sat watching her for a while in silence as she plied her comb with the sun-shaken masses, pouring over her face like ruddy smoke. "'Lady Igraine,' he said at length. The girl's eyes glimmered at him slantways from behind her hair. "'I knew your father, Malgo, before his death,' Igraine merely nodded. I am claiming to be the friend of his daughter, seeing that I have learnt the very colour of her several girdles, the number and pattern of her gowns, since I rode into Winchester. The venture in flattery was perhaps more suggestive than Igraine could have wished. You must waste much time, my lord, but little. I am sorry if I have so poor a wardrobe that you have fathomed the whole of it in less than a month. To tell the truth, when I came into Winchester, I had only one gown, and that rather ragged. Did they not give you green and gold at Avangel? No, the good women wore grey to typify the colour of their souls. Gorlois laughed in his keen, quiet fashion. The girl's eyes were wonderfully bright and subtle, and he had never seen such a splendour of hair. He longed to finger it, to let it run through his fingers like amber wine. Leaning one elbow on the stone back of the seat, and his head on his palm, he watched the silver comb rippling at its work, with a kind of dreamy complacency. The girl's voice broke out suddenly upon him. "'My lord?' Gorlois attended. "'You know many of the knights and gentlemen famed for arms in Britain. I may so boast myself. I was once befriended, a piece of passing courtesy.' Yet I have always been curious to learn the character and estate of the man who did me this service. Have you heard of a knight named Peleus? Gorlois fingered his sharp-peaked black beard and looked blankly irresponsive. I have never known such a knight, he said. Strange. Never so. We men of the woods and moors often ride under false colors, sometimes to try our friends on the sly, sometimes to escape cognizance. The man who befriended you may have been Peleus in your company, Egrain cut in with a laugh. And Ambrosius at home, she said. Even princes love masquerading in strange arms. Meadow flower that I am, I have never seen the stately folk of the court, Ambrosius or Uther. I have heard Uther is an ugly man. If strength makes an ugly man, Uther may claim ugliness. Well... Picture a dark man with black hair, eyes packed away under heavy brows, a straight mouth, and a great clean-shaven jaw that looks sullen as death. Not beautiful in words. Gorlois stretched his shoulders and half yawned behind his hand. Uther is a man with a conscience like a north wind, he said, always lashing into tremendous effort for the sake of duty. He has the head and neck of a lion, the grip of a bear. You have never known Uther till you have seen him in battle. Then he is like a mountain thundering against a sea, a black flood plunging through a pine forest. A quaint, gentle, devilish, god-ridden madman. I can paint him no other way. Igraine laughed softly to herself. A man worth seeing, she said. I should judge so. Tell me, is it true that Uther has gone into the wilds and been seen of no man many days? Uther left Winchester more than two months ago, and no word of him has come to Ambrosius. Curious. 
Madam, nothing is curious in Uther. If I were to hear some day that he had ridden down to Hades to fight a pitched battle with Satan, I should say, Poor Satan! I warrant he has a sore head! Indeed, quoth Igraine. She shook her hair, tilted her chin, and looked at Gorlois out of the corners of her eyes. She guessed her power was young, and a woman. It tempted her to read this creature called Man in his various forms and phases, and hold his heart in the hollow of her hand. Her interest in Gorlois was no discourtesy to her love for Peleus. She had seen few men in her time. They seemed strange beings, strong yet weak, wise yet very foolish, sometimes heroic yet utter children. Gorlois, who had the sun in his eyes, beheld her as in an unusual mist. He was warming to life, for his brain seemed full of the sound of harping, and his blood blithe with summer. Stretching out a hand, he touched Igraine's hair as it poured over her shoulders, for the red-gold threads seemed magnetic to his fingers, and the glimmer of her eyes made his tough flesh creep. You have wonderful hair, he said. I learnt that long ago, drawing the strand away. The dawn of knowledge, it reaches not so very far from my feet. Igraine hung out a flag, as it were, to try the man. She knew the look of Peleus's eyes, and she wanted Gorlois for comparison. Standing up, she shook the glistening shroud about her while it seemed to drop perfumes and to spark out passion. The man's malady showed plainly enough on his face, but his eyes did not please Igraine. There was too much selfishness, not enough abasement. She knew Peleus would have looked at her as though she was a saint in a church, and he but a lad from the brown plowland. Igraine thought that she loved mute devotion far better than the bold, impatient hunger on Gorlois's face. The man leant back and tilted his beard at her, while his eyes were half shut for the sun. I have heard it told that women are ambitious. Is it truth? Igraine, all gravity again, with her tentative mischief banished, looked at her knees and said she could not tell. Gorlois waxed subtle. Are you ambitious, Igraine? Ambitious, my lord? Have you never wished to stand out like a bright peak above the world? No. Or to have the glory of your beauty filling the gate of fame, like a scarlet sky? Igraine forced a titter. I suppose you are a poet, sir. Only a fool, madam. Ah. All poets are fools. How do you contrive that? Because they are forever praising women. And yet you are a poet, my lord. How could I be else, madam, since I am a man? Gorlois took a deep breath and smiled at the dark yews, somber and mysterious behind their belt of glowing roses. Igraine was watching his face in some uneasiness. It gave the profile of a strong, stark man, whose every feature spelt alert, daring, and a great hardihood of mind. There was a keen, half-cruel look about the tight lips and impatient eyes. She was contrasting him with Peleus in her heart, and the dark, brooding face of lion-like mold that so haunted her left little glory for Gorlois's lighter, leaner countenance. They were both strong men, but she guessed instinctively which was the stronger. Gorlois turned suavely again with his courage strung like a steel bow. "'I am a queer fellow,' he said. Igraine began to bind her hair. "'If I ever loved a woman—' "'Well, my lord, she could be ambitious to her heart's content. "'The more her pride flamed, the better I should like her.' Igraine frowned. "'She would be intolerable.' Gorlois arched his eyes, covered his convictions with a laugh. Shall I tell how I should win her? It would be a quaint tale. In the beginning, I should half kill any man who braved it out that she was not the comeliest woman in Britain. Somewhat harsh, my lord, but emphatic. I should make her the envy of every lady, dame, and damsel in the land. 
not wise. Like a golden Helen she would rise in the east, blood should flow about her feet like water. I would tear down kingdoms to pile her up a throne. Such would be my wooing. Igraine looked at her lap and said never a word for a minute or more. All these heroics were rather hollow to her ear, though she did not doubt the man's sincerity towards himself, and his earnest mind to please her. Then she asked Gorlois a very simple question. Imagine, my lord, that the woman loved some other man. Gorlois's answer came swift off his tongue. I should meet him in an open field, sword to sword and shield to shield, and kill him. Egrain started suddenly, grave and gray as any beadswoman. She did not think Peleus would have taught any such doctrine. To you is that love? she asked. What else? Igraine thrust her silver bodkin into her hair with some vigor. There was no mirth or patience in her. I name it murder. Madam! Stark, selfish murder. Gorlois spread his hands and laughed. What is love? he asked. Should I know? Stark selfishness, nothing more. Igraine thought of Peleus and the way he had left her for knowledge of her imagined vows. Something in her heart told her that that was love indeed, that had clasped thorns in the struggle to embrace truth. Therewith she wished Gorlois a very formal good morning, refused his escort, and went straight home with the clear conviction that she had learnt something to her credit. Her talk with Gorlois had set a brighter halo about Peleus's head. Gorlois of Cornwall was nothing if not subtle. A selfish man of diplomatic mind may reach the very zenith of unselfishness to work his ends. Gorlois had so studied the expediencies and discretions of his purpose that even his love, headstrong though it may have been, was for the time being harnessed to the chariot of circumspection, whence intellect drove with steady hand. He had discovered for himself that Igraine was of sterner, prouder stuff than the general mob of women, and that he could not count much upon her vanity. She was to be won by honor, stark, unflinching honor, and by such alone, and Gorlois, thanks to the no mean wit that was in him, had judged that to his credit. He set about winning her at first with a consistency that was admirable, and a wisdom that would have honored Nestor. Naturally enough, Radamanth was amazed, sitting in a goldsmith's parlor and soliciting his patronage and countenance with a modest manliness. Radamanth stroked his beard, strove to appear at ease under so intense an obligation, struggled to wed servility with a new-found sense of importance. The whole business was most astonishing, not that Gorlois should love the daughter of Malgo of the Redlands, but that he should come frankly to a Winchester merchant and make such a minos of him. Radamanth beamed, stuttered, excused himself, crept, condescended in one breath. When Gorlois had gone, the good man sat down to think in a sweat of wonder. Probably he would find himself feasting with the king before long, and certainly it might prove excellent for trade. After a cup of wine and a biscuit to restore his faculties, he sent for Igrain, who was in the garden, and prepared to parade his news with a most benevolent pleasure. He took a most solemn and serious mood, bowed her to a chair in magnificent fashion, and began in style. "'My dear niece, I have great honour to lay before you.' Igraine, who had heard nothing of Gorlois's visit, merely waited for Ranamanth to unfold with a mild and silent curiosity. The old man was big and benignant with the news he had, and when he began to speak he rolled his words with the sonorous satisfaction of a poet reading his verses to patrons in some Roman peristyle. "'Lady Igraine,' he said, "'honor is pleasant to an old man, and reverence welcome as savory pottage, yet to honor those he loves is even sweeter to him than honor to himself.' In honoring a kinswoman of mine, a certain noble gentleman has poured oil of delicious flattery on my gray head, and treated me to such an exhibition of grace, frankness, and courtesy that my heart still warms to him. Perhaps, my dear niece, you can guess to whom I refer? Igraine thrilled to a sudden thought of Peleus. I cannot tell, she said. 
Radamanth could have winked, only in his present exalted frame of mind, he remembered that such an expression was neither dignified nor courtly. If he were to become the associate of noble folk, it behooved him to raise up new ideals, and so he contented himself with a most ingenuous smile. Hear, then, he said, that my noble visitor was the Count Gorlois. Gorlois? Exactly. Radamanth believed Igraine wholly overwhelmed. He waxed more and more patriarchal till his very beard seemed to grow in dignity. Believe me, a most honorable man. Gentlemen of his position might well fancy other methods. Well, never mind that. Count Gorlois came to me, like a man, to frankly crave my sanction for a betrothal. Igraine stared admired Gorlois's excellent plan for netting faith, hope, and charity at one swoop, but said nothing. Radamanth prosed on. Count Gorlois besought me in most courtly and flattering fashion to countenance him in his claims. He would have everything done in the light, he said, in honorable, manly, and open fashion. No secret loitering after dark or sly kisses under hedges. Mark the gentleman, dear niece. The goldsmith idled over the words as though they were fat morsels of flattery, and Igraine had never seen him look so eminently happy before. She understood quite well that Gorlois's move had inspired him into complete and growing partisanship, and that she was to have those sage words of advice that young folk love so much. Radamanth climbed down, meanwhile, to material things, and began to knock off Gorlois's possessions in a practical fashion on his fingers. "'A grand match,' he said. There are castles in Cornwall, Terrible and Tintagel, the lands in Gore and elsewhere, the palace in London and the great house here by the river. In Logria he has lands, I have heard, miles of fat pastures, woods, and many manors, lying towards the great oaks of Breederwode. The man is as rich as any in Britain, and if death took Ambrosius or Uther, Igraine cut in upon his verbiosity. What did you tell him, uncle? Radamanth stared at her, with his fingers still figuring. "'Tell him, child?' "'Yes.' "'What a thing to ask! Of course I promised to further his cause with you in every way possible. I said we should soon need the priest!' Igraine groaned in spirit. "'It is all useless,' she said. "'What? I have no scrap of love for this man.' Now, Radamanth had never heard a word of Peleus, for Igraine had cautioned Lilith never to speak to her father on the matter. Like many old people who have spent their lives in getting and possessing, he had lost that subtle something that men call soul. Sentiment to him was a foolish and troublesome thing when it interfered with material advantage or profit, or barred out mammon with its rod twined with red roses. Consequently, he was taken aback by Igraine's cool reception of so momentous a blessing. He sat bolt upright in his chair and stared at her. My dear niece! There was such chagrin in his voice that Igraine, remembering his many kindnesses, hung her head and felt unhappy. Do not be angry, she said. I do not wish you to speak of this more. But, my dear child, the honor, the fame, the noise of it! Igraine almost smiled at his palpable dismay, for she knew that her words must have flustered him not a little. Radamanth mopped his bald head, for the season was sultry. "'I am astounded,' he said. "'Uncle, let me reason with you. Love is not reason. No, niece, it is prejudice. Yet I assure you Gorlois is a most noble soul. If he were a seraph, uncle, I could not love him.' "'You women are all fancy. "'Why, you have hardly seen the color of him. "'Come now. "'I do not need to see more of Gorlois. "'Why, bless my soul, my wife never loved me "'till we had been married a month, "'and she had learned my fiber.' "'Igraine thought a moment. "'Then she asked Radamanth a question. "'Do you love Lilith?' "'Why, girl, what a question. "'Would you marry her to a man she did not love or trust "'simply because it brought gold?' Radamanth saw himself rounded in the argument like a rat in a corner. He sat stroking his beard and striving to look pleased. "'Think over it, my dear,' he said presently. "'There is no need.' 
Gorlois will woo you like a hero. Let him. He will accomplish nothing. It would be a grand match. Igraine jumped up, kissed him to show she bore no ill will, and, and ran away, much troubled, to find Lilith in the garden. She flung herself down beside the girl in the bower of laurels and told her all that had passed that morning in Radamanth's parlor. Lilith listened with her brown eyes deep with thought and a quiet wonder. When Igraine had finished, Lilith took both her hands in hers and, kneeling before her, looked up into her face. "'What will you do, Igraine? "'Need you ask, dear? "'Forgive me. "'Ah, you love Peleus!' Igraine put her arms round Lilith's neck and kissed her. End of Book Two, Chapter Three Recording by Thor Van Walsam in Hardwick, Vermont To read things I have written, visit thorvwis.cool Section 14 of Uther and Igraine This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thor Van Walsam in Hardwick, Vermont. For more information on this reader, please visit ThorVWIs.cool. Uther and Igraine by Warwick Deeping. Book 2, Chapter 4. Radamanth's words to the girl proved very true before many days had gone. His prophetic belief in Gorlois's mood found abundant justification in the event. Gorlois had the warm imagination of his race, an imagination that found extravagance and rich taste ready ministers to work his purpose. Igraine, met by all manners of devices on all possible occasions, began to realize the cares of those whom a purblind world insists on smothering with limitless favors. Flowers were poured in upon her, worked into posies, garlands, shields, harps, crosses, all bearing with them some mute plea for mercy. It might have been perpetual May Day in Radamanth's house, so flowered and scented it was. Flowers were followed by things more tangible, a pearl-set cithern, a great white hound, a gold girdle, a pair of doves in a cage of silver wire, a necklace of rich stones gotten by some Byzant mart. Gorlois seemed ready to send her all the finery in Winchester, despite her messages and her words to him. My lord, I can suffer none of these things from you. Servants and slaves came down to Radamanth's house as though they had been sent from Sheba, while one of Radamanth's men went back from Igraine like an echo, bearing back the unaccepted baubles. It was a patient game, and rather foolish. These were but small flutters in Gorlois's sweep for the sun. Had not Igraine been stabbed in the public gardens? Gorlois put the incident to use. He formed a bodyguard of certain of the noble youths who were under his patronage, and warned Igraine with all reverence that he had acted for her sanctity, and that a dozen gentlemen would follow near her when she walked abroad, or went to bath or church. Even her humblest stroll in the street began to partake of the nature of a triumphal progress. Children would gather to her in the gardens and throw flowers and laurel branches at her feet, and she would be followed by music and some sweet love ditty to the harp. A hundred quaint flatterers seemed to dog her from door to door, till she hardly dared to stir out of Radamanth's garden. Naturally enough, her name was soon the one name in Winchester. The good folk, with their Celtic beauty-loving souls, spoke of her with quaint extravagance. Her skin was like the apple blossom in spring, and her lips like rich red may. Her feet moved soft and swift as sunlight through swaying branches. Her hair was a cloud of gold, plucked from the sky at dawn. She was gaped and pointed at in the street like a prodigy. When she went into church on Sunday, half the folk turned to stare at her, and a clear circle was left about her where she sat in the nave. She was, for the season, the city's cynosure, its poem, its gossip. Aphrodite might have stepped out of mythology and taken lodging at Radamanth's, to judge by the curiosity displayed by the people, and doubtless many a comfortable piece of business came to Radamanth thereby. Many women would have glorified for herself's sake in such a pageant of flattery. It was not so with the grain. She was a woman who mingled much warmth of heart with strength of will, and fair measure of innate wisdom. Her feelings were too staunch and vivid to be swayed or weakened by any fresh circumstance, 
however strange and magnificent it might appear. Her love, once forged, could bend to no new craft. Her thoughts were all of Peleus, and any glory her beauty received she kept it in her heart for him. Igraine was so eternally in love that even worldly prides seemed dead in her, and she had not vanity enough to be tempted by Gorlois's great homage. The whole business troubled her not a little. There was a certain mockery in it that hurt her heart. It was as if she had panted in thirst for water, and some rude hand from heaven had thrown down gold. Gorlois had her in measure at his mercy. He seemed to take all her rebuffs with a sublime stoicism, and she had no one to whom she could appeal. She wished to bide in Winchester, for the city seemed to promise her the best chance of seeing Peleus or Uther, and of learning if these twain were one. One night there was music under her window. Flute, harp, and cithern with deep voices were pleading for Gorlois under the stars. Igraine listened, lying quiet, and thinking only of Peleus. Take then my heart, my soul, my shield, my sword, sang the voices under the window. Igraine kissed the gold cross that hung at her bosom, and longed till her heart seemed fit to break for yearning. If only the song had come from Peleus, how fair it would have sounded in the night. As it was, the whole business made her feel desperately weary. Gorlois had begun by holding somewhat aloof. It was part of his purpose to work behind a glowing and fantastic screen, serving Igraine more at a distance, in a spirit of melancholy, that should web round him with a mystery that was more splendid than truth. He bore Igraine's passive antagonism for a while with a spirit of enforced fortitude, going cheerfully by the old and somewhat foolish saying that a woman's looks lie against her heart, and that persistence wins entry in the end. To do credit to Gorlois's self-favor, he never considered the ultimate shipwreck of his enterprise as possible. He had fame, gold, bodily favor on his side, and what woman, he thought, could gainsay such a chorus? There are some men who never fail in anticipating success, and Gorlois possessed that quality of mind. As the days went by, and the girl was still stoned to him, he began to chafe and to look for stauncher measures. The gay gentleman who served him suggested various expedients, one a more passionate appeal, another sly bribery of servants. A third, who was young in years, hinted at humble despair that might evoke pity. Gorlois laughed at them all, and swore he would win this girl, hook or by crook, in a month or less, or lose all honor his sword had won. He was tired of mere courtesies that ran contrary to his more stormy spirit. He had a liking for insolent daring, for a snatch at love as at an enemy's banner in the full swing of a gallop on some bloody field. Mere mild homage was all very well for a season. Gorlois loved mastery, and believed there was no wine like success. About this time a horde of heathen ships came from the east, sailed past Vectis, and began to pour their wild men into the country twixt Winchester and the sea. Hamlets and manors were burnt, peasant folk driven to the woods, the crops fired, the cattle slain. The noise of it came into Winchester with a rabble of frightened fugitives who had fled to the city for refuge. Ambrosius, the king, was in Caerleon, and Uther, errant, so that the chance fell to Gorlois of driving the heathen into the sea. No man could have been more heartily glad of this innovation. Igraine should see him swoop like a hawk in his strength. She should hear how he led men, and how his sword drank blood. In making war on the heathen he would boast himself before her eyes and show her the merit of manhood, and the glory of a strong arm. Winchester bustled like a camp. Troops poured in from Sarum, and the sound of war went merrily through the streets. Folks boasted how Gorlois would harry the heathen. He rode out one night with picked men at his back, and head straight for the coast, while Elder of Gloucester, a veteran knight, marched southward before dawn with five hundred footmen. It was Gorlois's plan to cut the heathen off from their ships, and crush them between his knights and the spearmen led by Eldol. It was such a venture as Gorlois loved, keen, shrill, and full of hazards. Riding straight over hill and dale, they saw the glimmer of waves as the sun rose, and knew they had touched the sea. 
Gorlois's scouts had located the main mass of the Jutes camped in a valley about a nunnery they had taken, and the British knights coming up through the woods saw smoke in the valley and men moving like ants about the reeking ruin of the holy house. Looking north, they saw a beacon burning on a hill. Eldol's signaled that he had closed the woods north, east, and west with his footmen, that he waited only for Gorlois to sweep up and drive the heathen on to the hidden spears. Never was there a finer light in Gorlois's eyes than at such a season. He loved the dance and noise of steel, the plunging hustle of horses at the gallop, the grand rage of the shout that curled like the foam on an ocean billow. His courage sang with the wind as his knights rode down over the green slopes in a great half-moon of steel, a moving barrier that rolled the savage folk northwards and rent them like a harrow of iron. By the blackened walls of the nunnery, Gorlois caught sight of a line of mutilated bodies tied to posts, dead nuns, stripped and still bleeding. The sight roused the wolf in him. Kill! Kill were his words as they rode in upon the skin-clad horde. It was savage work, bloody and merciless. Eldol's men closed in on every quarter, and the heathen were cut down like corn in summer. Very few went back to their ships that day. Scores lay dead with their fair hair dribbled in the blood about the ruins, and on the quiet slopes of the dale. As they had measured out violence to the peasant folk and women, so it was meted to them in turn. Vengeance piled up great measure, running over with blood. Some sixty maimed men were taken alive, but mere death was too mild for Gorlois when he remembered the slain nuns. He had certain of the captured burnt alive, others hacked limb from limb, the rest crucified near the river for the birds to feed upon. Then he buried the nuns, and made a great entry into Winchester, taking care to ride past Igraine's window, with his white horse bloody to the saddle and his armor splashed as he had come from the field. She should see his manhood, if she would not have his presence. This single slaughter, however, did not end matters on the southern shores. Bands of Saxons were foraying from Kent, where they had established themselves, and Gorlois rode out again and again to crush and kill. There would be battles in the woods, bloody tussles in the deep shadows of Andredswold, wild flights over moor and waste, triumph cries at sunset. Three times Gorlois rode out at the head of his knights from Winchester. Three times he came back victorious, hacked and war-stained, thundered in by the people, past Radamanth's house to the church in the market square. Igraine sat at her window and watched him go by, lowering his spear to her with all his proud love ablaze on his face. Had he not driven the barbarians into the very heel of Kent, and left many a tall man from over the seas rotting in sun and rain? It was customary, year by year, in Winchester to hold a water pageant on the river, depicting legendary and historic things that had passed within the shores of Britain. August was the pageant month, and in this particular year the display was made more elaborate in order to celebrate the rout of the heathen by Gorlois, and to please the common folk who had made him their idol. The pageant was of no little splendor. Great galleys, fittingly decorated, were rowed down the narrow stream amid a horde of smaller craft, each great barge bearing figures famed in British legend lore. The first barge portrayed Brute the Trojan, voyaging for Britain. Others, Locrin's death by the river Severn, Redutibras, mythical founder of Winchester, the reunion of Lear and Cordelia, Porex, the fratricide done to death by damsels. One barge, draped in white and purple, moralized the reconciliation of Brennius and Belenus at the intercession of their mother. A great galley in red and white bore Joseph of Aramathy and the Holy Grail, and a choir of angels who sang of Christ's blood. Last of all came Alban the Protomartyr, pictured as he knelt to meet his death by the sword. The day was blue and quiet, with hardly the shimmer of a cloud over the intense gaze of the sky, while banners of rich cloth were hung over the balustrades of the river terraces, and the gardens themselves were full of gay folk who kept carnival, and watched the boats go by. The great pageant galleys had hardly passed, and the small craft that had kept the bank were swarming out into midstream, 
where a great barge with gilded bulwarks and a carved prow came sweeping down like a swan before the wind. It was driven by the broad backs of twenty rowers clad in scarlet and gold. In the stern sat Gorlois, holding the tiller, with a smile on his keen lips as a quavering clamor went up from the gardens and the boats that lined the shallows. By Radamanth's house Gorlois held up a hand, and the blades foamed as the men backed water. The great barge lost way and lay motionless on the dappled silver of the stream. Slowly it was pulled into the steps that ran from the water's edge to the terrace of Radamanth's garden. A light gangway was thrown ashore, and a purple carpet spread upon the steps, while the men lined the stairway with their oars held spearwise as Gorlois went up to greet a grain. Clad in white and gold, with a rose over her ear, she was sitting between Radamanth and Lilith on a bench at the head of the stairway. There was an implacable, irresponsive look on her face as Gorlois came up the steps and stood in front of her like a courtier before a queen's chair. Radamanth and the merchant folk present were on their feet and uncovered. Only Igraine kept her seat in the man's presence and looked him over as though he had been a beggar. They were left alone together on the terrace, Radamanth shepherding his merchant friends aside for the moment with the discreet desire to please the Count. Gorlois stood by the stairhead and told Igraine the reason of his coming, as though she had not guessed it from the moment his barge had foamed up beside the steps. He told her frankly that he wished to speak to her alone, and that his barge gave her an opportunity of hearing him, without his having the advantage of her in solitude, while the noise of oars would drown their words. Igraine listened to him with a solemn face. She began to feel that she must face her destiny and give the man the truth for good. Procrastination would avail nothing against such a man as Gorlois. Being so minded, she gave Gorlois her hand and hardened to satisfy him that day. Away went the great barge before the strong sweep of the long oars. Igraine watched the water slide by, foaming like a mill race as the blades cut white furrows in the tide. The river gleamed with color as innumerable galleys, skiffs, and coracles drifted in the shadows or darted aside to give passage to Gorlois's barge. Fair stone houses, gardened round with green, slid back on either side. They passed the spectacular galleys one by one, and the wooden wharfs packed with the mean folk of the city, and, foaming on under the great water gate, drew southward into the open country and the fields. Igraine looked at Gorlois and found his face impenetrable with thought. A fillet of gold bound his hair, and he was wearing his great sword and an enameled belt over his rich tunic. The cushions of the barge had been sprinkled with perfumes, and the floor covered ankle-deep with flowers. Igraine groaned in spirit and read the old extravagance that had persecuted her so long and made a mockery of her love for Peleus. Gentle meads lapped greenly to the willows, giving place anon to woods that seemed to stride down and snatch the river for a silver girdle. The festival folk on their skiffs were out of sight and hearing, yet Gorlois's barge ran on to plunge into emerald shadows, tunnels whose floors seemed of the blackest crystal, webbed with nets of green and blue, whose vaultings were the dense groinings of the trees. Not a wind stirred. The great curving galleries in the woods were dark and mysterious, the water like glistening basalt, the trees dreaming over their own images in an ecstasy of silence. The foam from the oars was very white, and the moist swish of the blades made the silence more solemn by contrast, while the water seemed to catch a golden flicker from the flanks of the barge. Igraine knew well enough what was in the man's heart as he sat handling the tiller, and watching her with his restless eyes. She was quite cold and undisturbed in spite of her being at his mercy, and the consciousness that in her heart she did not trust him vastly. Gorlois had spoken only of the town, and they were running on under dense foliage into the forest solitudes that edged the river. Yet Igraine had faith in her own wit, and believed herself a match for Gorlois, or any man for that matter, save Peleus. Gorlois passed the time by telling her of his battles in Andredswold, how he had driven the heathen into Thanet, and freed Andred's town from Leaguer. Igraine began to wonder how long it would be before he would turn to matters nearer to his heart. 
The day had already slipped into evening, for the water pageant was ordered late, so that it might merge into a lantern frolic on the river after dusk. Igraine, seeing how the light lapsed, told Gorlois to have the barge turned for Winchester. She had hardly spoken when the boat ran out from the trees into open water. In the west the sky was already aflame, ridged tier above tier with burning clouds, while the blaze fainted zenithwards into gold and azure. A queer cry, as from a man wary of torture, came down from the west. On a low hill near the river, bleak against the sky, stood a black concourse of beams, sat upright in the ground, looking like charred pillars of a burnt house. They were crosses, and the bodies of men crucified. Gorlois pointed to them with the evening glow on his face, and, taking a horn that hung at his belt, blew a loud call thereon. At the sound, a vulture rose from a crossbeam, and went flapping heavenwards, a black blot against the scarlet frieze of the west. Others followed, like evil things driven from their food. Again the cry, the wail from one who had hung torn and racked in the parching sun, came down from the darkening hill. The grain shuddered and felt cold at the sound, and watched the figures against the sky with a kind of awe. Who are these? she said. Dogs from over the sea. Some are still alive. These pirates are hard. They die slowly despite beak and claw. Such be the death of all who burn holy houses and homes and put women and children to the sword. Take them down, or let them be killed outright. Never. At my prayer. What I have done, I have done. Cruelly. Cruelly, by madam, you should have seen twenty dead nuns tied to stakes as I have seen, and you would gloat and be glad as I am. By God, little mercy had this awful at my hands in the glades of Andredswold. I burnt and crucified and tore with horses. Mere steel is too good for such as these. My lord, what is hate unless it is hate? I can never brook an enemy to Britain. Egrain had sudden insight into the core of Gorlois's nature. She understood in a vague, swift way what primeval instincts were hidden him, ready at the beck of baser feelings such as jealousy or smitten pride. Womanlike, she recoiled from a man whose strength was so inflexible that it owned no pity or leaving kindness, where malice or anger was concerned. She loved strength and the natural wrath of man, but she had no touch of the Semiramis around her, and her heart could not echo Gorlois's wolf-like cry. The rowers had turned the barge, and they were soon back again under the shadows of the trees. It was dim and ghostly with the onrush of night, while a faint fire flickered through the trees from the west and touched the sullen water with a reddish flame. Gorlois's face was in the shadow. He was leaning over the tiller towards Egrain and his eyes seemed to burn out upon her face and to make her heart beat faster. She sat as much away from him as the gunwale suffered, and looked ahead over the misty river, or up into the dense black bosoms of the trees. The foamy rush of the oars and the grind of the looms in her rowlocks half-drowned Gorlois's words as he spoke to her. Igraine, my lord, you have read me to the heart. Egraine turned and looked him full in the face. Now that the brunt had come, she was strong and ready to tell the man the truth, though it might be bleak and bitter to his pride. Gorlois was very near her, and she could see his white teeth between his lips, and the glint of his eyes as he leant towards her in the shadows. "'Are you ambitious, Egraine? "'No, my lord. "'Not even a little?' My lord, I have no more ambition in me than one of those dead men hanging athwart the sunset. You are a queer woman. Pardon, I have a conscience. Gorlois bit his lip, stared her in the face, and set a hand upon her wrist. You can never shirk me, he said. I never shirk the truth. Come now, give me the word. My lord, may I save you pain in the telling of it. You can never come near to my heart. Woman, never be so sure. Gorlois drew back, and said never another word. 
Egraine watched him furtively as his keen profile hung near her in the dusk, clear as marble. Now and again his eyes gleamed out upon her and made her fear the moment, while the oars swung out over the smiling stream, and the black woods started by like night. Soon the lights of Winchester showed up against the northern sky, and far ahead, over a straight stretch of water, they could see the lanterns and torches of the folk who kept festival. A golden mist and the noise of music came down to them, as they surged under the great water-gate and ran on through the city amid a glimmering web of lights and laughter. Soon the barge found the shallows, under white walls, and Igraine was standing on the steps leading to Radamanth's garden, with a starry sky sweeping like a wheel above the world. Gorlois went slowly from her, down the steps, with a face that was dark and brooding. Torchlight glimmered on the fillet of gold about his hair, on the splendid setting of his baldric, and the scabbard of his sword. At the water's edge he lifted up his face to her out of the night. "'It shall be life or death,' he said. Then he was swept away with a red flare of torches over the river, and a grain went solemn-eyed to bed. End of Book Two, Chapter Four Recording by Thor Van Walsam in Hardwick, Vermont. To read things I have written, visit thorvwis.cool. Section 15 of Uther and Egraine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thor Van Walsam in Hardwick, Vermont. For more information on this reader, please visit ThorVWIs.cool. Uther and Igraine by Warwick Deeping. Book 2, Chapter 5. Not a word of Uther yet, no sound of his name in Winchester, though Igraine lived on in Radamanth's house and hoped for light in the dark. Gorlois had had the truth, and she wondered what would come of it. Lulled by an ingenious reasoning into the belief that she would be free of the man, she began to breathe again, and to take liberty in her hand. She did not think that Gorlois could plague her longer after the blunt answer she had given him. His pride would drag him aside, make further homage impossible, and there the matter would end. If Igraine believed this, then she was in very gross error. Many men never show their true fiber till they are given the blunt lie— and Gorlois was never more himself than when baffled. There was much of the hawk about him, and Egraine had underrated his pride if she expected it to take leave with her, against its kinsman passion. Her measure only uncovered the darker side of the man's nature, and sounded the doom of a lighter, gayer chivalry. Gorlois's pride and self-love never dragged in the wind, but held him taut to the storm, as though determined to weather all the perversities of which a woman's heart is capable. In truth, Igraine had done the very thing least likely to free her from the man's thought. She had taunted his passion and thrown down a challenge to his pride. Gorlois kept his own counsel and frowned down the mischievous curiousness of his friends when they laughed at him, and asked how the girl framed for a wife. He struck Brastias, his squire, to the ground for daring to jest sympathetically on the subject. Those who went about his house and hunted and diced with him soon found that he was in no temper for light raillery, or the sly privileges of an intimate tongue. The fabric of a mere nice romance had stiffened into sterner, darker proportions. There was the look of a dry desire in the man's eyes, a lean, hungry silence about him that made his men whisper. Some of them had seen Gorlois when he hunted down the heathen. They knew his temper and the cast of his features when there was some lust of enterprise in his heart. About that time a knight came from Wales, thrusting a woman's beauty upon every man with the point of his spear. As had been his custom elsewhere, he set up a green pavilion outside the walls, and daily rode out armed to the sound of a trumpet to declare a certain Amoret of Caerleon the fairest gentlewoman in Christendom. He was a big man, red and burly, and had overthrown every like fanatic for love's sake on this particular adventure. Gorlois heard of the fellow with no little satisfaction. Every finger of him itched to spill blood, and he took the deed on him, vowing it should be the last peace-offering to Igraine. 
arming one morning, he rode down and fought the green knight in his meadow outside the walls. It took them an hour to settle the matter. At the end thereof, the errant from Wales was lying impotent and bloody in his tent, and the name of Amoret aped the ineffectual moon. Afterwards, Gorlois rode into the town, war-stained as he was, found Igraine at her window and presented her the green knight's token on the point of his spear. It was a woman's sleeve in green silk and edged with pearls. Igraine saw a crowd of upturned faces about the man on the white horse. His bright arms seemed to burn in upon her and to light a sudden impatience in her heart. She took the green sleeve from the spear and, looking Gorlois full in the face, in reckless mood she threw the thing down under his horse's hoofs. There was a great hush all through the street at the deed, and Gorlois started red as a man struck across the face with a whip. His eyes seemed to grow large, like the eyes of an angry dog. Never had folk seen him look so black. He stared up a moment at Igraine, shook his spear, and, trampling the green sleeve under the hoofs of his horse, rode away without a word through the glum and gaping crowd. Igraine had thrown down the glove with a vengeance. It was a mad enough method of beating off the pride of a man, such as Gorlois, whose temper grew with the blows given, and who knew no moderation in love or in hate. Gorlois had ridden home through the town that day to have his wounds dressed, and to spend half the night in a fury of cursing. Yet, for all his bitterness, he had the power of level thought, and of taking ground for the future. He would read this woman a lesson. That much he swore on the cross of his sword, and the early morning saw him again at Ranabanth's, strenuous to speak his mind. The goldsmith happened to know that Igraine was alone in the garden. Without noise or ceremony, he sent Gorlois into her, locked the door on them both, and went to watch from a narrow window on the stairs. He swore that Gorlois should have his own way and not go balked for a woman's whim. Igraine was sitting, sewing, in the arbor of laurels with the little gold cross hanging down over the bosom of her dress. A grass walk led to the arbor between beds of flowers. As she sat stitching, she heard the sound of feet in the grass and saw a shadow slanting across the entry. She expected Lilith, but, looking up, found Gorlois. He was white from his wounds of yesterday and the blood he had lost by the green knight's sword. His left arm lay in a sling of red silk. Igraine noted in her sudden half-fear how his eyes were very bright and that his beard looked coal-black below his bloodless cheeks. There was something in his face, too, that made Igraine cautious. She rose and folded her embroidery in the most unperturbed and quiet fashion, though she was thinking hard all the same. Gorlois watched her and held back for her to speak, with a hollow fire creeping into his eyes, for the girl's passionless mood chafed him. He had no gentleness toward her for the moment. Such love, as he knew, had been blown into a red beacon by starved and covetous desire. "'A word with you,' he said. The speech was rough and pertinent, showing the trend of the man's purpose. He had abandoned superficialities. Igraine, gathering up her silks, turned and faced him with the frankness of a full moon. Gorlois saw her lips tighten, and there was a temper swimming in her eyes that promised abundant spirit and no shirking. If he had launched out to rouse her from passive antagonism, he could not have chosen a better method. Igraine made a step towards the house, but two strides put Gorlois in her path. Make way, not a foot, till you have the truth out of me. Have a care, I will be stormed at by no man. Woman, look at me. Igraine was looking at him with all the temper she could summon. If Gorlois thought to ride straight over her courage, he was enormously mistaken. She would match him for all his hectoring. "'If you are not a fool,' she said, "'you will end this nonsense and go. "'Am I a scullion?' "'You should know, my lord. "'I have not bled for nothing.' "'As you will. "'What have you to say to me?' Igraine lost all patience, tossed her embroidery aside, and simply flashed out at him with all her soul. Say, she said, I have somewhat to say, and that bitter. Listen, if you will. You, Gorlois of Cornwall, who bade you make my name a byword in Winchester, listen to me, hear the truth and profit. 
you who pestered me with mad tricks till I hated it all and held it in insolence. Who asked you to make me gossip for a city? Did I? Who took your presents? Who told you the truth? Who threw your token under the hoofs of your horse to shame you? I have mocked you enough. Now leave me in peace or rue it. By God, madam, don't echo me. Go, get out of my sight. I hate you. Gorlois flushed to the temples in this wind of passion. The girl looked splendid to him in her great anger, her head thrown back and her eyes steady on him as stars. The scorn of her beauty leapt over him like crimson light, and he was more a sensation than a man. He had a great thirst in him to grip her with his hands, to bend her straight body as he would bend a bow, to strangle up the scorn in her throat with his own breath. He went near her, stooping and staring in her face. Igraine, mark my words, you golden shrew, you temptation of tempers, hold off. By God, I'll tame you, don't doubt me. Igraine, very watchful, slipped past him suddenly like light, and walked for the house with a sweeping air that bade him keep his distance. Coming to the door of the house, she tried it, but found the lock shut. The red badge of a new anger showed upon either cheek. She turned on Gorlois. Her eyes blazed out at him. A petty trick. What now, madam? You had this door locked. Never. You lie in your throat. Radamanth, open it. I have no key. Igraine's figure seemed to dilate and grow taller, and her eyes shone well nigh as bright in color as her hair. Obey me. Not if I had the key. Obey me. I will be the master before the sun is at noon. You dog. A sudden madness whirled Gorlois away. He went red from the neck, clutched at Igraine's wrist, and held it. For a moment they stood rigid. The girl could not shake him off, although he had but one hand to hold her. His breath was hot upon her face as he pressed her back against the wall and held her there till his lips touched her neck. Igraine, breathing fast and straining from him with all her strength, set a hand on his face and thrust him away. She twisted her wrist free and slipped from between him and the wall. Then the door opened, and Radamanth stood by them. Igraine slipped away with a white face, and running above to her chamber threw herself down on the bed and cried for Peleus. She heard Gorlois stride through the house, heard the gate crash as he went out into the street. Shame and loneliness were on her like despair, and she was weak and shaken after her anger, and very hungry for love and comfort. The world seemed a dull blank about her, cold, irresponsive, and gray as a November evening. Every hand seemed against her. Even Radamanth, the man of serious years, had turned the key upon her, more kind to Gorlois than herself. Her thoughts were very bitter as she lay and brooded over it all. Presently she heard someone coming up the stairs. Darting to the door, she bolted it and went back to bed, while a hand rapped out a somewhat diffident summons, and Radamant's voice came into her. "'My dear niece,' it said. Igraine made no answer. "'My dear niece, let me have a word with you.' Still no answer. Radamanth tried the door and found it fastened. "'Gorlois is gone.' he said. Igraine remained obdurate, with a face drawn and sully-eyed. She heard him shuffle down the stairs again, go into his parlor, and shut the door very gently, like a man who is ashamed. Then all was quiet, save for casual footsteps in the street, and the garrulous chatter of a starling on the tiles. Noon had come and gone a long while, and still Igraine lay in her room and moped. She felt sore and grieved to the heart. All her sanguine courage was at a low ebb. Winchester seemed a prison house where she was shut up with Gorlois. The man's greed and power of soul seemed to stare upon her till white honor folded its hands over its breast and turned to flee. Oh, for Peleus and the brave look of those honest eyes, the staunch touch of those great hands, he seemed to stand up above the world, above the selfishness, the lust, the violence— like a pine on some lonely hill. She could trust, she could believe. To find him would give her peace. As she lay there that noontide, a new purpose came to her, and lighted up hope. It was frail and flickering enough, but still, it burned. 
she would leave Radamanth's house and go afoot into the world to find a shadow. Anything was better than laying cooped in the place for dread of Gorlois. She had long contemplated such a measure, and that morning, in Radamanth's garden, gave her decision and made her strong. She rose up from the bed and hunted out her old evangel habit from a cupboard in the wall. Then she set off to doff the rich stuffs Radamanth had given her, the embroidered tunic, the colored leather shoes, the goodly enameled girdle. In their stead she stood again in the old gray gown, hood, and sandals, with a little thrill of delicious recollection. It was like the dream of an enchanted past. She had hardly ended the transformation when there came a shy tap at her door, and a mild voice calling to her from the landing. It was the girl, Lilith. Egraine felt a sudden warmth at her heart as she let her in and barred the door again. Lilith stood and stared at her, with great brown eyes wide with astonishment. "'Why this old dress, Egraine? "'I will tell you, dear. "'And you have been crying, for your eyes are red.' Egraine took the soft-voiced little woman to the window seat and told her sadly enough all the doings of the morning. Even Lilith looked ashamed and showed her anger openly. Radamanth had confessed nothing of what had passed in the garden. "'I have never loved my father less before,' she said. "'I should never have thought this mean trick of him. "'I am ashamed, Egraine. "'Never trouble, dear. "'You are my joy in Winchester. "'And why this old nun's habit? "'I am going to leave you, child.' Lilith clutched at her with both hands, her face suddenly white and almost piteous. "'Oh, no, no, Egraine. "'I must, dear. "'Forgive. "'It is not that alone. "'I cannot rest here longer. "'Gorlois and the city have crushed the heart out of me.' Lilith lifted up her child's face to her, and then began to sob unrestrained on Egraine's bosom. "'It seems cruel,' she whimpered. "'No, no. "'It is best for me, after all.' But where will you go, Igraine? Heaven knows, dear. I cannot rest here longer after this morning. I feel as if I should stifle. Don't go, Igraine. Hush, dear. Don't weaken me. I am hard put as it is. They were both weeping now. Lilith's slim body shook as she lifted up her face to Igraine's and looked at her through her tears. She had learnt to love Igraine, and jealousy of her tall and splendid kinswoman had no place in her heart. Lilith possessed to perfection the power of sympathy, and, being a simple little soul who lived wholly for the present, she perhaps felt the more for that very reason. She could not say evil enough of Gorlois, nor put too much kindness into her kisses as she sat with her head on Egraine's shoulders. "'You cannot go out alone in the world,' she said presently. Egraine was silent. "'I know father would never forgive himself. There are convents, child.' They would guard and give me harbor for a time. A convent, but you hate the life. If I could only hear of Uther, I would— Yes, yes, I know. But will you go, Igraine? My mind is made up. Nothing can change it. Then let me come with you. Igraine kissed her, but shook her head at the suggestion. I love you for the wish, dear, but I could never drag you into my own troubles, and it would be very wrong to Radamanth. That afternoon they had many words together in Igraine's room, and dusk caught them still talking. Igraine had made Lilith promise that Radamanth should know nothing of her flight till the following morning. Lilith proved a little obstinate at first, but yielded in the end for fear of grieving Igraine. With the dusk she crept downstairs and brought up food. Igraine made a meal, while Lilith, with her tears still falling, put up food and a few trifles into a bundle slipping in all the little store of money she had. Then she ran softly downstairs to see if the way were clear. Radamanth had gone to supper with a merchant friend, and the house seemed very quiet and lonely. In the passageway the two girls took leave of each other, Lilith clinging to Igraine for a moment with all her heart. With sad eyes Igraine left her, and went out into the night. End of Book Two, Chapter Five Recording by Thor Van Walsam in Hardwick, Vermont. To read things I have written, visit thorvwis.cool. Section 16 of Uther and Egraine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Thor Van Walsum in Hardwick, Vermont. For more information on this reader, please visit thorvwis.cool. Uther and Igraine by Warwick Deeping. Book 2, Chapter 6. Igraine found lodging that night in the great abbey of St. Helena that Peleus had spoken of on their ride from the island banner. Posing to the portress as one who had wandered long after her escape from Evangel, she was taken to the refectory, where supper was being spread by the juniors. The women of the place gathered round her, and Igraine inquired with some qualms for any chance news of Malt, Claudia, and the rest, but getting nothing, she felt more confident. She told them her name was Meliboa, and she recounted at length the burning of Evangel and her subsequent wanderings, carefully purging the tale of all that might seem strange to their virgin ears, or set their tongues a-clacking. The women were very kind to her, partly for her own sake, and partly for the interesting gossip she had brought them. At supper she sat next a young and merry nun who shared her misery cords with her. The good women of the place were suffered to talk between Vespers and Complins, and Igraine, sly at heart, edged the talk to a tone for which she thirsted, and began to speak to her neighbors of Gratia, abbess of Evangel. "'Did any of you know her?' she asked. "'Only by fame.' said a fat nun opposite Igraine. "'I have heard she was near of kin to the king,' said another, who drooped her lids in very modest fashion. Igraine started in thought. "'Aurelius,' she said. The nun nodded. "'How were they related?' "'I have heard Gratia was his aunt.' "'And aunt to Uther also?' "'Of course, seeing they are brothers.' Igraine looked at her wooden platter and pressed the little gold cross to her bosom with her hand. And now a strange thing happened. The old nun opposite Igraine, who was the mistress of the novices, brought out news that she had heard in the abbess's parlor that very morning. "'Uther has been seen again,' she said. "'Uther?' The word snapped out like a bolt from a bow, and brought the nun's eyes on Igraine across the table. "'The man comes and goes like a shadow. He is ever riding alone to do some great deed against the beasts.' or against the heathen. A great soul is Uther. Here were tidings dropped like dew out of heaven at the very hour she stood in need of them. Igraine felt the mist lighten appreciably in her brain. She popped an olive into her mouth and spoke almost carelessly. Where is Uther? At Sarum Town. He rode, they say, to the great camp there, looking like a ghost, or as though he had been playing Simeon on a pillar. Igraine merely nodded. Uther always looks a serious soul. Have you ever seen him, sister? Never. A dark man? With a face like a sun and a thundercloud rolled into one. A good man. So they say. He has a clean look. A little bell began to sound to call them away to Compline's. Igraine went with the rest into the solemn chapel and let the chant sweep into her soul, and the prayers take her heart to heaven. Incense floated down, colors shone and glimmered on the walls, the dim lamps shivered like stars under the roof. Igraine felt her hollow heart warm as a rose in the full blaze of a golden noon. She said her prayers very fervently that night, for love was awake in her and glad of her new-blossomed hope. She would go to the great camp at Sarum and see this Uther for herself. She had little comradeship with sleep in the great dormitory that night. When the matin's bell rang, she was up and ready for her flight like a young lark in the day. After chapel, she begged a pittance from the celleress and stowed it with her bundle in the little wallet Lilith had given her, excusing her early going on the plea that she had to walk far that day. She set out briskly from the grey shadows of the abbey. The place lay quite close by the western gate, so that she was soon beyond the walls and in the fields and orchards where all was goldly quiet at that early hour. Winchester stood like a prison house, void and fooled in the east. Igraine turned and looked down at it a while, huddled in its great girdle of stone, a medley of towers, roofs, and mist-wrapped trees. She shook her fist at it with a noiseless little laugh when she thought of Gorlois. Further yet, to the east, she could see the blue, pine-smirched ridge where Peleus had built her that little bower on the night he had left her sleeping. Her eyes grew deep with desire at the thought of it all, even as she had thought of it a thousand times since then. 
Peleus's dark face was garlanded with green in her memory, and trouble, as it ever does, had made love take deeper root in her bosom. Cheeriness comes with action. Igraine, fettered no longer, footed it along the road with snatches of song on her lips and her eyes full of summer. A quiet wind came up from the west, and the clear morning air suited her courage. All the wide world seemed singing. The trees had an epithelium on their whispering tongues, and the sky seemed strewn with white garlands. The tall corn in its occasional cohorts bowed down to her with murmuring acclaim as though it guessed her secret. When she had gone a league or so, she sat down under a tree and made a meal from stuff in her wallet. Country folk went on by the road, for it was market day in Winchester. One apple-cheeked lad, seeking a nun sitting there, came devoutly with his palms full of fruit, taken from his ass's pannier, and made his offering with a shy smile and a bend of the knee. A grain, touched, blessed him most piously, and gave him a kiss to cap it. The lad blushed and went away thinking he had never seen such a pretty nun before, and wondering if there were many like her in the great abbey. A grain watched him towards Winchester and wished some country girl joy of a good husband. Presently she held on again in great spirits, nor had she gone very far when a tinkling of bells came up beside her with a merry clatter of hoofs. Turning aside to give passage, she looked back and saw an old gentleman riding comfortably on a white mule with two servants jogging along behind him on cobs. The old man's bridle was fringed with little silver bells that made a thin jingle as he rode. He was solidly gowned in plum-colored cloth turned over with sable, and seemed of comfortable degree, judging by his trappings. Igraine looked up in his face as he passed by, while the old gentleman stared down to see what sort of womanhood lurked under a nun's hood. The man on the mule was Udall, Radamant's bosom gossip. "'Hey, now, on my soul,' said the little merchant, reining in with a will. "'What have we here, my dear, gadding about nunwise on a high road? My faith, I hold a catechism.' Igraine, knowing the old man's vulnerability, answered with a smile. Ah, Master Udall, you are a very lady's man, a gem of discretion. So, and truth, said the merchant with a chuckle. Igraine went close to him and patted the white mule's neck, while the serving men held a wise distance. I am running away from Winchester, she said. Strange sport, my dear. Now you must tell not a soul, on your honor. Not a living soul, on my honor. Igraine let her eyes flit a laughing look upon them. "'Why, then, Master Udall,' she said, "'if you will order one of your men to walk, "'I will get up and ride along with you for a league or two. "'There is trust for you.' "'Udall appeared entranced with the suggestion. "'He ordered one of his fellows to dismount, "'to spread a cloak over the saddle, "'to shorten the stirrup leather and give a grain his knee. "'The girl was soon mounted, "'seated side-fashion with one sandaled foot in the stirrup "'and one hand on the pommel to steady her. "'She flanked Udall's white mule, "'and they rode on side by side at a level tramp with the henchman some twenty paces in the rear. Udall soon waxed fatherly, as was his custom. He twitted a grain on the temerity of her venture with the senile and pedantic jocosity of an old man. He said things that would have been impertinent on the tongue of a youngster, and exerted to the full that eccentric fad of age, the supposition that youth needs pleasant patronage and nothing more. Old men, holding young folk to be fools— reserve their rusty brains on the privilege of seeming wise. They are content to straddle the crawling, leather-jointed circumspection that they call knowledge. The bird flutters to his mate, sings, soars, and is taken before the night by the fowler. The snail creeps his roomy round, covered with the slime and slobber of prudence, to rot in the end under a tree stump, unless some good throstle cracks him prematurely on a stone. Udall had something of the snail about him, but he essayed, none the less, to ape the soaring of youth with a very ragged pair of wings. That morning he flew with a senile eagerness for Igraine's favor, and thought himself a match for any young man in the matter of light chivalry. "'Come now, dear,' he said. "'Let us have a good look at you.' "'Well, sir?' "'My word, you make a gorgeous nun. Who ever saw such eyes under a hood before? My dear, you are quite foolhardy to go pilgrimaging alone.' Men are such rogues, and you have such a pretty face. There was a cringing tone about the old sinner that made Igrain thoroughly despise him. He seemed to combine elderly bravado with smooth servility, qualities peculiarly obnoxious to the girl's spirit. 
She had never liked or trusted Udall overmuch in the past, but she was at pains to be civil with him now, seeing that he might serve her in sundry ways. She took his speeches with outward graciousness and laughed at him hugely in her heart. He began to lecture her in a rather egotistical fashion. "'You must remember, my dear,' he said, "'that I am a man of the world, and one whose experience may be relied upon. I may tell you that my judgment is much valued by your good uncle Radamanth, a man of much sagacity, but yet one who lacks just that subtle insight into events that I may say has always been my special characteristic.' I am so experienced that I may deserve the infinite honor of advising you, if you care to tell me where you are going. I have had so much to do with the world that I can tell you the best tavern in any town this side of the Thames where clean and honest lodgings may be had. I can inform you as to tolls, prices, customs, bylaws. Are you soon returning to Winchester? Egraine shook her head at him. Who have you been quarreling with, dear? Myself, most. To think of it, syrup quarrelling with honey. What will your Lord Gorlois do? Igraine stifled the question on the instant. Master Udall, leave that name alone if you want more of my company. Pardon, my dear. I did not know it was so unpleasant a topic. I hate the very name of him. My dear, such a splendid fellow. Detestable boaster. Tut, tut. A very popular nobleman. Just the very man for you, and vastly rich. Now when I heard that he... That gentleman, for God's sake, Master Udall, leave your chatter. The old merchant, for the moment, looked a little taken aback. Then he smiled, pulled his goat's beard, and grew epigrammatic. She who wears a gilded shoe, he said, will find it pinch in the wearing. Stick to your sandals, my dear, and let your pretty white feet go brown in the sun. Better breathe in the open than freeze in a marble house. Just play the savage and let ambition go hang. Igraine thanked him as though she held his counsel to be of the most inestimable value to herself. She was wise enough to know that to please an old man you must take his words in desperate earnest, and appear much caught by his supreme sagacity. Udall smacked his lips and was comfortably warm within himself. He went on to tell the girl that he was writing to a little country manor that he owned some few leagues from Winchester. He informed her sentimentally that he was a very Virgil over his farm and garden. Igraine thought Virgil might be well Greek for fool, but she hid her ignorance under her hood. Udall ran on to dilate on the subtleties of husbandry, making a fine parade of expert phraseology in the doing of it. "'I see you do not follow me,' he said presently. "'Young folk are not fond of turning over the sods. They love grass for a scamper, not clay and dull loam.' Shall we talk of petticoats or sarsnet that runs down a pretty figure like water? Eh, my dear? You set the tune, I'll follow. Igraine contented himself with keeping him to his hobby. My father loved his violet beds, she said. Wise man, wise man. A garden makes thoughts sprout as though they would keep time to the leaves. You shall see my garden. Let me see. What road are you for following? The road to fortune, Master Udall. Truth, then, it must run near my doorway. The good woman who keeps house for me will make you most welcome. You must rest on your journey. You are very good. Not a bit of it, my dear. I shall call you Saint Igraine. <laughs> and you will ripen all the apples in my orchard by looking at them. Faith, am I not a wag? You ought to be at court, sir. Hee <laughs> You would make all the young squires red with envy. My dear, my dear, truth, do flatter an old man so. But you are really such a courtier. You'd all squirmed and chuckled in the grotesquest fashion. Assuredly, we make very good friends, he said. Udall's manner nearly halved the mileage between Sarum and the royal town of Winchester, and Egrain found his suggestion quite a happy help to her plans. If needs be, she could bide the night there and make her room next day with but trivial trouble. She was glad, in a way, that she had fallen in with Udall, for the ride had proved quite a charity to her, and his antique vanities had passed the time better than more modest characteristics could have done. Her only fear was lest he should cheat her, and send word to Radamanth. Accordingly, she spoke to him again about her flight, and made him promise on the cross that he would not betray her whereabouts. Udall, silly soul, was ready enough by now to promise her almost anything. About noon they halted and made a meal, with a flat stone lying under the shade of a tree for table. 
Udall drank quite enough wine to quicken his failings, and to lull what common sense he had to sleep. He had become so maudlin, so supremely sentimental, that Igraine had much ado to throttle her laughter. She quite feared for him when they had to get to horse again. His men had to hoist him into the saddle between them. Once there, he seemed quite arrogantly confident of his seat, and, being a hardy old gentleman at the pot, he soon steadied down into a comparative docility, managing his mule as though there had been no such luxury at dinner. He was more garrulous and fatherly than ever. Now and again he had to quench a hiccup. Otherwise he was only an exaggerated portrait of himself. An hour's ride brought them to Udall's own pastures. He pointed out his sheep to a grain amid the clanking of their diverse bells, and told her the profits of the last shearing. Soon the house edged into view, a homely place set back an arrow's flight from the road, and ringed round with a score or so old trees. It was a green and quiet spot, mellow with the warm comfort of pastureland and wood. A pool twinkled in the meadows, through which ran a small stream. There was no bridge over the brook. The track crossed it by a shallow ford where the water gurgled over pebbles. The banks were loose and crumbling, and the trackway littered with stones. Udall's mule went over sure-footed as a goat, but Igraine's horse, slipping on the slope, set a forehoof on a shifting stone and rolled down with a crash. The girl did not avoid in time, and the brute's body pinned her ankle. She felt the sinews crack and the stones bruise her flesh. For a moment she was in danger of the animal's plunges to rise, but one of the men came up and seized the bridle while his fellow drew a grain clear. Udall climbed down, splashed through the water, and came up, puffing sympathy. Igraine tried to walk, but gave up with a wry face. The men helped her to the grass of the bank, where she sat down with Udall fussing round her like an old woman. He sent the men on to the manor to bring a bed, and, seeing that Igraine had grown white from the wrench, he ran for the wine flask at his saddle-bow and urged her to drink. The girl had more fear of a spoilt journey than a cracked bone— and feeling faint for the moment, she suffered Udall and took the wine. The old man was on his knees by stroking her hand, his thin beard wagging and his glazed eyes vinously sympathetic. When the men came back with the bed, they laid a grain thereon, and bore her through the meadows to the house, Udall following like a spaniel at their heels. End of Book Two, Chapter Six Recording by Thor Van Walsam in Hardwick, Vermont to read things I have written, visit thorvwis.cool. Section 17 of Uther and Igraine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thor Van Walsam in Hardwick, Vermont. Uther and Igraine by Warwick Deeping Book Two, Chapter Seven While Igraine slept in the abbey dormitory and dreamt of Peleus, the man Gorlois burnt on the grid of his own passions and found no peace for his soul. The night's sky was not a whit more black than his spirit, and his sinister cogitations were checkered ever with palpitating points of fire. The restless fever of an unfed leopard seemed his, and he was in and out of his tumbled, sleepless bed ten times before dawn. Only a boarhound kept him company, a savage, red-eyed brute whose temper suited that of his master. The dog followed Gorlois as he wandered from bedchamber to atrium, out from the peristyles to the garden, down walks of yew and cypress, between the beds of Helicrese and Asphodel, over the smooth lawns clear in the eye of the moon. There was an evil thing in Gorlois's thought, a thing fit for beggarly disrelish, yet very white and lovely to look upon. He stalked like a ghost in the night, biting his lips looking out into the dark with red and eager eyes. How often he reached out in naked thought and clasped only the air. He cursed himself and the woman, honored and abused her in one breath, grew hot and cold like a live coal played upon by a fickle wind. As soon as dawn came, he had a plunge and a swim in a pool in the garden, and, having suffered the ceremony of a state toilet, went out unattended into the town. It was the very hour when Igraine was shaking her fist at Winchester for thought of him, 
but Gorlois was spared the prick of self-knowledge and the frank truth of the girl's distaste. He thought her nothing more than a shrew, and the possessor of a splendid temper. His long legs and the heat at his heart soon took him down through the quiet streets and the market square to Radamanth's house. Early as was the hour, the goldsmith had escaped sloth and was busy at his ledgers in the little counting-house behind the parlor. Gorlois came in in great state, with the serving wench who announced him feasting her curiosity on his face with a sheepish giggle. Radamanth fetched from his figures, bowed very low, and made the gentleman a most obsequious welcome. He was wondering what Gorlois's humor might be after the repulse of yesterday. To tell the truth, Radamanth felt somewhat ashamed of the trick he had served a grain, and he was none too eager to meet his niece, seeing that she still seemed determined to hide her anger in her room. His doubts as to Gorlois's mood were set at rest by that gentleman's somewhat saturnine opening. Radamanth, your honor's servant, I have come to make peace. Your lordship's magnanimity is phenomenal. Was I over hasty, Goldsmith? A young man's way, my lord, no fault at all. Many's the time I had my face smacked as a youngster, and was none the worse in favor. Take no serious view, sir, but press her the harder. She'll give in, my faith, yes, being full and full of bone. You are troubled, my lord, with too much conscience. Have you seen the woman since? Radamanth raised his eyebrows and shrugged. Well, no, he said. I am afraid my niece has rather a hot spirit. Breeding, my lord, proud blood in her. I know that part of her nobleness well enough. Radamanth refrained for a moment from a sense of discretion. My lord would see her? I'll not budge till I have done so. You understand women? Gorlois smiled a peculiar smile. I have wit enough, he said. I have my plan. If it please you, sir, to go into the garden, I will endeavor to send her to you. No more locking of doors, Goldsmith. Sir, I contemn my late indiscretion in your service. Gorlois passed out by a long passage into the gardens, with its green leaves shelving to the river, while Radamanth, half a coward at heart, went towards the stairs that led to Igraine's chamber. Halfway up he met the girl Lilith coming down, very white and frightened looking, as though she dreaded her father's face. Radamanth kissed her and asked for Igraine. Then her distraught look dawned on him in the twilight of the stairway and made him suddenly suspicious. Is Igraine awake? Lilith hid her face in his sleeve. Speak, girl, what's amiss? The room is empty. What? Igraine has left us, said the girl with a stifled whimper. Radamanth, sage and solemn soul, lapsed into the sin of blasphemy. When did you learn this girl? Father, quick now, don't lie. He shook her by the shoulder. Father, be gentle with me. Quick, hussy. I can't, I can't. Radamanth took her firmly by the wrist and brought her with no very considerate care into the parlor. Now, he said, thrusting her into a chair, you atom of ingratitude, tell me what you know. Lilith began to sob. She hid her face behind her fingers and dared not look at Radamanth. The goldsmith chafed and paced the room, hectoring her. "'Don't think to fool me,' he said. "'You know more yet. You would have answered before if there had been any truth in you.' Radamanth's harshness seemed certainly to calm the girl and to conjure up some passing antagonism in her heart. "'The blame is yours, father.' "'Impertinent child!' "'Ukraine was angry with you.' "'Well, have I not treated her like a daughter?' "'She fled away last night.' "'Where?' I don't know. You do. I don't, father. Tis truth. The girl's brown eyes appealed to him tearfully. She was honest enough, and Radamanth knew it. He took her sincerity for granted and proceeded to question her further. How was she clothed, child? Lilith looked at the floor and plucked at her gown with fingers. Do you hear me? Yes, father. Then answer at once. I can't. Upon my soul! Igraine made me promise. Radamanth lost his temper again and began to bluster like a march wind. Lilith's cheeks were wet with her tears. They ran down and dropped into her lap like little crystals. She shook and sobbed in her chair, but answered not a word, a martyr to her promises. Then Radamanth, 
man of money-bags and craft, found something wherewith to loose her tongue. Listen, he said, a certain lad never enters this house again, and you never again have speech with him unless you answer me this at once. The mean measure triumphed. Lilith's tears never ceased, but she gave way at last, and, hating herself, told Radamanth what he wanted. Then he left her there to whimper by herself, and went into the garden to speak with Gorlois. The Count of Cornwall guessed from the merchant's face that matters had fallen out ill for him somewhere. He forestalled Radamanth's confession with an impatient gust of words. She is still in a deuce of temper? My lord, it is otherwise. Then why so glum? Man, have I not uncovered ingots of gold for you if I wed? Radamanth held his hands up like a priest giving a blessing. Any one might have thought him grieved to death by the ingratitude of his niece's desertion. The goldsmith dealt in coarser sentiment. My lord, the girl has forsaken my house and fled. Gorlois had half expected some such news. He said nothing but merely stared at Radamanth with dark, masterful eyes, while his fingers played with the tassels of his belt. His heart was already away over moor and dale, chasing the gleam of a golden head of hair. When did you miss her, goldsmith? She crept away at dusk yesterday. Whither? Heaven knows, my lord. How dressed? As a grey nun. Has she gone back to the church? She did not love such a life, my lord. By God, no. Gorlois frowned a moment in thought. The scent of the girl's dress was still in his nostrils, and her eyes haunted him. Then he turned past Radamanth to go, hitching up his sword belt, a significant habit he had learnt long ago. I shall find her, he said. Good, my lord. I have your countenance. Be kind to the girl, sir. I could go to hell for her. My lord, why not try heaven? A good jest. Men always go to hell for such things, said the goldsmith. There was life and stir enough in Gorlois's great house when its master came back that morning. Gorlois's orders were like a torch to tinder. Men went to every wind, some to the gates, some to the market, others to the religious houses and the inns, all bent on striking the trail of a nun's grey gown. The men knew their master's mood, and the measure of his pulse on such occasions. Gorlois bided quiet in his garden, more like a leopard than a lover. He had made up his mind to catch Igraine, and to win mastery of her, hook or by crook, since she chose to play the shrew and mar his wooing. It was not likely that one of the first men in Britain should be baffled by the temper of a goldsmith's niece. About noon, a certain slave who had gone out to net news came back with much elation and claimed his lord's ear. Brought in before Gorlois, he told how he had talked with a boy selling fruit in the marketplace, and how the boy, when questioned, had told him of a nun he had seen sitting under a tree by the road to Sarum that very morning. The lad had described her as a very beautiful lady, with large eyes, and a cloud of red-brown hair, and that she wore a grey nun's habit somewhat torn and travel-stained. Gorlois thought he recognized a grain, and gave the slave fifty acres and his freedom on the instant. Waiting for further news, word was brought him that a grey nun had been marked by the guard going out of the western gate not very long after dawn. Later still, Gorlois heard of such a nun, calling herself Meliboa, having lodged the night at the great abbey of St. Helena. Gorlois held himself in leash no longer. He buckled on his richly gilt armor, and his great white horse was saddled and brought into the court. Not a knight would he have at his back, neither groom nor page. Getting to horse in the full welt of the afternoon sun, he rode out of Winchester alone, by the western gate, watched of many people. Once clear of the town, he pricked incontinently for Sarum, lusting much to catch Igraine upon the way. About that very same hour, Udall was exerting himself in Igraine's service in the manor farm in the meadows. The men had carried her up from the ford and set her at her own seeking in a shady place in the garden where she might lie at peace. It was a pleasant enough nook where they had set her bed, a patch of bright green grass with a bank of flowers on one hand and a dense laurel hedge hiding it from the track to the house on the other. A vine trained upon poles raised a pleasant pavilion there, Autumn would soon be whispering in the woods, and already some few leaves were ribbed with gold and maroon. Udall played the physician and made a very critical examination of her ankle. 
he prided himself, among his other vanities, on having studied Galen, and since the healing craft is often a matter of phenomenal words and wise nothings, Udall might have outphysicked Gildas at his own game. The art of medicine is the art of hypocrisy, and the sage apothecary is often a broken reed trembling in the wind of ignorance. Udall, having no reputation at stake, pronounced Igraine's hurt to be a mere strain of the ankle joint, and, as it happened, he was right. He swathed her foot in wet linen and set it on a pillow, while the woman who kept house for him, a red-cheeked piece of boxomness, brought wine and foodstuff on a tray. Seeing a nun's habit, the good woman was comforted, and indulged a grain with many smiles and much motherly care. Udall came and sat beside her with a great book on his knee, Virgil's Bucolix, as he told her, and writ most learnedly for the edification of the wise. Udall read very little of the book that afternoon. The volume abode with him for effect, but he preferred rather to dwell upon the more Ovidian interests of the girl beside him, and to talk to her in his familiar and fatherly fashion. He made many sly attempts to get the purpose of her pilgrimage from her, but Igraine had enough wit to keep him discreetly mystified on the subject. She was wondering, all the while, how long her strained ankle would keep her to her bed. Udall smothered her with offers of hospitality. "'On my word, you shall not be dull,' he said. "'Though there is only an old man to entertain you, one day you shall ride out in a litter to my vineyards, another you shall be carried out a-hunting. I have a little wench here who can harp and sing like a mermaid. By the poets, I can make you quite a merry time.' Igraine made the best smile she could and thanked him. "'You must not put yourself out for me.' "'Nonsense!' "'You are very good.' Udall shook his finger with most earnest expression. "'My dear lady, it is duty, duty,' he said. They had not been so very long in the garden when Igraine's quick ear caught the sharp and rhythmic smite of hoofs on the stony track across the meadows. The sound disquieted her, for she was in the mood for dreads and suspicions. Listening to make sure that the sound approached, she appealed to Udall and asked him to look and see who rode for the manor. There was a little wicket gate some way down the laurel hedge carefully screened by shrubs. Udall went to it and scanned the meadows under his hand. He came back somewhat flustered to Igraine, and told her that a knight in gilded armor mounted on a white horse was riding up the track to the house. Igraine started up on her bed with her eyes very big and suspicious. "'It is Gorlois,' she said. "'Heavens, my dear! Have you not been lying to me?' "'On my soul, no!' Igraine touched her forehead with her hand and looked askance at the sun. "'Master Udall, if you would serve me, go and fool the man. Send him away.' "'My dear child, he must not see the servants or have speech with them. "'But I command you, go and speak to him. He is very near.' Udall looked at her with his lower lip a-droop. His grey-green eyes met Igraine's, gleamed and faltered. He bent over the bed. "'I will do my best. Give me a kiss, my dear.' By Augustus, I will get rid of Gorlois if I can. He went out quickly by the wicket gate, and, closing it after him, waited for the night to approach. There were no slaves about, and Udall remembered with confidence that his men were in the cornfields, well away to the north. Gorlois came up with splendid arrogance that so suited him, his rich armor glowing above the white flanks of his horse, his spear balanced on his thigh. Udall went forward some paces to meet him, as though to learn his business. Igraine, listening behind the laurel hedge, heard their words as plainly as though the two men were but three paces away. "'Greetings, sir,' said Yuldal's thin voice. Then she heard Gorlois's clear, sharp tenor questioning him. She heard him ask whether a grey nun had called for food, or whether Yudal had seen or heard of such a person. She heard the old man's meandering negative, and Gorlois's retort that a grey nun had been seen riding beside a merchant on a white mule. Grain's heart seemed to race and thunder. Udall, rising to the event, suggested that the merchant might be a certain fabulous person from Aquae Solis, a man of means, he said, who often came by Sarum to Winchester in the fur trade. He hinted that the knight might overtake him on the road or discover them at Sarum that evening. Gorlois fell to the suggestion. Igraine heard him inquire further of Udall, speak to his horse, and ride away with a ring and clatter. She sat on her couch behind her laurel rampart and laughed. Udall came back to her, pleased as possible. "'How was that done, sweeting?' "'Nobly,' laughed Igraine. 
The virgin pardon me. What perjury for a pair of lips. End of Book 2, Chapter 7 Recording by Thor Van Walsam in Hardwick, Vermont To read things I have written, visit thorvwis.cool Section 18 of Uther and Igraine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thor Van Walsam in Hardwick, Vermont. For more information on this reader, please visit ThorVWIs.cool. Uther and Igraine by Warwick Deeping. Book 2. Chapter 8 Nothing is more chafing to the patience than to lie abed crippled, knowing the while that coveted hours are slipping through one's fingers like grains of gold. To Igraine her maimed ankle was a very thorn in the flesh. Her thoughts were tugging to be at Sarum, and she was in continual fear lest Radamanth or Gorlois should track her to her temporary refuge and attempt to mar her freedom. She was not a woman who could take hindrance with perfect philosophy, comforting herself with the reflection that care never yet salved unrest. She chafed at delay, and even blamed Udall with great unreason, because he had obliged her with a horse, not proof against stumbling. The knowledge that Gorlois rode in search of her did not tend to the easing of her mind. She began to understand Gorlois to the full. He had betrayed so much of himself in Radamanth's garden that her dread grew nearly as great as her disrelish. Udall had made her comfortable enough in his manner. She had no need to find fault with his hospitality. She had her own room, a little girl to wait and sing to her, fruit and food of the best. She spent the greater part of each day in the garden, her bed being set under the vine leaves. Two of Udall's slaves would carry her down in the morning and bear her back again at night, so that she should not be too venturesome in trying her ankle. The old merchant kept his folk close on the farm and suffered none to go to Winchester or Salisbury, for fear lest the knowledge of Igraine's whereabouts should leak into interested channels. The more the girl saw of Udall, the less she relished him in her heart. The lean look of him, his little green eyes, his thin goat-like beard reminded her much of the picture of some old satyr she had seen in the frescoes on the walls of the triclinium at Winchester. He grew more fatherly and kind to her, would smile like some old saint as he sat and read moralities to her from the lives of some of the fathers. He was very fond of holding her hand and stroking it while he purred sentiment, and made her color to hear his nonsense. He was quite wickedly delighted when he had fetched a blush to her face. He would sit and chuckle and hug himself while his little eyes glistened and his beard shook. Igraine, though her cheeks often tingled, did her best to suffer him, knowing well enough that she was greatly dependent for her peace of mind upon his good will. She would laugh, turn his senile flatteries into jest, and assume his humor as the most vapory and fanciful piece of fun possible. She often hinted that Udall must be neglecting his farm for her sake, though her suggestions were absolutely to no purpose, seeing that Udall had forgotten all about such mundane matters as harvesting or the pressing of cider. One afternoon they had a shrewd fright, and the incident led in its final development to Igraine's leaving the manor in the meadows. She was in the garden with Udall when two horsemen wearing Gorlois's livery rode up to the gate and demanded entertainment with much froth and bombast. They were sturdy, hot-tongued rogues, quick at liquor, quicker still at blasphemy. Udall, much flustered, had them brought into the house and set loose upon a wine flask while he smuggled Igraine out of the garden. There was a barn standing on the other side of a little meadow near the house, and the building was screened by a fringe of pines and a thorn hedge. Udall hurried Igraine to the barn, saw her couched on a pile of hay, closed the door on her, and scampered back to take great care of Gorlois's gentleman. Udall proved a most obsequious and attentive host. He kept the men primed with wine, watched them like a lynx, forbade his slaves and servants the room so that there should be no chance of gossip. The fellows thought themselves well harbored. Udall, hardy old tipster, kept them going with a will till they swore he was the best old gentleman at his cups they had met this side of the Thames. He out-drank, out-yarned, out-jested the pair of them. 
grown very mellow towards evening, they vowed by all the calendar that they loved him so much that they would make a night of it, and not go to bed till they were carried. Udall could have denied himself their great esteem, but there was nothing for it but to humor them. He got rid of the fellows next morning, when they went away sadly, very glazed about the eyes, swearing they would pay him another visit at their very earliest opportunity. Udall, when they were out of sight, went out to the barn and found Igraine comfortably couched there on a mass of hay. The little maid who served her had brought her supper on the sly the night before, and she had fared well enough in her new quarters. As a matter of fact, Udall had had a parting cup with the men that morning, and had hardly outbreathed as yet the maudlin heritage gotten the previous night. He kissed Igraine's hand, mumbled his usual courtesies, excused his long absence with a warmth that nearly brought him to tears. He was somewhat flushed over the cheekbones. His eyes were bright, and his breath pregnant with the heavy scent of wine. Igraine wiped the hand he had kissed on her gown, looked at him with little love or gratitude, and told him that she had been trying to walk, and that her ankle bore her passably. Udall, edging near, proceeded to narrate at preposterous length how he had kept Gorlois's men employed, made them drunk as cobblers, and packed them off innocently to Winchester that morning. He was hugely sly over it all. He came and climbed up beside Igraine on the hay, and pinched her arm with his lean fingers as he talked. There was a gaunt, red, eager look about his face. It was quite twilight in the great barn, and a mingled smell of hay and pitch-pine filled the air, while dusty beams of light filtered through in steady streams. Udall's vinous and fatherly solicitude had developed abruptly into an absurd revelation of his inner self. He had hold of Igraine's arm with one hand, leaving go suddenly. He reached for her waist, poked his gray beard into her face, and made a clumsy dab at her cheek. In a moment the girl's arm had swept him backwards like an impotent bag of bones. She saw him overbalance and roll off the haycock onto the edge of a scythe. Without waiting for more, and with a glimpse of the old fool's slippers still in the air, she slipped down from the hay and out of the barn, and, shutting the door, pegged the catch with a piece of wood. Then she went laughing half-resentfully towards the house, and told them Phoebe that her master had gone to the fields to oversee his slaves. The woman had taken a remarkable dislike to a grain, being sulky-eyed and dumb-saucy in her presence as far as she dared. The grey nun told her that she was ending her sojourn at the farm that morning, and was going on foot for the west. The woman's face changed as suddenly as a spring sky. She was suave and smiling instanter, ready with queries as to a grain's ankle, very eager to pack her wallet with stuff from Udall's larder. A grain with an inward flush saw how the wind blew. She was keen to be gone before Udall should be loosed from the barn. Even the woman's changed mood seemed a tacit insult in itself. She was soon treading the meadows where the backs of Udall's sheep stood out like white boulders on the solitary stretch of green. The country began to be as flat as a table, though there were still masses of woodland piled on either side the great white road. Igraine kept in among the trees with just a glimpse of the highway to keep her to her mark. Her grey gown passed almost imperceptibly among the mold-grown trunks as she went in the checkered light like a grey mouse through green corn. Her ankle bore her better than she had prophesied, and she made fair travelling at a modest pace. Later in the afternoon the strain began to tell in measure, and her ankle ached and felt hot, as though she had done enough. Sitting down on a fallen tree, she watched the road, and waited for someone to pass. A charcoal burner went by with a couple of asses panniered up with a comfortable load. Then came two soldiers and a couple of light wenches who haunted camp and castle and lived to the minute. Next a great wain, half laden up with faggots, came lumbering along, drawn by a pair of sleepy horses, and driven by a peasant in a green smock and leather breeches. A grain took her choice, and, going down from the trees, stood by the roadside, and begged the man of a lift. Seeing a nun looking up at him, the man reined in, climbed down cap in hand, and louted low to her. There was some clean straw spread over the boards at the bottom of the cart. The man helped her up onto the tailboard, and raked the straw into a heap to make her a seat. Then they lumbered on again towards Sarum. In due course, she began to talk to the man as he sat on a couple of faggots and held the ropes. He was an honest, ignorant fellow, with a much-whiskered face that wore a perpetual look of kindly stupidity. Igraine sought to know whether he was going as far as Sarum. The man shook his bushy head like an amiable ogre, and told her that he was for his lord's manor, some two leagues distant. 
where he served as woodman and ranger, or soldier, when there was need of steel. He commended his lord's house to her for lodging, with a solid faith in the generosity of its board. Questioned as to other habitations, he told her of a hermit's cell, set in a little dale in the woods, a cell where wandering folk often found harbor for the night. Igraine made up her mind to choose the ascetic's bread and water, having had enough of the world's welcome. Possibly in some dim and distant way, she began to realize the intense and ingrained selfishness of the human heart. The man of faggots, believing her a holy woman, soon began to relate his domestic troubles to her with the most touching reverence. He told her how his wife had been abed two months from her last childbirth, and how sad and dirty his little cabin was for lack of her hands. He asked a grain to put the woman in her bed-roll, a simple favor that she granted readily enough. Then the fellow, with some stolid pathos, went on to describe how his eldest lad, a boy of eight, had caught a fever through sleeping in the woods after rain, and how he had fallen sick. "'I went to a good monk,' said the man, "'and bought holy water and a pinch of dust from a saint's coffin. "'Party, but it cost me a year's savings. "'The good father bade me pour the water on the boy's head "'and shake the dust over his body. "'Glad I was, holy sister. "'I ran five miles home to cure the lad. "'And is he well?' "'The man gave a doleful whistle. "'The boy died.' said he with pathetic candor and a short catch in his voice. I didn't sleep two whole nights. Then I kissed my woman, mopped her eyes, and went and told the priest. Igraine merely nodded. Ah, the dear father, he told me twas God's will, and that the blessed dust had drifted the lad straight to heaven, where he would be singing next King David like any lord. So he came and buried the boy, and there was an end on it. Igraine, for the moment, felt heavy about the eyes. I should like to see him there, in his little white stole, she said. Do you know, good man, why so many children die? Faith, madam, I have no learning, said the fellow with a dumb stare, because the great God loves to have children laughing for love of him in heaven. Is't so? That is why he took your boy. The man's face brightened with a new dignity. Little Rule was ever a gentle child, he said. I must tell my woman. It will just make her happy. I will pray for her health. God bless you, holy lady. You have a wise, kind heart. Igraine blushed, but said nothing. Presently the man stopped his horses and pointed her to a little path that led, he said, to the hermitage. He helped Igraine out of the cart and knelt on the road for her to give him a blessing. Igraine had a Latin phrase or two from Evangel, and the benediction was earnest enough in spirit, though it lacked genuine authority. Then she took the path through the trees and left the man standing cap in hand by his wagon. Her brief ride with him had done her heart good. A mile's walk through unkempt pastures and straggling thickets brought her to an open dale set beneath the shoulder of a wooded hill. On the grass slope over against she saw the hermitage, a grey cell of unfaced stone standing in a garden in a grove of ancient thorns. By the rivulet that ran half hid by undergrowth, a figure in a brown cassock was drawing water. Passing over the water, Igraine overtook the recluse halfway up the slope to the hermitage garden. She remarked his bald head fringed with a mournful halo of hair, his stooping shoulders, his ungainly weak-kneed gait. Hearing her tread behind him, he turned a tanned face to her, a face that brought forth a smile of brotherly greeting at the sight of a nun. Igraine, by way of creating good feeling, took his water-pot and carried it for him, pleading youth in extenuation of the service. There was a keen yet kindly sapience about the old man's big-nosed face that caught her fancy. He was a bit of a cynic on the surface, but warm as good earth at the heart. Igraine confessed her need of a lodging for the night, and the man retorted bluntly with the remark that the hermitage was not his house, but only a refuge to bury strangers in. Pointing to a great slab of stone that stood near the little cell, he told her that the stone had been his bed, summer and winter, these fifteen years— and that dew, rain, frost, and snow had worked their will upon his body and found it leather. The confession, pithily, almost humorously, put without a trace of rhodomontade, set the girl smiling. She looked at the man's brown buckram skin and congratulated him, embodying her flattery in a little jest that seemed to catch the ascetic fancy. He commended it with a patriarchal twinkle, and, throwing open the door of his cell, surrendered her its shelter. Egraine soon fathomed the shallow compass of the hermitage. It held two pallet beds, some rude furniture and crockery, and such things as were necessary to the old man's craft, namely a scourge, a calthrop set on the end of an iron chair, a coat made of furs, 
a garland of thorn twigs and a pair of spiked sandals. Gardening tools were piled in a corner. Over the doorway hung a rusty suit of harness and a red-crusted sword. Here, in this narrow place, the war tools of world and church were mingled. Igraine turned back into the hermitage garden. It was a quiet spot, webbed with the fairy tracery of flowers and flowering shrubs, golden with helicries, full of the mist of unshorn grass, bright with the water of its little fish pool, where the ferns grew thick. A low wattle fence, climbed about by late-seasoned roses of red, shut the hole within its rustic pale. Some of the herb beds were cut into symbols of holy things, and a bay tree had been laboriously pruned into the rude image of a cross. A number of doves peopled the place, flocking about the hermit as he worked, often lighting on his hands or his shoulders while an old hound dozed in the sun, or followed at his heels. Peace seemed over the little refuge like a tranquil sky. The hermit handed Igraine a hoe, as a matter of custom, and set her to work on the weeds in a neglected corner, while he busied his hands with pruning some of his rose-trees and removing the clay and linen from his grafts. He was by no means the solemn, dismal soul or the kindly simpleton Igraine might have expected. He had a keen, world-wise air about him that made him seem a sort of Christian Diogenes, and it was plain that he had lived much among men. The mingled austerity and happiness of his habits, when set beside his inwardly sympathetic yet somewhat cynic humor, gave a strong interest to his personality that quite commanded a grain's liking. Despite the vast responsibilities of man, as he himself put it, he was not above having a jest at life in general. For, he said, as he pruned his rose bushes, he who knows and obeys the truth can of all men afford to be merry. Igraine, smiling through the boughs, agreed with him from her heart. There are no heaven, she said. Assuredly not, said the hermit almost fiercely. Then why have such mortifications of the flesh, father? Looking up from his pruning, he beamed over the world. I am a very human rogue. Human? Well, you see, sister, mea culpa, I loved the world when I was in it like my own life, and even now if I did not gnash upon myself I should grow frivolous at times. When I have spent a night in the rain, or plied my scourge, it is marvellous how swiftly vain the fabrics of a vaunting pride become. I am dust. I am dust. I cry and am sound at heart again. I look upon bread and olives and a drought of river water as true godsends. Having endured exceeding discomfort of the flesh, I am as happy in the sun here, among my flowers, as a mortal can be. A grain rested on her hoe, and put her head back, while the evening light gave her hair a rare metallic luster. "'You believe in a life of contrasts, father?' The old man suddenly became more serious. "'To tell the truth,' he said, "'I have found that by making myself fanatically uncomfortable so many hours a day, I can attain for the rest of it that simple, contented, and heaven-soaring mood that belongs to the honest Christian. Man's great peril is apathy, and my customs save me from sleepy ease.' There is such a thing as living to pander to the flesh. It is the creed of the majority. In order to enjoy a truly spiritual end, I annihilate the appetites of the body, and, esse homo, marry, conscience whole, clean. Igraine resumed her harrowing of reprobate green stuff. I suppose your doctrine is right for yourself, she said. An answer came back to her leisurely over the rosebush. To the backbone, sister! Yet I am not one who would thrust my habits down other men's throats simply because the said habits happen to suit my soul. All religious methods are a matter of individual experiment. One man may feel more Christian if he drinks wine instead of water. If so, by all the prophets, let him have his wine. I hold doctrinal tyranny to be the greatest curse in Christendom. Igraine agreed with him like a sister. Soon the sun went down with a flood of gold over the trees, the little pool put off sheeny samite for black velvet, and the doves flew up to roost. The hermit, in a genial mood, went to his vesper meditations. Igraine saw him kneel down before the great stone with his scourge and crucifix beside him. She was still carnal enough to prefer the thin comfort of a pallet bed in the hermitage to stone or mother earth. When it had grown dark and very still, she heard the swish of the steel scourge, and the man's muttering mingled with the occasional baying of his dog. This phase of mind was, at her age, quite incomprehensible to her. She remembered to pray that night for the peasant's wife, who had been sick in bed so long, 
and the little lad who lay under the green grass. Then she went to sleep, thinking of Peleus. End of Book 2, Chapter 8 Recording by Thor Van Walsam in Hardwick, Vermont To read things that I have written, visit thorvwis.cool Section 19 of Uther and Igraine This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thor Van Walsam in Hardwick, Vermont. For more information on this reader, please visit ThorVWIs.cool. Uther and Igraine by Warwick Deeping. Book 2, Chapter 9. Radamanth the goldsmith had not wasted the hours since his niece had fled Winchester, and his house in the dark. He was a man who did not let an enterprise slip into the limbo of the past till he had attempted honestly, and dishonestly for that matter, to bring it to a successful issue. He had set his heart on getting Igraine married to one of the first lords in the island, and he also had skew ideas as to brimming up his own coffers. Taking it for granted that Lilith and the girl had not been close friends for weeks together without sharing secrets, and being also strongly of the opinion that Igraine's perversity arose out of some previous affair, he laid methodical siege to his daughter's confidences, and cast a parental dyke about her that should compel her to open every gate and alley to his scrutiny. Lilith, amiable but weak as milk, was soon worn into surrender by her father's methods. He had an unfailing lash wherewith to quicken her apprehension, in that young Mark, the armorer's son, should be barred the house unless she bent to the parental edicts. Lilith soon brought herself to believe that, after all, there could not be so much disloyalty in telling certain of Igraine's adventures to her father. Radamanth, bit by bit, had the whole tale of the way from Evangel to Winchester, seeing how often Igraine, woman-wise, had pictured her man to Lilith, the goldsmith won a clear perception of the strange knight's person, how he rode a black horse, wore red armor, bore a red dragon on a green shield, and was called Peleus. Radamanth made a careful note of all these things, and laid the knowledge of them before Gorlois. Various subtleties resulted from these facts, subtleties carefully considered to catch Igraine. To turn to Udal. That lean old satyr had fallen gravely into error in the conviction that he had fooled Gorlois's men so cleverly over the wine-pot. The deceit had been deeper on the other side, and more effectual seeing that there had been a curtled traitor in the manor camp. If Udal had been stirring just after daybreak on the morning of the carouse, he might have caught one of Gorlois's men coming down a little winding stair that led to a certain portion of the house. A little earlier still, he would have found the fellow with his arm around Dame Phoebe's waist in a dark entry on the stairs. The woman did not love Igraine, nor did she want her in the house. Moreover, Gorlois's man was young, and had fine eyes and a most wicked tongue. Udall, like most diplomats, was far from being infallible while there was a woman in the coil, and Dame Phoebe was very much a woman. Gorlois's fellows had no sooner cleared the meadows that morning than they were away for Winchester at a dusty rattle. It was fast going over the clean, straight road, and the grey walls were not long in coming into view. The pair swung through the western gate, and went straight through the streets in a way that set the city folk staring and dodging for the pathway. At the gate of Gorlois's house, the porter had a vexatious damping for the spirits of these fiery gentlemen. Gorlois had ridden out. The men swore, off-saddled, and made the best of the matter over a game of dice in the kitchen. There was a great bustle when Gorlois had heard the men's tale. They excused their not having taken a grain on the plea that Gorlois had forbidden any to approach her save himself. The man was in a smiting mood, and he swore Udall should rue giving him the lie, and sending him a wild chase miles into the west. Getting to horse at once, and taking the two men with some ten more spears, he rode out and held for Sarum. There was a swirl of dust before Udall's gate, and a sharp scattering of shingle as Gorlois and his troop rode up. A slave who had seen them by the garden, and had taken them for robbers, was prevented from closing the gate by a brisk youth wedging it with his foot. There was a short scuffle at the tottering door. 
Then Gorlois and his men burst it in, and cut down those slaves on the threshold who had tried to close the door. The women folk were herded screeching into the kitchen, and penned there like sheep. Out of a cupboard in an upper room they dragged the woman Phoebe, limp with fright, and hurried the truth out of her that Ygraine had gone that very morning, and that Udall was still in the fields. Gorlois, believing her a liar, had the house searched, beds overturned, cupboards torn open, every nook and cranny probed. Then they tried the garden and the stables, with like fortune. One of the fellows, catching sight of the barn across the meadows, half hidden by pines, they made a circle around it, closed in, and forced the door. A blinking, red-eyed face came up out of the shadows, its beard and thin thatch of hair wisped with hay. Udall, collared with little kindness, began to wonder after his drunken sleep who these rough folk could be. A word as to a grain brought him to his senses. He saw Gorlois, a dark-bearded, black-eyed man with a frown that he did not like the look of. He began to shake in his slippers, to excuse himself and to deny all knowledge of the girl since the morning. Matters were against Udall. Gorlois thought that he had plucked the old man from hiding, and that he was a liar to the bone. His shrift was short, measured out by the man's hard malice. They struck him down at the door of his own barn, covering his gray head with his hands and screaming for mercy. His blood soaked the hay and shot black streaks into the dusty floor. Then they cast back to the manor, and half-throttled the woman Phoebe, till Gorlois was satisfied that he had got all the truth from her he could. In half an hour they were at gallop again for Sarum. Gorlois reigned in cruelly more than once to fling hot questions at the folk they passed upon the road. His horse was all sweat and foam, and its mouth bloody with the heavy hand that played on the bridle. Wayfarer after wayfarer looked up half in awe at the iron-faced man towering above them in the stirrups. Their blank, irresponsive faces chafed Gorlois's patience to the bone. Not a word did he win of Ygraine and her gray gown. Waxing sullen as granite and very silent, he looked neither to right nor left, but plodded on like a baffled sleuth-hound, with the rest of the pack trailing at his tail. The girl's hair seemed tossing over the edge of the world, like a golden hue from the west, and there was a passionate wind through the man's moody thought. It was towards evening when Gorlois, with his men, a bunch of spears, came upon the peasant in the green smock, driving his wainload of faggots slowly toward the setting sun, and began his catechism anew. The fellow pulled up in his team, and, eyeing the horseman with some caution, acknowledged curtly that he had carried in his cart a league or more such a woman as Gorlois had pictured. To further quick queries, he proved stubborn and boorish. Gorlois had lost his temper long ago. "'Speak up, you devil's dog!' The man looked sullen. Gorlois's sword flashed out. He spurred close up and held three feet of menacing steel over the peasant's head. "'Well, you'll be damned,' he said. "'What want you with the woman, lording? "'Am I to argue with a clod of clay? "'The woman is marked for great honor and must be taken. "'Will you spoil her fortune?' "'The man fingered the reins, looking hard at Gorlois with his stupidly honest face. "'He guessed he was some great lord by his harness and his following. "'It was not for him to gainsay such a gentleman, "'especially when he flourished a naked sword.' "'I would do best for the good nun, lording,' he said. "'Then speak out.' "'She promised to pray for my woman.' Gorlois gave a laugh and scoffed at the notion. "'Let prayers be,' he said. "'Tell me where she went.' The man told Gorlois of the hermitage in the dale where Egraine had gone for a night's lodging. He described how the path could be found a mile or more nearer Winchester. Gorlois threw a gold piece into the cart and let the man drive on. Then he sat still on his black horse with his sword over his shoulder, and looked into the wood with dark, glooming eyes. For a minute he sat like a statue, staring on nothing in the keen thought. His men watched him, looking for some swift swoop from such a pinnacle of pondering. They knew his temper. His sword shot back into its scabbard, and he was keen as a wolf. Galeas of Camelford a man with a hooked nose and high cheekbones heeled his horse forward and saluted. Ride hard, find the hermitage, be wary, watch at a distance for sight of the Lady Igraine. 
If she is at the Hermitage, gallop back to Sarum before nightfall. I shall be in Sir Accolon's house. Attend me there. The man saluted again, turned his horse in stanter, and rode hard into the east. Gorlois, with a half-smile on his lips, rode on with his troop for Sarum. In Sarum town there was a queer house of stone, very dark and very saturnine. It was hid away behind high walls and hedged so blackly with yews and hollies that it seemed to stand in the gloom of a perpetual twilight. After dark, a sullen glow often hung above the trees. Casements would blaze blood-red light into boughs creaking and clutching in the wind. Or there would be a moony glimmer on the glass, and belated folk passing near might hear voices or elvish music about them as though dropped from the stars. It was the house of Merlin, the man of dreams, wrapped in the gloom of immemorial yews. That night Gorlois sat in a room hung with black velvet, where a brazier held a dying fire, and a bowl thereon steamed up perfumes in a heavy vapor. A man with a face of marble and eyes like an eternal night was chaired before him with long, lean, restless fingers, continually touching the cloud of hair that fell blackly over his eyes. His fingers were packed with rings gemmed with all manner of stones, jasper, sardonyx, chrysolite, emerald, ruby, and the like. His gown was of black velvet, twined all about with serpent scrolls of white cloth. On his breast was broached a great diamond that blazed and wavered back the glow from the fire. Gorlois sat in his carved chair, stiff as any image. His strenuous soul seemed mewed up by the psychic influence of the man before him. He spoke seldom, and then only at the other's motion, at a curious gesture of one of those long, lean hands. The room was silent as the burial hall of a pyramid, and it had and it had the air of being massed above by stupendous depths of stone. Presently the man in the black robe began to speak with deliberate intent, holding his voice deep in his throat so that it sounded much like the voice of an oracle declaring itself in the noise of a wind. The woman is beautiful beyond other women, like a true golden may, and true as a sapphire, yet will not have you. Not a shred of me. The man with the rings smiled out of his impenetrable eyes and fingered the brooch on his breast. The woman has great destiny before her. Ah! I have seen her star in the night. You dare take her fate on you? Like ivy holds a tree. As a wife? Gorlois laughed. How else? As a wife by the church. Ah, or no help of my hand. Again there was silence. A coal fell in the brazier and seemed like a rock down a precipice. The black eyes that stared down Gorlois were full of light and strangely scintillant. Gorlois listened, with his limbs asleep and his brain in thrall, while the man spoke like a very Michael out of a cloud. The clear, glittering plot given out of Merlin's lips came like a dream vivid to the thought of the dreamer. If Gorlois obeyed, he should have his desire, and catch Igraine to a white marriage bed by law and her own willing. The fire died down in the brazier, and the bowl ceased to smoke perfumes. Gorlois saw the man gather his black robe with his glittering fingers, and move like a wraith round the room, to stand beckoning by the door. In another minute, Gorlois was under the stars, with the house and its yews a black mound against the sky. Like a sleeper half-wakened, he took full breath of the night air, and stretched his arms up above his head. But it was not to sleep that he passed back through the void streets to the house of the night Acolon, to return to Igraine housed for the night in the little hermitage. At the first creep of dawn, when daffodils were thrown up against the eastern sky, she left her pallet bed in the cell and went out into the hermit's garden. The recluse was down at the brook drawing water, whither the dog and the doves had followed him. Igraine passed through the garden, spun over as it was with webs of dew. To her comfort she found her ankle scarcely troubling her, for she had feared pain or stiffness after the walk of yesterday. Going down the dale, she patted the old dog's head and picked up the pitcher as the recluse gave her good morning. "'You're an early soul, sister.' 
My dog and I came down to the brook each morning as the sun peeps over the hill. You are not lonely, said Egrain. The old man tightened his girdle, looking over the solemn piers of the woods, sniffed the air, and hailed an autumn savor. Not I, he said. I have my dog and my doves, and folk often lodge here, and I have word of the world and how the Saxons vex us. The good people near bring me alms and pittances, or come to ask prayers for their souls, and— with a twinkle, for their bodies, too. Igrain remembered the peasant's little son. Was it you, she said, who gave a peasant fellow near here a saint's dust to scatter over a sick child? The old man shook his head and smiled enigmatically. I have no dealings in such marvels, he said. The boy died. Of course, they will sell your dust some day. A keen look, cynical with beaming scorn, spread over the man's gaunt face. "'Much good may it do them,' he said. "'Death is monstrous flatterer of mere clay. I may feed a rose-bush with my bones, a better fate than the cheating of superstitious women.' He made a sign with his hands, and the birds went wheeling in circles above him. The dog crept up and thrust his snout into the old man's palm. The garden lay above them, ripe with an autumn mellowness. Yet there was no regret, though winter would soon be piping, and the man's hair was gray. "'What think you of life?' said Egrain. "'You should know, sister, as well as I. "'But you see, father, I am not a nun, uh, only a novice.' He stared at her a moment with a slight smile. "'Remain a novice,' he said. "'You advise me so. "'Why subordinate your soul to chains forged of men?' These seem strange words. He patted his dog's head and, half stooping, looked at her with keen gray eyes. Have you ever loved a man? Yes, she said, with a clear laugh and a slight color. Is he worthy? I believe him a noble soul. Naturally. He ran away and left me because he thought I was a nun. The hermit applauded. That sounds like honor, he said critically. I am seeking him to tell him the truth. And I will pray that you may soon meet, said the old man, for there is nothing like the love of a good man for a clean maid. If I had married a true woman, I should never have taken to the scourge or the stone bed. Marry wisely, and you are halfway to heaven. They broke fast that morning in the garden, it being the man's custom to make his meals on the granite slab that served him as a bed. The little dale looked very green and gracious in the tranquil light, with its curling brook and dark barriers of trees. Igraine, as she sat on the great stone and ate the hermit's bread, followed the brook with her thoughts, wondering whether it became the stream that ran through Udall's meadows. She was for Sarum that day, where she would throw off her grey habit and take some dress more likely to baffle Gorlois. She had enough money in her purse. Worldling again, she could give herself to winning sight of this Uther, and to learning whether he was the Peleus she sought or no. As she sat and fingered her bread, something she saw down the dale made her rigid, and still as a priestess smitten with the vision of a god in some heathen oratory. Her eyes were very wide, her lips open and very white, her whole air as one watching in a sudden stupor of awe. Another moment and she had broken from the mood like a torrent from a cavern. With eyes suddenly amber-bright, she touched the hermit's hand and pointed down the dale, gave him a word or so, then left him and ran down the hill. A man on a black horse had ridden out from the trees, and was pushing his horse over the brook at a shallow spot not far away. The armor glowed in the sun with a metallic luster. Even at that distance, Igraine had seen the red dragon rampant on a shield of green. As she ran down the grass slope, she called the man by name, thinking to see him turn and come to her pushing on sullenly as though he had not heard the cry that went after him like a winged love, he drew up the further slope without wavering, and sank like a red streak into the dense green of the trees. End of Book Two, Chapter Nine Recording by Thor Van Walsam in Hardwick, Vermont To read things I have written, visit thorvws.cool Section 20 of Uther and Igraine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Thor Van Walsum in Hardwick, Vermont. For more information on this reader, please visit thorvwis.cool. Uther and Igraine by Warwick Deeping. Book 2, Chapter 10. Igraine forded the brook and followed the man by the winding path that curled away into the wood. She was ever a sanguine soul, and the mere sinister influences that might have discouraged her in her purpose that morning were impotent before the level convictions of her heart. She had seen Peleus ride in amid the trees. She was sure as death to his cognizance and his armor. Now Peleus, she could vow, had not heard her call to him, and if he had heard, he had not understood. If he had seen, he had not recognized. Doubts could have no place in the argument before such a justification by faith. It was not long before she caught sight of the red glint of armor going through the trees. It came and went, grew and disappeared, as the path folded in its curves or thrust out a heavy screen of green to hide it like a heavy curtain. The man was going as he pleased, now a walk, now a casual jog, now a short burst of a canter over an open patch. One moment, a grain would see him clearly, then not at all. Sometimes she gained, sometimes lost ground, yet the knight of the red harness never seemed to come within lure of her voice. In due course, she reached the place where the path ended bluntly on the Winchester High Road, and where the way ran straight as a spear shaft, so that she could see Peleus riding for Winchester with a lead of a quarter of a mile. The distant ringing tramp of hoofs came up to her like a mocking chuckle. Putting her hands to her mouth, she hallooed with all the breath left her by her run through the wood, yet, as far as she might see, the man never so much as turned in the saddle, while the smite of hoofs died down and down into a well of silence. Another halloo and no echo. He's asleep, or deaf in his helmet. She forgot the distance and the din of hoofs that might well have drowned the thin cry that could have reached the rider. Moger, her heat, and her flushed face, Igraine had no more thought of giving in than she had of marrying Gorlois. With Peleus so near, she had made her vow to follow him, and follow him she would like a comet's tail. If needs be, she would wear her sandals to the flesh, but catch the man she must in the end. A mile more on the high road, with her feet and the hem of her gown dust drenched, and she was still little nearer the man in the red harness for all her hurrying. She could have vowed more than once that he turned in his saddle and looked back at her, as though to see how near she had come to him on the road. A mile from the hermitage path he turned his horse southwards from the track into a grass valley, headed by a ruined tower and hedged densely on either hand by pine woods. Igraine, seeing from a slight rise in the road this change of course, cut away crosswise with the notion of getting near the man or of intercepting him before he should win clear law again. After all, the effort added only more vexation. She saw the black horse pressed to a canter and crossed the point where she might have cut him off, while a great stretch of firs that rolled away to the black palisading of the pines came down and threw a promontory in her path. Peleus was a mile to the good when she had skirted the firs and the bend of the wood, and taken a straight course southwards down the valley between the pines. All that morning the sport of hunter and hunted went on between the novice in grey and the man on the black horse. For all her trouble, Igraine won little upon him, lost little as the hours went by, while the rider, in turn, seemed in no wise desirous of being rid of her for good. They passed the pine woods with their midnight aisles, forded a stream, climbed up a heath, went over it amid the heather. From the last ridge of the heath, Igraine saw the country sloping away into undulating grasslands, piled here and there with domes of thicketed trees. Far to the south, a dense black mass rose like a rounded hill against the sky. The man in red was still about a mile in front of her, riding slowly, a red speck in a waste of green. Igraine, having him in view from her vantage point, lay down full length to rest and take some food. She was tired enough, but dogged at heart as ever. She vowed that if the man was playing with her, she would tell him her mind, love or no love, when she came up with him in the end. As the sun swam into the noontide arc, she went on again downhill, and found in turn that the man had halted, for he had been hidden by trees, and getting view of him suddenly she saw him sitting on a stone with his horse tethered near. As soon as Igraine was within measurable distance, she took advantage of a hollow, dropped on her hands and knees, and began to crawl like a cat after a bird. 
Edging round a thicket, she came quite near the man, but could not see his face. His spear stood in the ground by his horse, and he had his shield slung about his neck, and a bare poniard in his hand. It was clear that he was watching for a grain, for despite her craft, he caught sight of her face, peering white under the hem of a bush, and climbed quickly into the saddle. A grain started up, made a dash across the open, calling to him as she ran. Perverse as hate, his horse broke into a canter and left her far in the rear. The girl shook her fist at him with a sudden burst of temper. She was standing near the stone where the man had been sitting. Looking at his flat face, she saw the reason of the naked poniard in his hand, for he had been carving out thin, straggling letters into the stone. Sancta Igraine, she read. Ora pro nobis. The screed dispelled the doubts in Igraine's mind on the instant. Palpably the man knew well enough who was following him, and was avoiding her of set purpose. But for what reason Igraine racked her wit to discover? She ran through many things in her heart, the possible testing of her devotion, a vacillating weakness on Peleus's part that would not let him leave her altogether, a freakish wish to give her penance. Then she knew that he was superstitious, and the thought flashed to her that he might think her a wraith or some evil spirit that had taken her shape to give him in temptation. Mogur, her spirit, and her pride, she held again on the trail, eating as she went some dried plums that she had in her wallet. The man had slackened down again and was less than half a mile away, now limbed against the sky, now folded into a hollow or shut out by trees. Like a marsh fire, he tantalized her with a mystery of distance, holding steadily south at a level tramp, while Igraine plodded after him, her hair down and blowing out to the casual wind, her eyes at gaze on the red lure in the van. So the mellower half of the day passed, and towards evening they neared the mount of trees Igraine had seen from the last ridge of the heath at noon. The black horse was heading straight for the cloudy mass in a way that set Igraine thinking and casting about for Peleus's motive. Perhaps he had some quest in the solitary place that needed his single hand. Would he take to the wood and let her follow as before, or had he any purpose in leading her thither? Drowned in conjecture, she gave up prophecy with a vicious sense of mystification, and accepted inevitable ignorance for the time being as to the man's moods and motives. She was no less obstinate to follow him to the death. If she only had a horse, she would come near the man, pride or no pride, and tell him the truth. Pressing on, with her strained ankle beginning to limp, she topped the round back of a grass rise and came full in view of the wood she had long seen in the distance. It looked very solemn in the declining light. The great trunks of giant beeches were packed pillar upon pillar into an impenetrable gloom. The foliage above, densely green, billowy, touched with red and gold, rolled upwards cloud on cloud as the ground ascended to the south and east. A great bronze carpet of dead leaves swept away into the night of the trees. There was an eternal hush, a gross silence over the glooming aisles that seemed to beckon to the soul, to draw the heart into the night of foliage as into a cavern. Over all was the glowing aegis of the setting sun. Igraine saw the man on the forest's edge, where an arch of gloom struck into the inner shadows. He was facing the west, motionless as stone on his black horse, with the slanting light plucking a dull red gleam from his harness. There was a mystery about him that seemed to harmonize with the stillness of the trees and the black yawn of the forest galleries. Igraine imagined that he might be in a mood at last to speak with her if he believed her human. At all events, if he took to the trees and she did not lose him, she would have the vantage of him and his horse in such a barricaded place. It began to grow dark very quickly as she passed down the gradual slope towards the forest. The trees towered about her, a black mass rising again towards the east. Keen to see the man's mood, she hurried on and found him still steadfast in the great arch that seemed like the gate of the wilderness, ready to abide her. A hundred paces more, and her heart began to beat the faster, and the moil of the day's march dwindled before the influx of a rosier idol. Every step towards Peleus seemed to take her higher up the turret stair of love, till her lips should meet those that bent at last from the gloom to hers. 
pride and vexation lay, fallen far below, dropped incontinently like a ragged cloak. A more generous passion shone out like cloth of gold. She was no longer weary. Her eyes were very bright, her face full of a splendid wistfulness, as she neared the man under the trees, looking up to see his face. Twilight lay deep violet under the wool shah, while horse and man were dim and impalpable, great shadows of themselves. Egrain could not see the man's face, for the mask over the mazale of his helmet, and he was silent as death. She was quite close to him now, and ready to speak his name, when he wheeled suddenly, looked back at her, and pointed into the wood with his long spear. She ran forward and would have taken hold of his bridle, but he waved her back and slanted his spear at her in mute warning. Egrain, heart-hungry, could hold herself no longer. Man, man, are you stone? He rode straight ahead into the night of the trees, and said never a word. Egrain drew her breath. Peleus! Ah, Egrain! The voice that came to her was muffled like the voice of a mourner, yet the girl thought she caught the old deep tone of it, like the low cry of the wind. Why do you vex me? Follow. Peleus, Peleus, I am no nun! Follow. I kept this truth from you too long. Follow. Peleus, would you hurt my heart more? Follow. God shall make all plain and good. She gave in with a half-sob, and bent quietly to the man's mood, though she had no notion what he purposed in his heart, or what his desires were in mystifying her thus. No doubt it would be well in the end if Peleus bade her follow like a penitent and promised ultimate peace. At last he had not turned her away, and she trusted him to the death. He was a strong, deep-sensed soul she knew, and her deceiving may have made him bitter in measure, and not easily appeased. In this queer trial of endurance, this tempting of her temper, she thought she read a penance laid upon her, by the man for the way she had used his love. They were soon far into the wood, with the western sky dwindling between the innumerable pillars of the trees. It began to be dark and utterly silent, save for the rustle of the dead leaves as they went, and the shrilling chafe of bridle or scabbard, or the snort of the great horse. Wherever the eye turned, the forest piers stood straight and solemn as the columns in a hypostyle hall in some Egyptian temple. The fretwork of boughs roofed them in with hardly a glimmering through the darkening sky above. There was a pungent autumn scent on the air that seemed to rise like the incense of years that had fallen to decay on the brown flooring of the place, and there was no breath or vestige of a wind. Presently, as the day died, the wood went black as the winter night, and Igrain kept close by the man, with his armor giving a dull gleam now and again to guide her. They were passing up what seemed to be a great arcade cut through the very heart of the wood, as though leading to some shrine or altar, relic of druid days, or times yet more antique. The tunnel ran a curved course, bending deeper and deeper as it went into the dense horde of trees. So dark was the wood that it was possible to see but a few paces in advance, and Igrain wondered how the man kept the track. She was close at his stirrup now, with the dark mass of him and his horse riding above her like a statue in black basalt. Though he never spoke to her, and though she touched no part of him, his horse or his harness, she felt content with the queer sense of trust and proximity that pervaded her. There was magic in the mere companionship, as she had humbled her will to Peleus's the night when he had taken her from the beech tree in Andredswold, so now in like fashion she surrendered pride and liberty and became a child. Suddenly the trackway straightened out into a great colonnade that ran due south between trees of yet vaster girth. Igraine felt the man rein in and abide motionless beside her, as she held to the stirrup and waited for what next should chance. Silence seemed like depths of black water over them, and they could hear each other take breath like the faint flux and reflux of a sea. Igrain saw the man lift his spear, a dim streak less black than the vault above, and hold it as a sign for her to listen. Her blood began to tingle a very little. There was something far away on the dead, stagnant air, 
a sort of swirl of sound, shrill and harmonious. Like a wind playing through the strings of a harp, it was very gradual, very impalpable. As the volume of it grew, it seemed to rush nearer like a wind, to swell into a swaying plaintive song smitten through with the wounded cry of flutes. It gave a notion of wood phase dancing, of whirling wings and flittering gossamer moonbright in the shadows. Igraine's blood seemed to spin the faster, and her hand left the stirrup and touched the man's thigh. He gave never a word or sign in the dark. She spoke to him very softly, very meekly. What place is this, Peleus? She saw him bend slightly in the saddle. It is called the Ghost Forest, he said. What are the sounds we hear? Who can tell? Ygraine had hardly heard him when a streak of phosphor light flickered among the trees, coming and going incessantly as the great trunks intervened. It neared them in gradual fashion, and then blazed out sudden into the open aisle, a man in armor riding on a great white horse, his harness white as the moon, his face pale and wide-eyed, his hair like a mass of twisted silver wire. A misty glow haloed round him, and, though he rode close, there seemed no sound at all to mark his passing. As he had come, so he went, with streaks of flickering light that waxed less and less frequent till they died in the dark, and left the place empty as before. Egrain thought the air cold when he had gone. She felt the black horse move beside her, and they went on as before into the night of the trees. The noise of flute and harp that had ceased a while bubbled up again quite near, so that it was no longer the ghost of a sound, but noise, more definite, more discreet. It had a queer way of dying to a sighing breath, and then gathering gradually into an ascending burst of windy melody. Egraine could almost fancy that she had heard the sweep of wings, the soft thrill of silks trailing through the trees, yet the man on the horse said never a word, as they went on like a pair of mutes to a grave. The colonnade opened out abruptly on a great circular clearing in the wood shut in by crowded trunks, its open vault above cut by a dense ring of foliage. A gray light came down from the sky, showing great stones piled one upon another, others fallen and sunk deep in rank grass and brambles. The man halted his horse in the very center of the clearing, with the grain beside him, watchful for what should happen and for the moment when Peleus should unbend. Hardly had she looked over the great Chromalex, black and sinister in that solitary wilderness, than the whole wood about them seemed dusted suddenly with points of fire. North, south, east, and west torches and cressets came jerking redly out of the night, flitting behind the trees in a wide circle, gathering nearer and nearer without a sound. They might have been great fireflies, playing through the aisles and ways, or— goblin lamps carried by fairy folk. Igraine drew very close to the man's horse for comfort, and looked up to see his face, but found it dark and hidden. Her hand crept up past the horse's neck, rested on the mane a moment, and ventured yet further to meet the man's hand where it gripped the bridle. For a minute they abode thus without a sound, watching the weird torch dance in the wood. With a sudden gibber of laughter and a swirl of pipes, the throng of lights seemed to seethe to the very margin of the clearing. Queer, fantastic shapes showed amid the trees, and the great circle grew wide with light, and the gray cromlechs surprised in sleep by the glare and piping. At that very moment, Igraine had a thought of someone looking deep into her eyes, of a will, a power, streaming in upon her like sunlight into a sleepy pool. Her desire went from the man on the black horse into the square shadow of the great central cromlech, where an indefinite influence seemed to lurk. Looking long under the roofing stone, she grew aware of a tall something standing there, of a pair of eyes like the eyes of a panther, of a lean white hand moving in the shadows. The eyes under the cromlech seemed to follow a grain like fire, and to burn in upon her a foreign influence. Rebellious and wondering, she stiffened herself against a spiritual combat that seemed moving upon her out of the dark. She could have smitten the eyes that stared her down, and yet the magnetic stupor of them kindled things in her heart that were strange and newly sensuous. 
she felt her strength sway as though her soul were being lifted from her, and she was warmed from top to toe like one who has taken wine, and whose being swims into an idyllic glorification of the senses. Again her desire seemed turned to the man in red harness, yet when she looked the saddle was empty, and the horse held by an armed servant who wore a wolf's head for covering. Still mute with fear, desire, and wonder, she saw a tall figure move into the full glare of the torches, a figure in red harness with a shield of green, and a red dragon thereon, and with head unhelmed. The armor was like the armor of Peleus, but the face was the face of the man Gorlois. And now the eyes under the shadow of the Cromlech were full and strong upon Igraine. Breathing fast with a hand at her throat, she stepped back from Gorlois, hesitated, stood still. She was very white, and her eyes were big and sightless like the eyes of one walking in a dream. For all her strength, her scorn, and the tricking of her heart, she was being swept like a cloud into the embraces of the sun. Reason, power, love, shrank away and became as nothing. A shudder passed over her. Presently her hands dropped limp as broken wings, and her body began to sway like a tall lily in the breeze. A gradual stupor saw her coleptic. She stood impotent, played upon by the promptings of another soul. Gorlois went near to her with hands outstretched, stooping to look into her face. A sudden light kindled in her eyes. Her lips parted, and new life flooded red into her cheeks as at the beck of love. She bent to Gorlois full of a gracious eagerness, a wistful desire that made her face golden as dawn. Her hand sought his, while the shadowy shape under the cromlech watched them with never-wavering eyes. Gorlois's arms were round her now, all wreathed in her hair. Her face was turned to his. Her eyes were clasped upon his neck. Another moment, and he had touched her lips with his. A sound of flutes the tinkling of a bell, and a solemn company came threading from the trees, guests, acolytes, torch-bearers in glittering cloth of gold, with a great crucifix to lead them. Gorlois and Igraine were hand in hand near the stone that hid the frame of Merlin. A priest in a gorgeous cape drew near, and began his patter. The vows were taken, the pact sealed, with the noise of a chant and music. Thus, under the benedictions of the great trees and the spell of Merlin, Gorlois and Igraine were made man and wife. End of Book Two, Chapter Ten. Recording by Thor Van Walsam in Hardwick, Vermont. To read things I have written, visit thorvws.cool. Section 21 of Uther and Igraine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle, West Orange, New Jersey, United States of America. Uther and Igraine by Warwick Deeping. Book 3 The War in Wales. Chapter 1. Aurelius Ambrosius, the king, was dead, taken off in Winchester by the hand of a poisoner. He had been found stark and cold in his great carved bed, with an empty wine-cup beside him and a tress of black hair and a tress of yellow laid twined together upon his lips. The signet ring had gone from his finger, and by the bed had been discovered a woman's embroidered shoe, dropped under the folds of the purple quilt." The truth, sinister enough in its bare suggestions, was glossed over by the court folk out of honour to Aurelius, and of love to Uther, the king's brother. It was told to the country how an Irish monk sent by Pacentius, dead Vortigern's son, had gained audience of the king, and treacherously poisoned him as he drank wine at supper. The tale went out to the world, and was believed of many with a sincere and honest faith. Yet a certain child-eyed woman, wandering on the shores of Wales for sight of Irish ships, could have spoken more of the truth, had she so dared. Uther Pendragon had been held king at York before the bristling spears of a victorious host. But a week before he had marched against the heathen on the Humber, 
and overthrown them with such slaughter as had not been seen in Britain since the days when Boadicea smote the Romans. At the head of his men he had marched south in a snowstorm, to be thundered into Winchester as king and conqueror. Twelve maidens of noble blood, clad in ermine and minerva, had run before him with bows of mistletoe and bay. Five hundred knights had walked bareheaded, with swords drawn behind his horse. The city had glistened in a white web of frosted samite, sparkled over by the clear visage of a winter sun. There were many great labours ready to the king's hand. Britain lay bruised by the onslaughts of the barbarians. Her monks had been slain, her churches desecrated. The pirate ships swept the seas, and poured torch and sword along the sunny shores of the south. Andreswald, dark, saturnine, mysterious, alone waved them back with the sepulchral threatening of its trees. Yet for all the burden of the kingdom upon his broad shoulders, Uther gave his first care to the honouring of the dead. Aurelius Ambrosius was buried with great pomp of churchmen and nobles at Stonehenge, and a royal mound raised above the tomb. At Christmas tide, with snow upon the ground, a great gathering was made at Sarum of all the petty kings, princes, and nobles of the land. Hither came Meliogrant, king of Cornwall, and Urientz of the land of Gore. Fealty was sworn with solemn ordinance to Uther Pendragon the king, and common league bonded against the heathen and the whelps of the north. There were other perils brewing for Britain over the sea. Persentius, dead Vortigern's son, had been an outcast and a wanderer since the days when the sons of Constantine had sailed from Armorica to save the land from the blind lust and treason of his father. He had been a drifting fire beyond the seas, an intriguer, a sower of sedition, a man dangerous alike to friend and foe. Beaten like a vulture from the coasts of Britain, he had turned with treasonable hope to Ireland, and its king, Gilomanius the Black, a strenuous potentate, boasting little love for Ambrosius the king. Here, in Ireland, a kennel of sedition had arisen. Persentius, keen, hungry plotter, had toiled at the task of piling enmity against those who had destroyed his father amid the flames of Genorium. A great league arose, a banding of the barbarians with the Irish princes, a union of the Saxons who ravaged Kent with the wild tribesmen over the northern border. Month by month a great host gathered on the Irish coast. Many ships came from the east and from the south. Midwinter was passed before Gilomanius embarked, and, setting sail with a fair wind, turned the beaks of his galleys for the shores of Wales. Noise of the gathering storm had been brought to Uther as he journeyed through the southern coasts, rebuilding the churches, recovering abbey and hermitage from their desolate ashes. His zeal was great for God, and his love of Britain well nigh as noble. Warned thus in due season, he marched for the west, calling the land to arms, assigning for the gathering of the host Colleen upon Usk, that fair city, bosomed in the fullness of its woods and pastures. Many a knight had answered to his call, many a city had sent out her companions. The high roads rang with the cry of steel in the crisp winter weather. Duke Gorlois had come from Cornwall from his castle of Tintagel, bringing many knights and men-at-arms by sea, and the Lady Igraine, his wife, in a great galley whose bulwarks glistened with shields. In Carleon, Gorlois had a house built of white stone, set upon a little hill in the centre of the city. To Carleon he brought this golden falcon of a woman, this untamable thing that he had kept prisoned in the high towers of Tintagel. He mewed her up like a nun in his house of white stone, so that no man should see the fairness of her face. She was wild as an eyes from the woods, fierce and unapproachable and sharp of claw. Robbed of her liberty, had she not sought to take her own life with a sword, and to throw herself from the battlements of Tintagel? Gorlois had won little love by Merlin's subtlety, and he feared the woman's beauty and the spell of her large eyes. It was the month of February, and clear, crisp weather. The white bellies of the Irish sails had shown up against the grey-blue stretch of the sea, 
a white multitude of canvas that had sent the herdsmen hurrying their flocks to the mountains. Horsemen had galloped for Carlion, and the cry of war went up over wood and water. Flames lit the night sky, from Caerleon to St. David's, from St. David's to Erery, the red blaze of beacon fires told of the ships at sea. The cry of the storm arose in Carlion, and the tramp of armed men sounded all day in her streets. The great host lodged about the city, broke camp, and streamed westwards along the high road into Wales. Bugles blew, banners flapped, masses of sullen steel rolled away into purple of the winter woods. Bristling spears and lines of skin-clad shields vanished into the west like the waves of a solemn sea. On the walls of Carlion stood many women and children watching the host march for the west, watching Uther the king ride out with his great company of knights and nobles. At the casement of an upper room in Gorlois's house stood a woman looking out over Carlion towards the sea. She was clad in a mantle of furs and in a tunic of purple linked up with cord of gold. A tippet of white fur clasped with a brooch of amethysts circled her throat. Her hair was bound up in a net of fine silk, and there was a girdle of blue silk about her loins, and an enameled cross upon her bosom. She stood with her elbows resting on the stone sill, and her peevish face clasped between her hands. Her eyes looked very large and lustrous as she stared out wistfully over the city. In the great court below, horses champed the bit and struck fire from the ringing flags. Men in armor clanged to and fro. Rough voices cried questions and counter-questions. Bridles jingled, spear shafts clattered on the stones. Now a clarion blared as a troop of horse thundered by up the street, their armor gleaming dully past the courtyard gate. The growl of war hung heavy over Carlion, a grim, sullen sound that seemed in keeping with the restless chiding of the wind. Igraine's face was hard as stone as she watched the men moving in the courtyard below. She looked older than of yore, whiter, thinner in cheek and neck, her great eyes staunch, though sad under her netted hair. Her face showed melancholy mingled with a constant scorn that had rarely found expression with her in the old days, save within the walls of a vangel. She looked like one who had endured much, suffered much, yet lost no wit of pride in the trial. Though she may have been blemished like a Greek vase smitten by some barbaric sword, she was herself still, brave, headstrong, resolute as ever. The shame of the things she had suffered had perhaps wiped out the gentler outlines of her character, and left her more stern, more wary, less honest, more deep in her endeavours. There was no passive humility or patience about her soul, and she was the falcon still, though caged and guarded beyond her liberty. As she stood at the casement, with the prophetic murmur of war in her ears, it seemed to her as though life surged to her feet and mocked her bondage like laughing water. The desire of liberty abode ever with her, even to the welcoming of stagnant death. She thirsted for her freedom, plotted for it, dreamt of it with a zeal that was almost ferocious. Her life seemed a speculation, a perpetual aspiration after a state that still eluded her. In the evangel days she had been wild and petulant, then Peleus had come through the green gloom of early summer to soften her soul and inspire all the best breath of the woman in her. Again, thanks to Gorlois, she had fallen with the usual reaction of circumstance upon evil times. The change had discovered the peevish discontent of the girl, hardened into the strong willfulness of the woman. She hated Gorlois with a fanatical immensity of soul, when the man was near her, she felt full of the creeping nausea of a great loathing, and she waxed faint with hate at the veriest touch of his hands. His breath seemed to her more unsavory than the miasma of a gutter, and it needed but the sound of his voice to bring all her baser passions braying and yelping against him. He had driven the religious instinct out of her heart, 
and she was in revolt against heaven and the marriage pact forged by the authority of the church. She had often vowed in her heart that she could do no sin against Golois, her husband. He had no claim upon her conscience. The bondage had been of his making. Let God judge her if she scorned his honour. Standing by the window, watching the knights saddling for their lord Sally, she heard heavy footsteps mounting up the stairs and the ring of steel-tipped shoes along the gallery. The footsteps were deliberate, and none too fast, as though the man walked under a burden of thought. A shadow seemed to pass over Igraine's face. She slipped from the window, ran across the room, shot the bolt of the door, and stood listening. A hand tried the latch. She knew well enough whose fist it was that rattled on the oaken panels. Her face hardened to a kind of cold malevolence, and she laughed noiselessly in her sleeve. A terse summons came to her from the gallery. "'Wife, we ride at once.' The man could not have made a worse beginning. There was a suggestion of tyranny in a particular word that was hardly temperate. Igraine leant against the door. She was still smiling to herself, and her hands fingered the embroidered tassel of the latch. "'We are late on the road.' I can make no tarrying. The door quivered a moment, as though shaken by a gusty wind. Everything was quiet again, and Igraine could hear the man breathing. Putting her mouth to the crack between post and hinge board, she laughed stridently, as though in scorn. Igraine! The voice was half imperative, half appealing. My very dear lord. Are you abed? No, dear lord. Open to me. I would kiss your lips before I sally. You have never kissed me these many days. True, wife. Is it fault of mine? Nor shall again, dear lord, if I have strength. She heard the man muttering to himself a moment, but this time there was no smiting of the door, no fume and tempest. His mood seemed more temperate, less masterful, as though he were half heavy at heart. Igrain. "'Why do you whimper like a dog? she said. "'Go, get you to war. What are you to me?' "'When will you learn reason?' "'When you are dead, sire.' "'Perhaps I deserve all this.' "'Are you so much a penitent?' Her mockery seemed to lift Golois to a higher range of passion, and there was great bitterness in his voice as he tossed back words to her with a great kindling of desire. "'Woman, I have been hard in the winning of you, but God knows you are something to me.' "'God knows, Golois, I hate you.' His hand shook the door. "'Let me in, Igraine. "'Break down the door. You shall come at me no other way.' "'Woman, woman, I am a fool. My heart smarts at leaving you.' You sound almost saintly. I have left Brastius in charge of you. Thanks, Lord, for a jailer. Igraine drew back from the door, and stood at her full height with her hands crossed upon her bosom. She quivered as she stood with the intense effort of her hate. Gourloy still waited without the door, though she could not hear him moving— the silence seemed like the deep hush that falls between the blustering stanzas of a storm. Igraine! It was a hoarse cry, quick and querulous. Igraine had both her fists to her chin in an attitude of inward effort, as though she racked herself to give utterance to the implacable temper of her scorn. Her face had a queer, parched look. When she spoke, her voice was shrill, like a piping wind. Go, Alois! Wife, would you have my blessing? Give it me, Igraine. Go then, and look not to me for comfort. When you are in battle, and the swords cry on your shield, I shall pray on my knees that you may get your death. Gourlois gave never a sound as he stood by the barred door with his hand over the mazale of his helmet. It seemed dark and gloomy in the gallery, and the staunch oak fronted him like fate. His eyes were full of a dull light as he turned and went clanging down the stairway with slow, heavy tread. 
his sounding footsteps died down into the din of arms that came from the great court. Igraine ran to the window and watched him and his men ride out, smiling a bleak smile as the last mailed figure gleamed out by the gate. End of Book Three The War in Wales Chapter One Section 22 of Uther and Igraine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle, West Orange, New Jersey, United States of America. Uther and Igraine by Warwick Deeping. Book 3 The War in Wales. Chapter 2. When Golois and his knights had gone, Igraine unbarred the door and passed down the narrow stair to the state chamber of the house, where a fire was burning. It was a solemn room, shadowed with many arches, with vaults inlaid with marble, its walls painted green and gold, its glimmering casements lozenged with fine glass. Furs were spread upon the mosaic floor, painted urns held flowers that bloomed in the mock summer of the room. Igraine stood and warmed herself before the fire. From an altar-like pillar near she took storax and galbanum from brazen bowls and scattered the resinous tears upon the flames. A pungent fragrance rose up into her nostrils. The flicker of the fire played upon her face and set a luster in her eyes. It was winter weather and the warmth was welcome. The refrain of her talk with Gorlois still ran at fever heat like a wild song through her brain. She was stirred to the deeps of her strong soul. For Gorlois she had no measure of pity. He was a rotten tree to her, a slab of granite, anything but quick flesh and blood capable of aspiration and desire. She hated him more for his pleading than for his tyranny, fearing to be pleased by one she dreaded. He was strenuous and obstinate. She knew that it would be great joy to her if she saw his face no more, and if his body crumbled in the rain on some bleak coast in Wales. As she stood by the fire and looked into it with pondering eyes, she heard a curtain drawn and the sound of a footstep on the threshold. Turning briskly, like one accustomed to suspicions, she saw the man Brastius in the doorway looking at her, half furtively, as though none too proud of the office thrust upon him. He had great grey eyes and a calm face. Bending stiffly to a grain with his hand over his heart, he turned aside to a cabinet by the wall, took therefrom an illumined scroll of legendary tales, and sat down on a bench to read, as though he had no other business in the room. A grain's long lip curled. She knew the meaning of the man's presence there shrewdly enough. Going to a window, she opened the casement frame and looked out on the winter scene, usk winding silver to the sea, the purple roll of the bleak bare woods, the far sea itself dying a sullen streak into a sullen sky. It was dreary enough, and yet it suited her. She could have welcomed thunder and the rend of forked fire above the woods. Thought was fierce in her, with the wind crying about the house like a wistful voice, the voice of days long dead. To be free of Gorlois, to cast off her present self like a rotten cloak, to adventure liberty, though the peril were shrill as the wind through the swaying pines on the hillside, to deal with Brastius. Now, Brastius was a grave-faced knight, neither young nor old, but a very boy in the matter of the mock wisdom of the world. He was possessed of one of those generous natures that looks kindly on humanity, with a simple optimism born of a contented conscience. He was a devout man, a soldier, and a gentleman. Moreover, he owned a holy reverence for women, a reverence that led him into a somewhat extravagant belief in the sincerity of their truth and virtue. He was blessed, too, in being nothing of a cynic in his conceptions of honour. Gorlois knew the man to the heart and trusted him, a fact well proven by the faith imposed upon him in his wardenship of the Lady Igraine. Brastius hated the task as much as he hated the telling of a lie. 
There are some men whose whole instinct is towards truth. They are golden souls, often too easily deceived with a gross dross that makes an outward show of kindred colour. Brastius was no stranger to Igraine, for he had served her as one of the knights of the guard in the great castle of Tintagel. He was a man who could look into a woman's eyes and make her feel instinctively the clear honour of his soul. There was nothing of the flesh about Brastius, and it was in this chivalrous faith of his that Igraine discovered a credulity that might make him prone to believe a certain profession of faith that was taking sudden and subtle form within her mind. Months ago, she would have hesitated before the man's grey eyes, but feeling herself sinned against, and stirred by the shame of the past, she found ample justification for herself in the lie Gaulois had practised for her undoing. She left the window and went and stood by the fire with her back to the man. Brastius, she said, quite softly. The man looked up from the scroll and seemed ill at ease. I trust your duty is pleasant to you. Brastius's eyelids flickered nervously, and he cleared his throat. May the virgin witness, he said. I have no love of the task. My lord Gorlois trusts you. He has said so, madam. And am I not his wife? Brastius put the scroll aside with a constrained deliberation. He felt himself wholly in the wrong, as he always did before a woman, and his wit ran clumsily on such occasions. It had needed but the observation of a child to mark the gulf between Gaulois and his wife. Gaulois had spoken few words on the matter, had given commands and nothing more. Brastius was not the man to tamper officiously with the confidences of others. He thought much, said little, and bided quiet for a green to speak. She stood half-turned towards the fire, with her face in profile and her hands hanging limply at her side. Looking for all the world like a penitent, she spoke with a certain unconscious pathos, as though she touched on a matter that was heavy upon her heart. Brastius, I may call you a friend. I trust so, madam. Then there is no reason for me to be backward in speaking of the truth. The man bowed and said nothing. Come then, Brastius, tell me honestly, have I seemed to you like a woman who loved her husband? The girl's blue eyes were staring hard into the man's grey ones. There was little chance of prevarication before so blunt a question, and Brastius's courtesy like Balaam's ass, refused to deny the scrutiny of truth. Igraine could read the man's face like a piece of blazoned parchment. Never fear to be frank, she said. Your belief hangs on your face like an alphabet, and that shows me how much you know of a woman's heart. Pardon me, madam. Never blush, man. You would have said that I had as little love for Gaulois as for the dirtiest beggar in Caerleon. Brastius frowned mildly and agreed with her, remembering as he did a certain wild scene on the battlements of Tintagel. And, doubtless, you would say that it pains me not a whit to see Gorlois, my lord, ride out from Caerleon into the wilds of Wales. There was such reproach in her voice that Brastius fell into confusion before her eyes reddened and began to excuse himself. Your ladyship's behaviour he said, with an ingenuous look and an intense striving after propitiation. Your ladyship's behaviour would hardly warrant me in believing that my lord Gaulois was vastly dear to you, and, pardon me, a woman does not seek to run away from her husband. You insinuate. Brastius felt himself in the mire and groaned in spirit. Madam, I would say— Yes, yes, I understand you. Give me leave, not another word. Igraine smiled softly to herself, turned her back on Brastius, and stared long into the fire. The man stood by, watching her with a humbled look, his fingers twisting restlessly at the broidery of his black tunic. Igraine traced out the mosaic patterns on the floor with the point of her shoe. I think you men are all fools, she said. Brastius's silence might have suggested contradiction. Have you ever loved a woman? The man shifted and went red under his straight, fair hair. 
His eyes took a dreamy look. Yes, he said, as though half ashamed. Igraine hung her head and sighed. Perhaps, she said, growing suddenly shy and out of countenance, perhaps you may have learnt the lesson of the forward heart, the heart that comes by love when it is in peril of great loss. Brastius drew a quick, deep breath. By the Virgin, that's true, he said. Igraine turned to the fire and hid her face from the man. There was a pathetic droop about her shoulders, a listless curving of her neck, that made Brastius picture her as burdened with some immoderate sorrow. He was an impressionable man, not in any amorous sense, but in the matter of sympathy towards his fellows. He thought he heard a catch in the girl's breathing that boded tears. Her hair looked very soft and lustrous as it curved over her ears and neck. Madame Igraine. No answer. Brastius went a step nearer. Listen to me. A slight turning of the head in response. What ails you, madam? Never trouble. I beseech you, tell me. The man was quite afire. His face looked bright and eager, and his eyes shone. Gorlois has gone to war. The words were jerked out one by one. Madam! War and death. Courage, madam, courage! On my soul, you are not going to say, Brastius, you understand. Then? Man, man, don't drag it out of me. Don't you see? Are you blind? Brastius invoked a certain saint by the name of Christopher, and straightway emphasized his words by falling down on his knees beside Ygraine. She had contrived to conjure up tears as she bent over the fire. Brastius found one of her hands and held it. This will be my lord's salvation. Thank you so. On my soul, my dear lady, I thank our lord Jesu from my heart, for I know my lord Gorlois, and the bitterness that weighed him down, though he spoke little to me on this matter, being staunch to you and to his courtesy. And by our lord's passion, madam, I love peace in a house, and quiet looks, and words like laughing water, for there is never a home where temper rules. Brassius, you shame me. God forbid, dear lady, there's no gospel vanity in my heart. I speak but out. The man's quaint outburst of gladness touched Igraine's honesty to the core, but she had no thought of recantation, for all the prickling of her conscience. She passed back to the open window and leant against the mullion, while Brastius rose from his knees and followed her. I am faint, she said, and the fresh wind comforts me. Courage, madam. Duke Gorlois fights for Britain and the cross. What better blessing on his shield? Igraine was looking out toward the sea and the grey curtain of the sky cut in places by dark woods and the sweep of dull green hills. There was a wistful droop about her figure that made Brastius molten with intent to comfort and dumb with words of sympathy that died inarticulate in his throat. He stood there, a man muzzled by his own sincerity, bankrupt of a syllable, though he commanded his wit to be nimble with stentorian cry of conscience. He felt hot in his skin and vastly stupid. By the time he had lumbered up some passable fancy, Igraine had turned from the window with a quick intelligence kindling in her eyes. Brastius. Madam, listen to me. I have come by a plan. A sudden flood of sunlight streamed through a rent in the grey canopy of clouds. The landscape took a warmer tinge, the purple of the woods deepened. Brastia saw the sudden gleam of light strike on Igraine's hair. Her head was thrown back upon her splendid neck, and her eyes seemed large with love. "'I will show Golois how I love him,' she said. Brastius's face was still hazed in conjecture. "'I will wipe out the past.' Ah, we will follow Gorlois to the war, you and I, Brastius, together. What say you to that? The man looked at her with clear grey eyes and with a transient immobility of feature that changed swiftly to a glow of understanding. The words had gone home to him like a trumpet cry. Their courage warmed him and he was carried with the wind. A great hazard and noble, 
he said with a flush of colour. The peril is on my neck, and yet I'll bear it. Igraine's face blazed. Brastius, you will go with me. By my sword to the death. Come hither, man, I must kiss your forehead. Brastius knelt to her again with crossed hands. She looked into his grey eyes and touched his forehead with her lips. Thus I salute honour, she said. My lord's lady, you have trusted me. Else had I been ashamed. The man went away to arm, warm at heart as any boy. Igraine stood a moment looking into the fire with an enigmatic calm upon her face. For Brastius she felt a throttled pity, an impossible admiration that only troubled her. Her lust for liberty bore her like a storm wind, and her hate of Gorlois made her iron at heart. She could dare anything to fling off the moral bondage that cramped and bound her like a net. While Brastius was away arming and ordering horses, she went to a little armory on the stairs, and filched away a short hauberk and a sheathed poniard. She wore these under a gown of black velvet bound with a silver girdle and a cloak of sables, hooded and lined with sky-blue cloth. She had a strange joy of the knife at her girdle as she passed down the stairway to the court. A few silent servants gaped at her as she passed from the house. Brastius came out to her in armour. In the court she heard the cry of steel bridles, the sparking of hoofs on the stones, they were soon mounted and away under the great gate and free of Carlion in the decline of the day. The west had no colour, and a wind pined in the trees as they swept into the twining shadows of the woods and saw the boughs clutch each other against the sullen sky. Soon night came in a black cowl, and with a winter wind that roamed the woods like the moan of a prophecy, Igraine, riding with her bridle linked in that of Brastius, pressed on for the west with a mood that echoed the roar of the trees. End of Book 3, The War in Wales, Chapter 2 Recording by Michelle, West Orange, New Jersey Section 23 of Uther and Igraine This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle, West Orange, New Jersey, United States of America. Uther and Ygraine by Warwick Deeping Book 3, The War in Wales, Chapter 3 A man in black armour, a lady in a cloak of sables, a pine forest under a winter sky, Myriad trunks, interminably pillared, grey-black below, changing to red beneath the canopy of boughs, patches of grey-blue sky between, a floor overgrown with whortleberry and heather, and streaked seldom by the sun. Through the treetops, the various sighing of a wind, a sound that crept up the curling galleries like the softly taken breath of a sleeping world, Away on every hand, oblivious vistas, black under multitudinous green spires. The woman's face seemed white under the sweep of her sable hood. Its expression was very purposeful, its mouth firm and resolute, its air indicative of a deliberate will. Her eyes stared into the wood over her horse's head with a constant care, dropping now and again a quick side-glance at the man in black armour riding on her flank. She spoke seldom to him, and then with a certain assumption of authority that seemed to trouble his equanimity but little. Often she would lean forward in the saddle, as though to listen, her eyes fixed, her mouth decisive, her hand hollowed at her ear to concavitate some sound other than the wind-song of the trees. It was evident that she was under the spell of some strong emotion, for she would smile and frown by turns as though vexed by perpetual alternatives of feeling. The man at her side watched with his grey eyes the path curling uphill between the trees. Having his own inward exposition of the woman's mood, he contented himself wisely with silence, keeping his reflections to himself. 
He was not a man who blurted commonplaces when lacking the means of inspiration, and he was satisfied with the fancy that he understood completely the things that were passing through the woman's mind. He believed her troubled by those extreme anxieties of the heart that come with war and the handiwork of the sword. Perhaps he was fortunate in being ignorant of the truth. The interminable trees seemed to vex the woman's spirit as their trunks crowded the winding track and shut the pair in as with a never-ending barrier. But for an occasional patch of heathland or scrub, no lengthy vista opened up before them. Tree boles stood everywhere to balk their vision, silent and stiff like sullen sentinels. The horses plodded on. Igraine's impatience could be read upon her face and discovered in her slighter gestures. It was the impatience of a mind at war with itself, a mind prone through the chafe of trouble to be vexed with trifles, sore, sensitive, and hasty. Brastius watched her, pretending to be intent the while on the path that wandered away into the mazes of the wood. He was a considerate creature, and he suffered her petulance with a placid good humour, and a certain benevolence that was the outcome of pity. Igraine jerked her bridle and eyed the trees as though they were the members of a mob thrusting themselves between her and her purpose. She was inclined to be unreasonable, as only a woman can be on occasions. Brastius, calm-faced and debonair, contented himself with sympathy and refrained from reason as from the handling of a whip. "'That pleasant fellow was a liar,' he said, by way of being companionable. "'Yes, the whelp. "'I'll swear we've ridden two leagues, not one.' "'The fellow should have a stripe for every furlong.' "'Rough justice, madam.' "'Igraine laughed. "'If justice were done to liars,' she said, "'the world would be hideless, scourged raw. "'Brastius edged his horse past an intruding tree "'and chuckled amiably. "'It would be a pity to spoil so much beauty. "'Eh, the women would come off worst.' "'Igraine flashed a look at him. "'Balam's ass spoke the truth,' she said. They had not gone another furlong when Brastius reined in suddenly and stood listening. He held up a hand to Igraine, looking at her with prophetic face, his black armor lusterless under the trees. Hark! Igraine stared into his eyes. Neither moved a muscle for fully a minute. A trumpet cry! Brastius lowered his hand. From the host! End the advance, by the sound on it. Then we shall be out of the woods soon. Go warily, madame. It would be poor wisdom to stumble on an Irish legion. Brassius, I would not miss the day for a year in heaven. As they pushed uphill through the solemn shadows of the forest, a sound like the raging of a wind through a wood came down to them faintly from afar. It was a sullen sound, deep and mysterious as the hoarse babble of the sea, "'smitten through with the shrill scream of trumpets "'like the cry of gulls above a storm. "'In the alleys of the pine forest "'it was still as death and calm "'beneath the beniscus of the tall trees. "'Igraine and Brastius looked meaningly at each other as they rode. "'The sound needed no words to christen it. "'The two under the trees knew that they heard the roar "'of host breaking upon host, "'the cataractine thunder of a distant battle.' Pushing on as fast as the forest suffered, the din became more definite, more human, more sinister in detail. It stirred the blood, challenged the courage, racked conjecture with the infinite chaos it portended. Victory and despair were trammeled up together in its sullen roar. Life and death seemed to swell it with the wind sound of their wings. It was stupendous, sonorous, chaotic, a tempest cry of steel and many voices merged into the grand underchant of war. Igraine's face kindled to the sound like the face of a girl who hears her lover's lute at night under her window. Blood fled to her brain with the wild strength of the strain humming like a wind through the trees. She was in the mood for war. The tragedy of it solemnized her spirit and made her look for the innumerable flash of arms, the rolling march of a multitude. For the moment it was life, 
and the glorious strength of it. Death and the dust were hid from sight. Yet another furlong, and the red trunks dwindled, and the sombre boughs fringed great tracts of blue, and to the north mountains rose up, dim and purple, under an umbrage of clouds. To the west the sea appeared, solemn and foamless, set with pine-spired isles and a great company of ships at anchor. Nigh the shore the great pile of a walled town stood out upon green meadows. Igrain and the man pushed past the outlying thickets and drew rain upon a slope that ran gradually down from them like the great swell of a sea. Tented by the dome of the sky lay a natural amphitheatre, shelving towards the sea, but rising in the east by rolling slopes to a ridge that joined the mountains with the forest. The valley was a medley of wasteland, scrub, gorse, and thicket, traversed by the white streak of a road, and closed on the west by the grey walls of the town rising up above the green. It was a wild spot enough. However still and solitary it may have seemed in its native desertedness, however much the haunt of the wolf and the boar, it seethed now like a cauldron with the boiling stir of battle. Men swarmed through scrub and thicket, masses of steel moved hither and thither, met, mingled, broke, and rallied. Wave rushed on wave, bodies of horsemen smoked over the open with flashing of many colours and the glittering pomp of mail, to roll with clanging trumpets into some vortex of death. The whole scene was one shifting mass of steel and strife, dust and disorder, galloping squadrons, rolling spears, rank on rank of shields a flicker in the sun. And from this whirlpool of humanity rose the dull, grinding roar of war, fierce, stupendous, clamorous, grand. To the trained eye of the soldier, the chaos took orderly and intelligent meaning, and Brasti stood in his stirrups and pointed out to Igrain the main ordering of the hosts. Uther Pendragon held the eastern ridge with his knights and levies. Gilomanius and Pacentius thrust up at him from the sea, while the valley between held the wreck of the countercharges of either host, and formed debatable ground where troop ran against troop and man against man. The masters of Uther's army swept away along the ridge, their arms glittering over the green slopes, their banners and surcoats colouring the height into a terraced garden of war, the whole a solemn streak of gold against the blue bosoms of the hills. To the north stood Meliogrant, with his levies from Wales, and next to him Duke Eldul and King Nentris headed the men of Flavia Caesariensis. South of all the great banner of Tintagel showed where Golois and the southern levies reared up their spears, like a larch wood in winter. Brastius pointed them all out to the girl in turn, keeping keen watch the while on the shifting mob of mail in the valley. Igraine, stirred by the scene, urged on from the forest, and the night following her, they crossed some open scrubland, wound through a thicket of pines, and stood at gaze under the boughs. Igraine's eyes were all the while turned on the banner of Tintagel, and from the common mob of mailed figures, she could isolate a knight in gilded harness on a white horse, Gorlois, her husband. The mere sight of him set her hate blazing in her heart, and seemed to pageant out all the ill she had suffered at his hands. Her feud against the man was a veritable insanity, a species of melancholia that wrapped all existence in the morbid twilight of self-centred bitterness. As she looked down upon the host, there was a kind of overmastering madness of malice on her face, an emotion whose very intensity paled her to the lips and made her eyes hard and scintillant as crystal. She was discreet for all her violence of soul. Turning to Brastius, who was scanning the valley under his hand, she pointed to the banner with a restless eagerness of manner that might have hinted at her solicitude for Gorlois, her lord. "'See yonder,' she said, is not that the Lord Gorlois on the white horse by yonder standard? Brastius turned his glance thither, considered for a moment, and then agreed decisively. Love is quick of eye, he said with a smile. Let us ride down nearer. I care not for the hazard, madame. Who fears at such a season? 
By my sword, madame, not your servant. I am but careful of your safety. Fear for me, Brastius, when I fear for myself. Methinks, madame, that would be never. Brastius, I believe you. Igraine's courage had risen to too high an imperiousness for the moment to brook baffling or to endure restraint. She had been lifted out of herself, as it were, by the storm cry of battle and by the splendour of the scene spread out before her eyes. A furlong or more down the hillside, a little hillock stood up amid a few wind-twisted thorns, proffering rare vantage for outlook over wood and dale. She was away like a flash, and several lengths ahead before Brastius had roused up, put spur to horse, and cantered after her. The man saw the glint of her horse's hinder hooves spurning the sod, and though the wind whistled about his ears, he was left well in the rear for all his spurring. Igraine, with her hair agleam under her tossed-back hood, and her cheeks ruddied by the wind, headed for the rising ground at a gallop, gained it, and drew rein on the very verge of a small cliff that dropped sheer to the flat below. The hillock was like a natural pulpit, its front face a perpendicular stone twenty feet high, while its hinder slope tailed off to merge into the hillside. Gorlois's mailed masses stood but a hundred paces away, and Igraine could see him clearly in his gilded harness under the banner of Tintagel. Brastius galloped up to her with a mild bluster of expostulation. You court danger, madame. What if I do, Brastius, to be near my lord? Your sanctity lies upon my conscience. I take all such care from you. Madame, that is impossible. Duty is duty both night and day, in battle and in peace. Duty bids me fear for my lord's wife. Igraine found certain logic invincible in the argument and made good use of it. She meant to rule Brastius for her own ends. Fear, she said. I forget fear when I am nigh Gorlois, my husband, and who could gainsay me the right of watching over him? I forget fear when I think of Britain, the king, and my lord, and had I a hundred lives I could cast them down to help to break the heathen and serve my country. Amen, said Brastius signing the cross upon his breast. Sterner interests quashed any further polite bickerings that might have risen from Igraine's pride of purpose, for Brastius, with the instinct of a soldier, marked some large development in the struggle that had been passing in the valley below them. The scattered lines of horse and foot that had been thrown forward by Uther to try the strength and spirit of the Irish host were falling back sullenly uphill before the masses of attack poured up from the flats by Gilomanius the king. The whole battle had shifted to the east. Bodies of horse were spurring uphill, driving in Uther's men, cutting down stragglers, harrowing the slopes for the solid march of the black columns of foot that were creeping up between the thickets, winding like giant dragons amid firs and scrub. It was a grand sight enough, the advance of a great host, a rocking sea of spears pouring up in the lull that had fallen over the valley, as though the battle took breath and waited. Uther's men kept their ground upon the ridge, watching in silence the advance of Gilomanius's chivalry. Only a brief wild cry of trumpets betokened the gathering of the waves of war. Even at this juncture, Brastius racked his wit and courtesy to persuade Gorlois's lady to fall back and watch from the shelter of the woods, he pointed out her peril to Igraine, besought, argued, cajoled, threatened. All he gained was a blunt but half-smiling declaration from the woman that she would hold to her post on the hillock till the battle was over or some mischance drove her from the place. Brastius caught her bridle, spurred round, and tried to drag her back by main force, but she was out of the saddle in stanter and obstinate as ever. In the end, the man capitulated and gave his concern to the fortunes of war. The sudden uproar that sounded out along the hillside made mere individual need dull and impossible for the moment. The shock of the joining of the hosts had come like the fall of snow from a mountain, a sound sweeping down the valley, echoing among the silent fastnesses of the hills. Men had come pike to pike, shield to shield, upon the ridge, Mass rushed upon mass, billow upon billow. 
From the mountains to the forest, the sweat and thunder of strife rolled up from the long line of leaping steel, from the living barrier, steady as a cliff. It was one of the many marathons of the world, where barbarism clawed at the antique fabric of the past. Igraine's glance was stayed on Gorlois and the southern levies about the banner of Tintagel. Her hate surged up the green slope with the onrush of the Irish horde, and brandished on the charge in spirit towards the tall figure in the harness of gold. She saw Gorlois in the press, smiting right and left with the long sweep of his sword. In her thirst for his destruction, she grudged him strength, harness, sword, the very shield he bore. She was glad of his courage, for such would militate against him. Moment by moment, her desire honoured him with death, as she thought him doomed to fall beneath the surge of steel. A sudden shout from Brastius brought her stare from this chaos of swords. The man was standing in his stirrups and pointing to the west with his face dead white and his mouth agape. By God, look! Truth to tell, there was little need of the warning. A dull rumble of hoofs came up like thunder above the shriller din around. Igraine, looking to the west, saw a black mass of horsemen at the gallop, swaying, surging, rocking uphill, full for Golois's flank. The sight numbed her reason for the moment. She was still as stone as the column swept past the very foot of the hillock, a flood of steel, and plunged headlong upon Golois's lines, hewing and trampling to the very banner of Tintagel. An oath from Brastius made her turn and look at him. He had his hand on his sword, and his face was twisted into a snarl of wrath and shame as he stood in his stirrups and watched the fight. "'My God!' he cried. "'My God! They run!' It was palpable enough that the southern line was breaking and crumbling ominously before the rush of Gilomanius's knights. Little bunches of men were breaking away from the main mass like smoke and falling back over the ridge. Igraine guessed at Brastius's pride and fury, saw her chance of liberty, and took it. She set up a shrill cry that stirred his courage like a trumpet cry. "'My lord! My lord Corlois! Brastius, what of him?' The man's sword had flashed out. "'Send me to death, lady, only to strike a blow for Britain.' Igraine spread her hands to him like a Madonna and made the sign of the cross in the air. Brastius lifted up his drawn sword— "'kissed it, and saluted her with the look of a hero. "'Then he wheeled his horse, plunged down from the hillock, "'and rode full gallop into the battle. "'Igraine soon lost sight of his black harness in the melee, "'and since he met his death there, she saw Brastius alive no more. "'Despite the grim uproar of the overthrow, "'despite the taunts of a patriot pride, "'there was an undercurrent of gladness through her thought "'as she watched Gorlois's men giving ground upon the ridge.' Her lord's shame was her gratification. To such a pitch of passion was she tuned that she could find laughter for the occasion, and a shrill cry of joy that startled even her own ears when the banner of Tintagel quivered and went down into the dust. Men were falling like leaves in autumn, and the southern wing of Uther's host seemed but a rabble, trampled, overridden, herded, and smitten over the ridge. Everywhere the swords and spears of Gilomanius's knights and gallow glasses spread rout and panic, while the wavering mass gave ground, rallied, gave again, and streamed away in flight over the hillside. She could see no sign of Gorlois, and with a whimper of hate, the strong doubt of his escaping the slaughter took hold on her heart and found ready welcome there. She was rid of Brastius, good fellow that he was, and though she honoured him, she loved liberty better. Liberty enough! Gorlois, her lord, had been slain, such were her reflections for the moment. Pendragon's host seemed threatened with overthrow. The southern wing had been driven off the field by a charge of horse. Gilomanius held the southern portion of the ridge and pressed hard on Meliogrant, both flank and face. The imminent need of Britain was plain enough even to Igrain, yet a sense of calm and liberty had come upon her, like the song of birds or the gush of green in springtide. Even her patriotism seemed dim and unreal for the moment, before the treasonable gratitude that watched the overthrow of Gorlois's arms. She was alone at last, solitary among thousands, able after the bitterness of past months to pluck peace from the very carnage of battle. 
Trouble had so wrought upon her mind that it seemed a negation of all probable and natural sentiment, a contradiction of the ethical principles of sense. The day was fast passing, and the grand fires of a winter sunset were rolling all the caverns of the west into a blaze of gold and scarlet. The pine forest, black and inscrutable as night, stood with its spines like ebony to the fringe of the west, while the slanting light lit the glimmering masses of steel on the hill and valley with a web of gold. To the north the mountains towered in a mystery of purple, a gleam of amber transient on their peaks. Sudden and shrill came a cry of trumpets from the hills, a sinister sound that seemed to issue in the climax of the last phase of a tragedy. Igraine's eyes were turned northwards to the green slopes of the higher ground, where the great banner of the golden dragon had flapped over Uther the king. Here a great company of knights, the flower of the host, had stood inactive throughout the day. With a cry of trumpets, this splendid company had moved down to charge the masses of Gilomanius's men, who now filled the shallow valley east of the ridge and threatened King Meliogrant and the whole host with overthrow. Uther had ridden out to lead the charge with his own sword. It was one of those perilous hours when some great deed was needed to grapple victory from defeat. The rest of the scene seemed blotted out as a grain watched from her hillock the glittering mass rolling downhill with the evening sun striking flame from its thousand points of steel. On over the green slopes, past the pavilions of the camp, it gathered like a wave lifting its crest against a rock, on towards the swarm of men squandered in pursuit of Gorlois's broken line, on to where Gilomanius formed his knights for the charge. The green space dwindled and dwindled with the rush and roar of the nearing gallop. Igraine saw the rabble of Saxons, light-armed kerns, and Irish gallow glasses split and crack like a crumbling wall. For a short breath the black mass held, with Uther's storm of mail cleaving cracks and wedges in it, streaks of tawny color like lava through the vineyards and gardens of a village. Then, as by magic, the whole mass seemed to deliquesce, to melt, to become as mist. All visible was a thunderstorm of horsemen, tearing like wind through a film of rain, with scattering fringes of cloud scudding swiftly to the west. The knights had passed the valley, and were riding up the slope, hewing, trampling, crushing as they came. Gilomanius's columns that had pushed Gorlois's men into rout had become a rabble in turn, wrecked, scattered to the wind, trodden down in blood and dust. They were streaming away in flight over the ridge, scampering for scrub and thicket, no lust in them save the lust of life. Igraine saw them racing past on every quarter, a blood-specked, dust-covered herd, their hairy faces panting for the west and the ships on the beach. Not a hundred paces away came the line of trampling hoofs and swinging swords, a demonic whirlwind of iron wrath that hunted, slew, and gave no quarter. Beyond the summit of the ridge, and all about the hillock where Igraine stood, the glittering horde of knights came to a halt with a great shout of triumph. Right beneath Igraine, and the straight face of the hillock, a man in red armor on a black horse, with a golden dragon on his helmet, stood out some paces before the ranks of the splendid company. A great cry rolled up, a forest of swords shook in the sun. The knight on the black horse stood in his stirrups, and with sword and helmet upstretched in either hand, lifted his face to the red triumph fire of the west. Igraine knew him. Peleus, Uther, the king. End of Book 3 The War in Wales Chapter 3 Recording by Michelle, West Orange, New Jersey Book Three, Chapter Four of Uther and the Grain, by Warwick Deeping. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The sun had rolled back between the pylons of the west. Night was in the sky, night in her winter austerity, keen, clear, a glitter with stars, as though her robe were spangled with cosmic frost. The mountain's rugged heads were dark to the heavens. 
and the sea lay a faintly glimmering, plain open to the beck of the moon. The Irish host had broken and fled at sunset before Uther's charge, and the streaming spears of Eldil and King Nentris. The green meadows, the wild scrubland, had been checkered over with the black swarm of the flying soldiery. The whole valley had surged with swords and the sound of the slaughter. By the gray walls of the town it had beleaguered. The driven host had turned and rallied in despair to stave off to the last the implacable doom that poured down from the hills. It was the vain effort of a desperate cause. Broken and scattered like dust along a highway, there had been no hope left them but their ships. The battle had ended in the very foam of the breaking waves. Crag and cliff, rock citadel, and yellow sand had had their mead of blood and the shrill sound of the sword. The great ships had saved but a remnant and had put out to sea in the dusk, their white sails like huge ghosts treading the swell of the twilight waters. Yet with night there had come no ceasing of the carnage. Despair had turned to front victory. Irish Galaglass and heathen Churl, forsaken by their ships and hemmed in by sea and sword, had fought on to the end, finding and knowing no mercy. Gilamanius the king and Pacentius were dead and the blood of invasion poured out like water. Now it was night, and in the clear, passionless light of the moon, a figure in a cloak of sables moved toward the mound where Galois of Cornwall had flown his banner early in the day's battle. Everywhere the dead lay piled like sheaves in a cornfield, their harness glinting with a ghastly luster to the moon piled in all attitudes and postures, staring blankly with white faces to the sky, or prone with their lips in blood, contorted, twisted, clutching at throat and weapon, mouths agape or clenched into a grin, man piled on man, barbarian upon Britain. Dark quags checkered the grass with the sickly odor of shed blood, and sword and spear, shield and helmet, flickered impotently among the dead. A grind went among the bodies like a black monk, seeking some still quick enough to be shriven before their souls took flight from the riven clay. Her cloak was gathered jealously about her as she threaded her way among the huddled figures, peering under helmets, scanning harness narrowly in her death-inspired quest. Casting hither and thither in the moonlight, she came to a tangled bank of firs, and beyond it a low hillock that seemed piled and paved with the bodies of the slain. Here had stood the banner of Tintagel, and here the prowess of Gorlois's household knights had fallen before the charge of Gilamanius's chivalry. The grind saw the medley of mail, the dead horses, jumbled figures, wreck of shield and spear rising out above her in the moonlight, cloaked with a silence grim and irrefutable, as though death himself sat sentinel on the pyramid of carnage, half shuddering at the sight like an aspen. For all the intent that was in her heart, she drew near. Determined and resolved to search the mound. Compelled to climb over the dead and set her foot on the breasts and shoulders of the slain, her tread lit more than once on a body that squirmed like a dying snake. Strong to do the uttermost after that day of revelation, she struggled on, loathing the task, her shoes clammy with the blood sweat of death. On the summit of the mound, she came upon Gorlois's white horse lying dead by the wreathing folds of the fallen banner of his house. A whimper of joy came up 
into Igrine's heart. Sinister as the sign seemed, she was soon searching the mound with an alert desire in her eyes that prophesied no vestige of pity for the thing for which she sought. Hunt as she would, and she was marvelously patient over the gruesome business. No glint of Galois's golden harness flattered her hate as she searched the mound. Many a good night lay there, some that she had known at Tintagel, and hated because they served her husband. But of Galois she found no trace. As a last hope, she dragged aside the great standard and found a dead man there sheeted in its folds, a man in black armor with his face to the sky, Brastius, who had ridden with her from Carlion. She stood a moment looking down at him with a sudden feeling of awe, such as had not come upon her through all that day. A white face lay turned to the sky, a face that had looked kindly into hers with a level trust, and smiled with a wealth of manly sympathy. It was a simple thing enough, nothing but one death among many thousands, but it touched a grind to the core and made her ashamed of the lies she had given him. She found herself wondering like a child whether Brastius was in heaven, and whether he watched her. The notion disquieted her. She bent down, took his naked sword from his hand, and shrouded him again in the gorgeous blazonry of the flag for which he had died, and so left him with a sigh. As she climbed back again from the mound, a gashed and clotted face heaved up and stared at her from a heap of slain. It was the face of a man who had struggled up on his hands to look at her with mouth agape, dazed after a sudden waking from the stupor of a swoon. For a moment in the moonlight, she thought it was Galois by certain likeness of feature, but discovered her error when the man spoke to her in gibberish she did not understand. He began to crawl towards her with a certain air of menace that made her start back and rear up the sword she had taken from dead Prastius. The thread of steel proved needless enough, for the man dropped again with a wet groan, and seemed dead when she went and bent over him with thoughts of succor. Passing again to her hillock, she stood there brooding and looking out towards the west. A great bell in the town by the sea was pulsing heavily, as though for the dead, and there were many cressets flaring on the walls, and torches going to and fro in the meadows. The sounds of a triumph hymn chanted by hundreds of deep voices, floated up like a prayer from the western meadows. At the sound, Egrain's eyes were strangely full of tears. By some strange echoing of the mind, the idols of the past days woke like the song of birds after a storm of rain. Clear in the dusk, she seemed to see the red figure on the black horse. His face lit like a god's, by the slanting light from the west as he stretched his sword to heaven. Again the scene changed, and she saw him riding through the flowering meads of Andredswold, looking down on her with a grave and luminous pity. She was glad of him, glad of his great glory, glad that he had kissed her lips and berayed the love to her that was in his heart. The scene and the occasion were strange enough for such broodings, yet her eyes were very dim as she stood in a half-dream and let the picture drift across her mind. The revelation had come upon her with such suddenness that she had been for the moment like one dazed. She had watched Uther sweep on with his horde of knights, and had stood mute and impotent as one smitten dumb while the red harness and the golden dragon of Britain vanished again into the moil of war. Now her whole soul yearned out with a wistfulness born of infinite regret. If he had only come to her alone, 
if he had only come to her as Peleus, in some gloom of green. She could have fallen down before his horse's feet, kissed the scabbard of his sword, wept over his helmet, and burnished it with her hair. Sight of that dark, sad face had made a beacon of her on the instant. And Galois, if she had hated him yesterday, she hated him with a tenfold vigor since she had looked again upon Peleus's face. Certainly her malice had grown with an antian strength with each humbling of her heart to the dust, and the very thought of Galois seemed blasphemy against her soul at such an hour. With the memory of Galois, a cloud dulled the clear mirror of her mind, and her mood of dreams melted into mist. The strong sense of bondage, of ineffectual treason, came back with a fuller force as though to menace her with the fateful realism of her lot. A hand seemed to sweep down and wave her back with a meaning so sinister that even her hate stood still a moment as in sudden fear. She had some such feeling as of standing on the brink of a mysterious sea, whose waves sang to her a song of peril, of misery and desire, cooped up together in the dim green twilight of some coral dungeon. The lure of the unknown beat upon her eyes, while love and hate, like attendant spirits, beckoned her over the yawn of an open grave. For the moment, the importunity of her immediate need drew her from meditations like bitter and divine. A battlefield after dark, with all its lust and pillage, was no pleasant place for a woman. The lights of the town still showed up brightly in the west, but Agrain had little desire of the teeming streets, where victory would be matching blood with wine, and where the revels of the soldiery would celebrate the day in primal fashion. She was content to be alone under the stars, and even the dead seemed more sympathetic than the living at such an hour. A wind had risen, and she heard the hoarse salve of the forest in the night. The thousand voices of the trees seemed to call to her with a weird perpetual clamor. She saw their spectral hands jerking and clutching against the sky, and heard the creak and gibber of the crisscross boughs swaying in the wind. Leaving the hillock, and still bearing Brastius's sword, she held across the open, seeing as she went the dark streaks that dotted the hillside, the bodies of men fallen in the flight. She gained the trees, and was soon deep among the crowded trunks, pondering on her lodging for the night. Wandering hither and thither, looking for some more sheltered spot, her glance lit upon a dim swell of the ground that proved to be an ancient mound or barrow. It had been opened in times past, probably in the search for buried treasure or for weapons. Brambles, weeds, and heather had roofed the shallow cutting into a little recess or cave that gave fair shelter from the wind, and a grind, braving the notion of barrow ghost or spirit, claimed the place as a godsend and took cover therein. The last crumbs in her wallet finished, she sat with her face between her palms, brooding, big-eyed in the night, like any druidess wreathing spells in her forced solitude. The wind was crying through the trees, swaying them restlessly against the starry sky, making plaintive moan through all the myriad aisles. Igrain listened like one huddled among her thoughts, to keep out the cold. Miserable as was her lodging, her mind seemed packed with the day's battle. The whirl and thunder of it were still moving in her brain. A wild scene towered over by a man, bareheaded on a black horse, holding his helmet to the setting sun. Often and often she heard the roar of hoofs 
and saw the rush of the charge that had trampled the banner of Tintagel and hurled Galois and his men in rout from the ridge. Had it been death or life with the man? Was he with the king, hearing holy mass and lifting up the wine cup to heaven under a flare of lights? Or lying stiff and pinched under the mild eyes of night? It was this thought, holding hope and doubt in common yoke, that abode with her all the night in her refuge under the trees. It was bleak enough, with a silvering of frost over the land, when darkness had rolled back over the western sea, uncovering the wreck of death that lay huddled on ridge and slope. Igraine was stirring early from the barrow. With the cold and her own thoughts, she had slept but an hour, and at the first filtering of light through the branches, she was glad and ready for the day. She wandered through the forest towards the open land that showed glimmering through the tree boles, with no certain purpose moving in her mind. The future as yet was a blank to her, lacking possibilities, jealous of its secrets. Saturnine as death itself. There shone one light above her that seemed to burn through the unknown. It had long led her from distant hills, yet even her red lamp of love beckoned her over a sepulchre. Coming to the forest margin, she came full upon the incontestable handiwork of war. Under the sweep of a great pine, lay the body of a knight in black harness, all blazoned with gold, while his gray horse was still standing with infinite patience by his side, nosing him gently from time to time. The man's helmet, a visored cask, somewhat gladiatorial in type, had fallen off, and a young beardless face was turned placidly up to the blue, a white oval pillowed upon a tuft of heather. There was no blood or sign of violence visible, save a blue bruise on his left temple. It seemed more than probable that he had been pitched from the saddle and found death in the fall. Igrain stood and looked at him with some pity while the horse snuffed at her, staring with great wistful eyes as though for help or sympathy. The man was young, with a certain nobility of early manhood on his face, and it seemed to her very pitiful that he should be cut off thus in life's spring. As she looked at him, she noted that he was slim of figure, and not much above middle height. A sudden fancy took her on the instant. She tethered the horse, and kneeling down by the man, her fingers were soon busy at the buckles and joints of his armor. Ungirding his sword, she drew it from the scabbard and set it upright at his head, sheathing Brastius's in its place. Having stripped off his armor and long surcoat, she covered him reverently with her cloak, slung the horse's bridle round her wrist, and gathering up his arms and helmet, went back to the barrow where she had passed the night. The wood had received a woman in the dress of a woman. It gave in exchange a knight on a gray horse, a knight in black armor blazoned with gold under a surcoat of violet cloth. The brazen helmet, visored and hooded with mail over nape of neck and throat, gleamed and flashed under the green boughs. There were three lilies, snow-white and a cloven heart upon the shield, and the horse trappings were bossed and enameled, gold and blue. Igrain rode out from the trees with the pomp of a lancelot. The gray horse's mane tossed in the wind, the firs rippled on the hillside, the cloud ships sailed the blue with white sails spread. The girl was aglow with new life under her guise of steel. The essence of manhood seemed to have created itself within her as from the soul of the dead knight, and she suffered the glory of arms with a pride that was almost boyish. Holding out from the trees at a solemn pace, 
she headed westward down the valley along the grass slopes that slid between scrub and thicket to the sea. On the road below her, a company of spears trailed eastward uphill in a snake-like column that glittered through the green. Pushing on boldly across ground where the battle had raged hotly the night before, she reached the road as the head of the column swung up at a dull tramp on their march home for Carlion. Gruffing her voice in her throat, she hailed the knight who headed the troop for news of the battle of yesterday, posing as one late on the scene, and sore at having struck no blow for Britain. The knight drew aside, and letting his men tramp by, he gave tersely the tale of the fight as he had seen it from King Nentris' lines. St. Jude be blessed, said Ikrine at the end thereof. I am glad, friend, of these tidings. As for the field, it looks to have been as bloody a one as I have ever set eyes on. Bloody enough, quoth the man, giving his mustache a twirl. Too bloody for Gilamanius and dead Vortigern's whelp. What of Uther? Scarce a scratch. King Meliagrant? Wounded, but drunk as the devil. And Galoisa Cornwall? The man laughed as at a jest. Bedded in an abbey, said he, with a split face. Mere flesh, mere flesh, nothing deeper. Igraine thanked him with her helm a droop, and turning her horse, rode back towards the forest, heavy of heart. End of Book Three, Chapter Four Recorded by Laurie Nadeau Richardson, www.laurierichardsonvo.com. Section 25 of Uther and Igraine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Uther and Egrin by Warwick Deeping Book 3, Chapter 5 The king's house at Kirlian stood out above the Usk, on a little hill whose slopes were set with shrubberies and gardens, the white pillars and broad façade glimmering above the filmy cloud of green that covered the place as with a garment. A great stairway ran to the river from the southern terrace, that blazed in summer with flower-filled urns and stacks of roses that overspread the balustrade with crimson flame. It was a place of dawns and sunsets, of lights rising amber in the east over purple hills and amethystine waters, of quiet glows at evening in the west, with cypresses and yews carven in ebony against primrose skies while in the burgeoning of the year birds made the thickets deep with melody, and all beyond, Carleon's solemn towers, roofs, casements bowered in green, rested within the battlemented walls that touched the domes and leaf spires of the woods. It was noontide in Carleon, and down the great stairway, with its rows of cypresses, its banks of yew and myrtle, a fair company was passing to the river, where many barges clustered around the water gate like gilded beetles sunning their flanks in the shallows. Knights and churchmen in groups moved down from the palace, talking together as they went. There had been a council of state in the king's hall, a great assembling of the noble folk and the prelatry, to consider the need of Britain, the cry of the martyred, and the homeless from Kentlands and the East. And Arita, that great city of the southern shores, had fallen in a tempest of fire and sword. No single soul had escaped from its smoking walls. The barbarian had entered in and made great silence over the whole city. 
Now it was told that more galleys had come bearing the fair-haired churls from the sand dunes and pine woods, the rude hamlets of that angle land over the sea. Vectus had been overrun. Porchester burnt to the ground. Even the noble city of Winchester threatened despite its walls. Beast and robber had sole rule in Andredswold. Much of Nether Britain was a wilderness, a wistful land given over to solitude and the wild creatures of the forest. Churches were crumbling, gillyflowers grew on the high altars, and ivy wrapped the tombs. Sanctuary bells were silent, homes empty and as still as death. Desolation threatened the south, while the valleys of Amorica oversea gave refuge to many who fled before the Saxon sword. In the great hall of the palace, Uther still sat in his chair of ivory under a gilded roof that mingled huge beams with banners, spears, and rust-rotted harness. The walls were frescoed with Homeric scenes, Helen meeting Paris in the house of Menelaus, Achilles slaying Hector, Ulysses and Calypso. Twelve painted pillars held the cross beams of the hall, and from the fire on the great hearth a fragrant scent of burning cedar wood drifted upon the air. A long table covered with parchment, tablets, quills and inkhorns, and an array of empty benches testified to the number of noble folk who had assembled at the royal conclave. A single counselor remained before the king, Debricius, Bishop of Carlion, a tall, spare man, whose white hair and sensitive ascetic face bore testimony to an inward delicacy of soul. Uther was clad in a tunic of scarlet, with a dragon and gold thread blazoned upon his breast. No crown, coronet, or fillet was on his brow. On his finger he wore the signet of Ambrosius, and his sword was girded to him with a girdle of embroidered leather. His look was much the same as when he rode as Peleus in Andredswold, and was nursed of his wound by a grine in the island manor. Possibly there was more lines upon his face, a deeper dignity of sadness in his eyes. Circumstance had put upon him the cherishing of an imperiled kingdom, and with the charge his natural stateliness of soul had risen into a heroism of benignant chivalry. No more kingly man could have taken a land under the strong sweep of his sword. With the grand simplicity of a great heart, he had grappled the task as a thing given of God, bending ever in prayer like a child before the inscrutable wisdom of heaven. There had been grave business on his mind that day, and his face was dark with a cloud of care as he talked with Debrucius on certain matters that lay near his heart. Uther, like the men of old time, was superstitious and ever prone to regard all phenomena as possessing certain testamentary authority from the deity. In medieval fashion, he referred all human riddles to religious instinct for their solving, and searched in holy writ for guidance with a faith that was typical of his character. Wholly a Christian in a superstitious sense, he gained from the very fervor of his belief a strength that seemed to justify his very bigotry. It was a certain experience that to his mystic loving instinct omened history still dark in the womb of the future, and kept him closeted with Dubricius that day after night and churchmen had filed out from the conclave. In the twilight of the hall, with its painted frescoes and glimmering shields, Dubricius listened to the king as he spoke of portents and visions of the night. Uther, with his elbow resting on the arm of his chair and his chin upon his palm, stared at the cedar wood burning pungently upon the hearth and catechized Dubricius on visionary belief. The old man looked keenly at the king under his arched white brows. 
He was as much a mystic in his creed as the son of Constantine, a believer in miracles and in manifestations in the heavens. Certainly, unusual powers had been given to the early church, and it was not for the atomic mind of man to deny their presence in any later age. My lord dreamed a dream, said de Bricius tentatively, when he had heard the tale to the end. Uther quashed the suggestion with the calm confidence of a man sure of his reason. Never a dream, de Bricius. The old man's eyes were very bright, and his face seemed full of a luminous sanctity. A vision, then, my lord? I am no woman, de Bricius. I must believe the thing a vision, or damn my senses. My lord, it is no mere woman's part to see visions. Such holy writ where the chosen of God, the great ones, were miraculously blessed with portent and with dream. Uther looked into the old man's face as though for succor. I am troubled to know what God would have me know, he said. Debricius, you are aged in the service of the church. My lord, I have no privilege from heaven in the rendering of dreams. Am I then a pharaoh? "'disappointed of mine own soothsayers? "'Sire, what of Merlin?' "'Merlin. "'The man has the gift of prophecy "'and can speak with tongues. "'Send for him, my lord. "'He is a child of the church, though a mage.' "'Uther warmed himself before the fire of cedar wood, "'his face motionless in the contemplative calm. "'Presently he turned and looked deep into Debrish's Vigil hollowed eyes, as though to read the thoughts therein. Merlin, the black-haired man who told Vortigern of the future. He spoke the truth, my lord. Sad truth for Vortigern. Yet who should fear the truth? To Bricius, to hear of death. Death, my lord? Remember Vortigern. My lord, he was a planet lurid with murder and so damned to darkness. Need the sun fear light? Uther smiled sadly in the old man's face. You are too faithful a courtier, Dubricius. My lord, you are the pillar of a distraught land. God be merciful and spare you to us. I have done my duty. Amen, sire, to that. Uther went and stood by the great window of the room with his arms folded upon his breast. His hollow eyes looked out over the city, and there was a gaunt grandeur of thought upon his face. He was not a man who galloped down destiny like a huntsman on the trail of a stag. Deliberation entered into his motives, and he never foundered reason with overuse of the spur. Dubricius stood and watched him with the smile of a father, for he loved the man. Presently Uther turned back towards the fire. Dubricius saw by his face that he had come by decision, and that his mind was steadfast. Merlin is at Sarum, my lord. I shall not play Saul at Ender. No, sire. The man shall come to me with no jugglery in dark corners. Why spore thought, my lord king? I remember me, Dubricius, that you have little leisure to hear of dreams. I have given you the names of the holy houses to be rebuilt and consecrated in the name of God. We will save Britain by the help of the cross. God speed you. Alone in the half-light of the hall, Uther stood and stared into the fire, his eyes luminous in the glow, while the pungent scent of the burning wood swept up like a savor of eastern spices. There was intense feeling on his face, a kind of passionate calm, as he gazed into the red bosom of the fire. Presently, as though turning in thought from some enchantment of the past, he sighed wearily, put his black hair from his forehead with both hands, and looked at his image in a mirror of steel that hung from a painted pillar. There was a wistful look upon his strong face. 
He had a soul that remembered, a soul not numbed by time into mere painless recollection of the past. As in some mysterious temple, love, with solemn sound of flute and dulcimer, kept fire unquenched night and day upon the altar of his heart. Rising up out of his mood of gloom, an earthly Hyperion whose face shone anew over Britain, he passed out and, calling to the guards lounging on the terrace, descended the stairway that sloped through the gardens to the river. His state barge was in waiting at the gate, and entering in he was borne downstream towards the town whose white walls rose up amid the emerald mist of spring. Over all, Uther cast his eye with a luster look of love, a love that shone like the smile of a child at a mother's face. Carolyn was dear to him beyond all other cities. Its white walls held his heart with the whispered conjure word of home. Landing at the great quay, where many ships and galleys lay moored, he passed up towards the market square with the files of his guard, smiling back on the reverences of the people, throwing here and there a coin, happy in the honor that echoed to him from every face. Before the walls of a pilastered house his guards halted with a fanfare of trumpets, a sound that rolled the gates wide and brought a mob of servants to the line of the outer court. Knights came down from the house with heads uncovered. It was the king's first entry into Galois' atrium, since the disbanding of the host after the war in Wales. A face scarred with red across cheek and chin, with nose askew, one lower lid turned down, came out to Uther from the doorway of an inner room. There was a drawn look upon the man's face, a sullen Saturnine air about him, as though he were vexed inwardly with the chafe of some perpetual pain the pinched frown, the restless bloodshot eyes, the hunched shoulders, were all strange to Uther, who looked for Galois, the man of arrogant and imperial pride, whose splendor of person, carriage of head, and long lithe stride had marked him a stag royal from the herd of meaner men. Uther, grave as a god, gripped the other's thin, sinewy fingers his eyes searching Galois's face with a large-minded scrutiny, inspired by the natural sympathies of his heart. Galois, for his part, half crooked the knee and drew a carved chair before the ill-tended fire. He had an Asmodian pride, and the look in Uther's eyes was more troublesome to him than a glare of hate. His face never lightened from the murk of reserve that covered it like a mask, and it was the king who spoke the first word over the flickering fire. "'What of your wounds?' he said. Galois's black beard was down on his breast, and he looked only at the fire. He seemed like a man furtive beneath the consciousness of some inward shame, mocking his honor. "'My wounds are well, sire. You look like a man newly risen from a sickbed.' If I look sick, sire, blame my physician. He has tinctured me to the level of perdition. Bodily, I never felt in better fettle. I could hew down a horse and thrust my spear through a pine trunk. A man's face is a fallacy. Uther saw the scars, the harsh smile, and caught the twinge in the seemingly careless voice. He could comprehend some humiliation in the marring of personal comeliness, but not the humiliation that seemed to lurk beneath Galois's pride. There was more here than the scarring of a cheek. There is some care upon you, Galois, he said. Sire, you have much observation. Your men have spoken of the change to you. They are too discreet. God save their skins. Pride, pride. Sire, you are right. My pride suffers the inquisitiveness of kings, not subjects. Eagle calls to eagle. 
Men are mere magpies. Chatter maddens me. I grip your hand in spirit. Both men were silent for a while, the fire crackling sluggishly at their feet. Galois's eyes were on the window and the scrap of green woodland in the distance. Uther's eyes were on Galois's face. The latter, with the sore sensitiveness of a diseased spirit, felt the look and chafed at it. His petulance was plain enough to Uther as he sat and watched him and pondered the man's trouble in his heart. Galois. Sire, I am no gabbler. True, my lord. You are trouble-ridden. Galois's eyes flashed up to Uther's, faltered, and fell. What of that, sire? He said curtly. You have a deadly pride. I own it. Uther leant forward in his chair and looked earnestly into the other's face. I, too, am a proud man in my trouble, he said, buckling up unutterable things from the baseness of the world, jealous of my inward miseries. Yet when I see a strong man and a friend chained with the iron of a silent woe, I cannot keep my sympathy in leash. So tell him to unburden to a man whose pride feels for the pride of others. The words seemed to stir Galois from his lethargy of reserve and silence. Uther's very largeness of soul, his stately faith and courtesy, were qualities that won largely upon the mind, lifting it above factious things to the serene level of his own soul. Galois, impulsive spirit, could not rebuff such a man as Uther. There was a certain calm disinterestedness in the king's nature that made trust imperative and condemned secretiveness as churlish. Gerlois was an obstinate man in the extreme rendering of the epithet. He had spoken to no one of his trouble, leaving his thoughts to be inferred. Yet, staunch sympathy like Gyge's ring has power over most hidden things of the heart, and Gerlois was very human. It is a woman, sire. Mine was a woman, too. Gorlois scattered the half-dead embers with his foot. I married a wife, he said. I had never heard it. Few have. The woman's name? Never ask it, sire. It will soon lie with her in the dust. These are grim words. Grim enough for the man of my own house, my own familiar friend. Mother of Christ! Your friend? My brother-in-arms, sire. The shedding of such blood seems like justice. Had I suffered thus? Sire, you warm to my temper. It should be the sword. Mine yet waits white for blood. Galois, implacable, grim as a werewolf, threw open the door of a closet and led Uther within the narrow compass of its walls. It was a little oratory, dim and fantastic, with lamps hanging from the roof and black curtains over the narrow casement. Two waxen candles burnt with steady, windless flames upon the altar, and beneath their light glimmered a great sword, naked, and a cup half-filled with purple wine. Gorlois took up the sword and touched it with his lips. For the man, he said. Then he set the sword down beneath its candle and touched the goblet with his fingers. His black eyes glittered. For the woman, sire. And the two candles. I burn them till I have crushed the life out of two souls. Then I can pinch the wicks between my fingers and snuff them out in smoke. End of Book 3, Chapter 5 Recorded by Laurie Nadeau Richardson www.laurierichardsonvo.com Section 26 of Uther and Egrain This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Uther and Egrain by Warwick Deeping. Book 3, Chapter 6. It was spring at Caerleon, and a web of green had swept upon the empty purple of the woods and shut the naked casements to the sun. The meadowlands were plains of emerald that glimmered gold. The gorge blazed with its myriad lamps lighting the dark gateways of the pine forests and covering all the hillsides as with a garment of yellow. In the woods the birds sang, and hyacinths and dog violets spread pools of blue beneath the infinite greenness of the boughs. In Carlion's orchards, the fruit trees stood like mounts of snow flecked with ethereal pink and a prophecy of green. Yew, cypress, cedar reared their dark bosoms betwixt the gentler foliage, and many a bronze-leafed oak made mimic autumn with a mist of leaves. In a forest glade that opened upon the high road some three leagues eastward of Carlion, an old man sat beside a shallow spring, whose waters lay a pool of tarnished silver within the low stone wall that compassed them. The old man by the pool was clad in a ragged cloak of coarse brown cloth lined with rabbit skin. He had sandals on his feet, a staff and wallet by his side, and under the shadow of his hood of fur a peaky white beard hung down like an icicle under the eaves of a house. His hands were thin and white, and he seemed decrepit as he sat hunched by the well with a crust of brown bread in his lap and a little bronze pannikin that served him as a cup. It was late in the day, and the great oaks that reached out their arms over the well stood solemn and still in the evening calm, while the cloud masses bastioned overhead were radiant with the luster of the hour. The road curled away right and left into the twilight of the woods. No folk passed to and from Caerleon to throw alms to the beggar who squatted there like any old goblin man out of a tomb. From time to time he would turn and look long into the pool as into a mirror, as though he watched the future glimmering dimly in the magic well. He had finished his crust of bread, and his head nodded over his lap as though sleep tempted him after a day's journey. Rabbits were scampering and feeding along the edge of the forest. A snake slid by in the grass like a streak of silver. Far down the glade, a herd of fallow deer browsed as though caring nothing for the huddled scrap of humanity by the well. The beggar man might have been dead for all the heed he gave to the forest life that teemed so near. Yet it was soon evidenced that his faculties were keenly alive to all that passed about him by a marvelous perception of sound, a perception that made itself plain before the sun had drifted much further down the west. The old man had heard something that had not stirred the fallow deer browsing in the glade. A thin metallic sound shimmered on the air the clattering cadence of hoofs far away upon the high road. The beggar by the pool had lifted his head and was listening with his hooded face turned toward the west, his thin fingers picking unconsciously at his beard. Presently, the deer browsing in the glade reared up their heads to listen, snuffed the air, and swept back at a trot into the forest. Jays chattered away over the trees. Rabbits stopped feeding and sat up with their long ears red in the sunlight. The indifferent suggestion of a sound had grown into a ringing tramp that came through the trees like a blunt challenge to the solitary spirit of the place. Through the indefinite and mazy screens of green, a glitter of harness and a streaking of color glimmered from the wizard amber glow of the west. Three horsemen were coming under the trees, one in lurid arms before and two abreast behind in black. The beggar by the pool pulled his cowl down over his face and stood by the roadside with his bronze pannikin held in a shaky right hand to pray for alms. The knights drew rein by the pool, and he in the red harness flung down money from his belt and required tidings in return. The Lord Jesus have mercy on your soul in death, came the whine of gratitude. What would your lordship learn from an old man? Uther considered him from the shadow of his cask. He had his suspicions— and was half-wise in his conjectures. He could see nothing of the old man's face, and so elected to be innocent for the moment. Grandfather, have you heard in your days of Merlin the prophet? Have I heard of the devil, lording? Were he to ride here, should you know his face? 
Sir, I have seen no man these three hours. Yet, in truth, I did but now smell a savor as of hell. And there was a raven here, a black villain of a bird that croaked abracadabra to the letter. Uther smiled. Are you from Caerleon? he said. No, sire. It is Uther the king who comes from the city of legions. Uther, say you. Put back that hood. My lord, lo, I bow myself. I have kept the tryst. The cowl fell back. The cloak was unwrapped. The beard twitched from the smooth, strong chin. The bent figure, feeble and meager, straightened and dilated to a stature and bulk beyond mere common mold. A man with hair black as a raven's wing and great glistening eyes stood with his moon face turned up to Uther Pendragon. A smile played upon his lips. He was clad in a cloak of somber purple, wreathed about with strange devices, and a leopard skin covered his shoulders. His black hair was bound with a fillet of gold, and there were gold bracelets upon his wrists. It was Merlin who stood before Uther under the arch of the great trees. The benizens of all natural powers be upon you. The god of the stars and the spirit fires of the heaven keep you. Great is your heart, O king, and great your charity. Bid me but serve you, and the beggar's pence shall win you a blessing. The man bowed himself even to the ground. Uther left his horse tethered to a tree and faced Merlin over the pool. Both men were solemn as night in their looks. Merlin, said the king. Sire. I have a riddle from the stars. Speak it, O king. To your ear alone. Sire, pass with me into the forest. Blessed be thy head if thou canst read the testament of the heavens. It was toward sunset, and the place was solemn and still as some vast church. In the white roadway the black knights stood motionless, with spear on thigh, their sable plumes sweeping like cloudlets under the dark vault of the foliage. Merlin, with the look of an eternity in his eyes, bowed down once more before Uther, and pointed with his hand into the dim cloister of the trees. Red and purple passed together from the pool and melted slowly into an oblivion of leaves. In a little glade under a great oak, whose roots gripped the ground like talons, Uther told to Merlin the vision that had come to him in the watches of the night. He had stood late at his window, looking over Caerleon shimmering white under the moon, and had seen a star of transcendent glory smite sudden through the blue vault of the heavens. A great ray had fallen from the star, and from the ray had risen a vapor, a golden mist that had shaped itself into a dragon of gold, and from the dragon's mouth had proceeded two smaller rays that had seemed to compass Britain between two streams of fire. Then, like smoke, both star and dragon had melted out of the heavens, and only the moon had looked down on Usk and the sleeping woods about Caerleon. When Uther had spoken his whole soul in this mystery of the night, Merlin withdrew himself a little and looked long into the sky, his tall figure and strong face clear as chiseled stone in a slant gleam of the sun. For fully the third part of an hour he stood thus, like a pillar of basalt, neither moving nor uttering a sound, while the sky fainted over the treetops and flashed red fire from the armor of the king. Suddenly, as though he had caught inspiration from the heavens, prophecy came upon him like a wind at sunset. He stretched his hands to the sky. His body quivered. His eyes were as rubies in a mask of marble. I have seen, O oh king. I have looked into the palpitating web of the stars, into the glittering aisles of the infinite. Uther strode out from the tree trunk, where he had lent watching the man's cataleptic pose grow into the quick furor of prophecy. Stay on, he said. Merlin swept a hand towards him with a magnificence of gesture. Thou art the star. The dragon is thy son. He shall compass Britain with a band of steel, beat back the wolves of heathendom, and cast stupendous glory over Britain's realm. His name shall shine in history, sun-bright, magnificent, and pure. His name shall be Arthur. Thus, O king, Uther of the dragon... Read I this vision of the night. Uther, 
a gradual luster in his eyes, looked long at the sun behind the swart pillars of the forest. He seemed to gather vigor from the glow. Prophecy was in his thought, a prophecy that tempted the inmost dreamings of his heart and linked up the past with the promise of the future. To love, to be loved, to win the woman among women, to beget a son, a warrior, a king, to harden his body like an oak, temper his heart like steel, to set the cross in his hands and send him forth against the beast and the barbarian like a god. Such, indeed, were the idols of a king. Merlin, I have no wife, and you speak to me of a son, was his sole answer. The retort echoed from the man. Well, the king must wed. This is no mere choosing of a horse. Sire, you can learn to love. It is not so difficult a thing, no more than falling down upon a bed of roses. The retort was in no wise suited to Uther's humor. I am no boy to be married on the moment to cap the reading of a vision. Sire, bring me the woman I may love. If you are magical enough, then bid me wed. My lord, you mock me with a dream. Not so. Is she dead, then? On my soul, I know not. Then, sire, all women are dead to me, save one. Conjure her into my being, and I will give you the wiser half of myself, even my heart. For an instant, Merlin smiled. A smile like an afterglow in a winter sky. Clear, cold, and steely. He drew near Uther, his purple robe with its fantastic scrollwork dim in the twilight, his black hair falling down about his face. His words were like silken things purring from his lips. My lord, tell me more. You are a prophet. Read my past. Sire, my vision fails at such a depth. But not thy flattery. Her name, sire? I will read you a fable. Uther, his eyes lit as with a luster of recollection, turned from Merlin and the ken of his impenetrable face. He leant against a tree trunk and looked far away into the dwindling vistas of the woods. His voice won emphasis from the absolute silence of the place, and he spoke with the level deliberation of one reading aloud from some antique book. A woman befriended a knight who was smitten of a dread wound. It was summer, and a sweet season full of the scent of flowers— odors of grass knee-deep in dreamy meadows. The woman had red-gold hair and eyes like a summer night. Her mouth was more wistful than an opening rose. Her voice was like a flute over moonlit waters. And the knight lost his soul to the woman. But the woman was a nun. And so, to save his vows, he battled down his love and left her. Merlin's eyes took a sudden glitter. A nun, sire? A nun. With hair of red gold and eyes of amethyst. Her convent, sire. Evangel, burnt by the heathen on the southern shores. And the nun's name? Egrain, Egrain. Merlin gave a shrill, short cry. Ah! Badges of color had stolen into his cheeks, and he looked like a bacchanal for the moment. Sire, sire, the woman is no nun. Uther still leant against the tree and looked into the distance with his hand shadowing his eyes. It might have seemed that he had not heard the words spoken by Merlin, or at least had not understood their meaning. So unmoved was his look, so motionless his figure. Unutterable thoughts were moving in his mind. There was a grandeur of self-suppression on his face as he turned and fronted Merlin with the quiet of a great strength. Man, what words are these? Merlin had recoiled suddenly within himself. He was silent again, subtle as steel and very debonair. My lord, I swear she is no nun. Give me fact, not assertion. The woman is but a novice. I had the whole tale from one who knew her well at Radamanth's in Winchester, where she found a home. She had grieved, sire, for Pelias. Pelias? Egrain! My heart is great in me, Merlin. Where saw you her last? Wandering in a wood by Winchester. Alone? 
alone in heart. Where now? My lord, I know not. Oh, God, to see her face again. Merlin cast his leopard skin across his visage and stood like a statue. Even his immense grandeur of reserve threatened for the moment with summary overthrow. In the taking of twenty breaths, he had calmed himself again to stand with bare head and frank face before the king, a promise on his lips. My lord, give me a moon season to stare into this mystery. On the cross I swear it, I will bring you good news at Caerleon. On the cross? On the cross of your sword. Merlin, if this thing should come to be, if life returns to one whose hopes were dead... You of all men in Britain shall be next my heart. Behold, on the cross, I swear it. A certain season of youth seemed to have come down upon Uther and lighted up the solemn tenor of his mood. His face grew mellow with the calm of a great content. He was reasonable as to the future, not moved to any extravagant outburst of unrest. The constant overshadowing of the cross seemed to give his faith a tranquil greenness a rain-refreshed calm that pervaded his being like moist quiet after a wind. Merlin, what of the night? Sire, I am well provided. I have a pavilion near a brook where a damsel serves me. I go to Caerleon. You have conjured me back to the spring of life. My heart is beholden to you. Take my hand and remember. Sire, I am your servant. When Uther had passed, a streak of scarlet into the blue twilight of the darkening wood, when the dull clatter of hooves had dwindled into an ecstasy of silence, Merlin, white as the faint moon above, found again the pool under the trees by the high road to Caerleon. Going on his knees by the brink, he looked into its waters, black, sheeny, mysterious, webbed with a flickering west light, Sky mosaics dim and ethereal between swart-imaged trees. Still as a mirror was the pool, yet touched occasionally with light as from a rippling starbeam or a dropped string from the moon's silver sandals. Merlin bent over it, his fateful face making a baleful image in the water. Long he looked, as though seeking some prophetic picture in the pool. When night had come, he rose up with a transient smile, folded his cloak about him, and passed like a wraith into the forest. End of Book 3, Chapter 6 Recording by Cassian Hayes, Philadelphia Section 27 of Uther and Egrain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cassian Hayes. Uther and Egrain by Warwick Deeping. Book 3, Chapter 7. While Gorlois was lowering over an imagined shame, and Uther given to brooding on a vision, the knight of the cloven heart wandered through wild whales and endured sundry adventures that were hardly in concatenation with the distaff or the cradle. In rough ages, might was right, and every man's inclination law unto himself. To strike hard was to win crude justice. To ride a horse, to wear mail, to carry a sword, were characteristics that ensured considerable reverence from men less fortunate, by maintaining at least an outward arrogance of strength. Not only on these grounds alone did the knight of the cloven heart hold at a disadvantage those folks of the wilderness who went, to speak metaphorically, naked. She made brave show enough— had a strong arm and a strong body, and could match any man in the mere matter of courage. The moral effect of her great horse, her shield and harness, and the sword at her side carried her unchallenged through the wood and valley where meaner wayfarers might have come to grief or suffered a tumbling. The forest folk assumed her a knight under her helmet and her harness. A certain bold magnificence of bearing in no wise contradicted the assumption. It would be wearisome to record the passage of two months or more, to construct an itinerary of her progress, to chronicle the events of a period that was solitary as the wilds through which she passed. She never slept a night under populous roof the whole time of these wanderings. Luckily, it was fair weather, and a mild season. Forest shade, such as it was, 
and the caves of the wilderness, a ruined villa, the forsaken hut of a charcoal burner, an empty hermitage, such in turn gave her shelter from the placid light of the moon or the black stare of a starless sky. She never ventured even among peasant folk unhelmeted. Her food was won from cottager or herdsman by such store of money as she had about her, though many she came across were eager to appease so formidable a person with milk and pottage and the little delicacies of the rude home. Often, her fine carriage and youthful voice won wonders from the bosom of some peasant housewife. She had her liberty and was free to roam. The life contented her instincts for a season, and at least she was saved the sights of Gorlois. Since war had failed to loose her from the man, she would essay her best to keep him at a distance. If hate repelled, love drew with dreams. Yet had Egrain been asked of peace at heart, she would have smiled and sighed together. There are degrees of misery, and solitary suffering is preferable to that publicity which is very torture in itself, a galling whip to the tender flanks of pride. In being free of Gorlois, she was happy. In thinking of Uther, and in contemplation of the shadows of the unknown, she was of all women most miserable. A mood of self-concentration was settling slowly upon her like an inevitable season upon the face of the earth. Day by day, a dream prophetic of the future was pictured in the imagery of thought, till it grew familiar as an often-looked-on landscape that awakes no wonder and no strange unrest. The ordinances of man had thrust on her a damnable tyranny, and she was more than weary of the restrictions of the world. The inevitable scorn of custom had long taken hold upon her being, and she had been driven to that state when the soul founds a republic within itself— and creates its ethics from the promptings of the heart. Uther was at Caerleon. She had heard the truth from many a peasant tongue. Caerleon, therefrom, drew her with magic influence, as a lamp draws a golden moth from the gloom, or the light in the night sky wings on the wild fowl with the prophecy of water. Caerleon became the born of all her holier thoughts. Strange city of magic, it held love and hate for her, desire and obloquy. Though its walls were as a luring net scintillant with spirit gossamer, her very reason lulled her fears to sleep and turned her southwards towards Uzgland and the sea. It came to pass, on the very day that Uther spoke with Merlin in the forest, that Egrain rode over a stretch of hills by a sheep track and came down into a valley not many leagues from Caerleon. The place stood thick with woodland, ranged tier on tier with the peaked bosses of huge trees. That impenetrable mystery of solitude that abides where forests grow was deeply hallowed in this silent dale. The infinite majesty of nature had cast a spell there, and the vast oaks, like pyramids of gloom, caverned a silence that was utter and divine. Glimmering beneath the huge, stupendous boughs, through darkling aisles and the colossal piers that held the innumerable roofing of the leaves, Egrain passed down through umbrage and still ecstasies of green, by colonnade and gallery, interminable tunnels where stray light struck slantwise on her armor that it seemed a moving luster in the solemn shade. Deep in the woodland lay a valley, a pastureland girt round with trees, and where the meadows, painted thick with flowers, seemed all enameled white and azure, green, purple, pink, and gold. A peace as from the sun shone over it like saffron mist. A pool gleamed there, tranquil and deep with shadows, all the trees that Britain knew seemed girdled round it. Oak, beech and holly, yew, thorn and cedar, the elfin pine, the larch, whose delicate kirtle shames even broidery of silk. No sound save the cuckoo's cry, and the uncertain twittering of birds disturbed the sanctuary of that forest solitude. Egrain, halting on the brink of the meadowland, looked down over wood and water. The quiet of the place— the clear glint of the pool, the scent of the meadows, brought back the valley in Andredswold and the manor in the mere. She loved the place on the instant, even a blue plume of smoke rising straight to the sky and the gray-brown backs of a few sheep in the meadows, evidencing as they did the proximity of man, failed to disenchant the solitary grandeur of the scene. There is no stable perpetuation of peace in the world. Care treads upon the heels of mammon, and lust lies down by the side of love. Even in the quiet of the wilderness, the hawk chases the lark's song out of the heavens, and wind scatters the bloom from the budding tree. Thus it was that Egrain, 
watching from under the woods, saw the sheep scampering suddenly in the meadows as though disturbed by something as yet invisible to her where she stood. Their bleeding came up with a tinge of pathos, to be followed by a sound more sinister, the cry of one in whom pain and terror leapt into an ecstasy of anguish, a shrill, bird-like scream that seemed to cleave the silence like the white blade of a sword. Egrain's horse pricked its ears with a snort of wrath, as though recognizing the wounded cry of some innocent thing. The girl's pulses stirred as she scanned the valley for explanation of this discord, sudden as the sweep of a falcon from the blue. Nor was she long at gaze. A flickering speck of color appeared in the meadowlands, the figure of a woman running through the grass like a hunted rabbit, darting and doubling with a whimpering outcry. Near as a shadow, a tall streak of brown followed at full stride, terrible even in miniature. Hunter and hunted passed before the eye like the figures of a dream, yet with a fierce realism that whelmed self in an objective pity. Never did Britomart herself, with splendid soul, find fitter cause in fairyland than did the knight of the cloven heart in that woodland dale. Egrain rode down from the trees, a burning figure of chivalry that galloped through the green, and bore fast for the scudding forms that skirted round the pool. Like a stag pressed to despair, the hunted one had taken to the water and was already waist-deep in ripples that seemed to catch the panic of the moment. Plunging on past tree and thicket, Egrain held on, while sheep scattered from her to turn and stare with the stupidest of white faces at the horse thundering over the meadows. The pursuer had passed the water weeds and was to his knees in the pool when the knight of the cloven heart came down to the bank and halted, like a mailed statue of suckering vengeance. The white heat of the drama seemed cooled for the moment. Over the flickering scales of the little mirror, the girl's white face, tumbled hair, and blue smock showed as she half floated and half paddled with her hands. Nearer still, the leather-jerkened, fur-breached figure of the man bent like a baffled satyr balked of evil. On the green slope of the bank, the mailed splendor of chivalry waited like justice to uphold the right. The man in the mirror wore the short Roman sword, or perizonium. Any more effective weapon that he had possessed had been thrown aside in the heat of the chase and in the imagined security of his rough person. He had the face of a wolf. In girth and statue, he seemed a young Goliath, a savage thing bred in savage times and savage places, and blessed with the instincts of mere barbarism. Egrain's disrelish equaled her heat as she looked at him and slanted her great sword over her shoulder. In another instant, the scene revived and ceased to be a mere picture. The girl in the pool had found a footing, and her half-bare shoulders showed above the water. The man, with his short sword held behind him, was splashing through the shallows with a grin on his hairy face that meant mischief. Egrain, every wit as hot as he, held her horse well in hand and put her shield before her. Matters went briskly for a minute. The man made a rush. Egrain spurred up and sent him reeling with the charging shoulder of her horse. The short sword pecked at nothing. The long one struck home and drew blood. A second panther leap, a blow turned by the shield, and counter cut that made good carving of the fellow's skull. The shallows foamed and crackled crimson. Hoofs stirred up the mire. A plunge, a noise of crossed steel, a last sweep of a sword, and then victory. Egrain's horse, neighing out the spirit of the moment, trampled the fallen body as it had been the carcass of a slaughtered dragon. The girl in the pool waded back at the sight, her blue smock clinging about her and showing an opulent grace of shoulder, arm, and bosom, a full figure swept by the damp tangle of her dark brown hair. She had full red lips, eyes of bright blue, a round and ruddy face that told of a mind more for tangible pleasures than for spiritual aspiration. She came up out of the shallows like a water nymph, her frightened face already all aglow with a smile of gratitude, mild shame, and infinite reverence. Going down on her knees amid the water weeds and flags, she held up her playful hands as to a deliverer direct from heaven. Grace, Lord, for thy servant. With the peril past, Egrain could not forego the sly scrap of mischief that the occasion offered. Her white teeth gleamed in a smile under her helmet and she wiped her sword on the horse's mane before sheathing it. Give heaven thy thanks, she said with a quaint sententiousness of gesture. Be sure in thy heart that it was a mere providence of God that I heard thy screaming. 
As for yon clod of clay, we will bury it later, lest it should pollute so goodly a pool. For the rest, child, I am an old man, and hungry, and would taste bread. The girl jumped up instantly, with a shallow and half-puzzled smile. The voice from the helmet was young, very young, and full of the free tone of youth. Yet both manner and matter were sage, practical, leavened with a hoary-headedness of intention that seemed to bulk the inferences suggested by such panoply of arms. With a bob of a curtsy, she took the knight's bridle and led the horse some fifty paces round the pool, where, under the imminent shoulder of a cedar tree, a little cabin nestled under a hood of ivy. It was built of rough timber from the forest and thatched with reeds. Honeysuckle clustered over its rude façade and thrust fragrant tendrils into its reed-latticed windows, where an early rose or so shone like a red star against the russet wood. A garden full of flowers lay before the rustic porch that arched the threshold, and an outjutting of the pool brought a little fjord of dusky silver up to the very green of the path, a streak of silver blazoned with violet flags, golden marigolds of the marsh, and a lace-like fringe of snowy waterweed in bloom. All around the great trees, those solemn senators, stood with their green shoulders bowed in a strong dream of deep, eternal thought. Egrain left the saddle and suffered the girl to tether her horse to a cedar bough. Her surcoat of violet and gold swept nearly to her ankles, and saved from any marring the infinite art of the anomaly that veiled her sex. Her man's garb seemed every whit as worthy of a woman, nor did it hinder that loving grace that made her beauty of body the more admirable and rare. The girl came back with more bendings of the knee, and led Egrain amid the flowers to the porch of the forest dwelling. Once within, she drew a settle close to the doorway, spread a rug of skins thereon, and again bowed herself in homage. Let my lord be seated, and I will serve him. I am hungry, child, but first put off that wet smock of thine. The girl crept behind the door of a great cupboard, with a blush of color in her cheeks. Cloth rustled for a moment, a circle of blue and a slim pair of legs showed beneath the cupboard door. Soon she was back again in a gown of apple green, fastening it with her fingers over the full swell of her bosom. What will my lord eat? What you have, child. Bread and dried fruit, the flesh of a kid, new milk and cheese, a little cider. Give me milk, child, a mere flake of meat, some cheese and bread, and I ask nothing more. I will pay you for all I take. Lord, how should you pay me when I owe more than life to your sword? The little shepherdess went about her business with a barefooted tread, soft as any cat's. The cottage proved a wonder of a place. The great cupboard disgorged a silver-rimmed horn, Wooden platter, a napkin white as apple blossom, red fruit piled up in a brazen bowl. The girl set the things in order on the table, with an occasional curious look stolen at the figure in mail on the settle. Splendid visitant in so humble a place. And what a rich voice the knight had! How mellow, with its many modulations of tone! His hands, too, were wonderfully shapen, fingers long and tapering, with nails pink as seashells. There surely must be a face worth gazing at, for its very nobility, under that great brazen helmet that glinted in the half-light of the room. The meal was spread, but the guests still unprepared. The forest child dropped a curtsy, and a mild suggestion that the knight should make a beginning. Will not my lord unhelm? A rich, mischief-loving laugh startled her for an answer. <laughs> child, take the thing off if you will. The little shepherdess obeyed, and nearly dropped the helmet in the doing of it. A mass of gold fell rippling down over the violet surcoat. A pair of deep eyes looked up with a sparkling laugh. A satin upper lip and chin gave the lie to the nether part of the picture. Christ, Yesu, quoth the girl with the helmet, and again, Christ, Yesu, as though she could get no further. He grain caught her smock and drew her nearer. Come, little sister, kiss me, for thank you. With a contradictory impulse, the girl fell down on her knees and began to cry, with her brown hair tumbled in Egrain's lap. When persuasion and comforting had quieted her somewhat, she sat on the floor at Egrain's feet, her round eyes big with an unstinted wonder. Even Egrain's hunger and the devoir done upon the new milk could hardly persuade the girl that this being in armor was no saint, but a very real and warm-blooded woman. She even touched Egrain's fingers with her lips to satisfy herself as to the warmth and solidity of the slim, strong hand. 
She had never heard of such a marvel. A woman, and a very beautiful woman, riding out as a man, and doing man's bravest work with courage and cleverness. The girl made sure in her heart that Egraine was some princess at least, who had been blessed with miraculous power by reason of her maidenhood and the magic innocence of her mind. Egraine talked to the girl and soon began to win her to less devotional attitude with that graciousness of manner that became her so well at such a season. She forgot herself for the time in listening to this child of solitude. The girl's father, an old man, had died two winters ago, and she had buried him with her own hands under a tree in the dale. Since his death, she had lived on in the cabin, alone, a forest child nurtured in forest law. Every Sabbath, Renan, a shepherd lad in a lord's service, would come over the hills and pass the day with her. They were betrothed, and the lord of those parts had promised Renan freedom next Christmas tide. Then Renan and Garlot were to be married, and the cabin in the dale was to serve them as a home. Garlot was soon chattering like any child. She talked to Igraine of her sheep and goats, her little cornfield on a sunny slope, her garden, her wild strawberry beds and vines, her fruit trees and her marigolds. The lad Renan, bronze-haired and brown-eyed, sprang in here and there with irresistible romance. He could run like a hound, swim like an otter, fish, shoot with the bow, and throw the javelin a great many paces. He had such eyes, too, and such gentle hands. Egrain's sympathies were quick and vivid on matters of the kind. The girl's head was resting against her knees before an hour had gone. The evening was still and sultry, and the sky overcast. When Egrain went to the porch after supper, rain had begun to fall, and there was the moist murmur of a heavy, windless shower through all the valley. The sheep had huddled under the trees. Infinite freshness, unutterable peace, brooded over the green meadows and the breathless leaf clouds of the woods. For all the sweet, dewy silence, a bitter discontent lay heavy upon Egrain's heart, and woe made quiet moan in her inmost soul. Green summer swooned in the branches and breathed in the odors of honeysuckle, musk, and rose— Yet for her there seemed no burgeoning, no bursting of the heart into song. The girl Garlot stood by and looked with a quaint awe into the proud, wistful face. "'What are you thinking of, lady?' she said. Egraine's lips quivered. "'Of many things, child.' "'Tell me of them.' "'What should you know, child, of plagues and sorrow, of misery in high places, of despair coroneted with gold?' Of hearts that ache and eyes that burn for the love of the world that never comes? I am very ignorant, dear lady, but yet I think you are not happy. Is any woman happy on earth? Yet you are so good and beautiful. Child, child, beauty brings more misery than joy. It is a bright fire that burns upon itself. Renan has told me that I am beautiful. So you are, and to Renan. I never think of it, lady, save when Renan looks into my eyes and touches my mouth with his lips. Then say I in my heart, I am beautiful, and Renan loves me, God be thanked. The words echoed into Egraine's soul. There was such pain in her great eyes that the girl was startled from the simple contemplation of her own affairs of the heart. You are sad, lady. Child, I am tired to death. Bide with me and rest. See, I will feed your horse and give him water. He will do famously under the tree. There's my bed yonder in the corner. I spread a clean sheet on it this very morning. Shall I help you to unarm? Thanks, child. How the rain hisses into the pool. I love the sound and the soft rattle on the green leaves. All will be fresh in a glister tomorrow, and the flowers will smile and the trees shake their heads and laugh. Oh, how clumsy my fingers are. I am so slow over the buckles. Ah, there is the last. I will put the sword and the shield by the bed. Shall we say our prayers? You pray, child. I have forgotten how to these many months. End of Book 3, Chapter 7 Recording by Cassian Hayes, Philadelphia Section 28 of Uther and Agrine This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Uther and Agrine by Warwick Deeping Book 3, Chapter 8 
there is a charm in simplicity of soul, and in sympathies green in the first rich burgeoning of the mind, unshriveled and untainted by the miserable misanthropies of the world. The girl, Garlet, was as ignorant as you will, but she loved God, had the heart of a thrush in springtime, and was possessed naturally of a warm and delicate appreciation of the feelings of others that would have put to utter shame the majority of court ladies. Women of a certain gilded class are prone to judge by superficialities, living often in an artificial air of courtesy, the very life about them is a cultured, perfumed atmosphere, unstirred by the deeper wind-throbs of true passion, or the solemn sweep of the more grand emotions. Hypocrisy, veneered with mannerisms, propped with etiquette, pegged up with gold, passes for culture and the badge royal of fine breeding. Of such things the girl Garlet was indeed flagrantly ignorant. She had lived in solitudes, and had learned to comprehend dumb things. The cry of a sheep in pain, the mute look from eyes of a sick lamb. Her life made her quick to see, quick to discover. She had all the latent energy of a child, and her senses were the undebauched handmaids of an honest heart. She knew nothing of the trivial prides, the starched and petty arrogances, the small self-satisfactions that built up the customs of the so-called cultured folk. She thought her thoughts, and they were generous ones, mark you, and spoke out on the instant without fear, as one whose words were, in very truth, the audible counterpart of the vibrations of her mind. To Agrain at first there was some embarrassment in the ingenuous methods of this child of the forest. It was in measure disturbing to be confronted with a pair of blue eyes that looked at one like two pools of truth, and a pair of lips that naively remarked, You seem pale, lady, and in pain. You slept little, and talked even when you slept. I am rosy and cheerful, and I sleep from dusk till dawn. What is there in your heart that is not in mine? Still, with the abruptness once essayed, there was a refreshing sincerity in Garlet's openness of heart. It was as the first plunge into a clear, cool pool, a gasp at the first moment, then infinite warmth, intense kindling of all the senses, with the clean ripples bubbling at the lips, and the swinging water buoying up the bosom. Garlet recalled Lilith, Radamant's daughter, to a grain, only that she had more penetration, more liberty of thought and character. The one was as a warm wind that lulled, the other a breeze blowing over open water, clean, invigorating, kind. Egrine's mood of unrest found refuge in the valley, and in Garlet's cottage she won some measure of inward calmness in the simple life, the simple tasks that kept the more sinister energies of the mind at bay. It contented her for a season with its companionship, its air of home, its green, quiet, and tranquil beauty. Garlet's cheerfulness of soul, like some penetrating essence, suffused itself upon a grind, despite the militant savor of things more turbulent. She fell into temporary contentment almost against her will, even as sleep enforces itself upon a brain extravagantly possessed by the delirium of fever. For all the quiet of the place, circumstances were gathering and moving down upon her with that ghostly and inevitable fatefulness that constitutes true tragedy. No one could have seemed more hidden from the eye of fate than she in the deep umbrage of the trees. Yet often, when the heart imagines itself most secure from the factious meddling of the world, the far, faint cry of destiny smites on the ear like some sudden stirring of a wind at night. It was late evening, on the fifth day of Igrine's sojourn in the valley.
The day had been dull, gray, and colorless, wrapped in a blue haze of rain that had fallen heavily, drenching the woods and making monotonous music on the water. Towards evening, the sky had melted to a serene azure. The air was a web of shimmering amber. The west streamed through a mist of gold, and every leaf glittered with dew. A luminous vapor hovered over the little mere, and there were rain pools in the meadows that burnt with a hundred sunsets like clear brass. Garlet and Agrine had been bathing in the mere. They had come up from the water to dry themselves upon a napkin of white cloth, the bronze, gold, and brown hair of each meeting like twin clouds, while their linen lay like snow on the trailing branches of a tree near the pool. Their limbs and shoulders gleamed against the silver-black mirror spread by the mirror. Their voices made a mellow sound through the valley as they talked. Egrine had fastened her violet surcoat about her beneath her breasts. Garlet's blue smock still hung from a branch above her head. As they sat under the tree, drying their hair and looking over the pool to the forest realm beyond, Egrine told the girl much of the outer world as she had seen it. Nor was her instruction unleavened by a certain measure of cynicism, a bitterness that surprised Garlet not a little. The girl had great dreams of the glories of old cities, the splendor of court life, the zest of a mere material existence. "'You do not love the great world,' she said. "'Once, child, I did. Everything outside a convent wall seemed good to me. I thought men heroes, and the world a fairy place. Who has not? Thoughts change with time. That which I once hungered for, now I despise. I have never been into a great city, not even into Carlion. My father loved the country and said it was God's pasture. I would rather have a dog for a friend than most men, child. Man is always thinking of his stomach, his strength, or his passion. He is vain, dull and surly often, takes delight in slaying dumb things, drinks beer, and sleeps like a log save for his snoring. But Renan doesn't. There are some men, child, among the swine. And the women? I have known good women. In the convent? I suppose there they were good just as stones that lie in the grass are good in that they do very little harm. But they serve God! Mere habit, just as you eat your dinner. A hard saying. Your sayings would be hard, child, if you had learnt what I have learnt of the world. Garlet pulled her blue smock from the tree and wrapped it round her shoulders. But you love God! she said. What is God? The great Father who loves all things. Methinks then I am nothing. Nothing, Igrine. You say God loves all men and women. Why, then, have I been cursed with perversities ever since I was born, tormented with contradictions, baffled and mocked, till the eternal trivialities of life now make my soul sick in my body? Sorrow is heaven sent to chasten, just as rain freshens the leaves. Old, old proverb. Rain comes from clouds. Clouds hide the sun. How can sorrow be good, child, when it darkens the light of life, hides God from the heart, and makes the soul bitter? That seems the wrong spirit, Igrine. So meek folks say. We are not all mild earth to be smitten and make no moan. There are sea spirits that lash and foam, fire spirits that leap and burn. My spirit is of the flame. Am I to be cursed, then, because I was born with the soul of fire? We cannot answer all of this, Igrine. I hate to bow down blindly, 
to cast ashes on the head because a superstition bids us so. I have faith. I cannot see with my heart. I would you could, Igrain. Perhaps you are right. Garlet put on her shift and frock with a sigh, and straightway went and kissed Igrain on the forehead. They sat close together under the tree and watched the valley grow dim as death and the pool black and lustrous as a mirror turned to the twilight. Garlet's warm heart was yearning to Agrine. Her arm was close about her, and presently Agrine's head rested upon her shoulder. She began to tell the girl many things in a still, stifled voice. Her bitterness gushed out like fermented wine, and for a season she was comforted, with no lasting balm indeed for there was but one soul in the world that could give her that. Believe, Igrain, believe, said Garlet very softly. Believe, child, that there is good for everyone in the world if we wait and watch in patience. I seem to have watched years go by, and life stretches out from me as a sea at night. Look not there, Igrain, into your own heart, and into the gold of faith. I have no heart to look to, child. Save into a man's, and it was a good heart. Good as a god's. Then look into it still. You speak like a mother. They had talked on into the dusk of night, forgetful of time hearing only the dripping from the leaves, seeing nothing but the short stretch of water and herbage at their feet. Yet an hour ago a figure in a palmer's cloak and cowl had come out from the western forest and stood leaning upon its staff to stare out broodingly over the valley. The laurel green of the man's cloak harmonized so magically with the green of grass and tree that it was difficult to isolate his figure from the framing of wood and meadow. The pilgrim had stood long in the shadows and watched the two white forms come up out of the waters of the pool. He had seen them sit and dry their hair under the tree as the dust crept down. While they talked, he had passed down towards the cottage, accomplished by the trees, slipping from trunk to trunk to enter the cottage itself while the girls' faces were turned from it towards the pool. From one of the narrow casements his cowled face had looked out. He had marked Igrain's red-gold shimmering hair. He had seen her face for a moment. Also the shield hanging in the room with its cloven heart and white lilies. The sword and helmet. The harness of workmanship so subtle. When he had seen all this, he had stolen out again into the gloaming. A thin gliding streak of green under the gnarled thorns and the night-bosomed cedars. The forest had taken him to its depths again, and the unutterable silence of its shades. The girls by the pool had heard no sound, nor dreamt of the thing that had been so near, watching like a veritable ghost through the mist of the mere's twilight. Carolyn slept under the moon, a dream city in a land of dreams. Its walls were like ivory in a dark gloom of green. The tower of the palace of the king caught a coronet from the stars. While in the window of an upper room a thin flame flickered like a yellow rose blown athwart the black foliage of the night. Within blood-red curtains breathed over the arched door, a little altar stood against the eastern wall, guarded above by angels haloed with gold standing in a mist of lilies with wings of crimson and green. The silence of the hour seemed embalmed in silver. So pure, so still, so hallowed it was. Uther knelt before the little altar in prayer. The light from the single lamp slanted down upon him, but left his face in the shadow. It was past midnight, yet the man's head was still bowed down in his devotion. He was in an ecstasy of spiritual ascent to heaven, a mood that made the world a patmos, and his own soul a revelation to itself. At such a time his imagination could mount with a mystery of poetic rapture. 
angels drumming on golden bells, or bearing diamond chalices of purple wine, seemed to gaze deep-eyed on him from a paradise of snow and amethyst. Above all shone the eternal face, that clear sun of Christendom shining with wounded love through the crimson transgressions of mankind. Deliberate footfalls and the rustle of a drawn curtain intervened between solitude and devotion. The curtain fell again. Footfalls echoed away to die down into a well of silence. A tall man, wrapped in a cloak, stood motionless in the oratory. Uther, still upon his knees, turned to the window and the moonlight, with big prayerful eyes that questioned the intruding figure. Merlin he said with a breath of prophecy. Even so, sire. I was praying but now for such a thing. Sire, pray no longer. I have kept my tryst. Uther rose up straightway from before the altar and stood before the square of the casement. The moonlight made a halo of his hair and lit his face with a whiteness that seemed almost supernatural. Strong as he was, his hands shook like aspen leaves. His lips were parted, and his eyes wide with the shadow of the night. Merlin stood in the dark angle of the room. His voice seemed to come as from a tomb. The single lamp flame shook and quivered in a fickle draught. Sire, the moon is not yet full. And a grind? Sire? Where? Suffer me, sire. A moment. Speak quickly. God knows I have prayed like a Samson. Merlin cast his mantle from him and stood out in the moonlight wrapped in the mystic symbolism of his robe. Sapphire and emerald, ruby and sardonyx flashed with a ghostly gleam in the pale light and caught the moonbeams in their folds. Merlin's thin hands quivered like a spray of May blossom waving in the night wind and his eyes were like the eyes of a leopard. Sire, thou wert Peleus once. I should remember it. Thou art Peleus again. Again? In thy red harness, with thy painted shield, thy black horse. Take them all. The past rushes back like dawn. Near Caerleon lies a valley. There are twenty valleys. Go north, sire, in thought. Pass the cross on Beacon Hill. Hold on for the Abbey of the Blessed Mary. Take to the hills, go by a ruined tower. Ford Usk, where there is a hermitage. Pass through a waste. Cross more hills. Go down into a valley that runs north and south. I follow. Go alone, sire. Alone. The valley is piled steep with forest land. Go down and fear not. In the valley's lap lie meadowlands, a pool, a cottage. In that cottage you shall find a knight. His armor is gilded gold, his horse a gray. His shield shows a cloven heart set amid white lilies. Speak with that knight. Yet more. Speak with that knight, sire. In peace? If you love your soul. And, Igrain, Merlin, what of her? That night shall lead you to her, sire, I have said. This is the end of Book 3, Chapter 8. Narrated by Laurie Nadeau Richardson, www.laurierichardsonvo.com Section 29 of Uther and Egrain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Uther and Egrain by Warwick Deeping. Book 3 The War in Wales. Chapter 9. It was early and a clear dewy morning when Uther rode down alone from the palace by a narrow track that curled through the shrubberies clothing the palace hill. A generous sky piled its blue dome with mountainous clouds that billowed up above the horizon. 
the laurels in the shrubbery flickered their leaves like innumerable scales of silver in the sun amber sun rays slanted through the dense branches of the yews and flashed on the red harness that burnt down the winding track the wind sang the green larches tossed their kerchiefs in the distance the sea glimmered to the white frescoes of the sky uther peleus once more tossed his spear to the tall trees and burst into the brave swing of a chant d'amour with caracol and flapping mane his horse took his lord's humour it was weather to live and love in weather for red lips and the clouding down of perfumed hair god and the saints what a grand thing to be strong to have a clean heart to show to a woman's eyes what were all the baser fevers of life balanced against the splendid madness of a great passion down through Carleon's streets he rode unknown of any on his tall black horse it was pleasant to be unthroned for once and to put a kingdom from off his shoulders with what a swing the good beast carried him how the towers and turrets danced in the sun how bright were the eyes of the women who passed him by all the world seemed greener the sky bluer the city merrier the laughter of the children in the gutter echoed out of heaven the old hag who sold golden lemons under a beech tree seemed almost a madonna a being from the better world uther laughed in his heart and blessed god and merlin it is one of the rare reflections of philosophy dear to the contemplative mind how joy jostles pain in the world and pleasure in gold and scarlet elbows the grey cloaked form of grief even innocent merriment may throw a rose in the face of one who mourns innocent indeed of the desire to mock the throstle sings in the tree while the beggar lies under it dying so uther the king flashed hate in the eyes of one who watched knowing him only that morning as peleus the knight in an old play the jealous man saw the devil ride by and promptly followed him on the chance of finding his lost wife deeming indeed the devil's guidance propitious for such a quest it was the shield that caught gorloise's eye as he stood on a balcony of his house and looked out over caerleon the device smote him sudden as the lash of a whip the red harness the black horse the painted shield mingled a picture that burnt into his brain with a vividness that passed comprehension he knew well enough to whom such arms should belong had he not carried them fraudulently to his own doubtful profit this knight must be that peleus whose past had worked such mischief with his own machinations that peleus who had won egrain the novice fresh from the shadow of her convent trees Gorlois watched the man go by, with a kind of superhuman envy twisting in him like a colic. The smart of it made him stiffen, go pale, gnaw his lip. If this was the knight Peleus, what then? Gorlois could not reason for the moment. His brain seemed a mass of molten metal in a bowl of iron. Convictions settled slowly, hardened, and took form. Egrain had loved the man Peleus. Egrain was his wife. He had lost her and Brastius also. Poison and the sword waited to do their work. Supposing then this Peleus was in quest of Egrain. Supposing they had come to know each other again. Supposing Brastius and Peleus were one and the same man. Hell and furies! What a thought was this! It goaded Gorlois into action. He would ride after the man, hunt him, track him, in hope of some fragment of the truth hazard and hate, blood and battle, these were more welcome than chafing within walls as in a cage, or frying on a bed as on a gridiron. Gorlois's voice rang through gallery and hall like a battle cry. Ho there, my sword and harness! There was a grimness in the sound that made those who came to arm him bustle for dear life. They knew his black, furious humor, the hand that struck like a mace the tyranny that took blood for trifles. The stoutest of them were cowards before that marred and moody face. Be as brisk as they would, they were too slow for Gorlois's temper, a temper vicious as a wounded bear's. God and the saints, was ever man served by such a pack of stiff-fingered fools? 
The devil take your fumbling. Go and gird up harlots, or hold cooking pots. On with that helmet. A fellow, very white about the mouth, clapped the cask on and drew a quick breath when the angry eyes withered him no longer. Armlets, breastplates, greaves, quishes, all were on. Gorloys seemed to emit fire like metal at white heat. He went clanging down stairway and through atrium to the courtyard, where a horse-boy held a white charger. Gorloys cuffed the lad aside, mounted with a spring, took his spear from an esquire, and rode straight for the gate, his horse's hoofs sparking fire from the courtyard stones. Half an hour or more had gone since Peleus had passed by on his black horse, and Gorloys spurred at a gallop through Caerleon, bent on catching sight of the Red Knight before he should have ridden into the covering masses of the woods. Peleus, meanwhile, rode on like a lad whose first quest led him into the infinite romance of the unknown. Woods and waters called. Bare night and the blink of the stars summoned up that strangeness in life that is like wine to the heart of the strong and the brave. He was young again, young in the first glory of arms. The world shone glamoured as of old as he turned from the high road to a bridle track that led up through woods towards the north. Holding on at a level pace, he passed the woods and saw them rolling back like a green cataract towards the sea. Bare hills saluted him. The beacon height, with its great wooden cross, stood out against the sky. Mile on mile of wooded land billowed out before him, clouded with a blue haze where the domes of the trees rose innumerably rank on rank. The Abbey of the Holy Mary lay low in meadows on his left, its fish pools shimmering in the sun, its orchards densely green about its walls. Two leagues or more of wood and wild, a climb over hills, a long descent, and usk again shone out, trailing distant in the hollows. A crumbling tower stood up above the trees. Peleus passed close to it, giving antiquity due reverence as was his custom, looking up at its ivied walls, its crown of jelly flowers, its windows wistful as a blind man's eyes. Another mile and Usk ran at his feet. A hermitage stood by the ford. Peleus gave the good man a piece of silver and besought his prayers before he rode down and splashed through the river to the further bank. Heathland and scrub rolled to the east, merging into the blue swell of a low line of hills. It was wild country enough, haunted by snipe and crested plover, an open solitude that swept into a purple streak against the northern sky. It was noon before Peleus had made an end of its shadeless glare and taken to the hills that rose gently towards the east. His red harness moving over the green was lost to Gorlois, who had missed the trail long ago in the woods beyond St. Mary's. It was dusk when the Cornishman came guided to the ford and learnt from the hermit there that the chase lay across Usk and eastward over the heath. Gorloys gave the man no piece of silver, only a savage curse to gag his alms-seeking. Night came and caught him in the open, and rather than wander astray in the dark, he spent the night under a whin bush, calming his incontinent temper as best he might. An hour past noon, Peleus stood on the last hill slope and looked down upon the massed woodland at his feet. Here at last was Merlin's Valley choked up with trees, a green lake of foliage that rippled from ridge to ridge. Peleus, with the sun at his back, stood and looked down on it with a kind of quiet awe. So Godfrey and his knights looked down upon the holy city. So Dante saw Beatrice in his vision, and Cortez gazed at the Pacific in the west. Peleus had taken his helmet from his head and hung it at his saddle-bow. There was a grand hunger on his face, a passionate calm, as he abode on the hilltop with his tall spear a black streak against the sun. Mystery waved him on to the great oaks whose tops rose like green flames to the blue of the sky. Could Egrain be in this valley? Would he set eyes on her that day and see the bronze gloss of her hair go shimmering through some woodland gallery? It was nigh upon a year since he had seen her. It had been summer then, and it was summer now. His heart was singing as it had sung on that mere island when Egrain had looked into his eyes under the cedar tree. 
He had borne much, endured much since then. Time had hallowed memory and shed a crimson luster over the past. Manwise for the great love that was in him, he almost feared to look on her again, lest she should have changed in face or in heart. Great God, what a thought was that! It had never smitten him before. Stiffened by his own strong constancy, he had dowered Egrain with equal loyalty of soul, nor had considered the lapse of time and the crumbling power of ours. The thought brought a dew of sweat to his forehead and made him cold even in the sun. No, honor to God, the girl had a heart to be trusted, or he had never loved her as he did. Shaking the bridle, he rode down into the murk of the trees. He had to slant his spear and to bow his head often as the great boughs swooped to the ground. The dim glamour of the place had a sinister effect upon his mind. It solemnized him, touched the spiritual chords of his heart uncovered the somewhat gloomy groundwork of philosophy that lay deep under the fabric of religious habit. Merlin had told a tale and nothing more. God's blessings were not man's blessings, God's ways not man's ways. Peleus had learnt to look for what he might have called the contradictions of divine charity. We are smitten when we pray for a blessing, chided when desirous of comfort. Life would seem at times a gigantic tyranny for the creation of patience. Peleus remembered the past and kept his hopes and desires well in hand. But times he judged himself not far from the bottom of the valley, for through gaps in the foliage overhead he could see the woods on the further slope towering up magnificently to touch the sky. Still further, the long galleries of the wood arched out upon grassland gemmed with summer flowers. Showers of sunlight told of an open sky. He was soon out of the shadows and standing under the wool's haw, with the dale Merlin had pictured stretching north and south before his eyes. The scene smiled up at him from its bath of sunlight. The green meadows flecked white, blue, and gold. The diverse foliage of the trees. The little pool smooth as crystal. The solemn barriers of the surrounding woods. He looked first of all for the cottage built of timber, and could not see it for its overshadowing trees. Nonetheless, by the pool a girl in a blue smock stood looking up towards him, her face showing oval white from her loosened hair. Peleus held his breath for the moment, then saw well enough that it was not Egrain. Meanwhile, the figure in blue had disappeared as though in fear of him. He could no longer see the girl from where he watched on the edge of the wood. Riding out, he sallied down through the long grass with its haze of flowers. His eyes turned with a steadfast eagerness to the pool in the meadows. His impatience grew with every step, but he was outwardly cool as any veteran. First the brown thatch of the cottage came into view, then the blue smock of the girl who stood by the porch and watched. Last of all, Peleus saw a gleam of armor through the gloom of a cedar tree, heard the neigh of a horse, the jar of a swinging shield. The sight made his heart beat more briskly than ever ghost or goblin could have done. Pushing through the trees, he came full upon a knight mounted on a gray horse, who was advancing towards him, bearing on his shield the cognizance of a cloven heart. The knight on the gray horse reined in and abode stone still in the meadows, the sunlight flashing on his helmet and such points of his harness uncovered by his surcoat. Peleus, as he rode down, took stock of the stranger with an eagerness that was half jealous, malgré his perspicuity of soul. What had this splendid gentleman to do with Egrain the novice? Truth to tell, Peleus would rather have had some humbler person to serve as guide on such a quest. The knight on the gray horse never budged a foot. Peleus saw that he carried no spear and that his sword was safe in his scabbard. This looked like peace. Drawing up some three paces away, he scanned the strange knight over from head to foot, voted him a passable man, and admired his armor and since his whole soul was set on a certain subject, he made no delay over courteous generalities, but came at once to the point at issue. Greeting, sir. I have ridden from Caerleon to speak with you. The knight in the violet surcoat swayed in the saddle as though shaken by a spear thrust on his painted shield. Peleus noted that both his hands were tangled up in the gray horse's mane, though nothing could be seen of the face behind the fixed visor of the helmet. A voice, husky, toneless, feeble, 
answered him after a moment's silence. What would you with me, knight of the red shield? There is a lady whose name is Egrain, I seek her. I have been forewarned that a knight lodging in this valley has knowledge of her, and you, monsieur, seem to be that knight. That is the truth, quoth the cracked, husky voice from the helmet. Peleus considered a moment and held his peace. There was something strange about this knight, something tragical, something that touched the heart. Peleus's instinct for superb miseries took hold of him with a queer, twisting grip that made him shudder. His dark eyes smoldered as he watched the strange knight, and gave voice to the grim thought that lay heavy on his mind. The lady is not dead. No, said the husky voice with blunt brevity. And she is well fortuned? Passably. Thank God, said Peleus. There was a dry sob in the brazen helmet but Peleus never heard the sound. He was staring into the woods with large, luminous eyes and a half-smile on his lips, as though his thoughts pleased him. "'Is the Lady Egrain far from hence?' he asked presently. "'If you will follow me, my lord, I can bring you to her in less than an hour.' Peleus flushed red to the forehead. His dark eyes beamed. He looked a god of a man as he sat bareheaded on his black horse, his face aglow like the face of a martyr. The knight of the cloven heart looked at him, flapped his bridle, and rode on. Peleus said never a word as they passed up the valley. There were deep thoughts in his heart, yearnings and ecstasies of prayer that held him in a stupor of silence. His was a grandeur of mind that grew the grander for the majesty of passion. There was no blurting of questions, no gabbling of news, no chatter, no flurry. Like a mountain he was towering, sable-browed, impenetrable, while the thunder of suspense lasted. The knight on the gray horse watched him narrowly with a white look under his helmet that was infinitely plaintive. At the northern end of the valley, on the very edge of the forest, stood a thicket of gnarled thorns still smothered with the snow of early summer. The knight of the cloven heart drew rein in the long grass and pointed Peleus to these white pavilions under the near umbrage of the oaks. "'Look yonder,' said the voice. Peleus answered with a stare. "'Would you see your lady?' "'Be careful how you jest, my friend.' "'I jest not, Uther Pendragon. Get you down and tether your horse. Go in amid yon trees and look into the forest.' I swear on the cross you shall see what you desire. Peleus gave the knight a long look, said nothing, dismounted, threw the bridle over a bow. Then he thrust his spear into the ground and went bareheaded in among the trees. Standing under the shadow of a great oak, he peered long into the glooms, saw nothing living but a rabbit feeding in the grass. Suddenly a voice called to him. Peleus! Peleus! It was a wondrous cry, clear and plaintive, yet tremulous with feeling. It ran through the woods like silver, bringing back the picture of a solemn beech wood under moonlight and a girl tied naked to the trunk of a tree. A great luster of awe swept over Peleus's face. His eyes were big and luminous as the eyes of a blind man. He groped with his hands as he passed back under the may trees to the valley. In the long grass stood a woman in armor her helmet thrown aside, and her red-gold hair pouring marvelous in the sunlight over her violet surcoat. Her head was thrown back so as to show the full sweep of her shapely throat. Her face was very pale under her parted hair, while her lids drooped over eyes that seemed to swim with unshed tears. Her hands, slightly outstretched, quivered as with a shuddering impulse from her heart and her half-parted lips looked as though they were molded to breathe forth a moan. Peleus stood and stared at her as a dead man might look at God. He drew near step by step, his face white as egrains, his eyes as deep with desire as hers. Neither of them said a word, but stood and looked into each other's faces as into heaven. Odd, solemnized, silenced. Among them towered the green woods, 
The meadows rippled from them with their broidery of flowers. The scent of the white may swept fragrant on the air. Solitude was with them, and the mild smile of nature glimmered with the sunlight over the trees. Egrain spoke first. Peleus, was all she said. The man gave a great sob, fell on his knees, and would have kissed her surcoat. Egrain bent down to him with eyes that shone like two deep wells of love. Both her hands were upon Peleus's shoulders. His face was turned to hers. Kneel not to me. Egrain. Peleus. Let me touch you. There, there, you have my hand. My God, my God. Egrain gave a low cry, half knelt, half fell before him. Peleus's arms caught her. His face hung over hers. Her hair fell down and trailed a golden pool upon the grass. She put her hands up and touched his hair, smiled wonderfully, and looked at him as though she were dying. Kiss me, Peleus. Peleus drew a deep breath. His body seemed to quake. His whole soul was sucked up by the girl's lips. Egrain, was all he said. Her face blazed, her hands clung about his neck. Again, again. My God, have I not prayed for this? His eyes were large and wonderful to look upon. There was such awe and love in them that an angel might have looked thus upon the Christ and have earned no reproach. Egrain kissed his lips, crept close into his bosom, hid her face, and wept. End of section 29 Recording by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa Section 30 of Uther and Egrain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Uther and Egrain by Warwick Deeping Book 3 The War in Wales Chapter 10 When Egrain had ended her tears and grown calm and quiet, Peleus took her hand and led her to a grass bank painted thick with flowers that sloped to the white boughs of a great may tree. He was radiant in his manhood, and his eyes burnt for her with such a splendor of pride and tenderness that she trembled in thought for the secret she had kept from him in her heart. He could know nothing of Gorlois, or he would not have come thus to her. The mocking face of fate leered at her like a satyr out of the shadows. Yet with the joy of the moment she put the thoughts aside and lived on the man's lips and the great love that brimmed for her in his eyes. Peleus sat in the long grass at her feet and looked up at her as at a saint. Never had she seen such glory of happiness on human face, never such manhood deified by the holier instincts of the heart. The sheer strength of his devotion carried her above her cares and made her content to live for the present and to gird time with the girdle of an hour. You are no nun, Egrain. She smiled at him and shook her head. No, no, Peleus. Would to God you had told me that a year ago. Would to God I had. It would have saved much woe. Egrain hung her head. The man's words were prophetic in their honest ignorance, and the whole tale had almost rushed from her that moment but for a certain selfishness that held her mute, a fear that overpowered her. She knew the fiber of Peleus's soul. To tell him the truth would mean to call his honor to arms against his love, and she dreaded that thought as she dreaded death. I was a fool, Peleus she said, with a queer intensity of tone that made the man look quickly into her eyes. You did not know. Pardon, Peleus, I knew your soul, how true and strong it was. God knows I tried you to the end, and bitter truth it proved to me. If you had only waited. Ah, Egrain. Only a night. You would have had the truth at dawn. I struggled for your soul and for mine, as I thought. Yes, yes. 
you chose the nobler part, thinking me a mere woman, a frail thing blown about by my own passion. I loved you, Peleus, for the deed, though it nigh brought me to my death. God knows I honoured you, Egrain. Too well it had been better for us both if you had been more human. There was an anguish of regret in her voice, a plaintive accusation that made Peleus wince to the core. He bent down and kissed her hand as it lay in her lap, then looked into her face with a mute appeal that brought her to the verge of tears. Courage, courage, dear heart. God bless you, Egrain. I am very glad of your love. Come now, tell me how the year has passed. Egrain held his hand in hers and began to twist her hair about his wrist into a bracelet of gold. Her eyes faltered from his and were hot and heavy with an inward misery of thought. The man's words wounded her at every turn, and in his innocence he shook her happiness as a wind shakes a tree. There is little I can tell you, she said. Every hour is as gold to me. Would I had them lying in my lap? We are young yet, Egrain. There was a joyousness in his voice that sounded to the girl like a blow struck upon empty brass, or like the laugh of a child through a ruined house. His rich optimism mocked her to the echo. I took refuge in Winchester, she began, with Radamanth, my uncle, and lodged there many months. I watched for you and waited, but got no news of a knight named Peleus. Week by week, as my knowledge grew, I began to think and think, to piece fragments together, to dream in my heart. I longed to see this Uther of whom all Britain talked. Ah, you remember the cross, Peleus, which you left at my feet? Peleus smiled. She put her hand into her bosom with a little brush of pride and looked into the man's eyes. I have it here still, she said, where it has hung these many months. This scrap of gold first taught me to look for Uther. Ah, Egrain, am I a king? My king, sire, and oh, how long it was before I could get news of you. Yet in time tidings came. Then it was that I left Winchester, went on foot through the land, and hearing again of you I set out for Wales and Caerleon with rumours of war in my ears. Even from Caerleon I followed you, even to the western sea, where I saw the great battle with Gillomanius and the noble deeds you did there for Britain. Peleus's dark eyes flashed up to hers. A man loves to be noble indeed before the face of the woman he serves, a species of divine vanity that begets heroes. The girl's staunch faith was a thing that proffered the superbest flattery. You are very wonderful, Egrain. It was all for my own heart. And what greater joy could I have than to see you a king before the thundering swords of your knights? You saw that, Egrain? Do you remember a hillock by the pine forest on the ridge, where you reined in after the charge and uncovered your head to the sun? As it were yesterday. I stood on that hillock, Peleus, and saw your face after many months. Ah, Egrain, said I not you were very wonderful? No, no, I am only a woman, only a woman. God give me such a wife. The word was keen as the barb of a lance. Peleus's head was bowed over the girl's hand as he pressed his lips to the gold circlet of hair, and he did not see the frown of pain upon her face. Wife! What a mockery! What bitterness! The sky seemed black for a moment, the valley bare with the blasts of winter and the moan of tortured trees. She half choked in her throat, and her heart seemed to fail within her like a bowl that is broken. Yet there was a smile on her face when Peleus looked up from the circlet of her hair with the pride of love in his large eyes. What ails you, Egrain? A mere thought of the past. Tell it me. No, no, it is nothing. A mere vapor. 
and it has passed. How warm your lips are to my fingers. Tell me of yourself, Peleus. But this armor, Ygrin. I took it from a dead knight, God rest his soul. I have wandered long in Wales, yet ever drew to Caerleon where folk spoke your name. Yet never might I come near you, lest, lest you were too great for me. Child, child, Uther Pendragon, King of Britain. Let the world die. And let us live, Peleus. Tell me of yourself. The man looked long over the valley in silence. His face was very grave, and his eyes were deep with thought, as though the past awed him with the recollection of its bitterness. "'May I never pass such another night,' he said. The words were curt and calm enough, as though leaving infinite things unsaid. Egrain sat silent by him, and still plaited her hair about his wrist. I went away in the dark, for I thought you were a nun, Egrain, and I would not break your vows. I was nearly blind for an hour. Twice my horse stumbled and fell with me in the woods, and once I was smitten out of the saddle by a tree. Dawn came, and how I cursed the sun. I seemed to see your face everywhere, and to hear your voice in every sound. Days came and went, and I hated the sight of man. As for my prayers, I could not say them, and I was dumb in my heart towards God. I rode north into the wilds, and into the fenlands of the east. Strange things befell me in many places. I fought often, beast and wild men, and robber ruffians out of the woods. Fighting pleased me. It eased the wrath in my heart that seemed to rage up against the world, and against all things that drew breath. I wandered in the night of the forests, waded through swamps, took my food by the sword, and never blessed man or woman. I felt bitter and evil to the core. Egrain bent down and touched his forehead with her lips. Brave heart, she said. You shall hear how I came by my own soul again. Ah, tell me that. It was as though a still voice came to me out of heaven. I was riding in the northern wilds not far from rough coastland and the sea, and riding came upon a little house of timber all bowered round with trees. It was a peaceful spot. Flowers grew around, and the sun was shining, and I drew near, moved in my heart to beg food and rest, for I was half-starved and gaunt as a monk from an African desert. What did I see there? A dead man tied to a tree and gored with many wounds. A woman kneeling dead before his feet, thrust through with a sword. A little child lying near with its head crushed by a stone or a club. The sword was a Saxon sword, and I knew who had done the deed, but sight of the dead folk by their empty home seemed to smite my pity like the thought of the dead Christ. I had pitied but myself and you, Egrain, and had wandered through the land like a brute beast mad with the smart of my own wound. Here was woe enough, agony enough, to shame my heart. Straightway I went down on my knees and prayed, and came through penitence and fire to a knowledge of myself. Rise up, said the voice in me, rise up and play the man. There is much sorrow in Britain, much shedding of innocent blood, much violence and much brute wrath. Rise up and strike for woman and for babe. Let your sword shine against the wolves from over the sea. Let your shield hurl them from the ruined hearths of Britain, the smoking churches, and the children of the cross. So I rose up strong again and comforted, and rode back into the world to do my duty. When Peleus had made an end of speaking, Egrain's eyes were full of tears. 
The simplicity of the man's words had awakened to the full all the pathos of the past in her, and she was as proud of him as when she saw him hurl Gillimanius and his host down the green slopes towards the sea. Her lips quivered as she spoke to him, looking into his face with her eyes dim and shadowy with tears. Forgive me all this. It has been good for me, Egrain, nor would I alter the days that are gone. No, no. We have found love again. Ah, Peleus! What more need we ask? What more? Her voice was half a wail. Again it was winter, and the wind blew as though at midnight. The flowers and the green woods were blurred before the girl's eyes. Gorloise's hard face and the grey walls of Tintagel came betwixt her and the summer, and though the mood lasted but for a moment, it seemed like the long agony of days crushed into the compass of a minute. Evening stood calm-eyed in the east. A tranquil heat hung over wood and valley, a warm silence that seemed to bind the world into a golden swoon. Not a ripple stirred in the grass with its tapestries of flowers. Every leaf was hushed upon the bough. Nothing moved save the droning bee and the wings of the butterflies hovering color-bright over the meadows. The sky was a mighty sapphire. The woods, carved emeralds, piled giant-wise to the sun. There was no discord and no sound of man, as though the curse of Adam was not yet. Egrain had drawn Peleus's great sword from its sheath. She held it slantwise before her and pressed her lips to the cold steel. Old friend, she said, be ever true to me. Peleus laughed and touched her hair with his hand. A kind of exultation came upon them, and the zest of life crept through the bodies like green sap in spring. Egrain had filled her brazen helmet to the brim with flowers, and she scattered them and sang as they roamed into the hoar shadows of the woods. Dear love of mine, where art thou roaming? The west is red, my heart is calling. Never had the vaults seemed greener, the half-light more mysterious under the massive trees. The far world was out of ken. They alone lived and had their being. The toil of man was not even like the long sob of moonlit sea, or the sound of rivers running in the night. The infinite strangeness of beauty shone over them like a wizard light out of the west. Egrain's lips were very red, her face white in the shadows, her eyes deep with mute desire. Hand held hand, body touched body. Often she would lie out upon Peleus's arm, her head upon his shoulder, her hair clouding over his red harness. They were content to be together, to forget the world save so much of it as came within the ken of their eyes and the close grip of their twined fingers. They said little as they swayed together under the trees. Soul ebbed into soul upon their lips, and a deep ecstasy possessed them like the throbbing pathos of some song. As the day deepened, Peleus and Egrain turned back into the valley hand in hand. The west burnt gold above the treetops. The gnarled trunks were pillars of agate bearing bizant domes of breathless leaves. By the white may trees the two horses stood tethered, black and gray against the grass. Loosing them, and taking each a bridle, they passed down through flowers to the cottage and the pool. Garlotte met them there with her brown hair pouring over her shoulders and a clean white kerchief over her throat and bosom. She came to them through a little thicket of foxgloves that were budding early, white and purple. Her blue eyes quivered for a moment over Peleus's face as she made him a deep curtsy and bent to kiss Egrain's hand. There was a vast measure of sympathy in Garlotte's heart, and yet for all her well-wishing she was troubled for the two fearing for them instinctively with even her small knowledge of the world. She had learnt enough from Egrain to comprehend in measure that element of tragedy that had entered with Gorlois into her life. Her interest in the man Peleus was no mere vulgar curiosity, 
rather an intense pity that permeated her warm innocence of spirit to the core. She had spread supper on the table, a much-meditated feast that had kept her eagerly busy since she had guessed the name of the strange knight who had ridden down out of the woods. She had the pride of a young housewife in her creamy milk, her bread. She had made a tansy cake, and there was a rich cream cheese ready in the cupboard, and a fat rabbit stewing by the fire. Yet for all her ingenuous pride, she felt much troubled when it came to the test, lest her fare should seem rude and meager to the great knight in the red harness. Certainly he had a kind face and splendid eyes, but would he not smile at her humble supper, her horn cups, and her plates of hollywood? Her cares were empty enough, but they were very real to the sensitive child who feared to seem shamed before Egrain. Half the happiness of life lies in the kindly sensibility of others to our desire for sympathy. A surly word, a trivial ungraciousness, a small deed passed over in thankless silence, how much these things mean to a sensitive heart. Garlotte, standing in her cottage door, half shy and timid, found her small fears mere little goblins of her little invention. Egrain, radiant as the evening, came and kissed her on the lips. Little sister, you have been very good to me. The great knight, too, was smiling at her in quite a fatherly fashion. What a strong face he had, and what a noble look! She felt sure that he was a good man, and her heart went out to him like an opening flower. When he took her hand and a lock of her hair and kissed it, she went red as one of her own roses, and was dumb with an impulsive gladness. "'Little sister, you have been very good to me.' "'Good, my lord, to you?' "'Child, Egrain can tell you how.' "'But the Lady Egrain, she saved my life.' "'Ah, I had not heard that. Tell me.' Garlotte found her ease in a moment. The whole tale came bubbling up like water out of a spring. Peleus's strong face beamed. He touched Egrain's hair with his fingers— and looked into her eyes as only a man in love can look. Garlotte saw that she was giving pleasure, and felt a glow from head to heart. Surely this great, grave-faced knight was a noble soul. How gentle he was, and how he looked into Egrain's eyes and bent over her like a tall elm over a slim cypress tree. She caught the happiness of the two, and from that moment her heart was singing and she had no more fear for herself and her poor cottage. Even the horn cups took a golden dignity, and her tansy cake and her cream seemed fit for a prince. The three were soon at supper together, round the wooden table, with honeysuckle and roses climbing close above their heads. Garlotte would have stood and waited on Peleus and Egrain, but they would have none of it, so she was set smiling at the head of her little table, and constrained to play the lady under her own roof. It was a dull meal so far as mere words were concerned. Peleus's eyes were on Egrain in the twilight, and he had no hunger save hunger of heart. Yet that the supper was a success there was no doubt whatever. Garlotte watched them both with a quiet delight. Young as she was, she was wise in the simple love of love, and so she mothered the pair to her heart's content in her own imagination. If only Renan had been there to help her serve and touch her hand under the table, what a perfect guest hour it would have been. When the meal was over, she jumped up with a shy smile, took a rush basket from the wall, and went out into the garden. Egrain called her back. "'Where are you going, child?' Up the valley to the dead oak tree where herbs grow. I must make a stew tomorrow. It will soon be dark. Garlotte swung her basket and laughed from her cloud of hair. You gathered herbs on Sunday, Egrain. You squirrel. Renan was here. You came home after dusk. Goodbye, goodbye. They heard her go singing through the garden, a soft chant d'amour that would have gone wondrously to flute and sithern. It died away slowly amid the trees like an elf's song coming from woodlands in the moonlight. Peleus drew a deep breath and listened in the shadow of the room with his hands clasped before him on the table. He looked as though he were praying. 
Egrain's eyes were glooms of violet mystery as she watched him, her hands folded over a breast that rose and fell as with the restless motion of a troubled sea. She called the man softly by name, her body bent to him like a bow, her hair bathed his face with dim ripples of gold as mouth touched mouth. They went out into the garden together and stood under the cedar tree. Peleus, my love, my own, heart of mine, you will never leave me. How should the sea put the earth from his bosom, or the moon pass from the arms of the night? I am faint, Peleus. Hold me in your arms. They are strong, Egrain. There, let me rest so for ever. Look, the stars are coming out, and there is the moon flooding silver over the trees. My lips burn, and I am faint. Courage, courage, dear heart. How close you hold me! I could die so. What is death to us, Egrain? Or life? God in heaven and heaven on earth. Your words hurt me. End of Book 3, Chapter 10 Recording by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa Section 31 of Uther and Igrain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Uther and Igrain by Warwick Deeping Book 3, Chapter 11 How the birds sang that evening as a saffron afterglow fainted over the four spires, and when all was still with the hush of the night, how the cry of a nightingale thrilled from a tree near the cottage. The glamour of the day had passed, and now what mockery and bitterness came with the cold, calculating face of the moon. Ygrine tossed and turned in her bed like one taken with a fever. Her brain seemed a fire, her hair like so much flame about her forehead. As she lay staring with wide, wakeful eyes, the bird's song mocked her to the echo. The scent of honeysuckle and rose floated in like a sad savor of death, and the moonlight seemed to watch her without a quaver of pity. Her heart panted in the darkness. She was torn by the thousand torments of a troubled conscience, wounded to tears, yet her eyes were dry and waterless as a desert. Gorlois's face seemed to glare down at her out of the idle gloom, and she could have cried out with the fear that lay like an icy hand over her bosom. Peleus slept under the cedar tree, wrapped in an old cloak, relic of Garlet's father. How Igrine's heart wailed for the man! How she longed for the touch of his hand! God of heaven, she could not let him go again! and starve her soul with the old, cursed life. His lips had touched hers. His arms had held her close. She had felt the warmth of his body and the beating of his heart. Was all this nothing? A dream? A splendid phantasm to be rent away like a crimson cloud? Was she to be Gorlice's wife and nothing more? A bitter flower growing under a gallows, Sour wine frothing in a gilded cup? God of heaven, no! What had the world done for her that she should obey its edicts and suffer for its tyrannies? Galois had cheated her of her liberty. Let him pay the price to the fates. What honor, indeed, had she to preserve for him? If he was a brute piece of lust, a tyrant, a demagogue, so much the better— it would ease her conscience. She owed no fealty, no marriage vow to Gorlois. Her body was no more his than was her soul, and a dozen priests and a dozen masses might as well marry granite to fire. How could a fool in a cape and a frock, by gabbling a service, bind an irresponsible woman to a man she hated more than the foulest mud in the foulest alley? It was a stupendous piece of nonsense 
to say the least of it. No God calling himself a just God could hold such a bargain holy. And then, the truth! What a stumbling block truth was on occasions! She knew Peleus's intense love of honor, the fine sensibility of his conscience, the strong thirst for the highest good that made him the victim of an ethical tyranny. If he had left her after Andred's gold because he thought her a nun, what hope now had she of holding him if he knew her to be a wife? And yet, for all her love, she could not bring herself to keep him wholly from the truth. For all her passion and the fire in her rebellious heart, she was not a woman who could fling reason to the winds and stifle up her conscience with a kiss. Besides, she loved Peleus to the very zenith of her soul. To have a lie understood upon her lips, to be shamed before the man's eyes, were things that scourged her in fancy even more than the thought of losing him. She trembled when she thought how he might look at her in later days if a passive lie were proven against her with open shame. But to tell him of Gorlois and the humiliation of that darkest hour of her life, could such a man as Peleus serve her longer after such a confession? He would become a king again, a stranger, a man set in high places far beyond the mere yearning of a woman's white face. And yet, it was possible that his love might prove stronger than his reason. It was possible that he might front the world and frown down the petty judgments of men. Glorious and transcendent sacrifice! She could face calumny beside him as a rock faces the froth of waves. She could look Gorlois in the eyes and know neither shame nor pity. Her mood that night was like the passage of a blown leaf, tossed up to heaven, whirled over the treetops, driven down again into the mire. Strong woman that she was, her very strength made the struggle more indecisive and more racking. She could not renounce Peleus for the great love she bore him. And yet, she could not will to play a false part by reason of this same great love. Her soul, like a wanderer in the wilds, halted and wavered between two tracks that led forward into the unknown. Garlet was sleeping in the far corner of the cottage. The girl had given up her bed to Igrine, who envied her her quiet, restful breathing, as she lay and listened. In her doubt, she called and woke Garlet from her sleep, hardly knowing indeed what she desired to say to her, yet half fearful of lying alone longer in the night with her own thoughts for company. Garlet rose up and came across the room to the bigger bed. She knelt down. Two warm arms crept under the coverlet, and a soft cheek touched Igrine's. Why are you awake, Igrine? The warmth of the girl's body, her quiet breathing, the sweep of her hair, seemed to bring a scent of peace and human sympathy into the moonlit room. Igrine put her arms about her and drew her down to her side. Their white faces and clouding hair lay close together on the pillow. You are in trouble, Igrine? How should I be in trouble? You breathe like one in pain. And your voice is strange. Hush, Garlet. Am I not right? Peleus must not hear us talking. They were silent a while, lying in each other's arms with no sound save that of their breathing. Ekrine's misery burnt in her and cried out for sympathy. Garlet, half-wise by instinct, yearned to share a trouble which she did not wholly comprehend to advise where she was partly ignorant. The girl felt a great stirring of her heart towards Igrine, but could say nothing for the moment. Having no better eloquence at command, she raised her head and kissed the other's lips, a warm, impulsive kiss that seemed as rich in sympathy as a rose in scent. 
Ikran's confidence woke at the touch of the girl's lips. She hungered even for this child's comfort, her simple guidance in this matter of life and love. It was easy enough to die, hard to exist as a mere spiritless Galadia, devoid of soul. Garlet. Yes, Sigrain. Imagine you were married to a man you hated, and you loved Renan. Garlet raised herself in bed. And Renan loved you, and knew nothing. Yes. Would you tell Renan the truth? Garlet remained motionless, propped on her two hands and looking out of the window into the streaming moonlight. Her brown hair touched a grind's face as she lay still and watched her. The room was very silent. Not a breeze seemed stirring. The roses athwart the window were still as though carved in wood. Garlet spoke very softly, looking up with her face white and solemn in the moonlight. I should tell Renan, she said. Why? Because I love him. Yes, go on. I should not love him rightly in God's eyes if I kept him from the truth. The coverlet rose and fell over a grain's bosom, and there was a queer twisting pain at her heart. But if you were never to see Renan again, she said. If I told him the truth? Yes, child. Garlet dared not look into Igrain's face. Her lips were twitching, and her eyes were hot with tears. I do not know, she faltered. Think, child, think. I should not tell him. In half a breath, she had contradicted herself with a little gasp. Yes, yes, I should tell him. The truth? Because I could not be happy even with him if I were acting a lie. Ikrain gave a dry sob and drew Garlet down again to her side. They lay very close, almost mouth to mouth, their arms about each other's bodies. I love Peleus. Yes, yes. I will tell him the truth. Ah, Ikrain, it is best. It is best. But it will kill me if I lose him. Ah, Ikrain, but he will love you all the more. It was Garlet who broke into tears and hid her face in the other's bosom. Igrain's eyes were as dry as a blue sky parched with a summer sun, and her voice failed her like the slack string of a lute. The moonlight slanted down upon them both. Before dawn, they had fallen asleep in each other's arms. How many a heart trembles with the return of day! What fears rise with the first blush of light in an empty sky? The cloak of night is lifted from weary faces. The quiet balm of darkness is withdrawn from the moiling care of many a heart. To a grind, the dawn light came like a message of misery as she lay beside the sleeping garlet and watched the gloom grow less and less in the little room. This dawn seemed a veritable symbol of the truth that she feared to look upon and recognize. The night seemed kinder, less implacable, less grave of face. Day, like a pale justiciary, stalked up out of the east to call her to that a size where truth and the soul meet under the eye of heaven. How different it was with Peleus under the eaves of the great cedar. He had slept little that night for mere wakeful happiness. The moon had kept carnival for him above the world. At dawn the stars had crept back from the choir stalls into the chambers of the night. He had known no weariness, no abatement of his deep, calm joy. His heart had answered blithely to the dawn song of the birds, as though he had risen fresh from a dreamless sleep. The day to him had no look of evil. The sky was never gray. The flesh in the east recalled no flashing of torches over a funeral byre. He rose up in the glory of his clean manhood, the strong kindliness of his great love. His prayers went to heaven that morning with the lark, 
and the Spirit of God seemed like a wind moving softly in the green boughs above his head. Very early, before it was light, he had taken a plunge and a swim in the pool. A swinging burst through the still water that had made him revel in his great strength. He had come up from the pool like a god refreshed, and had put on his red harness while the mist rose from the valley, and the birds chanted in the ghostly trees. When the day was fully awake, he walked the grass path in the garden like a watchman, with the scent of honeysuckle and thyme in his nostrils, and a blaze of flowers at his feet. As he paced up and down with his face turned to the sky, he sang in a mellow bass a song of Guyon's, The Court Minstrel. When the dawn has come, my heart sighs for thee, and the gleam of thy hair, ah, as deep as the night, when the summer sky arches the world. So sang Peleus as he paced the grass, with his eyes wandering ever towards the doorway of the cottage. Presently Grain came out to him, and stood under the shadow of the porch. Her hair hung lustrous about a face that was white and drawn, despite a smile. Certainly a haze of red flushed her cheeks when Peleus came up with a glory of love in his eyes, took her hands and kissed them, as though there were no such divine flesh in the whole wide world. How wonderful it was to be touched so, to have such eyes pouring out so strong a soul before her face, to know the presence of a great love, and to feel the echoing passion of it in her own heart. After the barren months of winter and the long bondage in Tintagel, it seemed an idyllic thing to be so served, so comforted. And was this fairy time but for an hour, a day, and no longer? Was she but to see the man's face, to feel the touch of his hands, the grand calm of his love, before losing him, perhaps for life? Her heart fluttered in her like a smitten bird. And Peleus, too, what a thrust lurked for the man, a blow to be given in the name of truth. How could she speak to him of Galois when he came and looked at her with those eyes of his? Ygrine had never felt such misery as this, even in the gloomy galleries of Tintagel. It tried her courage to the death to face Peleus's wistful gaiety and the adoration that beamed on her from his eyes. Dear heart, it is dawn. It is dawn. Peleus held her hands and waited for her lips to be turned to his. Instead, he saw her lowered lids and quivering lashes, lips that were plaintive, a face white beneath a wealth of hair. Ah, oh, Grain, you do not look at me. Her eyes trembled up to his with a sudden, infinite luster. Peleus! Girl! Girl! I have hardly slept. Nor I, Grain. I am worn out with thinking of you. Ha, little woman, you are extravagant. You will die like a flower, even while I hold you in my bosom. Garlic came out of the cottage and was kissed by Peleus on the lips. The girl's eyes were red and heavy. She had been crying but a moment ago in the shadow of the cottage room, and she was timid and very solemn. Peleus looked at her like a big brother. Come now, little sister, he said with a rare smile. Methinks you must be in love too by your looks. Yes, Lord. Said I not so? You women take things so to heart. Yes, Lord. What a solemn face, little sister. Garlet mastered herself for a moment, then burst into tears and ran back into the cottage. Peleus colored, looked troubled, glanced at Igrine, thinking that he had hurt the girl's heart with his words. Igrine's face startled him as if the visage of death had risen up suddenly amid the flowers. He stood mute before her, watching her starved lips her drawn face, her eyes that stared beyond him with a kind of cold frenzy. 
Peleus, Peleus. It was like the wild cry of a woman over her dead love. The sound struck Peleus with a vague sense of stupendous woe, of dim prophecy of evil, like the noise of autumn in the woods. Before he could gather words, Igrain had turned and run from him as in great fear, skirting the pool and holding for the black yawn of the forest aisles. Peleus started to follow her in a daze of wonder. Was the girl mad? Had love turned her brain? What was there hid in her heart that made her wing from him like a dove from a hawk? By the trees, Igrain slackened and turned breathless on the man as he came towards her through the long grass. Her eyes were dim and frightened, her lips twitching, and there was a bleak, hunted look upon her face that made her seem white and old. Peleus's blood ran cold in him like water. A vague dread sapped his manhood. He stared at Igrain and was speechless. The girl put her arm before her eyes and shook as she stood. Peleus fell on his knees with a cry and reached for her hand. Igrain! Igrain! She snatched her arm away and would not look at him. My God, what is this, Igrain? Don't touch me. I am Galoris's wife. A vast silence seemed to fall sudden on the world. It might have been the dead of night in winter, with deep snow upon the ground and no wind stirring in the forest. To a grind, swaying in agony with her arm over her face, the silence came like the hush that might fall on heaven before the damning of a lost soul to hell. She wondered what was in Peleus's heart and dared not look at him or meet his eyes. God in heaven, would the man never speak? Would the silence crawl on into an eternity? At last she did look, and nearly fell at the wrench of it. Peleus was standing near her, looking at her with his great solemn eyes, as though she had given him his death. His face seemed to have gone gray and haggard in a moment. Galois's wife! was all he said. Egrain hung her head, shivered, and said nothing. Peleus never stirred. He seemed like so much stone, a mere pillar of granite misery. Egrain could have writhed at his feet and caught him by the knees, only to melt for a moment that white calm on his face that looked like the mask of death. A voice that was almost strange to her startled her out of her stupor of despair. How long have you been wed, Igrain? Nine months, Peleus. The man seemed to be struggling with himself as though he strove after the truth, yet could not confront it for all his strength. When he spoke, his voice was like the voice of a man winded by hard running. He appeared to urge himself forward, to goad his courage to a task that he dreaded. There was great anguish on his face as he looked into the girl's eyes. I must speak what I know, Igrain. The words seemed slow with effort. Igrain watched him in silence, full of a vague dread. Golos has spoken to me of his wife. Say on, Peleus. Peleus hesitated. The truth. Tell me the truth. She was almost clamorous. Peleus plunged on. Galoris told me how his wife was faithless to him, how she had fled with Brastius, the knight who had warred over her at Caerleon. I never knew her name until this hour. The words might have fallen like the strokes of a lash. Egrine stood and stared at the man, her mouth open like a black circle, her eyes expressionless for the moment, like the eyes of one smitten blind. The full meaning of the words numbed her, and hindered her understanding. A babble of shame sounded in her ears. The sinister intent of the man's accusation rose gradual before her reason, like the distorted image of a dream. She felt cold to the core. A strange terror possessed her. Peleus, what have you said to me? Her voice was a mere whisper. Peleus hung his head, and said never a word. 
His silence seemed to fling sudden fire into Igrain's eyes, and her face flamed like a sunset. It might have been Golois who stood and challenged the honor of her soul. Man, tell me what is in your heart. Her voice was shrill, even imperious. Peleus hung his head. Golois keeps poison for his wife, were his words. Igrain's lips curled. A sword for Brostius. Generous man. Peleus was watching her as a prisoner watches a judge. He had a great yearning to believe. Fear, anguish, anger were in Igrain's heart. But she showed none of the three as she stood forward and looked into the man's eyes with a steadfastness no honor could gainsay. Peleus, she said. Girl, look into my eyes. He did so without flinching. Igrain took his sword and gave it naked into his hand. Listen, Golois told you a lie. Igrain, do you believe me, Peleus? If not, strike with the sword, for I will live no longer. The man gave a sudden cry, like one who leaps over a precipice, threw the sword far away into the grass, and falling on his knees, buried his face in his hands. This is the end of Book 3, Chapter 11, recorded by Laurie Nadeau Richardson, www.laurierichardsonvo.com. Section 32 of Uther and Agrain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Uther and Igrain by Warwick Deeping Book 3, Chapter 12 Igrain stood and watched Peleus as he knelt in the grass at her feet with his face hidden from her by his hands. She saw the curve of his strong neck, the sweep of his great shoulders. She even counted the steel plates in his shoulder pieces and marked the tinge of gray in his coronal of hair. Calm had come upon her with the trust won by the confessional of the sword. She felt sure of the man in her heart and eased of a double burden since she had told him the truth and brought him to a declaration of his faith. She knew well from instinct that her honor stood sure in Peleus's heart. Going to him, she bent and touched his head with her hand. Peleus, she said very softly. The man groaned and would not look at her. Mea culpa, mea culpa, was his cry. Igrain smiled like a young mother as she put his hands from his face with a gradual insistence. It was right that he should kneel to her, but it was also right that she should forgive and forget like a woman. Yet, as she stood and held his hands in hers, Peleus hung his head and would not so much as look into her face. He was convicted in his own heart and contrite according to the deep measure of his manhood. Igrain touched his hair softly with her fingers, and there was a great light in her eyes as she bent over him. Come, Peleus, and sit by me under the trees, and I will tell you the whole tale. Never had she seemed so stately or so superb in Peleus's eyes, as she stood before him that morning, strong and sorrowful with the burden of her past. He knelt and looked up at her, knowing himself pardoned, humbled to see love in the ascendant so soon upon her face as she looked down at him from her golden aureole of hair. Am I forgiven? he said. Ah, oh, Peleus, you have shamed me. I am a broken man. 
He rose up half wearily, and stood looking at her as though some mysterious influence had parted them suddenly asunder. So expressive were his eyes that Egrain read a distant anguish in them on the instant and fathomed his thoughts to the troubling of her own heart. Look not so, she said, as though a gulf lay deep between us here. How else well should I look at you, Egrain, when you are wife to Galois? Never in my soul. How can that help us? Igrine winced at the words and took refuge in silence. She went and seated herself at the foot of a gnarled oak. Peleus followed her and lay down more than a sword's length away, leaving a stretch of green turf between. A thing insignificant in itself, yet full of meaning to the girl's instinctive watchfulness. The man's face, too, was turned from her towards the valley, and she could only see the curve of his cheek and chin as she began to speak to him of that which was in her heart. You know the man Golois, she said. Peleus nodded. In Winchester, Golois saw my face and straightway pestered me as he had been turned into my shadow. By chance he had rendered me service, and from the favor casually conferred, plucked the right of thrusting his perpetual homage upon me. I trusted Golois little from the beginning, and trusted him less as the weeks went by. His eyes frightened me, and his mouth made my soul shiver. The more importunate he grew, the more I began to fear him. Peleus shifted his sword and said nothing. A day came when the man Golores grew tired of courtesies, and we began said no longer. It was in Radamant's garden. We quarreled, and the man laid hands upon me and crushed me against the wall to thieve a kiss. In my anger I broke from him and ran into my uncle's house. The same night I fled to an abbey, the Abbey of St. Helena, and left Winchester in my dress at dawn. Igran could see the muscles of Polyas's jaw standing out, contracted as though his teeth were clenched in an excess of anger. He was breathing deeply through his nostrils, and his hands plucked at the grass with a terse snapping sound. These things pleased Igran. She went on forthwith. I left Winchester on foot at dawn and traveled towards Sarum, for I heard that Uther the king was there, and it was greatly in my mind, sire, to see his face. An old merchant friend of Radamant's overtook me on the road. At a ford, the horse he had lent me fell and twisted my ankle. I was carried to Udall's house and lay abed there many days, learning little to my comfort that Galois had ridden out and was hunting me through the countryside. Recovered of my strain, and fearful of Galois's trackers, I held on for Sarum through the woods and lodged the same night in a hermitage in a little valley. Here the first piece of craft overtook me, for early in the morning outside the hermitage I saw a knight ride by on a black horse bearing red harness, and armed at all points like to you. Peleus turned his head for the first time and looked at her as though with some sudden suspicion of what was to follow. Igrine saw something in his dark eyes that made her heart hurry. His face was like the face of a man who fronts a storm of wind and rain, with brows furrowed and eyes half-closed. There was much that was threatening in his look, a subdued, ominous wrath, like a storm nursed in the bosom of a cloud. Ikrine told the whole quaint tale, how she followed Gorlois in faith, how she was led into the forest, bewitched there, and made a wife, 
mesmerized into a false affection for the man by Merlin's craft. It was a grim tale, with a clear color of truth, and credible by reason of its very strangeness. It was sufficient to manifest to Peleus how Igraine's strong love for him had lost her her liberty and made her the victim of a man's lust. When she had ended the tale, Peleus left the grass at her feet and began to pace under the trees like a sentinel on a wall. His scabbard clanged occasionally against his greaves. Masses of young bracken covered the ground between the trees with a rich carpet of green, and his armor shone like red wrath under the wreathing arcs of foliage. His face was dark and moody with the turmoil of thought, but there was no visible agitation upon him. Nothing of the aspen, more of the unbending oak. Igrain leant against her tree and watched him with a curious care, wondering what would be the outcome of all this silence. Down in the valley the pool glistened, and she could see Garlet walking in the cottage garden. How different was this child's lot to hers! With what warm philosophy could she have changed Peleus into a shepherd and taken the part of Garlet to herself? Presently Peleus stayed in his stride through the bracken and came and stood before her, looking not into her face, but beyond her into the deeps of the wood. Tell me more, Igrine. What more would you hear from me? That which is bitterest of all. God, must I tell you that? Let us both drink it to the dregs. Ygrine's face and neck colored rich as one of Garlet's red roses, and she seemed to shrink from the man's eyes behind the quivering sunlight of her hair. She put her hands to her breast and stood in a strain of thought, of struggle against the infinite unfitness of the past. Peleus saw her trouble, and his strong face softened on the instant. He had forgotten milder things in his grappling of the truth. Igrain's red and troubled look revived the finer instincts of his manhood. Never trouble, child, he said. I know enough of Galois to read the rest. But Igrain, as by inspiration, had come by other reasons for telling out the whole to the last pang. She was at pains to justify herself to Peleus, nor was she undesirous of inflaming him against Galois, her lord. She had wit enough to grasp the fact that Peleus' wrath might be roused into insurrection against custom and the edicts of the church. A volcanic outburst might throw down the barriers of man and leave her at liberty to choose her lot. Moreover, her hate of Gorlois, an iconoclastic passion, had crushed the reverence of things existing out of her heart. A contemplation of her evil fortune had brought her to the conviction that she was exiled from the sympathies of men. A spiritual bandit driven to compass the instincts of a rebellious soul. In her hot impulse for liberty and the justification of her faith, she did not halt from making Peleus feel the full malignity of truth. She neither embellished nor emphasized, but portrayed incidents simply in their glaring nakedness, in a fashion that promised to inflame the man to the very top of her desire. Igrine's cheeks kindled, and she could not look at the man for the words upon her lips. Peleus's face was like the face of a man in torture. The woman's words entered into him like iron. His wrath whistled like a wind, and the very air seemed tainted in his mouth. What a purgatory of passion was let loose into the calm precincts of the place. This burning vault of blue, 
Was it the same as root the world of yesterday? The feathery mounts of green dappled with amber. And these flowers, had they not changed with the noon lust of the sun? There was a rank savor of fleshliness over the whole earth, and all life seemed impious, passionate, and unclean. My God! My God! The man's cry shook a grind from her rage for truth. In her confessional, she had been carried like a bird with the wind. Looking into Peleus's face, she saw that he was in torment, and that her words had smitten him in a fashion other than she had foreseen. It was not wrath that burnt in his eyes, only a deep grieving, a frenzy of shame and anguish that seemed to cry out against her soul. A sudden stupor made her mute. With a great void in her heart, she fell down amid the bracken with a sense of ignominy and abasement, overwhelming her like a deluge. Peleus stood and shut his eyes to the sun. A red glare smote into his brain. Love seemed numb in him, and his blood stagnant. Prayer eluded him like a vapor. Looking out again over wood and valley, the golden haze, the torpor of the trees, mocked him with a lethargy that smiled at the impotence of man. And a grind. He saw her prone beneath the green mist of the fern fronds, lying with her face pillowed on her arms, her hair spread like a golden net over the brown wreckage of the bygone year. To what a pass their love had come! Better, he thought, to have lived a king solitary on a throne than to have wandered into youth again and to give and win such dolor. His face was dark as he stood and looked at the woman's violet surcoat gleaming low under the bracken. How symbolical this attitude seemed of all that had fallen upon his heart. Love cast down upon dead leaves. Igrain had feared his honor. Peleus feared it for another sense as he looked at the woman and felt his pity clamoring for life. He could have given his soul to comfort her if no shame could have come upon her name thereby. As it was, some spiritual hand seemed at his throat, stifling aught of love that found impulse on his lips. A superhuman sincerity chilled him into silence and held him in bondage to the truth. A face stared up from the bracken, wan, tearless, and tragic. The wistfulness of the face made him quail within his harness. He knew too well what was in Igrine's heart, and the look that questioned him like the look of a wounded hare. Her eyes searched his face, as though to read her doom thereon. There was no whimpering, no noise, no passionate rhetoric. A great quiet seemed to take its temper from the silence of the woods. Peleus. Yes, Igrine. Tell me what is in your heart. Peleus hung his head. He could not look at her for all his courage. She was kneeling in the bracken with her hands crossed over her breast, and her face turned to his with the white wistfulness of a full moon. Peleus felt death in his heart, and he could not speak, nor look into her eyes. Peleus! Child, you do not look at me. Great God, would I were blind. The truth came crying to her like the wild cry of a bird taken by a weasel in the woods. A great sobbing shook her. She fell down and caught Peleus by the knees. Peleus! Peleus! My God, he cried. 
I stifle. Don't leave me. Don't send me away. What can I say to you? Only look into my eyes again. Pelles put his fists before his face. The girl felt him quiver, and he seemed to twist in an agony, like a man dangling on a rope. Igrine's hands crept to his shoulders. She drew herself by his body as by a pillar till her face met his, and she lay heavy upon his breast. Pelias! Her breath was on his lips and her hair flooded over his hands like golden wine. Peleus! Peleus! The words came with a windless whisper. Have pity, Agrain. I will never leave you. Goliath's wife! Never! Never! My God! I am not his, Peleus! Take me, body and soul. Take me, and let me be your wife. How can I sin against your soul, Igrine? Is it sin, then, to love me? You are Goliath's wife before God. There is no God, Igrine. I will have no God but you, Peleus. The man took his hands from his face and looked into Igrine's eyes. A strong shudder passed over him, and he seemed like a great ship smitten by a wave, till every fiber groaned and quivered in his massive frame. A green calm covered the valley, and the whole world seemed to faint in the golden bosom of the day. Not the twitter of a bird broke the vast hush of the forest. The sunlit isles climbed into a shadowland of mysterious silence, and an azure quiet hung above the trees. As for Peleus and Agrine, their two lives seemed knotted up with a cord of gold. They had mingled breath and taken the savor of each other's souls. Yet for all the glory of the moment, it was but autumn with them. A pomp of passion a red splendor dying, while it blazed into the gray ruin of a winter day. Igrine read her doom in the man's face. It was the face of a martyr, pale, resolute, yet inspired. A dry sob died in her throat, and her hands dropped from the man's shoulders. Peleus stood back and looked at her with a warm light in his dark eyes the green woods rising behind him like a bank of clouds. Igrine. She nodded, felt miserable, and said nothing. I cannot love you easily. Igrine's eyes stared at him with a mute bitterness. She was a woman, and thought like a woman. Mere saintly philosophy was beyond her. You are too good a man, Peleus, she said. I would hold my love in my heart like a great pearl in a casket of gold. What comfort is there in mere splendid misery and in such words? How should I love you best? Ah, oh, Peleus. Ask your own heart. The man was an impossible being for mere mortal argument. He seemed to bear spiritual pinions that tantalized the intelligence of the heart. Igrine felt herself adrift and beaten, and she was hopeless of him to the core. Think you I shall be a saint, Peleus, said she, when you have given me back to myself? I shall pray for you. And for a devil! She gave a shrill laugh and twined her hair about her wrist. Ah, oh, Peleus, you know not what you do. Too well, Grine. You are too strong for me, and yet... 
and yet I should not have loved you so well if you had not been strong. That is how I think of you, Agrine. You love me more by leaving me. I love you more by keeping you pure before my soul. A great calm had come upon Agrine. She was very pale and firm about the lips, and her eyes were staunch as steel. Her voice was as clear and level as though she spoke of trivial things. I shall not go back to Galois, she said. Beware of the man. Doubtless you would speak to me of a convent. Peleus fell into thought, with his dark eyes fixed upon her face. As a novice? Igraine almost smiled at him. And not a nun? For answer, he spoke three simple words. Galois might die. The stillness of the woods seemed like the hush of a listening multitude. A blue haze of heat hung over the rolling domes of the western trees, and never a wind wave stirred the long grass. Mountainous clouds sailed radiant over ridge and spur, and it might have been Elysium, where souls wandered through meads of asphodel. Igrine looked long over the valley with its stately trees, its flowering grass and quiet pool in the meadows. She was vastly calm, though her eyes were full of a woe that seemed to well up like water out of her soul. She still twisted and untwisted a strand of her hair about her wrist, but for all else, she was as quiet as one of the trees that stood near and overshadowed her. Peleus, she said. The man came two steps nearer. Go quickly. You're crying. Man, man, how long will you torture me? I am only a little strong. The calm of tragedy seemed to dissolve away on the instant. Peleus thrust his hands into the air like a swimmer, sinking to his death. His heart answered Agrine's exceeding bitter cry. Would that we had never come to this! I cannot say that, though my heart breaks. Peleus fell down and clasped her with his arms about the knees. His face was hidden in the folds of her surcoat. Presently, he loosed his hold, looked up, took a ring from his hand, and thrust it into her palm. The signet of a king, he said. Keep it for Niedergrine. Have you money? I have money, Peleus. God guard you. Igrine was white to the lips, but she never wavered. Heaven keep you she said. Her voice was hoarse in her throat, and she began to shiver, as though chilled by a sleety wind. Go quickly, Peleus. For God's sake, hide your face from me. It is death. It is death. He sprang up and left her without a look. Igrine saw him go through the long grass with his hand over his eyes, staggering like one sword smitten to the brain. He never stared back at her, but held straight for the cottage and the cedar tree where his black horse was tethered under the shade. She watched him mount and gallop for the forest, nor did she move till his red harness had died into the gloom of the trees. End of Book Three, Chapter Twelve Recorded by Laurie Nadeau Richardson www.laurierichardsonvo.com Section 33 of Uther and Egrain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cassian Hayes. Uther and Egrain by Warwick Deeping. Book 3, Chapter 8. Down through the woods that morning rode Gorlois on his great white horse, with helmet clanging at saddle-bow, shield hung at his left shoulder, spear trailing under the trees. He was hot, thirsty, and in a most evil temper. His bronzed face glistened with sweat, and the checkered webs of light flickering through the leaves flashed fitfully upon his golden harness. Since dawn he had ridden the hills in the glare of the sun till his armor blazed like an oven. It was June weather, and hot at that. His tongue felt like wood rubbing against leather. It was a damnable month for bearing harness. Casting out over the hills he had come upon Garlot's Valley, and seeing it green and shadowy had plunged down to profit by the shade. Since the red night was lost to him, it was immaterial whether he rode by wood or hill. On this account, too, Gorlois's temper was as hot as his skin. He hated a balking above all things. He was moved to be furious with trifles, and like the savage who gnashes at the stone that bruises his foot, he cursed creation and felt thoroughly at war with the world. A grim unreason had possession of him, such a mood as makes murder a mere impulse of the hand and malice the prime instinct of the heart. As he rode with loose rein, the trees thinned suddenly, and the forest gloom rolled back over his head. Gorlois halted mechanically under the woolshaw, and scanned the valley spread before him under the brown hollow of his hand. He had expected no such open land in this waste of wood. Open land with water, a cottage, sheep feeding, and horses tethered under the trees. One of the horses tethered there was a black. The coincidence livened Gorlois's torpid, sunburnt face with a cool gleam of intelligence. He sat motionless in the saddle and took the length and breadth of the valley under the keen ken of his black eyes. The man swore a little oath into his peaked black beard. His face grew suddenly rapacious as he stared out under the hollow of his hand. He had seen a streak of red strike through the green wall far up the eastern slope that fronted him, a scrap of color metallic with the hint of armor. It went to and fro under the distant trees like a torch past the windows of a church. Gorlois's hand tightened on the bridle. He watched the thing as a hawk watches a young rabbit in the grass. Betimes he gave a queer little chuckle, <laughs> and turned his horse into the deeper shade of the trees. He began to make a circuit round the valley, holding northwards to compass the meadows. He cast long, wary glances into the wood as he went, tried his sword to see that it was loose in the scabbard, took his helmet from the saddle-bow, and let down the cheek pieces from the crown. Before long he kicked his stirrups away, rolled out of the saddle, and tied his horse to an oak sapling in a little dell. Going silently on foot over the mossy grass, stopping often to stare into the sunny vistas of the forest, Moving more or less from tree to tree, he worked his way southwards along the eastern slope. Streaks of meadowland and the glint of water showed below him, and he heard the bleat of sheep far away and the tinkling of a bell. Presently, the murmur of voices came to him through the woods. He ventured on another fifty paces, then stopped behind a tree to listen. There were two voices, he was sure of that. One was a woman's and the other had the sonorous vibration of a man's bass. Gorlois's eyes took a queer, faraway look, and his strong teeth showed between his lips. He worked his way on through the trees with the cautious and deliberate instinct of a hunter. The two voices gained in timber, character, and expression. Their talk was no jay's chatter. Gorlois could tell that from the emphasis of sound and a certain dramatic melody that ran through the whole. Soon the voices were very near. Going on his belly, with his sword held in his left hand, he crawled like a gilt dragon through a forest of springing fern. He crawled on till he was quite near the two who stood and talked under the trees. Lying flat, never venturing to lift his head, he crouched, breathing hard through his nostrils and holding his scabbard sword crosswise beneath his chin. Gorlois's face, scarred and drawn as it was, seemed, as he listened, a clear mirror for the portrayal of human passion. His black mustachios twitched above his angular jaw, 
His eyes took a rapacious and glazed look, and a shadow seemed to cover his face. He turned and twisted as he lay, and dug the points of his iron-shod shoes into the soft ground as though in the crisis of some pain. It was the woman's voice that did all this for him. Every word seemed like the wrench of a hook in his flesh, and he cursed and twisted under the bracken. Presently, he lay still again, as though to listen the better. He could hear something of what was said to the man in the red harness, but the main drift of their talk was beyond him. Peleus! Peleus! He squirmed like a crushed snake at each sounding of the name. The bracken hardly swayed as he crawled on some twenty paces and again lay still, with his cheek resting upon the scabbard of his sword. Gorlois might die. Gorlois heard the words as plainly as though they had been spoken into his ear. A vast silence hung like thunder over the forest. Gorlois lay as though stunned with a stone, his dry mouth pressed to the cold steel of the sword. His eyes took a stubborn stare under the sweep of his cask. With gradual labor, he raised himself upon his elbows, drew his knees up under his body, and lifted his head slowly above the sweep of green. The ground fell away slightly from where Gorlois knelt in the bracken, and he could look down on the two who stood under the trees while the fern fronds hid his harness. He saw a woman in violet and gold, her hair falling straight on either side of her face and her arms folded crosswise over her breast. He saw also the knight in red harness, with his locked hands twisting above his head as in an agony, while his face was hidden by his arm. A passionate whisper of words passed between the two. Even when Gorlois watched, the man in the red harness jerked round and fell to his knees at the woman's feet. Gorlois suddenly saw his face. It was the face of Uther the King. Gorlois dropped back under the bracken as though smitten through with a sword. He lay there a long while with his head upon his arms. A sudden breeze came up the valley, sounding through the trees, swaying the green fronds above the man's harness, calling a gradual clamor from the woods. The overmastering image of the king seemed to frown down Gorlois for the moment, and he crouched like a dog, with the courage crushed out of his soul. Betimes, Gorlois's reason revived from the stroke that had stunned it for a season. Like Jonah's gourd, a quick purpose sprang up and shadowed him from the too hasty heat of his own passions. He was a virile man, capable of great wrath and great resentment. Yet he was no mere firebrand. His malice, strangely enough, was one-handed and reached out only against the woman. For Uther, he conceived a superhuman envy, a passion that rose above mere bloody expiation by the sword. Gorlois had the wit to remember the finer cruelties of a spiritual vengeance, the gain of wounding the soul rather than the flesh. His malice was a thing fanatical in itself, yet taken from the forge to be cooled and tempered like steel. When he lifted his head again above the bracken, Uther had gone, and Egrain stood alone under the trees. She stood straight and motionless as some tall flower, her hair falling like quiet sunlight, unshaken by a wind. Her great beauty leapt out into Gorlois's blood and maddened him. As she looked out over the valley, Gorlois, straining his neck above the bracken, could see that she watched Uther as he went down from her towards the pool. Even to Gorlois there was something tragic about the solitary figure under the trees, a stiff, grievous look as though woe had transformed her into a pillar of stone. To him the affair seemed a mere assignation, a hazardous passage of romance. Measuring the souls of others by his own morality, he guessed nothing of the deeper throes that surged through the tale like the long moan of a night wind. Gorlois saw Uther and his black horse disappear into the opposing bank of woodland. Viciously satisfied, he lay in the bracken and watched Egrain, coming by a queer pleasure in considering her beauty and in the knowledge that her very life was poised on the point of his sword. How little she thought of the man-dragon lying in his gilded scales under the green of the feathery fronds. Gorlois felt a kind of arrogance of ownership boasting itself in his heart. 
Certainly he held a means more sinister than the sword wherewith to perfect his vengeance and to preserve his honor. A very purgatory, Bolgia upon Bolgia, stretched out in prospect for the souls of the two who had done him this great evil. Gorlois made much of it with a joy that was hard and durable as iron. Egraine stirred at last from her stupor of immobility. Walking unsteadily, as though faint in the heat, she passed out from the trees with their mingling of sun and shadow and went down through the long grass toward the pool and the cottage. Gorlois knelt in the bracken and watched her with a smile. There was little chance of her escaping, and he could be as deliberate as he pleased over the matter. He inferred with reason that the cottage served her as a lodging in this woodland solitude, where she lay hid from all the world save from Uther, whose courtesan she was. Gorloy laughed, a keen, biting laugh, at the thought of it all. At least he would go back for his horse and spear, and make a fitting entry before the woman who was his wife. Egraine, walking as though in her sleep, came into the cottage, and almost fell into Garlot's arms. The girl looked frightened, and very white about the lips. She could find nothing in her heart to say to Egraine. She helped her to the bed and ran to the cupboard to get wine. Drink it, she said, the cup rocking to and fro in her hand. Egraine did her best, but spilt much of the stuff upon her bosom where it made a stain like blood. She sat on the edge of the bed and looked into the distance with expressionless eyes. Her hands were very cold. Garlot chafed them between her own, murmured a word or two, but could not bring herself to look into Egraine's face. From the valley the bleeding of sheep came up with a sudden wind, and the red roses flung their faces across the latticed casement. Egraine was looking through the window into the deep green of the woods. She could see the place where Peleas had left her, even the tree under which she had stood when she had pleaded with him without avail. How utterly quiet everything seemed. Surely June was an evil month for her. Had it not brought double misery and well-nigh broken her heart? And the end of it all was that she was to go back to a convent, to gray walls, vigils, and the sounding of a bell. Even that was better than being Gorloise's wife. Suddenly, as she sat and stared out of the casement, her body grew tense and eager as a bent bow. Her eyes hardened, lost their dreamy look. The hands that had rested in Garlot's gripped the girl's wrists with a force that made her wince. Saddle the horse. The words came in a hard whisper. Garlot stared at her and did not stir. Child, never question me. Be quick, on your life. Egraine, a different woman in a moment, had started up and taken her shield and helmet from the wall. Her sword was girded to her. Quick as thought, she gathered up her trailing hair, thrust on the cask, strapped it to the neckplate under her surcoat. Garlot, vastly puzzled but inspired by Egraine's earnestness, had hurried out with saddle and bridle over her shoulder. As she ran through the garden, she looked up to the woods and saw the reason of Egraine's flurry. A knight had come out from the forest on a white horse, his armor flashing and blazing in the noonday sun. He had halted motionless at the edge of the woodland, as though to mark what was passing beneath him in the valley. Garlot found Egraine armed beside her as she stood by the gray horse under the cedar and tugged with trembling fingers at the saddle straps. Bit and bridle were quickly in place. Egraine, moved by a hurried tenderness, gripped Garlot to her with both arms. God guard you, little sister. Where are you going, Egraine? God knows. Who is yonder knight? Gorlois, my husband. Egraine climbed into the saddle from the girl's knee. She dashed in the spurs and went at a gallop over the meadows towards the south. Gorlois's white horse was coming at full stride through the feathery grass. The man was riding crosswise over the valley, bent on cutting off Egraine from the southern stretch of meadows and driving her back upon the woods. It was Egraine's hope to overtake Peleas and to put herself behind the barrier of his shield. Gorlois, guessing her desire, drove home the spurs and hunted her in earnest. Egraine headed the man and won a lead in the first half mile. Her gray horse plunged like a galley in a rough sea, and she held to the pommel of her saddle to keep her seat. 
Gorlois thundered at full gallop in her wake, the long grass flying before his horse's hoofs like foam. He had thrown away his spear, and his eyes were set in a long stare on the galloping horse ahead. The zest of the chase had hold of him, and he used the spurs with heavy heel. The green woods rolled down on them as the valley narrowed to its southern end. Egraine had never wandered so far from Garlot's cottage, and the ground was strange to her, nor did she know how the country promised. Riding at full gallop, she saw, with a shudder of fear, a barrier of rock running serrate across her path and closing the narrow valley like a wall. Gorlois saw it, too, and sent up a shout that made Egraine's hate flame up into a kind of rapture. To have turned right or left up the steep grass slope towards the woods would have given back to Gorlois the little start she had of him. With a numb chill at her heart, she abandoned all hope of Pelias and turned to face the inevitable and Gorlois, her lord. The man came up like a wind through the grass and drew rain roughly some ten paces away. He laughed as he stared at Egraine, an uncouth, angering laugh like the yapping of a dog. He looked big and burly in the saddle, and the muscles stood out in his neck as he tilted his square jaw and stared down at his wife. Egraine had not looked upon his face since he had been smitten in battle. Its ugliness seemed to match his soul. Gorlois lifted up his voice and mocked her. Heh, <laughs> my brave, you are trapped, are you? Mother of God, but you make a good figure of a man. These many months I have missed you, wife in arms. And you have served in the pay of my lord the king. Good service and good pay I warrant, and plenty of plunder. I will have that harness of yours hung over my bed. Egraine suffered him not so much as a word. She was furious, and in no mood to be scoffed down and cowed by mere insolent strength. She looked into Gorlois's libidinous face from behind the visor of her helmet and thought her thoughts. Gorlois ran on in his mocking fashion. His bronzed face gleamed with sweat, and a rough, lascivious smile showed up his strong white teeth to her. Ha! Now, madam, deliver and let us have sight of you. The king loves your lips, eh? They are red, and your arms are soft. I warrant he found your bosom a good pillow. Uther was ever such a solemn soul, such a monk, such a father. It is good for the heart to hear of him knotted up in a woman's hair. Egraine shook with the immensity of her hate. You were ever a foul-tongued hound, she said. Am I your echo? I wish you were dead. So said the king. So you spied on us. Gorlois set up a scoffing laugh, showing his red throat like a hungry bird. And saw my wife the king's courtesan. Ha! What a jest! Come, madam, let us be going. Your honest home waits for you. I will chatter to you of moralities, by the way. He had hardly delivered himself of the saying when Egraine's hand clutched at the handle of her sword. She jerked the spurs in with her heels. Her gray horse started forward like a bolt, blundered into Gorlois, caught him cross-counter, and rolled his white stallion down into the grass. Egraine had lashed out at the shock. Her sword caught Gorlois's arm and cut through sleeve and arm guard to the bone. As he rolled with his horse in the grass, she wheeled round and, clapping in the spurs, rode hard uphill for the forest. Gorlois, hot as a furnace, scrambled to his feet and dragged his horse up by the bridle. Half off the saddle, with empty stirrups dangling, he went at a canter for the yawn of the wood. His slashed arm burnt as though it had been touched with a branding iron. Blood dripped down upon his horse's white shoulder. He was soon steady in the saddle and galloping full pelt after he grained, the ground slipping under his horse's hoofs like water, the long grass flying like spray. Egrain's horse lost ground up the slope. He had less heart than Gorlois's beast and was weaker in the haunches. By the time they reached the trees, Egrain had twenty yards to her credit and no more. She saw her chance gone and heard Gorlois close in her wake, caught sideways a glimpse of plunging hooves and angry harness. Drawing aside suddenly with all her strength, 
she let Gorlois sweep up on her flank and pass her by some yards. Before he could turn, she rode into him as fast as she could gather. Her sword clattered on his helmet. Sparks flew. Gorlois wrenched round and put his shield above his head. By God, hold off! Would you have me fight a woman? A swinging cut rattled on his shoulder plate for answer. Gorlois rapped out an oath and drew his sword. Hold off! His roar seemed to shake the trees. To Egrain, it was the mere meaningless threatening of a sea. She struck home again and again while Gorlois foined with her. More than once she reached his flesh. Gorlois's grim patience gave way at last. A clean cut drew spurting blood from his shoulder. God curse you! Take it then! He swung his sword with a great downward sweep, a streak of steel that struck crackling fire from the burnished cask. Egrain's arm dropped like a broken bow. For half a breath she sat straight in the saddle, swayed, sank slantwise, and slid down into the long grass. Her horse stood still at her side, looking at her with mild blue eyes. Gorlois gave a queer short laugh. Huh. He looked frightened for the moment. The flush of anger had passed and left him pale. He dismounted, bent over Egrain, unstrapped her helmet. She was only dazed by the blow. Blood trickled red amid her hair, and her blue eyes stared him in the face. She lifted up a hand with a bitter cry of defiance. Strike! Strike and make an end! Gorlois's grimness came back, and his eyes hardened. That were too good for you. Devil, by God I shall tame you. Never fear. End of Book 3, Chapter 8 Recording by Cassian Hayes, Philadelphia